I've spent a year, a year of my life studying the most controversial passage of the Bible, and this is the video teaching on that passage. And I have been delayed with some significant uh, health issues that have slowed me down a ton, don't get me wrong, but over the past year, I've spent the bulk of whatever time I could working on this project. And this is the video on that project. I've never uh, put this much time into one single passage of scripture or into one single video teaching. So it's gonna be long, as you already know from whatever timestamps you can see. Uh, speaking of which, there are specific chapters and the video's broken up into timestamps you can see either on YouTube or in podcasts down below if you check the description. This is just to help you navigate and find exactly what you need. So women in ministry, that's the topic. Women's roles, men's roles, what are they? Are they even? Do they even exist? And it's one of the biggest debates in the Christian world right now, especially the Western Christian world, which of course I'm part of. The amount of scholarly work an argument that goes into this issue is insane. It's just totally insane. It, you could spend your whole life just studying this one topic and never read anything else, and you would never run out of stuff. Uh, the, the, just the rate at which it all the papers are being written, it's, it's just crazy. Everyone is trying to prove their side. That's the point. And, and laymen like you, normal people, look at this stuff and they go, I, I can't make heads or tails of these complicated, in-depth debates about Greek language and ancient history. And yeah, I can make some sense of the his, the context claims about this verse in the context of this passage of scripture, but man, they're going right over my head with some of the claims about Artemis of Ephesia and the cult that was going on there, um, you know, when first Timothy was written, this sort of thing. Um, everyone's trying to prove their side. And amongst this, like, really sort of mean spirited debate most of the time, a lot of the time among this debate, there is no passage more hotly argued over and the tug of war is just, it never gets more extreme than on the passage of first Timothy chapter two, where Paul says, I do not allow women to teach or have authority over a man. And some other things he says there, like being saved in childbearing, all this kind of stuff. Everyone is arguing over this passage and this video today, right now, Part 12 in the Women in Ministry series is going to be a thorough examination of the debate on 1 Timothy chapter 2. This video examines, in other words, the most controversial passage of the Bible on the most controversial and contentious debated issue in modern Western Christianity. If at any point you decide you just want to get to the end, go to this timestamp right here and you can just catch the conclusions. Look, I just want this to be as good of a resource as I can for you. I know how full this video is. I didn't see any other way to do it. But go to that timestamp if you want to skip right to the conclusions. And I pray that this is a blessing to you. This is Women in Ministry, Part 12, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 11 through 15. Let me just read you the passage. Here we go. This is what the debate is all about. Let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Yet she will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control. And I already know you've got a ton of questions about this, but you're going to have even more questions after I explain to you the two sides and the things that they're saying and claiming about this passage. At the at the outset, here's my commitment, okay? And and of course, I could be wrong. I could be wrong about things I claim in this video. Um I my my conclusion is very strong and I don't see how it is it could be wrong potentially based upon the data that I've got available. I feel very confident about my conclusion and hopefully I can give you the ability to come to your own conclusion on this issue. But this passage, uh, we're going to go deep into it. The popular myths being propagated by particularly one side of the debate. They're really pushing a lot of myths and a lot of poor scholarship on this issue. Um, and I'm going to be exposing that poor scholarship. I'm not going to pull punches. And it's not because I'm trying to get it a scholar that I'm mad at or anything like that. I don't at all deride the scholars themselves but the things that are not true that are being propagated about 1 Timothy 2, that I want to put a spotlight on and say, hey, don't change your mind on the meaning of this passage based on what ends up being fake claims about history or a distorted version of the past or of understanding Greek language and that sort of thing. So it's extremely important, though, <clears throat> before we get into the details here, uh, before I start explaining the two sides and the claims they make and we start sort of hashing through all of the chaos to get clarity, it's extremely important that I let you know why I waited 
till part 12. I'm almost done with this series. I've only got one more video. Till part 12 in this series before I dealt with 1 Timothy 2. When 1 Timothy 2, especially verse 12, right? I don't permit a woman to teach or have authority over a man. That verse is like one of the first things people go to when they talk about women in ministry. But I waited till the end of the series. And nothing I've done in parts 1 through 10 or 11 in the series has depended on my understanding of 1 Timothy chapter 2. Here's the reason why. This video, right? This is video 12. There's over 27 hours I've got on everything else the Bible teaches on the topic. And now I'm stepping into however long, however many hours this video is. And I've saved it for last because one of the egalitarian claims is that many complementarians or people who I, the camp I ended up in, complementarian, many people in this camp, we use this passage wrongly. That we, we act like it's the only passage in the Bible that talks about the issue. So let me read to you what Cynthia Long Westfall, who's an egalitarian scholar, says, a claim that she makes. And this is one reason why I waited till the very end to talk about 1 Timothy 2. She says, historically, 1 Timothy 2.12 is the primary text that has been used up to the present to ban women from certain activities and functions within the church. Side note here, like eldership or maybe leading in different capacities in the church, speaking in certain ways during service like, say, from the pulpit, uh, doing a teaching on Sunday. Now, she continues, regardless of a woman's training, skills, or spiritual gifts, it has provided a lens or exegetical grid through which all other scripture is applied to women. That's in her book, um, Paul and Gender, page 279, that Westfall says this. Now, the reason why I, I waited was because I hear this not just from her, but I hear it from all kinds of different egalitarians that, the complementarians and the patriarchalists, they're they are taking 1 Timothy 2, and it can be a fair criticism. They're grabbing it, they're taking their understanding of this one passage, and then they're using it as a grid for how they interpret the rest of the Bible so that they have a distorted view of the Bible. Whereas if they maybe are, they're just wrong on this one section, 1 Timothy 2, then maybe they're misinterpreting the whole Bible because they're using it as their grid, as their filter. And of course, I think egalitarians are doing this with Galatians chapter 3, where it says there's no male or female in Christ. I think that that's what they've done with that passage. And I've made a video on that. We talked about that. But I want to make sure I don't do this. And nobody does this with this passage as well. So I want to avoid these two errors. The first error to avoid in 1 Timothy 2 is ignoring the rest of Scripture. Right? There's much to learn from all of Scripture and complementarians or patriarchalists. And I've explained these views before, if you're wondering. The patriarchalists think of them as the most extreme, in general, okay, the more extreme version of these gender differences in roles. And I'm not in that camp. And then there's the complementarians who say there's real differences between male and female. And there are some restrictions, but that many times people have gone too far. People have gone too far and they have violated biblical teaching, violated the rights and responsibilities and authority of women by going too far. But yet there are differences. The husband really is the head of the home and that does imply greater authority in that relationship. That men are supposed to be leaders in the in the office of elder in for example, in the church, and that there is uh, the idea of submission is actually a good and godly thing, um, but that it can often be abused. And so that's the camp I find myself in, complementarian, and I'll be defending that more as we go today. Then there's the egalitarians who basically say, look, there's there's generally say, there's a general generalizing of that group. They're saying, look, male, female, uh, we're different genders, but we don't really have different roles. Um, a woman can do any role with God's approval that a man can do, including elder. Um, and in marriage, most egalitarians would say in marriage, there aren't any sort of differences in the authority between a husband and wife. And the headship of a husband is about other things that has nothing to do with authority. All that kind of stuff, right? So that being said, um, I think complementarians or patriarchalists who rely entirely on 1 Timothy 2, they tend to have a harder and more restrictive and less nuanced view than the Bible actually does. Because when you go to Acts and when you go to um, 1 Corinthians, and when you look at Genesis chapter 1, not just chapter 3 or chapter 2, but you look at chapter 1 as well, you find that women actually have a greater, higher, more, I, what should I say here? These, these are probably clumsy terms to use. Women basically have less less restrictions or less rules or less cautions on them than the patriarchalists tend to give them. And it's these other passages of scripture that do that. So 1 Timothy 2 becomes this, it does become a group where you distort the rest of scripture a little bit because that's all you looked at. Okay, I, so I agree that that is a correct criticism. But the second thing I want to avoid is this. I don't want to make it seem like complementarians, 
as I am. We rest entirely on 1 Timothy 2. Like if you mis- if, if we're misunderstanding this one passage, then our whole case falls apart. And I think I've shown this is not the case. As I started this project, I was perfectly open to being egalitarian, actually kind of leaned that way, desired to be that. But I don't believe the scripture gives us that possibility. And I think that throughout our study of all of the relevant passages in the scripture up till 1 Timothy, we're already complementarian whether we like it or not. And so 1 Timothy 2 comes in and says, ha, I mean, it's it's very clear, it's very abundantly open and obvious what it means, but but it's certainly not the only thing we're relying upon. And the complementarian view is secured even without this passage. That that's my understanding of it. And I've made a whole series of videos to explain it. So I don't want it, I don't want to leave the impression with anybody that I'm depending on 1 Timothy 2 for my views here. Rather, they further support and, and, and further strengthen even that much more views that are taught elsewhere in Scripture. So this series has shown gender roles are thoroughly taught throughout the Bible, starting in Genesis. And you can go back and link below to all the all the stuff. But I didn't just wait to talk about 1 Timothy 2. Um, I didn't just delay dealing with this passage and then let it sit in the background, influencing my understanding of everything. I refused to make, and this is important, I just got to lay this out, I refused to make any previous interpretation depend on 1 Timothy 2. I may have occasionally mentioned, hey, that's consistent with 1 Timothy 2, but I didn't say that's dependent on 1 Timothy 2. So I never depended on 1 Timothy 2 for my other interpretations. I I don't think I'm open to this uh, frequent egalitarian claim that we're using this passage to interpret the rest of Scripture. The complementarian view is extremely well supported and consistently taught throughout scripture, even if we somehow lost 1 Timothy 2 from the Bible entirely. Complementarians may overemphasize 1 Timothy 2. I do think that that does happen. It gets overemphasized, but the view itself does not depend on 1 Timothy 2 in order to prove itself. It's just further support. All right, so here's the format for today. All right, here's what I'm going to do right now. We're going to move into the next stage. I've done the introduction. Now we're going to move into the next stage, which is me briefly teaching the passage. I mean, really quick, lightning round. I'm going to go through the passage and tell you what I basically think it means. And I think that this is the sort of obvious understanding that most people would look at, at least for most of the verses. Some of it's not obvious at all. We'll get into that in detail. But I'm going to make the the beginning of the video here an easy place for anyone to find a simple explanation of the passage. If that's all you're looking for and you don't want to watch the rest of the video, this is what you're going to be looking for right here, what comes next. And then I'm going to go over the other side, the egalitarian side, and I'm going to explain what they say that totally flips your understanding of the passage and how many today are starting to understand 1 Timothy 2, I think wrongly, because of false claims. I will try to support that bold statement that I just made. So here we go. This is what the passage appears to be saying. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 11 through 15. I'll read it and we'll talk about it. Let a woman learn quietly, here we go, with all submissiveness. I do not permit a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Yet she will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control. So this is inflammatory to Westerners. I acknowledge this right off the bat, but I just want to set that aside for now. Look, I'm not going to try and fix how people emotionally react to this passage. First, we're going to start with explanation. What does it simply mean? Whether people like it or not, I don't care right now. I just want to say, what does it mean? Let's just focus on understanding the passage for now. If you view the passage through how irritated you might be by it, you're just you're going to distort your understanding of it. So the straightforward view is this. Verse 11 says, hey, women can learn. Women can learn. This is against the culture of the time, actually. Women have a full place for discipleship and they can learn all that men can learn. Again, I'm not going to defend this view. I'm just going to explain it right now. They can learn everything men can learn. And already I bump up against some patriarchal views and even some complementarians who would say, tell a woman that they shouldn't be in certain Bible college classes. Um, There's uh, one rising up in his sort of notoriety or how well known he is. Um... A theologian, Christian pastor, who has said, you know, about his wife that he would tell her, I'll tell you when you can read this theology book or that theology book, because we'll decide when I'll decide when we become, say, post mill. That was the example that he gave. And so there's like limits he's putting on the on the theological education his wife can receive um, that let her learn. 
let her learn. And you might think, well, but to miss it. Now, yeah, we'll get back to that. So yet gender roles are to be preserved. And that's that whole with all submissiveness. And that's the whole rest of the passage, or at least the next few verses is about maintaining the the gender roles. We see from the following verses that quietly with all submissiveness, the way the woman's to learn, that this phrase um, isn't merely the posture everyone has while being taught. It is also connected to gender roles. Okay, that's important. We'll get into that in more detail. In verse 12, we see that remain quiet, remain quiet is contrasted with the earlier verse to teach or exercise authority. So she's not to teach or exercise authority, right? She's to remain, to remain quiet. That contrast implies that this is, again, about gender roles, not just about sort of general conduct in a church service. Verse 12, women can't teach or have authority over men in the church, specifically over men in verse 12. That's that's a kind of a big deal, what it's telling us here. This seems to be the elder role and, I say and, the elder function. So that is, it's not just the title elder, that a woman is not to hold the, the title of elder. I think the passage here seems to be saying, well, you know, on the surface, the plain reading of the text, it seems to me, unless you can overturn it with some historical research or Greek studies or showing the translation is wrong, is that it's not just the title, but the activity of teaching and having authority in the way that an elder does. That's the thing that Paul is saying, I don't permit a woman to do. The application in Paul's time is pretty simple. He would say, you know, I don't want to see the public teaching of doctrine that happens at every church gathering. I don't want to have women doing that. To wield a, the second thing he doesn't want to see is for them to wield authority over men in ways, as I understand it, in ways such as judging prophecy or enacting church discipline or um, doing elder slash pastor type things as Paul understood it, as the New Testament understood those roles. We often use these words, elder, pastor, deacon, in very unbiblical ways. So you have to ask the question of, is the thing that we're calling an elder, a biblical elder, is the thing we're calling a pastor, the biblical version of that? What do we mean by that? But the basic application is pretty simple. The full application, however, into all variety of like life, life gets complicated. Um, that's a huge question we'll handle, we'll handle later. Can a woman say, teach theology in a Bible college outside of a church environment? Can she have authority over men outside the church setting um, or in a, or maybe even in a church setting but in a lesser fashion than elder. Is it a specific just elder type authority or can she have other authority? Can she be in charge of the ushers? Right. What, what, how do we apply it into these types of situations? Obviously the passage doesn't give us all those answers. So we're going to, we're going to dig in for them later, but verse 13 and 14 we hear on our screen. Um, it explains the reasons for Paul's gender or sex based policy. And it's two reasons. One, is the order of creation. Adam was formed first, and you can see more on that in video number two in my series, Women in Ministry, video number two, where we talk about Genesis. Um, and some scoff at this as primogeniture, but the Holy Spirit teaches that this is the right view of Genesis too. This is him right here going, hey, here's the rule about authority, and here's the reason, because Adam was formed first. Now, this is not something to scoff at. This is actually what the Bible seems to be teaching, and even the Holy Spirit interpreting the Old Testament for us. So we don't miss out on what it means. It's also important to note that verse 13 is pre-fall so that the um, the roles between men and women being different is a pre-fall reality. It's not just a post-fall reality, which we also talked about in video number two. The second reason Paul gives in verse 14 is Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. So it's a difference between Adam and Eve again, showing why Paul has a different rule between men and women. Now, this is, this is an inflammatory section right here. But again, I, I don't care about that right now. Um, we will we will worry about people's inflammation at a later time. <laughs> For now, we're going to try to understand it. Um, so this is where some debates come up. And the question is, is Eve's de deception, why does that push for the rule about men and women having different roles? What about Eve's deception makes that a, a rule? How does this function? We'll talk about this. There's debates like, does that mean all women are easily deceived? I've heard people teach this. I've had leaders in my own life tell me this. They never said it around women. They only said it to me privately. That's interesting. But at any rate, uh, does that mean all women are easily deceived? We'll tackle that later. And my answer is going to be no. And I'll give several reasons why I believe that's the case. Um, does that mean that we're supporting this, the suffering of the fall instead of reversing it in Christ? We'll tackle that objection later. Mike, you're you're pushing for the fall if, if you use this as a reason for, for role differences now. Uh, what's clear is this. Both creation and the fall, both creation and the fall, push for Paul's policy on women in ministry. This makes it transcultural. 
and it makes it futile to attempt to dismiss it based upon like cultural happenings in first timothy setting in ephesus at the time um that's a kind of a big deal that's how it appears at least and we'll see if we can overturn that with egalitarian uh, scholarship so this is incredibly consistent with the other hours of study that i've done that we've done you've put into as well into this into this topic so far genesis shows different roles uh, th- there's a lack of female priests in the old testament women were in all roles of ministry in the new testament except elder and apostle the highest most authoritative roles uh, husband's headship w- over his wife in relationship to their wives this is a direct teaching about submission to husbands that we see in scripture in multiple places and this is super consistent with what we read in first timothy this is not an anomaly this is just more of the same the headship and hud covering issues of first corinthians 7 i did a six hour video on that you guys may have seen uh, congratulations if you did <laughs> this one's going to be even longer i imagine because the notes are longer so this is all incredibly consistent with all the hours of study we've done with the rest of scripture it shouldn't be controversial it just is that that's the plain reading how it looks we'll see if egalitarian scholarship can overturn this because they're going to they're going to hit you with some claims in a second i'll share them with you they're going to have you going wow Maybe I've completely misunderstood 1 Timothy 2. Maybe I've been wrong all along and it's the translation that was wrong or it's my lack of knowledge of history, which can't, okay, history can flip your understanding of a passage. You go, oh, there's a cultural thing going on that I didn't know about. Of course that changes my understanding. That's called context, historical context. It's a big deal. We'll get into that too. Now, verse 15. Okay, I got to admit, along with everybody else, okay, verse 15 has no straightforward meaning. What does verse 15 mean? She'll be safe through childbearing? If they, from she to they now, if they continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control, what is this talking about? Look, I'm going to study this carefully. We'll go through several different possible interpretations and I'll offer you what I think is the strongest and then a backup in case I'm wrong about that one. Um, We'll examine all that. But here's the important part. Uh, You should not think that this verse and the meaning of this hardest, most confusing verse in the book of First Timothy and in a lot of the New Testament even, that this should guide and change your understanding of the obvious meaning of the rest of the passage. That is, we don't take what's plain and clear and use what's obscure to flip it on its head, right? We we, we try to let what's plain and clear be there to help us understand what's obscure. And so we're going to do that because that's better Bible study. Um, So we don't use the obscure to change what's clear. It's the other way around. So this view that I've just shared, that's the basic complementarian, not patriarchal exactly, no, um, equal in value, equal in dignity, but not the same and actually different in function and role and that that's not a good or bad thing. Like that one's good, like men are good and women are bad. It's nothing like that. It's different roles because God has instituted order that he wants and it's a, it's a healthy thing. It's, it's a wonderful thing. It's a godly thing and it's something that preserves people in a good way. This view can be overcome with careful study, right? But you can't, you know, if you're an egalitarian, you know, you read the passage and probably thought it meant that when you first read it. You couldn't blame people for reading, at least in English, reading a Bible and going, eh, that's what it looks like it means. An approach like this is pretty well represented throughout time. If you go through church history, the basic outline I've given you of 1 Timothy 2, that's pretty much how people have understood it for the large part. This is not something that's fresh and new and a a fancy Mike Winger interpretation. This is kind of just how it looks, okay? We should all acknowledge that is definitely how the passage appears to be. But things are changing. Egalitarian scholars have been working really hard and doing hard, putting their massive brains, and I mean that as a compliment here, putting their massive brains to work to try to understand if we've misunderstood this passage, providing maybe, oh, here's the historical thing you didn't know. Here's the Greek language thing you didn't know. Here's the context thing you didn't notice. Here's where you've got it wrong. This has nothing to do with enforcing some differences in roles between men and women. So here's an example of some of the newer interpretations, part two or section two, right? How egalitarian scholars see the passage. So we're going to go back over it. I'm going to reread it and give you, I'm going to pretend I'm egalitarian right now. Here's uh, an overview of what they might say. Verse 11, let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. This is the only actual command. It says, let a woman learn. That's the only command in the whole passage. Remember, I'm the egalitarian mic right now, okay? Um, the, the complementarians and the patriarchalists have misunderstood the emphasis of this passage by focusing on things he does and doesn't permit and then statements about the Old Testament, right? But the only thing he commands is let a woman learn. So it's really about female liberty, not any sort of restriction. Verse 12 says, I do not permit a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man. 
she's to remain quiet. Well, I do not permit. That probably refers to Paul's personal opinion. I do not permit, right? It refers to his personal opinion, not an apostolic ruling. So you've misunderstood the passage by thinking it was a ruling when it's just about a personal thing. Um, the word quiet is... Um, Oh, 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 I skipped one. Okay, the, it's actually, it should be translated not, I do not permit, but it really should be something more like, I do not permit for now, for the time being, at this current moment. That word, permit, right, epitrepo, that's a Greek thing we're going to talk about later, but that is a mistranslation. It should be showing you that it's a temporary present tense issue. It's not a timeless practice. So if Paul's like, here's my personal thing. It's just for now. You guys have taken this and made it a rule for churches today, and it was never meant to be. This whole thing it was just for Ephesus, right? Also, the word quiet is mistranslated here. It says she is to remain quiet, but it should be the word peaceful. And the majority of scholars think that it does refer to sort of a peaceful demeanor today. And so that was that's just, you know, uh, an unlikely translation, quiet. She's to be peaceful. It's just talking about a woman sort of being in a learning environment in a godly way. Maybe women were acting up a little bit weird, but it's not putting them in a role. Just telling them to do what they would, what men should do too when they're learning is to learn with peacefulness. This uh, whole thing was really just for Ephesus. Even in the first century, it wasn't a practice of all the churches. It's just something Paul was saying to the local church in 1 Timothy 2, right there because they had a particular dilemma. Something crazy was going on with a lot of women at the time. And it's not meant for everybody for all time. The word teach here in verse 12, I do not pro permit a woman to teach. It's actually talking about false doctrine. It doesn't mean she can't teach good doctrine. It means she can't teach false doctrine. In fact, if you'll notice, 1 Timothy chapter 1, 2, 3, all the way through, it's primarily about false doctrine and false teachers. There's a, there's a number of ways we can see this, and I'll explain them later as we go through. And that's the real issue, not gender roles. Paul's just saying, I don't let women teach false doctrine. That's it. Now, egalitarians have different ways of supporting that view. They'll take different paths that don't even agree with each other, but we'll talk about a few different ways they do that. It may actually be not that a woman can't teach false doctrine, but really... This phrase, exercise authority, that's a mistranslation. What it should say is something more like, I don't permit a woman to teach in a domineering way. So she could teach, she could teach good doctrine, she just can't teach in a domineering fashion. So maybe it's false doctrine, or maybe it's just that she can't teach in a domineering fashion. That's what it could possibly mean. Or exercise authority is perhaps something else. It, it could mean incite violence. I don't allow women to teach in a way that incites violence. Or maybe it means I don't allow women to teach in a way that hijacks authority. She teaches with sort of self-assumed authority. She's like, I'm just going to make myself the teacher of the church. No, she's not allowed to do that. Nobody's allowed to do that. This has nothing to do with women. Just nobody's allowed to do that. Paul's just reinforcing normal Christian behavior for all people. History, egalitarians may say, history proves this actually true. Um, misogynistic translators have hidden it from us. And we can show a translation history that proves that misogynistic translators changed things for us. And if we look at the translation history, you'll see in the earlier church, they, they understood that this word meant like to assume authority in a, in, an, in a bad way, to take it on yourself. And it didn't mean to simply have authority. So woman is not being told anything about just having authority. We'll go into a ton of detail on that claim, by the way. I even hired a scholar to provide the first public translation of an ancient papyri to help us use all the ancient uses of the term, every time this word, exercise authority, authenteo, comes up any time around Paul for like 300 plus years. Every single example, we're going to have all of them laid out. Um, then this phrase, over a man, maybe as, say, Westfall would say, the scholar, this phrase, over a man, actually means over her husband, because that word man could mean man or husband, depending on the context. So this is really about wives and husbands. Maybe this entire passage has been misunderstood and has nothing to do with church leadership or activities in the church. It's about marriage. And it's just reinforcing a cultural thing. So it doesn't really apply. Then we get to verse 13. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. This is not, according to the egalitarian side, um, this is not saying that Adam being made first, that that gives him a higher authority than Eve. It's actually fighting, which you don't know because you're not from Ephesus and you don't live in the first century. It's fighting this Ephesian, ungodly creation story from a cult, the cult of Artemis, where the women are made first and women have authority over men. And so this is just fighting that bad, wrong view. That's all it's doing. Ephesus was actually according to the egalitarian side, some of them, some of them, Ephesus was a hyper-feminist community where they were sort of having women domineer over men. And this was like a play going on at the time in Ephesus. 
Paul's just fixing it back to egalitarianism. He's not establishing male authority. He's just rejecting female authority over men because Paul sees all as equal because there's no male or female in Christ. You see how all of a sudden the passage totally changes. The um, Let's see what else we got. So yeah, it's not giving us male authority. It's just establishing equality. Verse 14, Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Um, okay, this is, these are just analogies. Adam and Eve are not analogies for male, female. They're analogies for the educated versus the uneducated Christians. One of the problems at the time is that women who were less educated, right, but basically less educated people were trying to step into roles of teaching others in the church. And that could be unhealthy. That could lead them to deception. Well, Adam, who had more information, getting his information directly from God, he knew more about the tree and more about the garden situation than Eve did, who got it secondhand from Adam. So Eve, she was more easily deceived. So Paul really is just saying, I don't want less educated people teaching in the church. I want them to be fully you know, educated in Christian theology before they teach. It doesn't matter if they're male or female. It's just coincidentally in the culture, women were less educated. So this has nothing to do with gender. It's just an understanding that we shouldn't let people in the church be teachers and leaders until they know doctrine really well. That's all it's really saying. And then verse 15, well, verse 15 about being saved in childbearing. You see, women would call out to Artemis. They would call out to Artemis, who was known to be the one who would help people in labor, help people give birth to kids and not die in labor, that kind of thing, not have stillborn um, experiences. So women were calling out to Artemis. Christian women were still calling out to Artemis, but Paul's letting them know, you'll be saved in childbearing. God will protect you. You don't need to call to Artemis. Call out to, to God. Call out to the true God so that he will guard and protect you. Don't move back into paganism because you're fear of what might happen in the danger of childbirth. This is a promise that God will help them through their labor pains. So it proves, it pro- and this is important, it proves to us that the cult of Artemis really is the background, the main issue behind the passage in 1 Timothy, and this legitimizes us seeing the cult of Artemis behind, say, the creation account or women exercising authority over men, that sort of thing. There are other issues as well, and there's going to be timestamps down below as we're going to go through all of these things in great detail. This is just the start, as you know, because you've already seen how, I don't even know how long this video is going to be, but it's going to take days to record it. I know that. I know that. And I got to let you guys know, I should have said this earlier, my notes, my teaching notes that I'm using right now have tons of references to books and page numbers, and they have tons of links to web pages where you can read articles and read papers. And I've, I've, I've saved that stuff in my teaching notes here. These aren't all my notes. There's ridiculous amounts of notes, but my teaching notes are freely available, right? At a link below, or you go to biblethinker.org, my website, where everything's free and you can have whatever you want that might help you out there. So timestamps, teaching notes, all freely there for you guys. Um, This ministry, I give away as much as I possibly can for free, which is just about everything. And that makes me happy. And I think it makes you all happy too. So let's go to the next session or section. Testing egalitarian claims. And that's pretty much the rest of the video. (laughs) We're going to be going one by one through a whole bunch of different claims. I have like, I don't know, 300 different graphics to show you, slides, quotes, and things like pictures and things like that. We're going to take our time. I'm not going to try to rush because it wouldn't work anyways. (laughs) But, But here we go. First thing we'll deal with is was this just Paul's personal opinion? When when Paul says in verse 12, I do not permit a woman to teach or have authority, that phrase, I do not permit, was it really just his personal opinion? So we're going to look at four different approaches. Here's four different approaches egalitarians have on this. One, they'll say this is Paul's personal opinion because he uses the phrase I. He doesn't say do not permit. He says I do not permit. So just the use of his reference to himself implies that this is not really a ruling. It's just him talking about something he's he's doing for whatever reason. Then the second approach is that there's a, there's a non-universal application because of the phrase, I'll put it on your screen here, permit. That is the Greek word permit, that the, the nature of the word implies limited application. That's uh, Philip Payne makes that claim. We'll go over that in detail. The third way they'll, they'll use this phrase, I do not permit to, to pull away from the um, the lasting or universal application of this passage is to say that this is some kind of limited instruction because it's I do not. Okay, so we had I, we had permit, now we have the do not part. So Paul says I do not permit or 
what they'll interpret this to mean is, I am not permitting at this time. Um, in the Greek, it just refers to the tense. It's in the present. And so it's like, I don't permit at the moment, but it implies that he will permit at some other time. And then finally, it's the nature of who's talking here. Well, Paul's the one who's not permitting. And Paul has limited, this is the fourth claim, Paul has limited jurisdiction. Okay, this might sound crazy to many of you, because it is. But one of the claims is Paul is limited in his jurisdiction. We're not a church planted by Paul, so this doesn't really apply to us. That's a real claim. That's, can you feel how dangerous that claim is? Because it is. But we'll talk about it in detail. So let's talk about the first way. The way that the verb is communicated, it reveals the prohibition is limited. Okay, several egalitarians put forward this kind of argument. So Philip Payne, Linda Belleville, um, Sharon Grenz. Um, Sharon? I think her first name is Sharon? Grenz? Anyway, Grenz puts this forward as well. And here is an example. This is um, from Philip Payne. Paul often chose the first person singular, I, present active indicative, am not permitting, to indicate his own personal advice or position for a situation that is not universal. So his claim is, hey, when Paul uses, you know, Greek tenses are really specific, more so than in English. And this present active indicative and a personal, I, present active indicative, and then the rest, he does this to indicate his personal advice. And it's not universal. Is that enough of a rule here to be a guide for interpretation? Should we actually allow this concept to change our view of what Paul means? Can we say that every time Paul refers to himself, present active indicative, that it means it's not universal? He's trying to say, it's like when someone says like, ah, it's just what I think. You know, that's a diminu diminutive way of talking about yourself. Like, that's just my opinion. Maybe that's a better way to put it. It's just my opinion, guys. You're trying to tell people that you you don't think this is binding on other people. You're Maybe you have some uncertainty about it. Maybe you're realizing it's situationally bound. Okay, so there's problems with thinking this. Douglas Moo points them out. So Douglas Moo, uh, 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 more of a complementarian or, or patriarchalist or whatever you want to call him, scholar. So he's on the other side, not egalitarian. He says, the use of the verb epitrepo, that's the Greek word right there for I do not permit or I am permitting. In the present tense, he says, implies nothing as to the universal nature of Paul's prohibition. Payne contends that the formulation does suggest such a restriction. So you have to look at context. I mean, Moo's just trying to imply something that's generally true about Greek. Okay, in, in general, Philip Payne, now if you don't know Greek, you don't know this, but Philip Payne is not telling you something that's generally true about Greek. That when someone uses first person present active indicative, that that means that they don't mean it for a lasting rule or lasting time. They, they mean to like, diminish the impact of the statement. That's not some rule in Greek. Um, and Moo's pointing that out. Let's look at the next quote from Douglas Moo. He says, the point to be made here is that epitrepo is never used, never used of a permission or prohibition which could be universal, but is restricted. Now I'm shortcutting a whole bunch of research for you to tell you this. Moo looks at a whole bunch of examples of epitrepo and he shows that in no case do you have these two things. A statement which you might think was universal, but second thing is actually limited. And that phrase epitrepo is being used in that sense to limit it. You never have that happen. There's not one other example of it. Here's another example, a counter example to sort of prove Payne's point wrong. Moo's example is uh, when Jesus gives permission to the gathering demons to enter the swine, a universal application is plainly impossible. That is, Philip Payne, went, and, and again, we're getting into the weeds. This whole video is going to be in the weeds. So if this is like not your style, what I'm about to share with you, this video is not your style. And there's nothing wrong with that, okay? Not everything I do is for everybody. I know that. I make it for the people who need it. Some of you need it. You're like, I've been way over my head in this debate, in this discussion on women in ministry, and I really need someone to get into the weeds with me and walk me through it. That's what this video is for. It's for you, okay? I feel your pain. For people who are more just curious and you're finding this already tedious, click away. <laughs> and and God bless you, don't worry about it. I'm not, I don't care, it doesn't bother me at all. Um, I, I don't even know if this video is gonna get very much attention. I don't have any expectations, we'll see. But, it'll, but for those who need it, it'll meet that need. And that's, that's the agenda there. There's always, every time I make a video, I know there's someone who needs that. Whether it's a lot of people or a few people, isn't, isn't the main concern. Okay. So um, it never happens. It never happens where the situation pain is describing 
actually happens elsewhere where, oh, we, we could have thought this was universal, but he's using this word to imply it's not universal. That, that never happens. So this is merely looking for a clue where one doesn't exist. You can't just take first person present active indicative verbs. That's the, don't worry about those mean if you don't already know, don't worry about it. Just, you can't take this tense and just assume it means um, this command is not universal. Now, here's another example of a first person active indicative verb. Oh, oh hold on. Actually, first, let's go to Romans chapter 12, 1. Here's Paul himself using first person. So he says, I, and it's active indicative, present active indicative. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. This is... Everybody takes this, we all do, both both sides, egalitarian, complementarian. We take this to be like a universal statement that all Christians should be doing all the time. But it, it's exactly fitting the tenses that Philip Payne says indicate it's not universal. Here's another example from 1 Timothy, actually. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. Also present, active, indicative. Paul says, I urge, I urge, first person, present, active, indicative, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people. Does Paul intend for us by that first person, present, active, indicative, for us to interpret this request that we pray for everybody, that that was for first century only and temporary, and we weren't supposed to keep doing that? <laughs> um, I think the answer is obviously no, meaning that Philip Payne is giving you uh, data that you don't want to rely on here. Um, and again, nothing ins insulting. I've said this before. Philip Payne, who I briefly met at, uh, at an ETS conference, uh, two years ago, I think it was. Anyway, seemed like such a wonderful man, genuinely wonderful man, full of joy and excitement. And he was like a, a scholar who's full of no, no dead, no like dead, the dead eyes of scholars who've looked too long into books, like that kind of thing. Just full of joy and seemed like a really wonderful guy. But I think very wrong on many points that are very relevant to the issues. And that matters because the truth matters. So nothing personal at all. Um, I wish I didn't have to bring up their names, but they're, they've published publicly on these issues, so we need to talk about them. Just like you could, and people do, make videos and write papers trying to, or maybe successfully, some of you would think, and maybe you're right, I'm just speaking in general, people write papers and do videos to refute me. That's not personal. It's about facts. It's about what truth is, so we need to have those discussions. Um, another, another point is that Payne seems to imply Douglas Moo agrees with his reasoning. Now, if you've read Philip Payne, as one guy I know who became egalitarian, he recommended Philip Payne's book, which you see right here, um, Man and Woman, One in Christ. He recommended this book as one of the things that really opened his eyes. And, and other people have said the same thing. So I've included it in my research. And Payne has, has, developed, has devoted his scholarly career to this topic in large part. And so, yeah, it's very relevant. So the reason why I want to point this out is that I need you to know that on these issues, you can't. You, you, you just can't just take his word for it. Um, I hate to say that. Um, I don't know how else to put it. So let's look at... This is what Philip Payne says about Douglas Moo. He quotes Douglas Moo in this book. He says, Moo justifiably says, Paul's use of the present active or present indicative in exhortations and commands is also relatively rare, dot, 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 dot. Advice for a current situation was being given to Timothy. Moo quotes or sorry, Payne quotes Douglas Moo to reinforce a point Payne is making that Moo does not agree with. And the quote is taken out of context to that effect. Now, it might be an accident. I don't care if it was on purpose or not, in a sense, because in the end, that whether it was an accident or not is a discussion of like someone's internal character issues. I'm talking about the data that people are believing that Payne has written. That is incorrect. And that's what we care about right now. So the paper that, that, um, Philip Payne quotes is from Douglas Moo, and it's on your screen right now, at least the name of the paper you can check out. It's a paper Moo wrote as a response to Philip Payne, where he's actually trying to say why he thinks Payne is wrong. And you'd think Moo agrees with Payne. Um, the tenses of I am not permitting, supposedly, showing that Paul is offering advice that's not meant to be taken as a general rule. But if you read the paper, and I've got a link to it in my notes that you can have down below, if you read the paper, he actually says the prohibitions are universal. Philip Payne thinks 1 Timothy 2, I do not permit that that is a universal prohibition. That's his opinion. He does not agree with Philip Payne. He's just been quoted out of context.
So we need to read more of Mu's quote. Here's the rest of the quote to show this. It seems to me that Payne has framed the question wrongly in assuming that Paul uses the present tense to restrict his advice. It is not so much a tem the temporal limitation which the tense can suggest, which leads Paul to use this construction, but the note of personal appeal which is implied, the personal address to Timothy, in which advice for a current situation was being given, that's the part Payne quotes, virtually demands the use of a present tense. Therefore, the first person present of Epitrepo allows for limited application but does not constitute clear evidence for it. So he's not helping Payne's point here. He's saying that Paul, basically the opposite, Paul is not using this to indicate limitation. It's not that 1 Timothy 2.12 is non-universal because it was advice for a current situation. Indeed, it's advice, let me put it this way, it's advice for a current situation, but it seems to be advice that is, a, that is always true that is being applied to a current situation. And that's there's a difference there. Like, look both ways before crossing the street. I might say that to a kid who's just ran across the street and almost got hit by a car, but it's not just advice for that situation. It's advice for all time. That's why Moo says it, quote, implies nothing as to the universal nature of Paul's prohibition. Payne also overstates and says this. Here's a quote um, from Moo on Payne's overstating things. As a matter of fact, however, I think Payne overstates the case for finding a personal and temporal restriction in the use of the term epitrepo in 1 Timothy 2.12. He gives the impression that Paul consistently distinguished his personal advice from permanently valid instruction when such is not the case. It is only rarely, and it is very rare, and, and Payne highlights these, but he acts like they're the norm, but they're not. Uh, it's rarely that Paul makes such a differentiation, and when he does, it is precarious to infer any less authority. The words are still the words of the Apostle Paul, writing inspired scripture. This could easily apply to some of uh, Payne's 1 Corinthians 7 examples that he gives that you could read about in his work. But basically, um, when Paul's like, not I, but the Lord, not the Lord, but I, when he uses this phrase, it doesn't mean, and what I'm about to say doesn't really, it's not binding, it's not authoritative. Even when he makes that distinction, it doesn't usually mean that, it seems. Now, Mu points out Payne's hidden premise as he's critiquing this argument from Payne. There appears to be a hidden disjunctive premise in Payne's argumentation here. Either Paul's personal advice or universally valid principles. It's This is the either or fallacy. Either Paul's like, just me, or it's universally valid. But of course, Paul is usually giving both, Moo says. Paul typically does both when he says, I, this, that, this. Like when he says, according to my gospel, he doesn't mean you know, my version of the, he, no, he's talking about the gospel he preaches as an apostle. So this raises the authority of it. It doesn't lower it. I'll give you more examples of this in a moment, but um, Payne's not alone in this. Linda Belleville makes a very similar argument. She says, some have suggested that the present indicative is used because it allows Paul to give a, t give a temporary restriction. I'm not permitting quote at this time. This has some merit. Do not let a woman teach would certainly communicate a universal norm. If this was Paul's intent, then a shift from a command to a present state of affairs would make sense. So she doesn't say like super strongly, this is clearly it. She just says things like it has some merit. It would make sense. Like, hey, just kind of throwing it out there. But now here's five problems, five problems with Belleville's view. This is important because this changes your understanding of the whole passage. Is it something Paul's giving as a rule or is it just some sort of temporary personal opinion type thing. Five problems with Linda Belleville's position. Number one, it's the apostle Paul as an apostle. That's the that's what the I is implying, it seems to me, in this passage. I primarily points to a person, not a time. I doesn't mean for now. I means me, right? And Paul's pointing to himself. The weight of the I, the meaning of the I, the, the significance of the self-reference of I. It depends on the person it points to. When your little brother says, I don't want you to do that, it's different than when your father says, I don't want you to do that, right? The I is referring to a different kind of person has a much different force. Well, the I here refers to Paul. Paul is the I, the apostle Paul, and he's writing as an apostle who's been entrusted with the gospel and entrusted with a stewardship to the Gentiles. He's speaking with great authority when he says I. Paul commonly gives, commonly in scripture, he gives apostolic instruction with first person in indicators. I gave you Romans 12.1 as the example of this. Romans 12, I appeal to you, right? Present your bodies as a living sacrifice. 
he, he's doing this clearly as an as an apostle. First Corinthians one ten is another example. I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree. If if Paul referring to himself was diminutive, why on earth does he say by the name of Jesus? Because he is not giving anything diminutive. He's doing this as the apostle Paul. That's typical. Uh, number two, second problem with Belleville's approach. It's Paul's practice in all places and by implication is to be Timothy's practice in Ephesus as well. What do I mean? When Paul says, I do not permit, he doesn't just say, hey, Timothy, where you are, if I was in Ephesus, I would not permit. He's like, I don't permit. This is something I have as a practice wherever I go. That's the implication of the I do not permit language. Paul is saying, this is something I've already established as a practice. I'm just putting it in writing, maybe for Timothy to show somebody, maybe for him to answer some objection, maybe for him to lean on Paul's authority here as he gives it to someone else. That is his practice in all places. So 1 Timothy 2 a gives us some support for this. I desire that men in every place, uh, that in every place men should pray. This is again, this is in the same context, 1 Timothy 2. It's about men. Later, he's going to say, I don't permit a woman. It's still first person. He's presenting things that are just stuff he wants to happen in churches as an apostle. That's the implication. And 1 Timothy 2.12 is along the same lines. Note, Paul does this as his policy. I do not permit. It's not a ruling that he's just come up with. It's a practice he's already got in place. It's an apostolic teaching, it seems, for churches in general. I think that that seems clear. Um, you know, the First Timothy 2 passage, there's a reason why the complementarians and patriarchalists tend to grab this passage to throw it out there because it's just so obvious. And it's only, it's the only way egalitarians convince people otherwise is by re-couching our understanding of the, the language or the history. And we're going to go through all of that today. So here's the third reason why Belleville's suggestion doesn't work. It's grounded in creation. We'll talk more about this later. But the four, Adam was formed first, then Eve. Adam was not deceived, but Eve. This is the reason why he doesn't permit it. It's not because of a situation in Ephesus. It's because of creation itself. Yes, there are absolutely several egalitarian claims against this, and we'll cover all of them in detail. But in the end, we're going to come back to it being that it's because of creation. Uh, number four, it's tied to a clear command. Let a woman learn in silence with all submission. Notice again the second half of this quote from Linda Belleville, where she says, if Paul had said, do not let a woman teach, then that would communicate a universal norm. If it was just a do, do not let, if that was in there, it would be universal norm. But if you look at the passage of scripture, again, this is how it starts. Let a woman learn. That's a command then, according to Belleville, that is absolutely a command. This is merely a reinforcing of that command or how that command gets played out in, in normal life. So this is the second half of the command, in other words, that this is all connected. We're not pulling, we're not atomizing these scriptures. We're seeing that Paul has a flow of thought and we're going to preserve that flow of thought. Then we have the fifth reason why Belleville, I think, gets this wrong. Um, and I don't know any single translation that handles it this way. This is soft evidence, but it's definitely evidence that we should consider. I don't know any translation that handles it the way that, that Belleville has. Notice her translation she puts on the screen here, or in her quote, I am not permitting at this time, and then puts JB. It's difficult to find what she's referring to, right? She refers to JB. I'm not sure who that is. Uh, some particular scholar, most likely, just some scholar whose initials are JB, but not an actual Bible translation I could find. For instance, it's not the JB Phillips translation. That doesn't do it. She did not provide a footnote that gives us the details of who JB is or what that refers to. I surveyed 30 English translations dating back to the Tyndale Bible from 1526. I didn't find any of them in those translations. Um, I can show you guys some of the translations that I looked at here. Here's 30 of them. This is not conclusive evidence, but it's important because the rhetorical impact of putting up a little JB there, it implies here's a translation that does it this way. And then the casual reader who many of you are, okay, maybe, maybe many of her readers are not, but Many of us right here, we're the layman, a lot of the people who are watching this video, you're going to look at her statement there and think, oh, there's even a translation that does it and that legitimizes it. I think it's important to point out that I, I don't even know what JB refers to. Um, it seems pretty obscure to me. If some individuals translating it this way has merit, if, 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 if that would have force with you, seeing that JB did it that way, whatever that is, then it should probably have merit to you that every single translation on your screen right here doesn't do that. In fact, it's the almost universal consensus of translations, it seems, that don't do that. 
that would seem to be important. Now, Tom Schreiner re replies to this line of reasoning to Linda Belleville and Philip Payne by saying the following, and it's a long quote, but I'm going to read it because we're in the weeds today. Bring your weed whacker. You're going to need it. I don't know what that means. All right. Some egalitarians have appealed to the phrase, uk epitrepo, I do not permit, to support their case, arguing that the indicative mood demonstrates the exhortation is not even a command and that the present tense suggests the exhortation is merely a temporary restriction to be lifted once women are qualified to teach. And he mentions some resources on that. Both assertions are incorrect. Paul often uses indicatives to introduce commands. For example, the famous admonition to give one's whole life to God, Romans 12, 1 and 2, is introduced with the indicative, I exhort. It is linguistically naive to insist commands must be in the imperative mood. And he gives several examples of scriptures where this is proves this wrong. Nor can one appeal to the present tense to say that the command is merely temporary. The same argument could be then could then be used to say Paul desires believers to give their lives to God only for a brief period of time. <laughs> Just do it for Sundays, guys. Just on Sundays. Isn't that how it works? Welcome to America. Or he wants the men to pray without wrath and dissension merely for the present time. First Timothy 2, 8 in the same context. And he continues, but in the future, they could desist. So again, I have uh, in my notes, you've, you can find references to every single quote I'm going to put on your screen. Frequently, they won't be showing on screen for the sake of space um, as far as the references, but it's all right there in my notes. So it appears to be a special rule. What am I saying? This, this, this first question we have about... Does Paul just not permit for the time? Um, it appears to be a special rule that's only applied when desired. Egalitarians only seem to apply it to this one verse, and they don't apply it to other times Paul talks, this rule. When Paul uses the indicative or present tense elsewhere, even in the same chapter, they don't follow their rule. This is not smart stuff. Don't do this. This is changing the meaning of an obvious set of words in Scripture to avoid their implications. Uh, and it's not the only way. There's about 150,000 other ways we're going to talk about <laughs> as we do this video. So pain adds another layer to this point. And let me just say real quick for anybody who's like, Mike, I thought you were unbiased. You know, you're, you're clearly, you clearly think the Galtarians are wrong. Um, yes, I do. But I didn't think that going in. I did not think that going in. In fact, my, my own other notes going through their books, like on Kindle, I usually try to read these things. I have some you know, books and stuff like that, but I, I try to read as much as I can on Kindle so I can take notes in the text itself. And as I was looking at my notes preparing for today's video, I'm seeing where I was reading Payne and I'm reading Belleville and I'm writing things like, I'm really disappointed. I was hoping for some solid arguments. I was hoping to hear a really good, strong case for their view on this passage. I'm disappointed in this. And you could see me being let down as I go through. My attitude towards the egalitarian perspective on 1 Timothy 2 is not a result of me having bias going in. It's me having conclusions coming out. Um, but, you know, that's fine. People could could say I'm biased. I don't really need to defend myself against that because they could just actually deal with my claims <laughs> and not, not just target me personally. Well, you're biased. Like, that's the most, um, uh, if that's how you want to think, you're welcome to think that way. Um, okay. So, pain adds another layer to this point. Another layer to this point. He offers a number of examples of what he thinks are the same kind of thing, and all of them are from 1 Corinthians 7. So these, I alluded to this earlier, but here they are. P uh, Payne says, four times in 1 Corinthians, and again in Philippians 4, Paul uses the identical grammatical construction, first person singular, present active indicative form, associated with one or more present active infinitives to express his current desire or conviction, not a universal demand. So he's like saying, hey, look, we've got five ultimate examples here um, of Paul doing exactly what I'm talking about, showing it is actually a habit of Paul. This is actually super persuasive to people. Even if you don't know what all the Greek means, you know, you get the point. Paul does this, and I've just given you evidence that he does it. Here's five different times he does it. So it's the coupling of verbs, right? The first person present active indicative verb with the present active infinitive. In 1 Timothy 2.12, it's the I don't permit, and then the present active infinitives are teach and have authority. I'll say a few things here. First thing I'll say this, in 1 Corinthians 7, the four examples that he's given, I don't actually agree with pain that all of those are Paul's way of saying, here's a uh, way of Paul expressing his current desire or conviction, not a universal demand. I don't agree with his statement on that. But if it is a rule that this construction means that Paul isn't giving a universal demand, 
then it would hold true pretty close to every time. Not just five examples, but in the at least the, the strong majority or can, or you know ninety percent or eighty percent of the time, it would be the case. So I did a search. There are seven examples of the full construction: first person singular, present active indicative verb associated with one or more present active infinitive. Just just worry about this. There's like seven examples of the whole construction and each of these seems like a universal application so here we go seven examples i'll read through some of them okay so romans 12 3 the second one there for by grace by the grace given to me i say to everyone among you not to think of himself more highly that's the that's the the, the second part of the equation there that the way that that's phrased that he then he ought to think but to think with sober judgment each according to the measure of faith that god has assigned is paul intending to tell us this is not universal application no Romans 16, 17, I appeal to you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles. Is is Paul telling us to avoid these people only temporarily in the first century and only if you live in, in Rome? No. Um, 1 Corinthians 5, 11, but now I am writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of a brother if he's guilty of sexual immorality or greed or is an idolater, reviler, drunkard, or swindler, not to even eat with such a one. That phrase, to eat with, that, that's, that, that fits pain's construction the way that he's designed his his formula. Yet this is obviously something we all apply universally and we don't think was just about Corinth. How about 1 Corinthians 12, 12, 1? Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not I do not want you to be uninformed. Did Paul only not want them temporarily to be uninformed? <laughs> or, or did maybe Paul think that that was kind of a permanent thing? I don't want Christians to ever be uninformed about spiritual gifts. Or the last example, Ephesians 4, 17. Now this I say, present I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. Is this only temporary? Hey guys, this is the 21st century. Christians can totally walk in the futility of their minds now. <laughs> this is like totally okay now because Paul used the first person coupled with this kind of infinitive as a way of showing you that it was not universal. Ah, so what Payne did was with his examples... In the last quote from Payne, he just pulled the ones that agreed with him and he ignored the ones that didn't. That's misleading to the audience. And there's unfortunately way too much of that going on, in particular in 1 Timothy chapter 2, but there's a lot of that, it seems, going on in egalitarian scholarship in general, where people are not getting the right idea. You've been convinced to be egalitarian because you thought that they were giving you the whole picture, but they only gave you the edited Photoshop version of the picture that made it look just the right way. Many egalitarians right now watching this video, well-intentioned, you really are just, you've just given a bit too much um, trust in the scholars that you've picked. I don't know how else to put it. Um, sorry, um, don't mean it to be personal at all, at all. I feel, I feel bad about bringing these things up, but you know what I didn't do? I didn't make these scholars write works that were misleading, but I did read them and analyze them, and this is the explanation of why these views don't work. The next method that some egalitarians have, Philip Payne in particular, of saying that this whole passage really just doesn't apply to us today is in the meaning of the word permit. That is, they say that the Greek term, it just implies that the whole thing is very temporary. So that leads us to our next little research section, which is this concept that the word permit shows this simply doesn't apply to us. Philip Payne says this in his own words here, every occurrence of epitrepo, that's that word, in the Greek Old Testament refers to a specific situation, never to a universally applicable permission. Now this sounds very impressive, especially to the layman. Every single time the word is used in the Old Testament, it has this connotation of being limited. And, and that that is impressive until you realize that when you look at the footnotes, Philip Payne is only talking about two instances in the proper Old Testament two in the Old Testament, and then three times in 4th Maccabees, which we'll get to in a minute. Yeah, that's not in your Bible. Not even if you're Catholic, that's not in your Bible. Um, but 4th Maccabees, we'll talk about that as well. So let's dig into this in some detail and find out, does this word permit imply limitation in its application? So the two Old Testament passages are, the first one is going to be in Job chapter 32, verse 14, where it says, ye have commissioned a man to speak such words. And this is a good example of a limited permission, right? Um, the commissioning or the permission, epitrepo here, is just to speak certain things. So this doesn't imply a man can say anything he wants whenever he wants forever. 
right? It is a limited permission, okay? I acknowledge that. Then we have Esther 9.14, and he permitted it to be done so, and he gave up the Jews of the city to uh, of the city the bodies of the sons of Ammon to hang this has to do with specifically a, a, a group of men that are going to be hanged that's the permission and so is that limited yes I think it's very reasonable to say that these two uses of epitrepo in the Greek Old Testament right because it was originally written in Hebrew but it was translated to Greek and that Greek was accessible and known to the writers of our New Testament yeah that makes sense he permitted it to be done so limited because once those guys are hanged that permission is over the thing is, and we have to ask this question, these are limited, why? Why are they limited? Are they limited because the word epitrepo limited the permission or because the context of the activity is automatically limited? I permit you to say these words. That's inherently limited no matter what use, word you use to say permit. I permit you to hang these two guys. That's inherently limited to a one-time hanging event no matter what word you use to say permit. The context forces a limitation. What we're trying to do is see the word itself forcing a limitation. So these are limited due to the nature of the action, not the verb epitrepo. Let's look at the three occurrences in 4th Maccabees. And they, I think, actually run counter. These are things that uh, Philip Payne says actually support his view. But when we look at it in detail, I would disagree. So here we go. The first one is in 4th Maccabees 4.17 on your screen. It says, who had made a covenant, this king, a particular horrible king, Antiochus Epiphanes, he made a covenant that if he would give him this authority to pay yearly 3,660 talents. This is about the king making a political deal where he appoints a guy named Jason to become the new high priest. And this guy's got to pay every year a whole bunch of money over to the king. Is this limited? You might say it's limited because it's just appointing one guy or something like that. But actually it's not. In the Jewish culture, that high priest appointment happened for an entire lifetime. Once you were appointed, it was ongoing and permanent unless someone did something to shut it down, like the king violated their policies and pulled someone out of the high priesthood, which could happen, but was not typical and was not expected. Or if the guy dies. And that's the natural way in which high priests retired in the Old Testament is they simply died. And so 4th Maccabees 4.18, you go one verse down, it has the word again, epitrepo, and he committed to him the high priesthood and rulership over the nation. Same word, same scenario, and it's for life. That's pretty long-lasting. I, I, in Philippines, says it's always a specific time-bound, non-general application. But that's really not the case. It's not time-bound here. And it is not general because it's about appointing one man, the high priesthood. Okay, But epitrepo didn't make it not general. The context did. So we don't want to import meanings into words that the words themselves don't carry in those contexts. 4th Maccabees 5.26 is the final one. Those things which are convenient to our souls, he has directed us to eat. But those which are repugnant to them, he has interdicted. Talking about food laws, God's food laws that he gave to the people. Now, these food laws are obviously meant for all of Israel. I mean, Here's where I start to feel as though there's some, and I don't usually use the term, but some mental gymnastics going on to say that um, this is not a generally applicable permission, a universally applicable permission, and it's to a specific situation because it's really not. You're a Jew in the Jewish setting and you're talking about something that God has permitted your entire nation to do for an ongoing rule generation after generation after generation. How is that limited and not universal? It's about as universal as we need to say that the term epitrepo can refer to that sort of thing. It's speaking of food laws that from the perspective of the writer of 4th Maccabees um, was universally applicable to Jews, the people he's speaking of. Right? When he speaks of Jews, he means all of them. Just like when Paul says of women in 1st Timothy 2, he probably is referring to women in general, all of them, not just a specific small group in Ephesus at the time. So let's look at the next thing we've got here, which is ultimately where pain then moves from examples of the Old Testament to examples from the New Testament. He says, similarly, the vast majority of New Testament occurrences of epitrepo clearly refers to a specific time or for a short or limited time duration. Now here we don't say it's all of them. We say it's the vast majority of them. Um, he's not the only scholar who says this. Philippine's not on his own. He's not just a wild card here. Uh, Andrew Perryman is another scholar who says, that the word is, quote, in every case, in every case related to a specific and limited set of circumstances. And I have uh, the article where this is quoted in my notes. You guys, again, you can check out my notes for free 
Um, there's a link down below where you could download them yourself and look. Yeah, it's my teaching notes. It looks it'll look scattered to you because I don't have every piece of data there. It's just my reminders of what to say when I'm actually teaching. But I included links and footnotes there for you to follow up on your own research. So as with the two Old Testament examples, uh, the way that we know that these are limited, this is this is the important bit, is that the context of the of the situation forces epitrepo to be a limited permission. It is never that epitrepo forces the limitation onto the context. That's huge because that's what they're trying to do in 1 Timothy 2. Paul says, I do not permit. That looks about as universal as it could be, or at least potentially universal. And they want the word itself to force a limitation where the context doesn't have it. But at every example they give, it's the context that forces the limitation, not the word. Allow me to demonstrate. Here we go. Luke chapter 8, verse 32. Here's a good example. You guys know this story, the demoniac, Jesus casts these demons out and they want to, they're like, can we just go into the pigs? Right? So here we are, verse 32. Now a large herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside and they begged him to let them enter these. So he gave them permission. Jesus gave them permission to enter the pigs. Um, you could say that this is a limited permission. And I would say, yes, that is true. This is a limited permission. They just entered the pigs once. I mean, it, it couldn't be allowed again because the pigs are dead shortly thereafter. But what limited the permission? Was it the word epitrepo or was it the context? We know it's limited because the pigs, this and that. That's what limited the thing. And so we're, we're, we're doing something weird. We're creating a new connotation in a word based upon something that the word isn't actually doing in these different contexts. At least that's my impression of it. But there are some exceptions to the rule. Some New Testament examples where epitrepo, according to Paine, acknowledges three exceptions. Three times epitrepo doesn't do what he's saying it always does or it usually does. And we'll go over the first two of those right now. Mark 10, 4. Mark 10, 4, which says, they said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of divorce and to send her away. And Jesus said to them, and he talks about marriage and divorce. And I have a whole three hour video on that if you want to check it out. Um, I'll link that below since I brought it up. But yeah, the, the permission from Moses to divorce your wives, was that limited and non-universal? Doesn't seem like it because it applied to all the Jewish people because it applied for an extended period of time over a thousand years. You can't really, no human is like, well, it'll only last over a thousand years. So it's clearly limited. Like nobody's thinking that at least no reasonable person is thinking that. The second example here is just the parallel passage, uh, Matthew 19 verse eight. And it's the same thing. Um, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives because of the hardness of your hearts. In response to this, Philip Payne says the following. In response to Mark 10, 4 and Matthew 19, 8, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives. Jesus replied, because your hearts were hard, but it was not that way from the beginning. And what God has joined together, let not man separate. Anyone who divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her, adding an explicit ex exception for illicit sex. Jesus' reply, here's Payne's point, shows that epitrepo does not refer to a universal or permanent permission. So Philippine's case, it seems to me, is that a, a permission is not universal or permanent unless it lasts for eternity. I mean, that seems to be the, the situation here, in which case very little can be considered universal. In fact, oddly enough, I could look at what Paul writes in 1 Timothy 2 and say it only lasts until heaven, right, where there's, where there's no marriage in heaven and these gender roles seem to be functioning differently at least that's my personal opinion about that issue um so then that would make it not universal which means i could affirm that paul's first timothy 2 writing is still applicable today in the church age while not affirming it's universal if we're going to if we're going to change the meaning of the term universal to imply eternally and always applicable you know for the next 10 billion years and that's not even enough it's got to keep going forever I think this is weird. It's universal enough. It was for all of God's people, this this sort of marriage and divorce thing. And it was for a really, really long time, 1,400 years. And yeah, I, I think that we we can we can move on to the next example, which is first Corinthians, first Corinthians chapter 14, verse 34, which also breaks Payne's uh, claim that the term itself implies temporality and non-universal application. The, the women should keep silent in the churches for they are not permitted to speak, but should be in submission as the law also says. I have a whole long, long video on this topic that you guys can check out. 
in this series on women in ministry. I've already covered it, so I'm not going to go over it in detail. But here's the point. Philip Payne responds to this by saying, okay, yeah, this doesn't look limited and this looks kind of universal. And and it looks like it's applying to the same topic Paul's writing in 1 Timothy 2. So that would really push against this view that Epitrepo is limiting the, the meaning. His response is that he thinks this is an interpolation or that this passage is not original. Verses 34 and 35 that the, the, this whole section just doesn't belong in your Bible. Now, I covered that in detail in the previous video, so I'm not going to do that uh, on head coverings. <clears throat> uh, we're not going to cover that. No pun intended. Because I've already fully covered it, pun intended, <clears throat> in the previous video. Um, I, this this doesn't work. This doesn't work. Um, but let's pretend for a second that Philip Payne was right, that this was not original in, in our Bibles. That this, even though it's in every single copy of First Corinthians we've ever seen, and there's no good reason to think it's not supposed to be there in the first place. That's a nice way to get rid of a difficult passage, but it doesn't, it's not reasonable. But let's pretend that it worked. Then that would mean this was a very, very, very early use, almost contemporary with Paul, because we have it in every copy of First Corinthians, of the term to be non-universal, or to be universal, excuse me. It would still be a contemporary usage of Epitrepo that breaks his rule about the meaning of the word. So yeah. You can look at video number 11 for more details on that. But Payne seems to be wrong in assuming that 1 Corinthians 14.34 is not original. And so he ends up being wrong in dismissing this as something that breaks his pattern. His pattern is here again, that it never refers to a universal or permanent situation in any of its uses in the Septuagint or New Testament. That's not true. <clears throat> That's not true. It's universal enough, it's permanent enough. And to, to back this up, I would just say, go, you know, those of you who do even dabble in Greek, go look at lexicons, look at BDAG and LSJ and look at some other lexicons that, you know, are Greek dictionaries that talk about the usage of these terms around the time of Paul the Apostle. And you'll notice that I didn't find any that recommended that epitrepo means a, a time-bound, non-universal application. That meaning is, does not seem to be in the word and nobody else seems to find it. It seems as though we found a new meaning for a word because we needed a new meaning for a word because we need it to not mean what it looks like it means in 1 Timothy 2. Let's go to the next one because egalitarians are just going to need a different way of working around the implications of 1 Timothy 2. And um, this is going to be not with the word permit because the word permit just means what it means in English. Permit. That's all it meant. In English, you never say, I permit that. But you know, I mean, non-universally for a limited time. Like it just doesn't mean that. Okay, so the next way is the contrast with verse verse 11, 1 Timothy 2, 11. I typed first Yimothy in my thing here. Hold on. There we go. All right. Let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. That verse contrasted with verse 12. I do not permit a woman to teach or exercise authority over man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. Now, Andrew Bartlett is the one who promotes this egalitarian view. He says the contrast with verse 11 shows that Paul is only giving his current approach to a current problem. Current approach to a current problem. Here's the quote from Andrew Bartlett. See if you can track with me on this. Paul positively commands that a woman should learn. Why does Paul make such a strong verbal contrast between this command and his next statement? That he is not permitting a woman to teach and assume authority over a man. Does this not rather create the impression that his restriction on women's teaching is only a statement of his current approach to a current problem. He could have written, women must never teach, or some similar expression, but did not. The phrase which he uses seems a counterintuitive choice of words to express a rule which Paul intends shall apply to all worship assemblies of the church in all times and places. So basically the contrast, the reason why the contrast is brought up is because this is a strong statement. I command, basically, is how it's being interpreted. Let a woman learn, right? And then this is a really soft statement. I don't permit a woman to teach. So maybe he's trying to say, like, one of them is kind of universal. Always let a, The other one's really limited. I see some problems with this. Bartlett acknowledges that verse 11 is a strong command. Okay? And I, I would say, it. I mean, I don't know if it's a strong command. It's definitely in the category of a command. It's a command. I don't know if I would call it like stronger than other commands or something like that, but it's definitely in the category of command. Yet, Bartlett treats verse 11 like the only thing it commanded is what I've highlighted on your screen. Let a woman learn. But what did he command? Let a woman, let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. 
what Bartlett has done is he's taken the first part of, of a sentence, called that the command, separated it from the rest of the sentence, then compared it to verse 12 like they're two different ideas. But rather, the whole idea is in verse 11, let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. And then that's explained in more detail in verse 12. These two go together. They're, they're not really contrasting. They're more comparing. You remember those old, in class, you'd always get that stuff in school, compare and contrast these two things. Well, here this is a compare, not so much a contrast. These terms seem to be elaborated on quietly with all submissiveness in the following verses making the following verses part of the command and not a second softer piece of information from Paul on how he does things, but not ways he's commanding them to do things. The command for quietly with all submissiveness seems to relate to, right? The quietly part seems to relate to, we'll talk about this more later, this idea of not to teach and the all submissiveness part seems connected to not to exercise authority. Now, some are going to interpret teach and authority as totally different things with a different context and different historical stuff. We'll cover all that one by one as we go. But basically, this doesn't work is what I'm suggesting. Uh, Bartlett's view, it seems based upon intuition and implication. Um, you know, couldn't it doesn't it feel like maybe Paul's sort of trying to do this kind of thing here? It's like a sort of a, it's sort of a squirmy kind of a flexible way of looking at the passage, but it ignores the rest of the sentence quietly with all submission. So these terms are connected. The two, the command in verse 11 with the lack, the refusal of permission in verse 12 are not two separate ideas, but ultimately one idea expressed more fully. We will get into the meaning of Valentine and, uh, you know, authority later. That's one of the biggest debates in this entire thing is what does that word even mean? Massive debate. We're going to cover it in great detail. And some of you will be very happy about that and others will cry yourselves to sleep <laughs> because of how of how much detail there will be. There's one last method to say that this is a limited prohibition, to say that, hey, 1 Timothy 2, whatever's going on here, it's limited. And that comes from um, Andrew Bartlett as well. And this is the jurisdiction argument. So here, let me put it on your screen. Paul has no jurisdiction over us. That's the idea. Paul simply doesn't have any jurisdiction over you and me. The jurisdiction argument, well, I'm just going to read it. This is going to be a long quote, but let me just read it in detail. And I, I put it really, really strongly here. I don't think Bartlett would word it this way. These are not his words. Paul has no jurisdiction over us. No, no, these are the implications of his words that I'm couching in a very straightforward way because I don't want you to miss it in all the words. Okay, sorry for messing up your screen there. Okay, here we go. This is the quote. Uh, Andrew Bartlett says, Complementarians say that a woman in verse 12, refers generically to all women. But how can that be? In a context which does not involve the use of physical force, the expression, I do not permit, only makes sense within a range of jurisdiction. Discussing the meanings of permit, Tom Schreiner gives the examples of saying to his daughter that she is not permitted to go into the street or is not permitted to drive his car at 100 miles an hour. These statements make sense because he has jurisdiction over his daughter and his car, but he has no jurisdiction over other people's daughters or cars. If he were to say that he does not permit a girl to go into the street or to drive too fast, such a statement could not be taken to mean that he was laying down the law for all girls in all times and places. I agree with it this part so far, right? If like Philip, Acts 21, 9, he had four daughters, his words would be taken to apply to them. In the same way, Paul's words must be for a particular people over whom he has jurisdiction as the apostle who built up their Christian community. Now that's the key. This is what he's getting at. Paul's words are just for particular people over whom he has jurisdiction. There is nothing, he goes on to say, in the text to suggest that he is here meaning to claim jurisdiction over future generations everywhere. Thus, Paul's words express a particular restriction. He is not directly laying down the law for all women. This is from him book, Men and Women in Christ, page 292. And I can say this, um, I've read a lot of egalitarians. This is a rare argument, okay? This is, this is not one that I've seen them generally promoting. I'm not saying nobody does. I'm saying it seems more rare. Um, it requires limiting Paul's jurisdiction to only the churches he planted directly and only the ones in the first century. The ramifications of this cannot be overstated. We are throwing the Apostle Paul and his work in the body of Christ under the bus in order to get away from something he taught that we don't want it to apply today. 
I, I don't know how else to look at it. I'm not saying people are malicious in their intent. I'm talking about the results of what they're doing. The results of this type of move is to distance ourselves from the teachings of the apostle that God is appointed to lay down for all time teachings that were meant to apply to the church. So it requires limiting Paul's jurisdiction to only the churches he planted directly. Um, how then did Paul write Romans? Like Paul didn't even go to Rome before he wrote Romans. He didn't plant the church in Rome. And he writes to the Romans with great authority as this apostle who could just sort of barge into their existence and just start telling them about the gospel and about what they should believe and about the way they should live and about how they should deal with government and how they should deal with food and the kinds of things they eat and issues like divorce. And Paul's just laying all this stuff out like he can give rules to Christians anywhere because he's appointed as an apostle and this kind of gives him this ability to just do that anywhere he wants. Paul did not seem to treat his jurisdiction the way that Andrew Bartlett wants us to treat his jurisdiction. That's my point. Paul obviously has, has a wide jurisdiction as an apostle called by Jesus to establish churches and direct them both in doctrine and in practice. And the later church recognized that, that these apostolic works, the writings of the apostles and the writings that are from ultimately connected to the apostles, like say Hebrews, that these writings were the remaining and cons basically they have jurisdiction over the church, right? That this is something we are still under for all time. The, the, the Paul doesn't have jurisdiction over us argument is, is scary to me because it's fine if you're myopically focused on just first Timothy two, and you just want to get away from this one passage. But when you start to actually find that people might believe your argument, and carry it forward into other passages of scripture, you have the anti-Pauline people out there who actually reject Paul as an apostle who is only for, and to get this, who only had jurisdiction over a small group of people and doesn't really have application over us today. That's, that's a thing that exists and it's a dangerous teaching. So look at what comes just before. Um, and this is why, let me just say this, the jurisdiction argument backfires. It correctly acknowledges that Paul's jurisdiction is implied by the word permit. I get that. I do not permit. But when you examine Paul's jurisdiction, Paul has a massive jurisdiction that applies over us today as well. His teachings, his writings, they definitely apply to Christians today. This is not something um, that you can set aside. So look at what comes just before Paul says what he permits. 1 Timothy 1.1, 1, 1, when Paul talks about his jurisdiction in this very book that we're quoting. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by command of God, our Savior, and of Christ Jesus, our hope. Look up the use of the word apostle, the 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 authority of the apostles, the responsibility of the apostles, and their function, specifically of Paul the apostle, and you'll see that that's a big deal. This gives him wide jurisdiction. We scroll down a bit to 1 Timothy 1, 12, and we get this, same letter. I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service. This idea is that Paul has been appointed to specific service by Jesus himself. He's not just saying this because it was like a cool memory. Paul is saying this because the fact that Jesus appointed him speaks of the authority he has in the local churches and, and to go and evangelize the unsaved. Jesus himself appointed Paul is not just a statement of gratitude, but one of position. Paul has a certain position. Note the previous verse. We back up one verse. In accordance with the gospel of glory of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted. Jesus himself entrusted Paul with the, with the gospel. And don't try to be like, well, this woman thing's not technically part of the gospel. This is all connected. It's all part of the calling of Paul to go and preach and share and minister to others. Then we have another statement. First uh, Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. What do you do with this? It's an I statement from Paul. I urge that supplications, prayers, and intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, right? Because what? Because God wants all people to be saved. Are we to say that only if you were in Paul's jurisdiction is the Bible here urging you to pray? Like your prayers are not important? I mean, this is present active indicative. It's, it's similar to the Epitrepo statement. Then he again, in chapter two, he asserts his unique authority, his unique authority position in the churches. This is in verse 7. For this, I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I am telling the truth. I'm not lying. A teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. Hey, that's me. That's you. He was appointed. And so his, he's speaking of his jurisdiction as, as being about as broad as it can be. He's to go out and preach the gospel to like 
have a jurisdiction over the vast majority of those who would call themselves Christians today. And of course, Paul did not limit his jurisdiction to the Gentiles because he went and preached the gospel to the Jews as well. He just focused on the Gentiles, but he's not limited there, but he's definitely focused on the Gentiles. Um, then we have in 1 Timothy 2 verses 8 and 9, what is Paul's jurisdiction? Here he bases the instructions in the following verses on the calling and authority that he's already explained. I desire then, I desire then, what? because I was appointed by Jesus and I've been entrusted by him. Now I, me, the apostle Paul, he's, he's lifting up his jurisdiction here on purpose and then says, I desire then that in every place men should pray. Then he goes in verse nine, likewise also that women. Then he continues, verse 11, I do not permit a woman Right? The same guy that said, let a woman learn, which they will apply to all people in all times, is the same one who says, I don't permit. It, it, this jurisdiction argument backfires. So Bartlett's point, uh, the, the reasons why it backfires here, we'll summarize and move on to the next thing. Three things. One, Paul clearly appealing to his authority as an apostle to the Gentiles in general makes Bartlett's point backfire. When he talks about his jurisdiction, he means as an apostle called by Jesus to the Gentiles, uh, sp- focusing on the Gentiles. Second reason why it backfires, Paul gives instructions to the churches based on that authority. So he doesn't just say he has the authority, he gives instructions because of that authority. So again, that jurisdiction is is very strong, very broad, and it it appeals back to Jesus's authority. And this is pretty, you already know this. I'm just reminding you guys what you already know. And the third reason why it backfires, it seems clear that when Paul appeals to what he instructs people to do or what he will not permit them to do, he's doing it based on his apostolic calling and authority. The I in verse 12, I do not permit, it refers to him as an apostle. The do not permit makes it an authoritative rule for churches because he as an apostle does not permit this thing. It may be that he writes it this way so that Timothy can show it to others. Hey, look, guys, this ruling about women, it's from Paul, the apostle. He says that he doesn't permit. It's not just me, Timothy, making up stuff. It comes from him, his authority. This could have been a way of elevating the instructions, not decreasing them, which is what Bartlett wants to do with it. The one who will not permit is the Paul, right? The Apostle Paul functioning in his role as an apostle of the Gentiles appointed by Christ. Conclusion here, before we go to the next point. The phrase, I do not permit, does not lessen the universality or authority of the verse. You you just can't shrink the application or the intensity or any of that from the phrase, I do not permit. doesn't mean you can't do it some other way. We're going to go through each one and give them their full hearing one at a time. And the next one is about wives, not women. So the next method of uh, seeing uh, this passage with a different perspective, uh, an egalitarian one, is to say that this passage is about wives, not about women. Uh, The whole time we've really been misunderstanding it, trying to apply it to wives when it's really been all about women. An example of a translation that actually does this is the Common English Bible, which is kind of a loose translation, like they take some liberties here. Um, Not just here, but in various places, I mean. Um, They say, I do not allow a wife to teach or control her husband. Instead, she should be a quiet listener. Right? Verse 11, they do this too. They say, a wife should learn quietly with complete submission. So that the passage becomes about marriage. And this is, the implications of this are profound. If this is accurate, then 1 Timothy 2 doesn't apply to church leadership in any direct way at all. There's no immediate direct application to church leadership. There's a set, there's a, a, an indirect one that could potentially be there, but not a direct one. So before getting into it in detail, um, I just want to talk about the stakes because I think some people would see this and um, grab onto it without maybe thinking through the implications, the maybe non-direct implications of the passage. If it's about women in general, then it obviously applies to women and men's relationships in teaching and authority roles, at least in the church, and I think specifically in the church and not elsewhere. But another debate will follow about whether it relates to eldership or more and all that other stuff, and I'll talk about that later in today's video. But if it's about wives, if it's about wives, then it would mean that a woman can't do this verse 12 stuff over her husband, Right, like you, you'd have to embrace this. It's it's so some egalitarians will hold this view, and then they'll say, well, that but that's just cultural sort of bowing. We're just sort of giving into the culture. Paul's like, I don't allow it, and they'll have other reasons to soften what Paul is saying here. But I think that we, I think that we're playing some games here with the text. If it's about wives, it would mean a woman 
can't do these things over her husband. Um, but how does that apply to her being an elder in the church? Because every egalitarian that I've ever heard from every stripe agrees a woman can be in any position in a church, such as the, the, the senior pastor who holds the reins of all the authority of the church, no problem whatsoever. Then how can her husband attend that church where she's teaching and having authority over him? Now, the only real rescue for this, it seems, would be to reinterpret the phrase to teach or have authority or control to mean something different. We will talk about that in great detail. That'll be a large portion of the video on the meaning of the phrase control or authority that we have in the text. So what is the case for wives? What is the case for wives, uh, not women? Well, the NRSV foot, uh, footnote acknowledges this fact that the Greek word that's there in the original writing, it actually can mean wife or woman. Just like the word man there can mean husband or man. In Greek, it's gune, can mean wife or woman. Aner can mean man or husband. And the second point they'll offer in support of this view is 1 Timothy 2.15. Well, 13, 14, 15, I'll just say all of it. Um, that this is clearly limited to mothers because the childbearing aspect in verse 15 is a marriage context. So the not just Adam and Eve, the statement there, because that could be male or female, could be husband or wife. But the childbearing, that's in a family context. And so wives are in view here. Um, and in addition to this, some will say that the for wife view, some will claim that Paul consistent, consistently relates wives to husbands. He does not relate men and women. So whenever he talks about both male and female, he's usually talking about husbands and wives, typically. Let me start the pushback. Okay, so here's the pushback. Uh, Paul typically does do that more often than not. However, Typical habits do not establish rules of interpretation. And that's actually kind of important. You can't just say, well, usually when he says this, he means this because it's not always. And if you make it always, then you would misinterpret all the times when he doesn't mean that. So some examples of when Paul doesn't do that are 1 Corinthians 7.34. The unmarried or betrothed woman. This is talking about a woman who is clearly not a wife. He's using the phrase woman cannot possibly be referring to a wife here because he specifies that it's not. It's an unmarried woman. Then we have, so that's an example of a woman which couldn't be wife in Paul's writing, that same Greek word. Then there's another example of comparison of a man and a woman. So this is just like 1 Timothy, men and women are compared here, but it's not a husband and wife. So 1 Corinthians 11, 12. For as woman was made from man, that's Adam and Eve, right? But they're not being compared as husband and wife. How do I know? Because he says, so man is now born of woman. Well, you're not born from your wife, guys. And if you are, something went wrong in your family. <laughs> That's like not how it's supposed to go. That's illegal um, and, and immoral. So yeah, this is talking about male and female. Is it, And it's singular man, singular woman, not husband, wife. You can't just assume that Paul is doing that when he writes or you end up misunderstanding and misinterpreting him. The next example I've got is Galatians 4.4. 4. When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son born of woman. That's singular woman. And clearly she's not being referred to as wife here. He was not born from his wife. And Mary is not the wife in any way um, at all. Mary was a woman. That's her significance. She represents womankind, just like Adam represents mankind. Eve represents womankind. So Christ represents mankind and the the gender is what's being specified here, not the role of husband or wife. That's the point. So what about the context of First Timothy 2? Here's some more pushback to the wife view. First Timothy chapter 2 has specific indicators in the context that are outside of verses 11 and 12 that show us that male and female are in view, not just husband and wife. Um, actually, let me show you a quote from Douglas Moo on this topic. Um, do, 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 here it is. I have over 300 of these images to show you. So I'm keeping them organized as best I can. So verses 8 and 9, Douglas Moo says, a uh, really well-respected scholar, are clearly directed respectively to men and women, not husbands and wives, unless indeed Paul commands only husbands to pray and only wives to adorn themselves modestly. This is part of a case that Moo is building against the wife view. He's like, look, here we are verses 8 and 9. Like, you're going to tell me verses 11 and 12 are about a wife, but verses 8 and 9 are about male and female in general. So let's look at those verses real quick. Verse 8, I desire that men in every place, men should pray. 
Okay, that's talking about prayer in every place, not just husbands, men. Also, women should wear respectable apparel and do good works, verse 10. So these are all just gender related, not marriage related. Then verse 11, he's continuing the same basic ideas. Let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. I don't allow a woman to teach or have authority over a man. These are all, so far, if we're going to be consistent, if Paul's not changing subjects, then he's talking about a congregational gathering setting about male and female and not men and women. Uh, excuse me, not husband and wife. I know what I'm trying to say. I hope you do too. All right. This is um, why Douglas Moo says the context strongly supports the man slash woman meaning as opposed to the husband slash wife meaning. All of 1 Timothy 2, the whole chapter, if you read, just pause the video, go read 1 Timothy ch chapter 2. The whole chapter fits better in a church gathering context than a family one, right? Men praying in every place. That's not so much family as it is church gathering. That seems to be the focus. Um, uh, modest clothing and good works, um, that seems to fit a church gathering where they're got people, even today people gather together, they're more likely to put on different sort of showy clothes when they go to church. Then we have teaching and learning, the teaching and learning context of verses 11 and 12, that obviously seems to fit a church gathering more than a marriage. And that's why even scholars like Linda Belleville, who's a very strong egalitarian scholar, she agrees and says, quote, husband and wife do not fit the broader context of congregational worship. That's in Two Views, page 79. Here's a, a different support, though. Uh, another point in favor of the wife view. And I've, I've met others um, who take this angle and it, at first blush, it might make sense. I don't think it works, though. And here's another reason why you might take that view and I'll respond to it. So verse 11 isn't plural, it's singular. And so we can point to a, a tangible difference between verse 11 and the male and female discussion in verses 8 through 10. 8 through 10 is talking about men and women generally. I think everybody should agree on that. But verse 11 switches from man, uh, men and women to a woman and a man. And maybe that indicates a wife and a husband and that that singular that move from plural to singular, that is the thing that's our indicator. Paul's not just, we're not leaning on a habit Paul has. We're pointing to a, a specific tactic he took in this passage to change our understanding. I don't think this, this is the case. There is no rule in Greek that says that the singular makes it more likely to refer to a wife rather than a woman or a husband rather than a man. That's not like a rule in Greek. We're just noticing a difference and we're saying that means what we want it to mean, it, it doesn't seem like we're making an actual case for it. Why is the singular mentioned? Is there an indication in the text above us or next to me, to my, yeah, this this way, because if I'm watching, it's actually over here, but you're watching, it's over there and I shouldn't bother telling you what I'm watching. What's the point? At any rate, is there an indication in this text why Paul switches from plural to singular? And I think the answer is yes. It's the Adam and Eve analogy that I've highlighted on your screen. He wants to talk about Adam and Eve as representing male and female. So he he says, I don't allow a woman to do this um, in relation to a man. Why? Because Adam and Eve. See how that parallels there? It's not about husband and wife. It's about the prototypical male and female of Adam and Eve. So it's probably Eve's example that he's going to use in verses 13 through 15. She's the one woman who represents all women in the example that Paul gives, which is why his justification for the ruling in verses 11 and 12. Adam and Eve can represent husband and wife. That's true. It's possible. But they can also be prototypical male and female. And so I will put Linda Belleville on screen for a rare moment of me and her totally agreeing. <laughs> and, um, and, and just so you guys know, um, as an encouragement, I hope you don't just agree with me on everything. I mean, maybe you happen to conclude that you you agree, but that's fine. But I don't want you to just do that thing where you just find one teacher and you just trust everything they say. The purpose of my content is not that. Um, it's fine if you have that in your life somewhere, but I don't want to be that teacher for you. I'd rather be someone who's unpacking it in a way that you go, if I listen carefully, I can make up my own mind and figure out what I think about this. And so I'm trying to be transparent in showing both sides but also honest about the weaknesses that I see in certain arguments. At any rate, Linda Belleville says this, and I agree with her here. There is no indication whatsoever that Paul is shifting from, at verse 11, from women in general to married women in specific. True, Paul does refer to Adam and Eve in verses 13 to 14, but it is to Adam and Eve as the prototypical male and female, not as a married couple. So I would agree with that. 
There's other concerns. Um, why on earth would a wife not be able to teach her husband? What, what, where is this coming from? Where is this elsewhere in scripture? Um, my wife teaches me things. She just can't teach me. Now, if you if you look at teaching in the context of a church environment, then it's a specific, it could be a specific kind of teaching, a specific kind of authority in re, and teaching in relation to that authority. But if you move this to a marriage context, you just have a wife not teaching her husband. Um, that seems very strange. The authority part could make some sense because um, husbands do have a, a higher, they don't have the only authority in the home. Women have a very high role of authority, but husbands have the higher role of authority in the marriage. But if, if a wife is an elder in a church, based on a, every egalitarian believes this is a good thing. <laughs> if a wife's an elder in a church, I have to continue to raise this objection. How does this work? Does her husband go to a different church? Does he go to the church, but he doesn't submit to that elder because a wife can't teach or have authority over her husband? This awkwardness suggests that we're forcing a wrong understanding onto the passage. Finally, it segues into Paul giving qualifications. This is, this is an important point, and I don't think I've brought this up yet. 1 Timothy 2 restricts women teaching and having authority over men and immediately segues. The very next thing, if you remove the chapter break, the very next thing is Paul talks about who is allowed to be an elder in the church. Who can be an elder? And in video number four, women leaders in the New Testament, I went over 1 Timothy 3, and that eldership seems to exclude women. The, the the deaconate doesn't seem to, and there's more details on that, and there's a variety of different kinds of deacons, and maybe there's certain kinds that you you should have restrictions on. But the point is that doesn't there isn't a blanket removal there. But in the eldership requirements, there seems to be it, that, that only men can qualify for this position. And so when you combine this with 1 Timothy 2 saying, hey, I don't allow a woman to teach or have authority over a man. And then he's like, here's the qualifications for elders. And they don't involve, they, or they do involve rather being a man. This seems to push backward onto chapter 2 that this is about male and female, not husband and wife. So the, um, the idea that wives can't teach their husbands, but that they can be a teaching elder in a church their husband attends, also really odd. So those are some of the reasons. That's my sort of conclusion on that. It's um, not a good view. Let's go to the next alternate way. What does quietly mean? Uh, okay, this isn't exactly an alternate path. This isn't really where um, egalitarians and complementarians are you so much because whichever conclusion you come to on this, your application to 1 Timothy 2 is probably going to stay the same. You can skip this section if you feel like it and go to the next timestamp, and I won't hold it against you. But the term does occur in verses 11 and 12, quietly. And we're going to look at it here. Um, let a woman learn quietly with all submission. I do not p permit a woman to teach or exercise authority over man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. What does that word quiet mean? What does it mean? And so we're going to dig into it a little bit, a little bit of depth to get an answer to that question. Um, and we'll talk about the stakes and all that sort of thing. So it, it can basically mean one of two things, um, and, and according to the debate that's ongoing on this topic, and I'm going to I'm going to side with the minority here. You got to hey, try to find out where I'm wrong, because I'm I've, I disagree with the majority, so I may I may be wrong here, but I got to be honest about what I think. So it can mean one of two things. It can mean silence, like an audible silence, like you're just being quiet, or it can mean peaceable behavior. An example of it meaning. Um, quietness, like actual audible quietness, is Acts 22.2. And when they heard that he was addressing them in the Hebrew language, they became even more quiet. Quietness here is probably referring to like an audible quietness. They were making a lot of noise and then Paul starts appealing to them in Hebrew and then they get, this is in Jerusalem, and then they start listening to him. Then we've got an example of it meaning like peaceable behavior, and that's 2 Thessalonians 3.12. Now, such persons we command and encourage in the Lord Jesus to do their work quietly and to earn their own living. He's talking about moochers, people who mooch off others. And he's like, no, go get a job. Stop begging off everybody because you're lazy. Work, work, because there are people who are poor and need the help, but you're just, you're just doing it on purpose. Work and work quietly. That's not, he's not talking about getting a job where you don't make noise. He's talking here about like peaceable, good, like the kind of person you see as a good neighbor, right? They don't cause disturbances, that sort of thing. So a word on application, because both of these can be wrongly applied. <clears throat> if it's quiet, what is it? How, do, how would we apply this passage? If it means peaceable behavior, how would we apply this passage? Let's talk about that. So what if it means quietness, like silence or, or not making noise? What if it's referring to noise? Some would apply it wrongly as a woman can't make any noise in church at all. Have you heard this? 
I have heard this. There are some churches, and maybe you've been part of this church, and maybe your church is full of people who love Jesus. I'm not deriding your whole church, but there's a practice your church might have that is not biblical, right? As there's a practice my church might have that's not biblical. This is this is the case for any one of us at any time. But some churches have rules where women, women cannot sing and worship from the congregation because they're to remain silent in the church. And they interpret this word silent or quiet in the most strict possible way so that a woman just doesn't make any noise in church. No noises. I think that that's a big mistake. Um, another less extreme interpretation would be no speaking in church at all from like the pulpit. So they can't make announcements. They can't teach, obviously. They can't be worship leaders on stage vocally doing those things. Um, you know, I'll bet in those churches there's a debate on whether a woman can play, say, bass guitar because now she's making noise in church even though it's not with her voice. Um, or, or my view, and I think, I think the only right view if this is, if this is the meaning, if it's referring to audible silence is that it's context specific for a parallel on this. Let me give you the example we gave from Acts 22. When Paul is speaking to this Jewish crowd, it says when they heard that he was addressing them in the Hebrew language, they became even more quiet. This doesn't mean they became absolutely silent. Nobody was tapping their foot. Nobody was even whispering to their neighbor. No, it just means generally they're in a listening and not speaking role, but but a receiving role. That's what it means. Um, so that's the parallel in Acts 22 too. Consider the context of 1 Timothy. Learning in verse 11 shows that the silence is in context of a teaching environment. So it's not complete and utter silence. 1 Timothy 2, again, you're going to memorize this passage by the time we're done. Let a woman learn quietly. Quietly is, is how she's to learn, how she's to learn. So it's not quietness in every regard, like during congregational worship, she can't make noises or something, um, or can't sing, even from stage. I don't think it refers to that kind of thing at all. Verse 12, to reinforce this, it's do not permit a woman to teach or have authority over a man, rather to remain quiet. So the quietness is in contrast to what? Teaching or having authority. So quietly is only a specific kind of quiet in relation to teaching or having authority, in relation to learning. So in, in other words, I think, and I'm skipping way ahead of myself, application mode here, next week, next time I'll do a video on this, it'll be the final video we'll talk about application. I don't think church announcements are a problem because I don't think quietness in relation to all things is the teaching for women in church, but in relation to, to teaching and having authority, there's quietness. Consider also how that over application of silence would conflict with other cl clear teachings of scripture. Women prophesied, see video number 11 on this, but women prophesied in the church and Paul was totally fine with it. It wasn't something he allowed re reluctantly. I've, de I've dealt with those statements uh, in that previous video, video number 11. Women also could speak in tongues in the church. A woman could speak in tongues. A woman could pray for interpretation and then offer an interpretation of those tongues. Now, maybe you don't practice that in your church. That's fine. That's not the point. I'm not even getting into that. What I'm getting at is in the early church, Paul's saying, I, won't, I, I don't permit women to do this. I would want them to be silent or quiet. But he obviously let them prophesy in church, let them interpret tongues in church. They would probably worship in church. We have every reason to think they did. So that would not be a problem. But if you have a total silence view, then you're over applying it. You're taking it out of context and you're taking a, a word and you're expanding it way beyond Paul's initial meaning. If it does mean silence, then if it does mean audible silence, if we interpret it that way, and I think it does, I'll share why in a minute, well, in several minutes, then it isn't total silence and it shouldn't limit all sorts of things. It's just silence in relation to teaching. It's quiet in relation to teaching and having authority. It's a specific kind and moment of being in the receptive role instead of the delivery role. Okay, but what if it's peaceable? What's the, the application of the idea of a woman being quiet? If, in fact, the term means peaceable and not silence. Well, many people think that this meaning gets us away from verbal connotations because it's just affirming generically good behavior. It's really just saying, it's not saying anything about a woman not talking. It's only saying women should just be like, be good, be a good person, <laughs> have a positive impact in your community and in your, in your environment, in your local church. But even if it means peaceful, which the majority of people would say it does mean, it probably still has verbal connotations that it doesn't get us away from the same application as if it meant silent. This is why I say this is kind of a non-issue to me because whichever way you interpret the word, the application looks the same in real life. 
So here's some reasons why I say it still has verbal connotations, even if it means peaceable behavior. Well, the immediate context is all about verbal connotations. In verse 11, let a woman learn quietly. That's got verbal connotations, right? Because you can't learn while talking, <laughs> verbally speaking. There are verbal connotations in that. When you go on to verse 12, you see that the quiet of verse 12 is in contrast to what? Teaching or exercising authority. Again, this is this is all just very abundantly obvious. You don't need to know Greek to see this. Don't teach or exercise authority. Instead, remain quiet. There's obviously verbal connotations since teaching and exercising authority are done with verbal connotations, in particular teaching is. So there's verbal connotations there as well. And then in the parallel passage where we have Paul using the same idea, 1 Corinthians 14, 34, he says the women should keep silent in the churches for they are not permitted to speak, verbal connotation, but should be in submission as the law also says. Again, I have a whole video. I get into this in detail and explain this passage. The point is, here he uses similar language. He also implies verbal connotations. In 1 Timothy, when he talks about a very similar issue with similar language, it makes sense that peaceable here means more. It means more than quiet. It can mean godly behavior in general, but it doesn't mean less than quiet. So which is it? Now that I've told you that the debate doesn't change your application, how interested are you in finding out which one it is? Okay, for the silence view, this is the view that I personally lean towards. Okay, I take this view. BDAG, the lexicon, B-D-A-G. That lexicon takes this view, or Douglas Moo takes this view, or the DBL, um, Dictionary of Biblical Languages Greek, takes this position as well. But they would say, one, the immediate context of 1 Timothy 2, 11 and 12, that supports the silence view or the audible, quiet view. Um, the context is a teaching environment of the church implying audible silence, not just broadly peaceable behavior. There's also a parallel relationship between verses 11 and 12. The two qualifications of verse 11, and this I'm going to say multiple times in today's video because I really want us to catch it. It's important. It affects our interpretation a lot. The two things here, learn quietly with all submissiveness, two things. They relate to verse 12, not to teach or to exercise authority. So it's easy to see exercise authority relates to submissiveness. Well, learn quietly relates to teach. There seems to be a simple parallel. These, these verses aren't separate. These verses overlap. One explains the other. That would imply verbal connotations, which would lean towards us thinking that this word quietly has a verbal, a primarily a verbal meaning here. It almost doesn't need to be said, but a small point in favor of the silence view is just that that's what the word can mean. I mean, that is in the meaning of the word. So Linda Belleville um, has a strange claim about this and denies this fact. So this, again, I, I need to get into it in a bit of detail to defend against kind of what I think is a wrong claim. She says, some translate the Greek phrase en hesik in his hesikia as in silence and understand Paul to be setting forth public protocols for women in public worship. However, and this is the key, the semantic range for hesikia does not include silence. The word doesn't mean that. It's not even in the, so semantic range means, you know, when you have a dictionary word and you have a bunch of definitions, it could mean this, it could mean that. She goes, it's not even a could mean. This word hesychia doesn't, it can't even mean that. Um, this is a weird claim because she's wrong. I don't, she, I think it was just a mistake. It does mean this. Um, however, she even footnotes it. She says in her footnote connected to this, that BDAG and the LSJ both support her view. Well, what does BDAG say about hesychia? Definition number two. A state of saying nothing or very little, silence. She says that BDAG says it's not in there, but there it is in BDAG. LSJ, her, her footnote for LSJ, she says it doesn't mean silence, but LSJ says silence. <laughs> silence is one of the meanings. So yeah, it does, it can mean that, but, but, if, but if you've been following Linda Belleville and she's been like one of your go-to scholars on this, then you've been getting wrong information. So you feel really confident but your confidence is based on misinformation here on this particular issue. And that unfortunately happens way too much in 1 Timothy 2 in egalitarian scholarship as a rule. This happens all the time, not every time, but very frequently people's beliefs about this passage from the egalitarian side are based on things that simply aren't true. And a lot of this video is going to be me, me saying, here's the egalitarian claim and here's where it's simply not true, like factually not true. So if your interpretation is based on that claim, you need a new one, or maybe you need an old one, which would be my recommendation. Peaceful. Let's talk about for people who say, well, the word, no, I think peaceful, peaceable behavior, that's what it probably means, which may still have verbal connotations. 
Um, but we have Tom Schreiner who takes that view and he says, most scholars do. He says, most scholars today argue that this word does not actually mean silence here, but refers to a quiet demeanor and a spirit that is peaceable instead of argumentative. Uh, Schreiner actually changed his own view. He used to hold the, the, the view that I think is correct. Um, now he's holding a different view. Just to show you how people have moved on this topic. Maybe I'll change my view in the future as well. It won't change my application either way, but interesting. First uh, Timothy chapter 2, verse 2 uses a very similar word. And so the people who go for the peaceful behavior view, they point this out. We should pray for kings and all this stuff that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life. Clearly, this is not talking about audibly quiet lives, but peaceable and, and, and gentle and godly living. That's what it's talking about here. So that's a related word. It's the adjective version of Hesychios. It's similar, not the same, but very similar, just a, a cognate. Um, so here it clearly refers to being peaceful, not silent. In the same chapter, Paul then says women likewise, right? In verse 9, women likewise. I want them to do this and this and this, and then let them be quiet and all that. So maybe it's referring to the same thing. Okay, that convinces a lot of people, especially the likewise part. In fact, I've heard a scholar really lean on likewise women, which implies that the quietly here refers to the same thing as the quietly up here here forgive me if i'm zooming around i'm not sure the best way to show you this and um except that men aren't even told to live quietly here they're told to pray for kings so it, that parallel doesn't quite work for me i think that's kind of weak weak sauce some scholars point out that first peter 3 4 chapter 3 verse 4 has a similar statement and it's kind of a parallel passage that's a term that is used um, here, let me actually, before I show you the first Peter passage, let me show you the quote related to this. This is from uh, Tom Schreiner. He says, the parallel text in first Peter three, four also incl inclines us in the same direction since the gentle and quiet spirit of the wife in the home scarcely means absolute silence. So here's the first Peter three, four passage. Let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with an imperishable, the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit. This is not silence. This is talking about peaceable behavior in general. I totally agree. That's right. It is. But I would only push back and say um, why I don't find myself convinced, convinced by this is because it's a very distant context and similar topic because it's male and female related. But it's, you know, First Timothy 2 is about church, male and female in the church. First Peter 3 is about husband and wife in the home. So there are differences there. First Timothy 2 is about teaching and authority and then quietness is compared to that whereas first peter those those aspects are missing so if first timothy 2 looked like first peter i would be on board but it doesn't and the differences push me away from that and i always say direct context is more important than distant context i think as a general rule for interpretation that seems like a good good idea finally um we have the idea that hey if paul meant to say that he would he would have used a different word if he meant audible silence so um Schreiner says, in addition, if Paul wanted to communicate absolute silence, he could have used the noun sige, which is silence, rather than uh, hesikia or hesukia, quietness. And I would say to this, perhaps, um, I, I am legitimately not sure uh, what to do with this. And it, it, it makes me hesitate slightly in my own view, only because I'm not familiar enough with Greek to know if that's quite accurate. And I haven't... Uh, I haven't devoted enough time to this particular word to look at all of the potential ranges of words and when they get used and that sort of thing. So is it maybe Paul would have said that, but at any rate, I think, and I'll put this quote back up. I think that it's wrong to think that Paul meant absolute silence. Okay. I think no matter what you interpret the word to mean, if it means audible, quiet versus peaceable behavior, at no point should any, either of these views be taken to mean absolute total silence. Like women can't like talk to their neighbor in church or like when when they're taking prayer requests and the pastor goes anybody got a prayer request and woman's like well i got one but i can't raise my hand and say it out loud because i'm in church that view is wrong even if audible silence was the interpretation and i built a case for that so which is it um i lean lean towards the minority position why because here's the ultimate question i have what is the stronger influence on the meaning of the term the immediate context or other more distant usages like first Peter. And I tend to think that the immediate context informs me more strongly about the meaning of the term and it's contrasted with teaching and having authority 
Therefore, it's referring to speaking um, in the context of teaching, um, that sort of thing, or maybe even judging prophecy. See video 11 on that. And that's why that speaking, that silence is, is, is in place. Why do we know 1 Timothy 2.2 speaks of quietness? And let me back this up a bit. 1 Timothy 2.2, um, that right in the context passage. Why do I know that that speaks of peaceable behavior and not just audible silence? Because of the immediate context that we may lead peace, peaceful and quiet and a quiet life in godly, godly and dignified in every way. That is clearly not about an audible silence, an audible quiet. The immediate context forces that view. How do I know that 1 Timothy 2.12 isn't doing that? <laughs> because of the immediate context, teach or exercise authority. The immediate context contrasting learning with quietness or comparing learning with quietness. So the immediate context implies silence and the larger context and parallel passage implies peaceful behavior, but the application won't be significantly different in verse 12 because it's going to apply effectively the same way. Either way, it doesn't mean total silence. And either way, it doesn't mean just peacefulness with no verbal connotations. Uh, and I'll quote Tom Schreiner one last time. He says, the resolution of this question is not of prime importance for the debate before us, for it does not drastically change the meaning of the text either way. That'll depend on other questions. Other questions such as the next one up on our list, which is right here. Does the cult of Artemis change everything? And I've been so eager to talk to you guys about this, about the cult of Artemis. I, can I tell you what journey I went through in studying women in ministry? One of the toughest passages is 1 Timothy 2 for the, for the egalitarians in particular. And I was super curious to hear what they were going to say about this passage and maybe change my mind. Sort of wanted to change my mind, actually. Um, one of the things they get into a great bit of detail on, and they, and they really rely very heavily on, is the idea that in Ephesus there was this cult to this pagan deity called Artemis. And that there were so many people following her. And she had particular doctrines and beliefs going on inside of this cult that was affecting the church so that when you read 1 Timothy 2 as though it's a response to Artemis, it totally changes how you understand the passage. And so I started hearing, well, the cult of Artemis believed this. The cult of Artemis taught that. The cult of Artemis did these things. And that changes our understanding. It turns out that most of the claims about the cult of Artemis in egalitarian writings are not accurate not historically true, not factual. And therefore, many egalitarians are basing a new understanding of 1 Timothy 2 off of made-up history. Uh, I'm excited to share this with you because I think it will help clear the air because there are many people out there who feel a great deal of confidence that they found the real meaning of 1 Timothy 2 because they know, they got the gnosis, they got the knowledge about the secret stuff that was going on back then that modern people just don't know because we're just sort of patriarchalists who haven't paid attention to history. Well, let's pay attention to history. So here's what people do with Artemis. Number one, they show that the key to 1 Timothy 2 is seeing that Paul's responding to the cult of Artemis in Ephesus, not the more general issues that people assume. It becomes a filter. Where I see Artemis in the text, I only apply it to Artemis issues, which means the text doesn't apply to all sorts of issues. It just applies to those ones. So number two, they want to show that in the cult of Artemis and in Ephesus, there was a battle of the sexes where women were domineering over men and that the cult of Artemis was causing this. Right? It was like a hyper-feminist cult, effectively. They want to say that Paul is only against such hyper-feminist women domineering, not just women being equal, but women domineering over men. That's what Paul's against. That, they say, is what verse 12 is really about. I don't allow women to teach or domineer over a man. I don't allow women to bulldoze over men the way that Artemis has them doing. So Paul's just trying to restore, according to egalitarians, he's just trying to restore equality and egalitarian views here, where no sex has authority in relation to the other in any context. No. We've, we've taken what was meant to be an egalitarian teaching, and we turned it into complementarian or patriarchal teachings. So we're going deep. Deep in understanding of who Artemis was. We're going to talk about who her priests were and some of her fe fest 
uh, festival and activities and things were going on, her influence, who was in charge in the cult of Artemis. When we dig up ancient stuff in Ephesus, does it tell us who the boss was in the cult of Artemis and who who ruled and was it women? And did they keep men in their place? And did, didn't he write tell the truth about that? Did he get it accurate, I should say? I'm, I'm not at all suggesting that he was being misleading on purpose, but it might have been wrong and we all need to know that. Um, and so, yeah, we're going to get into all this. So Artemis was a false god that was a really big deal in Ephesus. Here's where everybody agrees. This weird looking lady was a big, big deal in Ephesus. She, Artemis, was uh, a, a, a false god, uh, but you even read about her in the book of Acts. In Acts 19, there's this sort of like this, this uprising in response to Paul because he's getting people to throw away their idols and that threatens the business of all the idol makers and that threatens the glory of the city because Ephesus and Artemis, they're connected. The glory of Artemis, the religion, it's kind of like the Vatican. The Vatican is is not just a city. It's also a religious hub. Mecca is not just a city. It's a religious hub. Well, Ephesus was the Mecca of the Artemis cult. You get that? It's the center of it. This is like the ultimate Artemis cult city. There was other Artemis temples and all that in other places, but Ephesus was considered to be like the place, the birthplace even for the God. So she was a big deal. So in Acts 19, when Paul's preaching, we get them, you know, yelling out, great is Diana of the Ephesians. You read about this. And um, Diana and Artemis, just just two different names for the same thing. Okay, it's more complicated than that. But for now, let's just say that. Diana is referring to that Artemis that I'm going to be talking about here. So the Artemisian uh, was a big old giant, gigantor, huge temple um, it was the largest building in the Greek world at the time. I, he, but I want you to realize this, how big of a deal Artemis was, okay? We look at it as this dusty old ancient fact. It was not dusty and old or ancient to them. It was um, the fame of their city was was centered around Artemis. And it was, it was bigger than just being a religion. So it was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. People would travel just to see it. You can see the pillars. Look at the size of the people. This is an actual photograph taken by Paul the Apostle, obviously, from the time. Um, it was over 350 feet. Nobody, you guys know. If you don't know, I'm joking. Then I don't, I don't know what to say. Um, but it was over 350 feet by 180 feet in size. That's really massive. It had 127 columns, each of them 60 feet tall. It was solid marble. It was built and rebuilt, bigger and bigger, and it got more important and it took on more political power and more authority until it was housing works of art in the time of Paul. Right? This thing. Literally, there's these glorious, expensive works of art that would just get housed and stored in the Temple of Artemis. People would come and do tours and take a look at them and stuff. There was a bank in the Temple of Artemis. Uh, the Temple of Artemis received a lot of donations, and then they would loan money out at an interest to other people. So it was a financial institution. So this is this is ancient Bank of America right there. This is Bank of Artemis, okay? And because of its security and uh, and like centrality and its power, wealthy people would deposit money there just to be held like as a bank. So they just thought Artemis, the temple's so big. It's it, there's so many eyes on it. It's got so much protection. I'm going to store a large amount of wealth there and then I'll just make some interest off it. They'll loan it out. So Artemis was a huge deal. When Paul in Ephesus starts challenging the, uh, the legitimacy of Artemis to the Ephesians, he's challenging their legitimacy as a city, the power they have in the ancient world, their financial institution, their, their um, tourist attraction, all of the above. The Temple of Artemis was even a landowner. About 120 square miles of land were owned by the Temple of Artemis. Okay, so huge deal. Huge deal. Not just not just a local cult. The temple was tied then to the reputation and the prosperity of the entire city of Ephesus. If you lived in Ephesus, Artemis mattered to you, even if you weren't a follower of that religion. So that stuff people can agree on. Okay, I don't think there's going to be any debate on that, to my knowledge, anyways, about Artemis. But there is a ton of false information through some egalitarians. Because what they do is they say, hey, look, if Artemis is such a big deal in Ephesus, and guess where Timothy is when Paul writes him? He's in Ephesus. Maybe we'll learn about the history of Artemis, and it will change our understanding of 1 Timothy. That's a legitimate, a legitimate idea, but you have to, like do good work to do it properly and make sure you get right interpretations. And here's where things fall apart. So let's look at some of the loud, uh, very strong, I should say not loud, strong claims made by egalitarians about the Temple of Artemis and about their roles 
in this society. N.T. Wright, who you guys asked me to deal with N.T. Wright's content, so I've included it. Uh, one of the main things he says we know about religion in Ephesus is that the main religion, the biggest temple, the most famous shrine, was the female-only cult, the Temple of Artemis. Now, he says it was female-only. This is part of building a case that there was sort of a hyper-feminist movement going on, and First Timothy 2 is just correcting that. He's bringing us back to egalitarianism. Paul would have fought patriarchy and he would have fought hyperfeminism. He would have just brought egalitarianism to everything. Well, Acts 19, 27 weighs in on this. And a lot of stuff's going to weigh on in this. I got so much data for you guys. And there is a danger, not only that this trait of ours may come into disrepute. Let me back up and tell you. All right. This is the, the, um, the idol makers in Ephesus. Paul's preaching. And here is what they say in response to them threatening their religion. There's danger not only that this trade of ours may come into disrepute, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis may be counted as nothing and that she may even be deposed from her magnificence. She whom all Asia and the world worship, right? The tourism would come there and they'd bow before the temple and stuff. So this, this, was, this was a big deal, except was it female only? Here it says all Asia and the world worship. Like even in this first century document, <laughs> We have a statement that Artemis is worshipped by men and women, not just women. Where does this female-only stuff come from? I don't know. N.T. Wright doesn't have footnotes in this book, in his book, Surprised by Scripture. There's, there aren't footnotes on any of these claims. So um, there's no way to figure out where they came from. Sandra Glan, who's done, uh, she has, she's an egalitarian who's written a, a recent book. Um, I think I have it here. Nobody's Mother. Um, this actually, this is an advanced copy. So if you get a copy, it'll look slightly different, but, um, because of the online teaching stuff, people just send me books. <laughs> but, um, did you wait, did you guys see that? I did hold that up to you, right? Okay. I'm just not sure if I got it right on the camera properly. At any rate, um, Sandra Glan, uh, she wrote in an article, uh, the identity of Artemis that quote, Artemis of the Ephesians had many male followers and was not a man hater. Numerous inscriptions give evidence of male devotees. Now, one of the things that Glan has done, and I'll disagree with her actually on a number of things, but one thing she's done is she's looked at a whole bunch of, of the archaeological dig evidence that they found in and around Ephesus. And so she's got some good information there. And a lot of, I mean, half of her book is actually just debunking other egalitarians and the other half is kind of pushing for her view as an egalitarian as well. Here's another claim from, from N.T. Wright, and he's not the only one who's going to do this. Uh, Linda Belleville is going to be doing things like this as well. There's others who, who do the same thing. But here's another claim from N.T. Wright to suggest that what was going on in the Temple of Artemis was like a hyperfeminism type thing. He says in uh, Surprised by Scripture, page 80, As befitted worshippers of a female deity, the priests were all women. They ruled the show and kept the men in their place. Again, there's no footnote here, um, but... I'm covering N.T. Wright's work at your request. This is not his scholarly work, and, and a scholar can do something really great, and then they can make a mistake over here. I'm not trying to deride his career or make him look bad. This argument is what's in question here, not um, him or his scholarly work, and I think there's a lot to look at and respect there, and there's some stuff to disagree with on both sides, in my opinion. At any rate, were they all female priests? Were the priests all female? Well, another egalitarian scholar... I'll, I'll quote another egalitarian, Marg Mosco says, I found no evidence that women were generally considered superior to men in the first in first century Ephesian society. Not any evidence. It is true that the high priest of the cult of Artemis of Ephesia was sometimes a woman, but more often than not, the high priest was a man. And I have a link there. You guys, you can't click that, right? Because I'm just putting pictures in front of you, <laughs> but, but you can go dig it up. Um, were all the priests female? No, they weren't. Even the high priest was uh, was more often than not, a man for the cult of Artemis, according to Mark Moscow. While some egalitarians are pretty conservative about the Artemis claims um, and won't rely on them for much, there are many egalitarians who still propagate these claims quite a bit. It's a very popular thing. A lot of people will shift their whole understanding of 1 Timothy 2 based upon these claims. So, I mean, it's, it's genuinely surprising to me uh, how many egalitarian views that I see circulating not all of them, but how many are based on unproven statements about Artemis of Ephesus, or in many cases, statements that can be proven wrong. So Linda Belleville claims that the cult taught that women had authority over men. This is in Discovering Biblical Equality, which I have right here. I've referenced this before. This is <clears throat> meant to be 
the th this is the third edition meant to be newer information, pretty updated stuff from a range of different egalitarian scholars brought together by uh, Ron Pierce to contribute to this volume. And Linda Belleville, of course, is one of the chief ones that we see sort of pushing the envelope forward on these issues. So in this new edition of Discovering Biblical Equality, Belleville has a theory that, you know, the word authority there refers to a domineering fashion, a domineering type of thing that Paul is saying women can't do. We'll get to that later. That'll be a bulk of this video talking about what the meaning of authority is, the authentane word in the Greek. But she has to explain then why would Paul be saying there's a problem with women doing this. And that, she thinks, is all about the cult of Artemis. Here's the quote. A probable explanation of why women would be teaching in a domineering fashion is that the women were influenced by the cult of Artemis in which the female was exalted and considered superior to the male. Now, this is, a, a again, a, a well-respected scholar here. And I do not at all mean to, like, sort of, you know, you guys don't know this scholar. Those scholars who are the few of you who are watching my work, I'm not trying to cast shadows on all of her work. I'm just, this is a problem, okay? And it's a pervasive problem in egalitarian scholarship, stuff about Artemis. This kind of claim that the female was exalted and considered superior to the male is completely unproven. If you'll notice, there's no footnote for this claim. Um, in her work, there's no footnote. And that's it's conspicuous how often footnotes are just missing from claims about Artemis or their footnotes that don't actually work very well. We'll come to that in a second. But I ultimately see zero evidence to support, you know, this claim about women being superior to men in the cult of Artemis. That, that would be a big deal. But I see zero significant or or really worthwhile evidence to support this sort of claim. Nothing. But there's even bad evidence that's presented we'll come to in just a second. The next quote from Linda Belleville is <clears throat> um, trying to support how women were superior to men in this cult is that the leader, Artemis, the, the, the person who is the focus of the cult worshipped by it, that instead of seeking fellowship among her own kind, Artemis spurned the attentions of the male gods and sought instead the company of a human male consort named Laman. Remember this guy's name and that Linda Belleville thought he was her consort and and okay let's we got to follow the logic here because i'm i'm confused on several levels to start with layman will find was not her consort um we'll also have to ask how is this justification for the idea and that's how belleville uses it in, in this writing for the idea that women were seen as superior to men it artemis isn't interested in male god instead seeks a human male consort like how is this a statement about women being superior to men i don't understand the logic at any rate Remember that Layman is considered a male consort. The next quote from Belleville goes like this. This made Artemis and all her female adherents superior to men. What? That doesn't make that doesn't make logical sense. Artemis wanted a human consort instead of a, a, a deified one. You know, when when Zeus wanted a female human consort, this didn't this didn't have any sort of statement about the superiority of men over women. It's just irrelevant. So she says, this made Artemis and all her female adherents superior to men, a belief that was played out at the festival of the Lord of Streets when the priestess of Artemis pursued a man. Notice the wording here. There is a belief that Artemis's cult supposedly had. Women are superior to men. This belief is what's played out in a well-known feast called the Lord of Streets. And how is it played out in a way that shows women are superior? A female priestess pursues a man. She pursues a man. You, you, you think she's pursuing a man to like be a consort with him maybe because that's the context of this claim. This is all on page 224. However, this is entirely not the case. You would completely misunderstand the cult of Artemis and this Lord of the Streets thing if you just used this writing from Belleville. Um, you will, however, notice that the little 63 there at the bottom of this quote, that's a footnote. So there are footnotes here. And in her footnote, she offers three resources that give us support for this claim. So I looked up all three resources and we're going to go over them in detail because it's when you check the footnotes that you often find these claims, they, they can fall apart. And I remember um, hearing um, Michael Heiser, who um, went to be with the Lord. I'm grateful that he's our brother in Christ. I disagree with him on this particular issue. He once talked about how you could make a strong case for the complementarian view and you can make a strong biblical case for the egalitarian view so that it was kind of a wash. And having studied so much in depth and actually looked at the footnotes, I thought you can only make a strong case if you don't check the footnotes. 
because it's based on claims about history that are often fallacious, that are just not true. Here's an example of those types of problems. So the first footnote is from uh, Pisanius, his description of Greece, and I've got the reference up on your uh, screen right here, and I actually have a link to where you can read this on your own in my notes that, again, you can download in the video description or on my website, BibleThinker.org, and it's all free. Um, happy to get to give it all away for free. So here it says, such is the inscription at Tegea on Philopomen, the images of Apollo, Lord of Streets. What? The images of Apollo, Lord of Streets? So this means that the Lord of Streets term is about Apollo, not Artemis. Now, Apollo is her brother, don't get me wrong. But if the festival is named after a, a male deity, it's difficult to see how it's a celebration of female superiority over men. That doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So the images of Apollo, Lord of Streets, the Tegeans say they set up for the following reason. What was the Lord of Streets festival about? According to Pisanias, this ancient source that, that she quotes, that she references in her work. We're just reading it here in context. Apollo and Artemis, they say, throughout every land visited with punishment all the men of that time who, when Leto was with child and in the course of her wanderings, took no heed of her when she came to their land. Here's the deal. Leto is the mom of Artemis and Apollo. She's pregnant. She's in labor. She's giving birth. And she starts traveling to find a safe place to give birth, someone who will help her through this labor pain. Well, people keep refusing her and they will not help her. And so later on, her kids, when they when they grow up, they're deities, but they have a birth story, right? When they grow up, they go on a hunt to get justice against all the people who wronged their mother at this at this crucial time. And so this Lord of the Streets is connected to this moment. Does that sound like female superiority over males? No, not really. So the term Lord of the Streets is a reference to Apollo, not Artemis. We also know from other writings that Artemis wasn't a lord of the streets she was she was in the jungle she was not the jungle perhaps in the wild in the wilderness in the forest she was not a city dweller she only occasionally visited cities whereas apollo her brother he was the city dweller and this is probably why he's called lord of the streets it's odd to see a festival as proof of female superior superiority over men when it was named after a male god who they called lord of the streets it just doesn't really make sense Let's look at the next part of this quote. This is, I'm just reading the very next verse from Pisanias in order. And it says here, <clears throat> So when the divinities came to the land of Tegea, Sephiris, they say, the son of Tegeets, came to Apollo and had a private conversation with him. And Laman, who was also the son of Tegeets, remember that guy, Laman? Suspecting that the conversation of Sephiris contained a charge against him, rushed on his brother and killed him. Let me give you the, the background here, right? Just It connects to what I already said. Apollo and Artemis are on the hunt to find the people who wronged their mom. Sephiris is starting to talk to Apollo, probably giving him information about who did what back in the day. And it seems that this guy, Laman, he was probably guilty of not having helped their mother. And he's worried that his brother's going to tell them what happened. So he rises up and he kills his brother before he could sort of spill the beans. This is Laman. He's not the consort of Artemis. That's a strange idea. The accusation was probably again that he mistreated their mother then the very the very next verse says the following immediate punishment for the murder overtook Laman, for he was shot by artemis with her arrow remember artemis has an arrow boom she she shoots him with bow and arrow at the time tagits and mera sacrificed to apollo and artemis both of them not not woman over man just both of them because they weren't it wasn't a gender issue but afterwards, a severe famine fell on the land. And then here's where the festival comes in. And an oracle of Delphi ordered a mourning for Sephiris, that guy who got killed wrongly by his brother. And the, at the feast, the Lord of the Streets, rites are performed in honor of Sephiris. Not Artemis, Sephiris. And in particular, the priestess of Artemis pursues a man, pretending she is Artemis herself pursuing Laman. The pursuit is not romantic. The pursuit is violent, right? So the, the picture is of, um, you know, there's a famine in the land. And, you know, what, what do they do? They, they're religious. They go, hey, what's up with the famine? And an oracle goes, well, there's this guy, Sephiris, who was killed around here. It was wrong. We need to do something to honor his memory. We need to sort of right that wrong and show that the blood's not on our hands. So we're going to do this Lord of the Streets festival in honor of Sephiris, not even Artemis. Right? She's part of it. So is Apollo. But, but it's in honor of Sephiris to remove this famine. 
and she, the priestess pursues the um, the man and you know pretends to kill him as a way of commemorating the justice that came for Sephiroth. It's not about a woman exercising authority over man and showing it by a priestess pursuing a man or something. It was a memorial of Artemis shooting an arrow at a bad bad guy, not a consort, a bad guy named Layman who wrongly murdered his brother and wronged Artemis's mother. No gender issues appear to be present at all. It was performed, it says, quote, in honor of Sephiroth. These are all the points of why we should not take this egalitarian view. The, the man who was murdered. It's in honor of a man who was murdered. I'm not sure if they even did this festival in Ephesus at that time. I haven't seen support for that. It's possible they did, right? And we just haven't seen the support. But in a lot of reading, a lot of research, uh, not just egalitarian writings, but just reading writings from scholars about Artemis and about Ephesus, I haven't seen the evidence of that. So it may or may not have even taken place at the time and in or in Ephesus. Um, but Belleville calls him a consort and seems to conclude that Artemis was showing female superiority over men by choosing a human consort. Again, this doesn't make any sense to me. That's the first of three quotes she has to support her claims. Claims that are repeated by others. We'll, we'll see other people who repeat these claims. I've seen them on, whether it's on Twitter or X now it's called, uh, or if it's on uh, Facebook or other social media or just in messages people send me, Mike, I hope you'll look into the Artemis background because they feel that they've found the real the real key to unlocking First Timothy. Um, but this is just misleading. This is just bad history giving us a bad interpretation or wrong understanding of scripture. Now it's possible, I'll just throw this out there, that Artemis had in her story some other layman that she you know, was was reaching out to and was was a consort with. I couldn't read about this anywhere. I searched and searched and couldn't find any other layman associated with Artemis. Also, the, after making the statements about layman and the consort and all this in the Lord of the Streets Festival, she then quotes Pisanias, which is what I just read to you, where it talks about layman. This seems to be the same layman Belleville was talking about. Let's look at the next one. This is the second one, which is actually, I'll, rather than putting it on your screen, I'll just show you. This is a book written by Sharon grits um who uh wrote you know paul women teachers and the mother god at ephesus again this is uh new-ish type of stuff the direction of seeking for a new understanding of first timothy based on the cult background of artemis and for this belleville just references 10 full pages of this book and again it's not a very long book it's short but it's one of those condensed books where a lot of research is sort of shoved into a small space in those 10 pages pages 31 through 41 i didn't see anything um uh, anything that established anything about female superiority over men i didn't even see anything that m she might be referring to in those 10 pages so i i have to say either it went over my head or it's not there those are the two options well let's look at the third quote the third reference she has is to a britannica article Britannica article, and I, I found what I believe is the correct entry right here. This is, um, here's the thing. The article's on your page right now. That, that's pretty much the whole article. Um, it doesn't have any reference to Artemis or women having superiority over men in the, in the Artemis cult. I thought maybe uh, it was an earlier version of the article. So I checked the web history and the edit history of the Britannica article. And there is no prior version having any information of any kind supporting the claims that Belleville made for which she uses this as a reference. Uh, I don't see anything there. This this article does use the it does talk about Artemis in, in, in reference to her being a fertility goddess. Now, this is a separate debate. We'll get into this briefly. I'm, I, you, there's whole books on this, right? But we can get into this briefly. Artemis was supposedly a fertility goddess, like a sex goddess, and that seems to be false. And uh, Sandra Glan has has shown in some of her work why that doesn't work, right? And and she has a recent book, Sandra Glan, uh, Nobody's Mother. <laughs> this is about Artemis, and I disagree with her interpretation of First Timothy. But a lot of her book is actually just showing many of the modern, popular egalitarian views as being wrong, even though she herself is egalitarian and is seeking to establish a different way of getting the same views. So the same conclusions, I should say, with, with a different path. Um, Sandra Glant says the following, uh, but the writers of this encyclopedia, yeah, it's this exact article she's talking about. The writers of this encyclopedia, as do contemporary tour guides, conflate the Ephesian Artemis with all, with all other manifestations of Artemis over time. It was not the writer's goal to identify the exact nature of this goddess at the time of Paul, meaning that this article referenced by Belleville, it's just sloppy 
to take this and think it's about the Ephesian Artemis. Again, there's, you know, lots of different cities worshiping Artemis. And uh, often in scholarly writings, they'll refer not just to Artemis, but to Artemis of Ephesia because there are differences between the different locales and the different traditions they had about the gods and goddesses they worshiped, even when they had the same names. All right, let's look at um, some, I think, sober comments from uh, a scholar named S.M. Ba. And these are from his book or his contrib contribution to women in the church. He says further, um, is that the right one? No, 53. There we go. All right. Furthermore, it cannot be shown that worship of such deities or of any female deity translated into societal status, rights, or power for women in ancient societies. To say that it did in Ephesus because of the centrality of the worship of Artemis Ephesia is sheer speculation that runs counter to the facts. This is so, very sober. There's lots of places that worshiped female deities, and we don't have any reason to think it turned into societal privileges or status or power for women in those cultures. So if if we have cities where they worship and, and center around a female deity, and it doesn't turn into like feminism or women empowerment, why assume it doesn't in, in Ephesus? It's us. We are in a Christian environment. We're in a monotheistic environment. We're just not used to hearing stories about cities where they worship pagan female gods. So we get a little gullible about what we think it means. And that, unfortunately, is what's happening with uh, some of the research on this stuff. Ba also goes on to say, for instance, one way to deny that this city was a bastion for women's of women's rights or that Artemis Ephesia was a fertility deity with eunuchs and sacred prostitutes among her cult personality that's something people like to say about Artemis. Well, she had all these sacred prostitutes and all these eunuchs. And it's like, th these are just claims, guys, but they're not supported by the actual historical research. He says, anyway, one of the ways to uh, show this is not the case is by evaluating the evidence or lack thereof adduced by those who maintain the feminist Ephesus position. We would find it wanting. The lack of footnotes or related foot footnotes that actually work is astonishing. Um, even in Gritz's own work, there's just a lack of supportive notes. It's just her summary, and you have having to take this is this one here. You have to take her word for it some of the times where you're reading, and you're like, ah, some of these claims are pretty important and they're lacking support. Not that her whole book's without footnotes, it's not. Uh, N.T. Wright's book, Surprised by Scripture, many of you have read. Um, it doesn't even have footnotes. Um, and so, Make them show you the support. Make them show you the first century evidence that proves that this is the case with Artemis or else we're, we're just getting sucked into something that's not accurate. The power of the historical filter. Let's talk about that for a moment. This filter, this feminist Ephesus, Artemis is the real background. It does two things. When you tell somebody, well, you think you know 1 Timothy 2, but have you understood the cult of Artemis? You immediately get them off guard. They're like, wait a minute, even though I've read the passage in context, there may be this whole other piece of the puzzle that I don't understand, totally can change my views. Then the next thing you do is you you then force them to rely upon um, scholars, which can be good and can be bad. It's a mixed bag. And any scholar who thinks it's not a mixed bag is not paying attention. Um, but they get you to rely on scholars that you will not be able to actually verify a lot of this data. And that's what I've done in this study is try to verify the data, look at the actual resources, original sources here. So the power of this filter is huge. It gets you thinking, I can't understand the passage in context. I need this historical understanding, which sometimes is the case, but usually is not in scripture. Um, and then I have to rely on sort of the word of somebody who tells me this is the background, trust me, because the lack of footnotes and support. This seems like a current trend among egalitarian scholars. Um, and I will just summarize it this way. Innuendo, sometimes they, they know they don't have a lot of historical support, so they use innuendo. Um, they won't make strong claims. They'll make strong-ish claims that sort of lead people to think that there was a feminist Artemis, but they're not really going to say it outright as strongly as other authors. And basically it ends up, well, let me give you an example. It ends up doing this. So here is uh, Nijay Gupta, who is a scholar who I uh, actually like on a personal level, have, having interviewed him in, as part of the Passion Project. And he had a fantastic contribution to the project. He did an evaluation of... Um, um, Brian Simmons' passion translation, and he did Galatians, and I thought it was really well done. It really, his paper was one of the easiest to read and most accessible, and all that. So, I have wonderful things to say about Nijay Gupta. Um, just disagree with him on this 
one thing here. He says the central focus on Artemis, along with the origin legend of the Amazons, gave the city a unique quality of female empowerment. Notice that these are very vague statements. It's 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 innuendo almost, right? Central focus on Artemis. Now, when there's central focus on other female deities, does it make other cities feminist? No. Why does it here? It just it just does. Um, what about the origin legend of the Amazons? Well, the Amazons, let's talk about that for a minute. And this, by the way, is in Nijay Gupta's uh, new book, Tell Her Story. It just came out. And I'm trying to sort of be on the edge of what's newer with egalitarian scholarship because I want this series to be relevant for a while. Many cities were said to have been founded by Amazons. Many ancient cities at the time. Now, you may not know this because here I am, 21st century human being, only speaking my native language and don't really know much about ancient history and all that. And I didn't realize that there was a whole bunch of cities that worshipped female deities. And there was a whole bunch of cities that, that were claimed to have been founded by Amazons. And none of them resulted in places where women had power over men. So why think the same, the same things in Artemis have a different effect? They didn't have it anywhere else. Why would they have it here? I've never seen any evidence that belief in Amazons resulted in female empowerment in any city, let alone Artemis, um, like the kind of not just feminism, but, and we'll talk about this later, hyper-feminism you need to support an egalitarian interpretation of First Timothy 2. You need super, super hyper-feminism, like beyond what we have today. You'd need some pretty hardcore stuff for their view to hold hold to hold true. It, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. It never is going to work um, because that's not what the text means. And, th and this text getting ahead of myself, is very apparent in what it means. And there's questions and there's things to debate, especially verse 15, or exactly what is the application of not teacher have authority, all that kind of stuff. I get it. That That's tough stuff to work through, and we're going to work through it. But these things are happening because um, these, these, these sort of, you have to reach further because you're further, your interpretation is further from the passage. So you have to find some really extreme historical things to do. So let's talk now about some of the claims, some more of the claims. Um, were the priests female only, as N.T. Wright says? N.T. Wright is quoted as saying that they were it was a female only priest cult. Uh, the answer to that is no. There were male and female priests. We know of the names of some of the male priests. Let me give you some of their names. I'll, you know, you could look up more of the stuff on your own. But Servilius, Bass, Servilius Bassus was one of them under Augustus, and that was around the time of Jesus. He was a male priest in the Artemis cult. Another male priest of Artemis was named C. Julius Atticus. Another one was Apollonius Politicus. For all three of these, you could see women in the church. Um, I believe it's the third edition, uh, page 38. And I've got references in my notes, of course. In the second century, a guy named Achilles Tatius wrote a romantic novel about priests of Artemis. But what was it about? Male priests of Artemis. Artemis of Ephesus. So... Um, that seems provably wrong, but there was a group in, and I won't get into too much, too much detail here because there's a lot we could talk about with the Curetis, uh, right? The Curetis were this like group prominent in the cult and we have years worth of lists of their names. They were like a, an authoritative group in the cult. They had authority. They had ruling power in the cult. They weren't just sort of servants. At any rate, um, there was... There was years worth of records of who were the Curetis in the Artemis cult, and every single one of them for years was male. Every one, not a single female one was there. These are people who had a role of authority in the cult, and they're all male. What does that imply? Is this a feminist Artemis cult, like Belleville claims and Gupta implies and strongly suggests, like N.T. Wright says? Um, no. No. The following is a 44 AD source. Okay, here's a first century source, 44 AD. We're talking really close to when 1 Timothy was written. And it says that the leaders of the city, called a koinon, right? The leaders of the city who would have all been male, that they actually had power over the people leading the, the Artemis cult, meaning that men were, were at the top rung of leadership over this cult. Let's look at this. Here it says, the temple of Artemis herself, um, which is an adornment to the whole province because of the magnificence of the building, the antiquity of the worship of the goddess, and the abundance of the incomes granted to the goddess by the emperor, is being deprived of its proper revenues. 
These have been sufficient for the maintenance and for the adornment of votive offerings, but they are being diverted for the illegal wants of the Koinon's leaders. The Koinon, this, this group of men ruling the city, they, they're in charge of the city. They're also in charge of the Artemis cult. They're able to re divert the funds. According as they consider, will it uh, will bring them profit. But look at how they use it. While using the appearance of, a div of the divine temple as a pretext, they sell the priesthoods as if at public auction. This is something common in the ancient world, common even in modern world in, in a sense, um, depending on where you live, the, the buying and selling of, of high positions. So it's, it goes on and says, indeed, they invite men of every kind to their sale, and they do not select the most suitable men upon whose heads the crown might fittingly be placed. Instead, they restrict incomes to those who are being consecrated to as little as they are willing to accept in order that they themselves might appropriate as much as possible. Um, they're they're hiring people at cheap costs so they can keep the money for themselves. But it's it's I mean, this establishes two things. This quote, I'll leave it on your screen here for a moment. One, the priests of Artemis are not all female because the terms here are generic. They're not feminine. I, I read the word men. I emphasize the word men. It doesn't mean males, but it's a generic term. It does not mean women. It's generically used of men and women inclusively when you look at the original language. So it, that establishes they're not all female. Okay, I'm making a conservative claim there. Number two, the male leadership of the city was exercising authority over the cult. This is the koinon. According to Ba, they were the city magistrates. They were in charge of the city. The city was over the cult. They were appointing people, male, potentially male and female, and um, definitely not just women. And you add this to the, the list of names and specific male priests that we know about and the curetes and all this. Now, I can add to all this another piece of evidence, which is the research of a guy named Guy McLean Rogers. His book, The Mysteries of Artemis at Ephesus, he demonstrates that um, Ar the Artemis cult was not primarily controlled by the priests and the priestesses at the time. While they're important figures, they're not the ones at the top, right? They're not the authorities, ultimately. The ruling group of curetes that was really in charge they had even been relocated from the temple of artemis physically relocated because this is i'm going to try to summarize a lot of complicated history stuff they've been relocated to the house of the pretanus pretanus by a guy named augustus you guys have probably heard of him changing who controlled things in the temple um why is that let me now explain what i just said the pretanus as an elected official of the polis that's the city reported not to the administration of the temple but to the boule and to the demos that is the Britannus is a city government guy. He's in charge of city-related things. He's not primarily religious. And by then moving the Coretis over to the house of the Britannus, it's so the city can have oversight over the temple, meaning the authority over the temple is the city's authority. Why is this important? Because the authority in the city is all male, all 100% male. There was male authority over the temple, in other words, at the time of Paul. Let's read on. Um, uh, Guy McLean Rogers goes on to say they were deprived of the authority to prescribe categorically how her mysteries would be celebrated and how the goddess would be defined at the celebration of her mysteries. That is the the priests and priestesses and all that and even the Coretis, they were had to submit to this leadership and the Coretis themselves are all male, of course. Then we have the next quote. The Coretis took along with them the authority of the priests and priestesses of the Artemisian to decide exclusively how the birth of Artemis was to be celebrated at the Mysteries. The Mysteries was just like the rituals and stuff they did. By the end of the first century BC, the Pertanus supervised some of the most important rituals that took place during the celebration of Artemis's Mysteries, including the activities of the Coretis. What does this all mean for anybody who feels like you're getting lost in the weeds? Well, here you go. Furthermore, the, Persic the Persicus inscription demonstrates that, here we go, officials in local government had direct control over access to the Artemisian's priesthood. Local government officials were in charge. They were males. Beneath them was the Coretes. They were all males. Beneath them were both male and female priests, priestesses for the uh, Artemis cult. It's not feminist, guys. Uh, we don't have good evidence to support that at all. We have really strong evidence to say the opposite. And the innuendo we get from egalitarians isn't working. Bot answers the questions of um, who is in charge this way. This is his summary of it. And he's specialized in this, in this area. What we find is something entirely expected for a Hellenic city of the imperial era. 
civil magistrates exercised supreme control over the Artemisium, while Roman governors actively meddled in their affairs. Right, Ba goes through not only the not only the fact that there were male priests, but men serving in a, with authority in a variety of other positions, demonstrating that that was the case in the Artemis cult, such as and I won't go over the details because again it's just TMI, but the Neopoioi, who functioned like a board of trustees for the temple property, uh, one of them was named Demetrius. Some scholars think that he might have been the silversmith of Acts chapter nineteen. And you can see, if that's super interesting, if it interests you, see Women in the Church, page 39, footnote 36. Check it out. It's kind of cool, but it shows us that even there in the text of Scripture, there's indications of male leadership in, in place in um, the cult of Artemis, which is not surprising. Not surprising historically at all. Here's some evidence that the city council, all male, they even regulated specifically the female priestesses. This is, this is a real particular piece of evidence because it suggests that men were over women in the Artemis cult in particular. Apparently, the state council itself set the requisite donations and generosity for priestesses of Artemis. That is, pause the quote here, uh, priestesses and priests would pay money and have to pay for the adornment of the, of the, of the idol and other things to take place to, to keep the temple pretty and nice and everything. They actually had to pay money to have those positions. And so the state council sets the amount for them to pay. And I continue the quote now. Since another stone reads, there's a name that was lost. Uh, So-and-so served as priestess of Artemis piously and generously and gave 5,000 denarii to the city in accordance with the state council's measure. Again, here's a group of men in charge of the female priestesses of Artemis. We may suppose that the definition of pious priestly service at least partly included serving generously. And note again how the Ephesian state council, called a boule, was involved directly in the affairs of Artemis worship. So Ba also will point out that in Paul's time, the Artemis of, Ephes of Ephesia, she had no female high priest at that time at all. So Ba goes a step further and will claim, while, while some egalitarian scholars say, hey, you know, Artemis of Ephesia, she had a female high priest. And we've seen also from another scholar that, yeah, well, sometimes she did, sometimes she had a male one, both it happened both ways. But Ba will claim that specifically during Paul's time, when Paul was writing, when Paul was visiting, when Timothy was there, they did not have a female high priestess. She was not present. But Linda Belleville responds. She pushes back against this claim. And here's her quote. There we go. Although Ba is correct in saying that urban Ephesus lacked a high priestess during Paul's day, he overlooks that suburban Ephesus did not. While Paul was planting the Ephesian church, uh, Yiluain served as high priestess of the imperial cult in Magnesia, a city 15 miles southeast of Ephesus. Now, let me just say this, this feels fishy to me, okay? This is my impression, my, you know, as, as someone who's on the outside, I'm not a scholar. I'm just doing my best to understand and research their work and come to conclusions that I think are going to keep me from being misled <laughs> by things and keep you hopefully. Um, this feels like a dodge, Okay. This is a city, it's not suburban Ephesus, okay? We, you can't call this suburban Ephesus. It's a city 15 miles away. It's a different city. Not only is it a different city, it's a different religion. It's the imperial cult. The imperial cult, which was not a woman-focused, it was not a gynocracy, it was not a woman-focused religion. Nobody thinks that. So here, this seems like a total dodge. Like, we just want to see a feminist Ephesus so bad that we're, we're able to ignore the even the Ephesian evidence and go, well, 15 miles away, there's a thing that if I if I cut it out of that context and I stick it over in Ephesus where it doesn't exist, maybe it'll support my point. This also ignores the fact that lots of places which had female high priestesses didn't have a belief that women were superior to men, and they didn't result in any kind of feminism. It was not uncommon to have a female high priest and have zero impact on the roles of women in the society. In fact, I don't know of anywhere where it had a, had an impact. I haven't heard of that. The, often these female high priestesses, not always, but frequently they're, they're young girls. So they're serving and they're, they're not really carrying a lot of authority, the, the, at, least, at least when they were young. So that the position doesn't translate to the kind of power that automatically, at least, that people often think it would. Let's look at um, how the book of Acts actually shows us that Ephesus had male religious influence, as in you could have, I don't recommend it, right? But you could have been unable to and skipped all the historical research and just looked at the text of Acts and you would have seen some support for this. Here we go. Ba's point here in um, The Apostle Among the Amazons. I have a, that article available somewhere in my notes. 
you have to search the 121 pages of it to find it, but it's in there. Uh, he says, Demetrius the silversmith and his guild, whom he addresses as Andres, which is men, they're males, were in the marketplace deriving a lucrative profit from the Artemisium tourist trade. Luke also mentions the male Asiarchs who were members of the premier social circles in the province of Asia. Ba's final point is only, and this really matters, the Asiarchs were the social elite at Ephesus. Men, and this is even in the text of scripture, we're seeing there isn't a feminist Ephesus. This doesn't exist in history. This is being fabricated by a modern attempt to reinterpret the text of scripture. And it's not true. And this is what I've seen as I've studied egalitarian writings, is that there's frequently a grasping for an idea, then trying to find as much support as they can. The evidence is lacking. Maybe we shift and try a new idea. But the interpretation seems to be in place before the the, the research is being considered. And at least that seems to be the case. Let's look here at more information about Acts. Uh, when we look further into Acts 19, we find hints of male involvement in Ephesian religious affairs, right? Not just female only cult, as N.T. Wright says. It was the secretary of the people, Grammatius, certainly a man, who diffused the excited mob in the theater by defending the goddess's honor. That was a man who stepped up. Uh, the secretary mentions that Ephesus itself was the Neokoros of the great goddess. That That is, it, well, I'll read what he says. This term, Neokoros, is frequently used for the individual or group charged with the oversight of a cult, as in the city itself was in charge of the cult, even based on acts. And of course, historical research has supported this claim as well about the whole idea of the curetes being put in the house of the Pertanis and it being the governors who were appointing um, priests and stuff like that. What do you know? Historical support for scripture. Uh, since women, I continue the quote, since women were not citizens of the Greek polis, Greek cities like Ephesus, it was the male citizen body of Ephesus acting through its municipal officers, Grammatus, and the all-male boule, the state council, who claimed the oversight of the cult of Artemis of Ephesia. We can safely infer from this slight New Testament evidence alone that religious affairs at Ephesus were not exclusively in the hands of women as the authors of Suffer Not a Woman allege. So Suffer Not a Woman is an older book. People don't use it anymore. It was one of the first reaches for this Artemis stuff and reaches for redefining uh, authentane to mean something totally different. Um, and other scholars are still reaching for the same conclusions, but they're reaching in different ways. Um, but the feminist Ephesus is a way that they're still reaching. At any rate, strong evidence here. Strong evidence that says that these oft-repeated claims by egalitarians are just not true. Not every egalitarian says it. Marge Mosko is much more conservative, and she's like, I haven't really seen support for that. If it's there, I'd like to see it. And so it's certainly not all of them do that. Okay, there's plenty of other avenues that people will take, but this is one that I think is very popular, and it's one that I see in comment sections and in people replying. So I feel like it's having a real-world impact. People go, Artemis changed everything for me. Now I see First Timothy 2 is egalitarian, and um, well, that wasn't true. So that interpretation isn't supported, at least not that way. So there is zero evidence so far to substantiate the extreme claims of people like N.T. Wright, who says it was a female-only cult, or that, quote, women ruled the show and kept men in their place. Zero evidence. There's actually evidence contrary to it. Or that what uh, Linda Belleville says, which is, quote, the women were influenced by the cult of Artemis, in which the female was exalted and considered superior to the male. Then further on, she says, this made Artemis and all her female adherents superior to men. Zero evidence supporting this and strong evidence contradicting it. Yet it will continue to be written on and continue to be taught because it's so prevalent. Like I just see it all over. Um, it shouldn't be. This is a this is a failure of egalitarian scholarship. I, I hate to say it, but it really is. And it's it's sad that more egalitarians aren't calling them aren't calling each other out on this. But you you know you're in a camp, and this can happen to both sides, right? You when you like for me when I say hey I don't think helpmate means what most complementarians and patriarchalists think it means. Okay, I don't think that. I I'm tempted to not say that because the people in my camp would disagree. But I have to ignore this because we need to follow to the best of our ability truth where it leads okay so ephesus wasn't just about artemis there were all manner of gods that were worshipped there if we look at first timothy like it's primarily an artemis cult related thing um that would be 
That would be weird. Uh, but this leads us to an important question, this observation, there was multiple gods. Did the religious environment in Ephesus in general support the view that there was a hyper-feminist Ephesus thing going on? Because it's not like the whole city was just Artemis worshipers and they were all part of this, how, I mean, how they could all be part of a female-only cult. <laughs> or it, you, just, you just can't like see it one-dimensionally like that. So look at what Ba says here. Um, he's referring here to a guy named Walter Burkhart. Bur Burkert, excuse me. Uh, the majority of these deities it, worshipped in Ephesus. The god, even the goddesses, were served by male priests at Ephesus, which is a bit unusual, since a priestess was very commonly officiated. A priestess very commonly officiated for goddesses and a priest for gods in Greek cults, according to the leading authority on ancient Greek religion. That's Walter Burkert. So typically, let me restate it for anybody who might need need that help. Typically, you go to a uh, an ancient Greek city and they're worshiping a, a goddess more often than not you see a female priestess there to represent that female goddess doesn't mean women are the bosses and in charge it doesn't turn into feminism but you typically see a woman in that role what's weird is that in Ephesus that's reversed more often than not you see male priests even for the goddesses implying what well one of the common egalitarian talking points is Female priests, female priestesses equals more likely a feminist type of environment in Ephesus. But when we look at Ephesus, we see a greater ratio of male priests, not female ones, than we do in even other ancient cities at the time. So I'm not going to spend too much time on this here, um, but that seems like a real problem for their view. Uh, nor does Ephesus have even a large number of females in high positions. If you look at the city registers and like who's sort of recorded in ancient writings and ancient inscriptions, how many females are there compared to men in sort of high roles in the society? But you don't see any disproportionately large number of females in those positions. There's some in associate that are, you know, in the inscriptions, there's some that are in, a, in association with a husband or father, implying that perhaps the husband or father was was ultimately the one who was in greater a greater higher role of authority there. There's some who are listed in Ephesus, but they're too young to be in any real power. They're so young, they're children. So they're not really showing us some kind of feminist thing going on. And there's a few, a small number, that may have had real power, though it seems very unclear as to how much. Now, some egalitarians will, will gather the names of all these women, and they will present them without mentioning the husbands, the fathers, without mentioning the age, and they'll gather them all as if you're sort of just going to benefit of the doubt they're all in a lot of power um, but it's not really that way I, i'm not going to spend a lot of time on it here uh, not because i didn't study it privately because i certainly did it just doesn't warrant a whole section in today's video so i'm just going to summarize that point and move on there's no there's no good reason to establish any kind of feminist or hyper feminist movement in ephesus in the first century that would give people a new understanding of first timothy 2. there's other ways however that egalitarians will get an artemis filter that changes how we see First Timothy. Uh, Sandra Glan, who wrote the book here, Nobody's Mother, um, and has written articles on this topic as well. Sandra Glan, she says that Paul starts First Timothy. Well, let me back up. She's going to try to find parallels, little hints, little little hints, parallels between Artemis and some of the text in First Timothy. Like maybe Artemis is called um, Savior. In her cult, she's called Savior. And then in First Timothy, Paul... First Timothy chapter one, verse one, he refers to God as our savior. And so maybe, let me get a flavor of how this logic works. Maybe this idea of savior is a hint that Paul's combating Artemis. Artemis was called savior. He introduces God as our savior. So he's sort of introducing God as he's better than Artemis. He replaces Artemis and any sort of adoration you have for Artemis is replaced by God. Any needs you had for Artemis is replaced by God. However, and we're going to go through a list of these. There's a list of things they'll see as like hints that Artemis is the background of 1 Timothy. And we, we do need those. If we're going to say Artemis changes our views, we need something to connect it to the text. But Paul also calls God our Savior in Ephesians 5.23, in Philippians 3.20, 3, in 1 Timothy 2.3, 4.10, in 2 Timothy 1.10, Titus 1.3, Titus 1.4, Titus 2.10, Titus 2.13, Titus 3.4, and Titus 3.6. Yet Titus isn't being written to an Artemis background. There are 24 uses of soter or savior in the New Testament, and 12 of them are from Paul, only three of which are in 1st and 2nd Timothy. 
right? So Paul's majority of his uses of Savior are outside of 1 Timothy. Uh, that to say, we're we're reading a lot if we think there's a, a special hidden meaning behind Paul simply calling God Savior. That's pretty common. God is our Savior, after all. It's not a special name for Artemis. It's just the kind of thing you say about someone you're looking to save <laughs> to save you, you know? Um, so Glan mentions, uh, says that Paul mentions Adam and Eve, another hint that Artemis is the background of 1 Timothy. Uh, Paul mentions Adam and Eve, and this is to counteract, and this we're going to spend a little time on, the creation story of the Artemis cult in Ephesus. The creation story. Now that sounds good. Because 1 Timothy, Paul's like, hey, Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but Eve was deceived and, and transgressed. And um, this is brought up according to her, not because it's about Adam and Eve exactly. It's to counteract the Artemis creation narrative. Let's look at her quote on that. And no, this is not going to work. This is going to be bunk, um, but we got to walk through it. One might also see an Artemis influence in Paul's reference to limiting women or wives teaching. He gives the he gives this reason for the restriction that he says in his practice. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. To Jewish people, the Adam and Eve narrative was old, familiar creation story. But for Gentiles, the focus of Paul's ministry, the Genesis narrative was new. The non-Jewish members of Timothy's spiritual community were well-versed in a far different creation story. I wish I had highlighted that phrase, creation story. Remember that. They had a special pride of place about this story because they believed its events, known throughout the empire, took place near their city. In the Artemis cult's origin narrative, the woman came first and her twin, Apollo, followed. In Timothy's context, the creation story from Genesis contradicts the local story and would have served as a logical corrective. To the Ephesians, women came first, woman came first and was preeminent. Okay, that's not true. Historically, that's not true. But supposedly, the creation narrative is pushing hyperfeminism. Then I, I read the quote on. To Jews, the, the woman was not only second, but she was even deceived. This is not to suggest Eve was a prototype of female sin. Rather, the facts about Eve knock women back to a place of equality with men. Let me illustrate it like this. Paul comes with his creation story. He comes to Artemis, or, in, in, or Ephesus rather. And in Ephesus, they were like, hey, we've got our own creation story. It even happened right down the road near Ephesus. Like this is where it happened. And in our story, woman was made first, then man. And guess what? That makes men lower than women. That makes women the authority. Paul goes, let me give you a creation story that will correct that. And I'm not going to bump Adam up and Eve down. I'm just, you know what I mean? You have, you have plus two, you have minus two, and now you have zero. I'm bringing it back to zero. Men aren't better. Women aren't better. It's not patriarchy. It's not complementarian. It's egalitarian. How do I take what looks like a complementarian view in 1 Timothy and say it's egalitarian? I say it's a corrective to a hyper-feminist gynocracy view. Okay. That being said, Belleville is, is in agreement with Glan in this basic idea, although they don't always get there in the same way, her and, her and Glan. She says, an Artemis influence would help explain Paul's correctives in 1 Timothy 2, 13 to 15, the Adam and Eve stuff. It was believed that Artemis appeared first and then her male consort. However, the biblical story is just the opposite. Adam was formed first, then Eve. Then too, it was Eve who was deceived, hardly a basis to claim superiority. You guys, I hope I can explain this properly. Um, I've been eager to teach this 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 long, long video because there's a mountain of misinformation and weird rug pulling things that are going on with the data. This is an example of that. Okay, it requires us think, thinking two things. Follow the logic, right? If you want to be a, uh, egalitarian, go for it. Find another way because <laughs> this, this way is not going to work. Um, okay, so one, the first thing you have to think: the origin of Artem of Artemis resulted in women dominating men. Okay, there's is there any evidence of this? Is there any evidence in the story of Artemis's origin in that giving us women dominating men? There's zero evidence, zero evidence that women dominated men in Ephesus. It's the opposite. Zero evidence that women dominated men in the Ephesian cult of Artemis. It's the opposite. So that so already this can't get off the ground because that that wasn't the case. But here's a thought. We have the same story of Artemis's creation, Artemis's, I don't even want to use the word creation, Artemis's origin story, because we'll find this is not a creation story. That's deceptive language that Glan is using. Um, we have the same story of Artemis 
It's everywhere. Everybody who worships Artemis thinks that she came out the same way and that that's how she started her first, then Apollo next. Nobody thinks that this results in women having authority over men. Nobody else. So why assume it's there in Ephesus? It's just weird. Here's a quote from uh, Sandra Glan, who kind of admits this. She says, still, in the minds of those referring to her in the first and second centuries, Artemis Ephesia had the same backstory as every other Artemis. They all had the same backstory. Even different Artemises, they had the same backstory. Didn't result in feminism anywhere else. Artemis worshippers around the Greco-Roman world did not take this as female super superiority over men. This is a 21st century, like reading things into the past that we want to see there. It's like when you get modern movies where they put like a, all these feminist ideals into these characters from like five, six hundred, a thousand years ago. And then they represent like 21st century college educated Westerner in like ancient Rome walking around going like, you know, you don't have to stand for that kind of thing. Um, this is this is uh, anachronism. It's not history. It's it's not right. So the first thing you have to think is that the Artemis story resulted in women dominating men. That is not true. It's 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 demonstrably false. The second thing you have to think, and this is also false, is that the art the origin of Artemis, where she came from, that this is a natural correspondence to the Genesis creation story of Adam and Eve. This is what Belleville relies on. This is what Glan relies on. This is what others who rely on them rely on. And it's simply not true. Artemis, the, the story that they haven't described in detail, right? I had to go look it up elsewhere to find out what was this origin story that Glan's talking about? What's this origin story that Belleville's, Belleville's referring to? It's not a creation narrative. It's a birth story of just how Artemis was born, right? Ephesus exists. Literally, there's already a city there. Humans are all there. They're still around. They already exist. This is where Artemis, the deity, came from. And it's not like monotheism, like this eternal deity. No, no. This is just like a superpower being, right? Artemis's mom, Leto, is, is pregnant. She travels around from place to place looking for a safe place to give birth. She lands in Ephesus. She gives birth. First out comes Artemis. Artemis then helps her mom in delivering Apollo, her brother. Does, uh, does Artemis take role even, even over Apollo? No. She doesn't have some higher authority than Apollo even in the story. Right? So unlike the Genesis narrative, which does imply, we've talked about this in video number two, um, there's a higher role of male authority. In, in, the, in Genesis 2 even, not just after the fall, but in Genesis 2, that seems to be in the text. And I think that's how they would have understand it, understood it at the time. But this is not the case with the Artemis story. It, this is all fabricated stuff. It's all, in a sense, a waste of time. Okay, I'm wasting your time, but we're, really what I'm doing is I'm undoing the waste of time that has been caused by certain interpretations that are just not correct. So one, the origin of Artemis did not result in women dominating men. Number two, the origin of Artemis is not a creation, a story, and it does not correspond to Genesis. And so Paul in 1 Timothy is not counteracting how Artemis was born by talking about where Adam and Eve came from. Paul's talking about male and female relations, and we, we have many people who want to think he's talking about Artemis. And every part of it falls apart. So how does Sandra Glan see this passage kind of in the long run, in the big picture, after she's kind of done the work that I, I would say doesn't give us the right grid for understanding this passage, but what, what was her conclusion on it? So she would say, and I'll put verses uh, 13 and 14 on your screen here so you could see them and think about it as I explain what her view of this is, that Paul is not offering principles, he's offering a story. That That's a powerful quote from Glan. Paul isn't offering principles, he's offering a story. I don't quite understand the logic here um, because, of course, often when you're offering a story, you're offering principles. There, there isn't an either or here, right? When just saying, here's a story, Adam was formed first, then Eve, right? There's a story. It's not just a story, right? This is authoritative God, how he made man and woman and how that impacts the way men and women should interact today. In the passage, Paul's like, hey, look, let a woman do this with this, you know, submissiveness. I don't permit teaching, having authority, remain quiet. And then here's the reason, because Adam was formed first. What is this? But principles and a story or a fact of historical revelation that uh, assures us these principles are actually valid and true. So it's both. Paul's doing both. Um, so that doesn't really make sense. That's an odd either or thinking, which I see frequently in egalitarian writings is an either or. It's not this, it's that. Not this, it's that. But often, it could be both of those things. The second thing that Glan concludes is that the story is not meant to show women are in any kind of different role, at least related to authority, than men are. 
it is to show that they're equal. Okay, so let me put this back on your screen. This phrase, right, Adam was formed first, then Eve. Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. This is meant to show they are the same. That's the conclusion. They're not to show there's a difference, but to show they're the same. Does that does that play out in your in your mind as you read this passage? It doesn't play out in my mind. I don't think it works. Her idea is that um, it's not establishing male authority. It's simply running counter to female authority. Because again, she sees this hyper-feminist Artemis thing going on, creation story and all this stuff that doesn't exist in reality and history. But because she sees that, this is merely the corrective. And that doesn't seem to be the case. Even if Artemis is being contrasted with Eve, which I'm, I'm confident she's not, um, this isn't an egalitarian contrast. This is all one, it's weighted one way. It's Adam was formed first, then Eve. Adam was not deceived, but Eve was deceived. These statements are meant to establish a sense of difference in role related to authority between men and women. And these principles are meant to establish that in the church, in the way the church functions. Whether I like that or not is a separate question. The text seems clear. Now, I'm going to get way more into this. A lot more questions we're going to ask about why Paul's quoting Adam and Eve, and we're going to go through other possible egalitarian interpretations. But um, but let's just summarize what we've done so far with the Artemis stuff, because I think we're getting close to being done with Artemis. So the Artemis story is not a creation narrative. There is no creation narrative in the Artemis story here. She's born, her husband, or her husband, her brother, not her consort, her husband, is born, but that's it. It's not saying anything about women in general. It didn't result in any sort of women's special women's rights that we're aware of in history in any location, to my knowledge. The mother, Leto, was pregnant with twins from Zeus. She gives birth to Artemis first, who then, as, as many pagan gods, she's born fully matured. She's born with, you know, like almost like an a, adult god. And she helps with eight days of labor that her mother goes through to give birth to Apollo. But to my knowledge, it doesn't result in her having any authority over Apollo in that regard or especially women having authority over men. That's just made up stuff. The Artemis story is not a creation narrative. It's also not a man or woman couple. And I want to highlight again, a I think, problematic, I'm trying to use nice words, <laughs> problematic quote from Linda Belleville. Imagine if you didn't know the things I told you and you read this from her, how she muddies things. She says it was believed, quote, that Artemis appeared first and then her male consort. However, the biblical story is just the opposite. Adam was formed first than Eve, right? So again, we're combining the opposites to equal equality. Like that doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but you, you got to wonder how would Paul establish some sort of ma ma male role? Like what words could he use that wouldn't be interpreted as just, well, that's egalitarian um, with these principles in place. But look at this. It was believed that Artemis appeared first. By using that word appeared first, we avoid the fact that it's her birth and not her creation. We avoid the fact that it's not the beginning of women, it's just the birth of Artemis. We also avoid, with this phrase, then her consort, we avoid the fact that it, Apollo was her brother and not her consort, not a husband. This is again the use of the consort language in a strange way in Belleville's writings. Apollo is her brother, not her consort. I think this phrase appeared changes our understanding, it muddies it, and the phrase consort distorts our understanding so that when she then brings up Adam and Eve, it feels like a parallel to you. Why does she have to use misleading language? Because it's not a parallel, because it doesn't really work. This is misleading people about the nature of the meaning of scripture on a passage that just happens to run 100% counter to pop thinking today. It's culturally offensive. And so here's a new interpretation. But I don't think egalitarians realize how dangerous this stuff is. Um, this historical filter, here's a new thing I'll just mention. It is it is potentially going to backfire on them because if, if the egalitarians are half right, which they're not even half right, but if they were half right, they would still be completely wrong in their final view. Because right, what they're doing is they're having a historical view and that view is meant to establish an interpretation. If they're only half right in their history, then, then their interpretation is 100% wrong. Let me explain. They do not just need a feminist Ephesus. They need a hyper-feminist Ephesus. I mean feminism beyond that which we see today in modern 21st century countries. Not, the, not even that kind of feminism is going to be enough to establish their views of 1 Timothy. They need hyper-feminism. They need women 
who are dominating over men, not just saying equal rights, not just saying there's no authority differences between men and women in marriage, not just saying anything like that. They need women who are saying, we are in charge, men, you submit to us. That's the natural and right order of things. And that's that has never existed in Ephesus. Um, and it will backfire if they don't get it. So here's Nijay Gupta who says, there we go. Here's the quote who says, uh, this could explain why Paul wrote to Timothy that he must intervene in a situation where Ephesian Christian women were trying to be domineering, not because they were striving for equality with male leaders, right? Cause that wouldn't be enough for their view. He says, but because they were trying to overpower them influenced by a spirit of female strength. And the Jay Gupta is sort of dancing around the idea that I'm pointing out here. If it's merely an ancient version of egalitarianism, then your first Timothy two interpretation doesn't work. You need women dominating men. You need women taking in charge of men because if women in Ephesus were merely looking for egalitarian views, modern egalitarian views, then Paul would be arguing against those. And that's what you want him to defend. You need him to argue against women who are just saying we're the bosses of all things. And this, of course, there's no support for such an extreme view. That situation didn't exist in the ancient world in Ephesus. Um, I don't know if it existed anywhere on the planet in the ancient world, at least certainly not in Ephesus. I'd be, be interesting to, to, to read about places where it may have actually happened. They need women domineering over men, not simply failing to believe in traditional roles. Zero support for that view. So if they're half right, they're completely wrong. That's the point. Okay, before we move on from the Artemis stuff, we got to cover a, sort of a group of arguments that try to connect First Timothy to the whole Artemis background issue. What I've done so far is I've mostly focused on the idea that the Artemis background in First Timothy uh, in that setting, it simply doesn't give you anything to use that can change your understanding of First Timothy. But there's, an, there's another disconnect, which is specific points of correspondence in the text that show that Paul's not dealing with something else. Why would I think that he's talking about Artemis in First Timothy? We talked about a little bit of it, like the use of the word soter or savior, right? And how that is something Paul uses commonly, even more commonly outside of First Timothy. So you shouldn't see it as an anomaly in First Timothy and think that because Artemis was called Savior, Paul's referring to Artemis in First Timothy chapter one. But there are other people who will take sort of a generic thing we see in First Timothy and they go, ah, here's a hint that this whole book has Artemis in the background. Paul, for whatever reason, he just doesn't want to say the name of a false god. And I've heard one, one person say, well, Paul never uses the names of these false deities. He just hints at them. And so you, you, now you have to look for hints for Artemis. Now that can be legitimate. I'm not laughing at the, the prospect of looking for such hints, but I do giggle a little bit at the quality of the hints that they actually find. So Gary Hogue is an example of someone who does this. He quotes a work that shows women decorated their hair with gold during a festival to Artemis. So first century women, yeah, they're doing a festival to Artemis and they put gold in their hair. And he then says, that's why first Timothy two nine says what it says. Let's look at the passage. First Timothy 2.9, also women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair and gold. Maybe the cult of Artemis is what Paul, now that's possible. Okay, this is possible. But against this, here's a summary, against this, and I won't go through all the quotes, the text that he quotes, it does not show the hairstyles mean anything in relation to the cult. He simply is talking about a festival and how an ancient person acknowledged that women were wearing nice hairstyles at the time. You see, in first in the first century, wearing gold in your hair was just a fancy hairstyle that wasn't associated with a particular cult or religion. It's like wearing a suit and tie. So if I told about some Artemis event, you know, and I was like, well, and all the men were wearing ties. And then someone goes, well, Paul mentioned ties in First Timothy. So ties must be a connection to Artemis cult. You see, in modern times, you realize that no, ties just mean fancy event. That's all it means. That's what the gold hair thing meant. Also, the text gives a reason for why women wore their hair with this sort of gold braiding mixed into it. The text says they did this because people would look for husbands and wives at the festival. So they were dolling themselves up to look pretty. It wasn't about Artemis. It was about a love connection. <laughs> and the third thing is it was common across that culture to consider such hairstyles immodest. They across the culture, they considered braided hair with gold an immodest hairstyle no matter where you were. There's nothing particularly Artemisian about the hairstyle. Then there's people who will offer a group of things, and Andrew Bartlett is one of them. Andrew Bartlett, a scholar who promotes uh, egalitarian views, 
or a writer. I don't, I don't know what his credentials are. I don't care. I will consider his views the same as anybody else's. I hope you do the same for me. <laughs> um, so Andrew Bartlett says there are numerous implied cross links between the text of first Timothy and the known and known religious life of Ephesus. So we're going to look at four of the ones that he offers. First, deacons are required to hold the mystery of the faith, not the mysteries of Artemis and other pagan deities who worshipped in Ephesus. So here, for Bartlett's first example, we have Paul using the term mystery. So in the cult of Artemis, the term mystery was a special term, and they used it a lot, and it was the mysteries of Artemis. Okay, Paul does seem to use this as a way of saying Christ is better, Christ is true, and he might even be using the term mystery to talk about how the religious views and beliefs and practices within Christianity were the genuine article compared to the fake stuff in the mystery cults of the time. However, there were tons of mystery cults and there's nothing specially Artemisian about the phrase mystery. There was that term mystery would be used kind of like we use the term religious or liturgy or laity or priesthood. We use these terms and we apply them across all kinds of religions. And that's the same way they use the term mystery. So that doesn't really imply specifically Artemis. The second point he says is Ephesians loudly claimed that Artemis was megas, that's the Greek, and it means great. And that's in Acts 19 where they're like, great is Diana of the Ephesians or great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Same person, different name. And he says, but Paul affirms that Jesus Christ, who embodied the mystery of godliness, is megas, is great. Actually, um, here Bartlett slightly changes the meaning of what Paul said. In 1 Timothy 3.16, Paul actually says that something else is great. He says, great is the mystery of godliness. Great indeed is the mystery of godliness. That, that is this revelation about the truth of Christ. And when Paul uses the term mystery here, he's not using it in the term of, um, we have secret religious rituals. That's how the mystery cults would tend to do it. They have secret, only the initiated could know about these secret rituals. Paul's using it in a different meaning, a different sense. It's not even the cultic sense. He's using it here to refer to something that was once hidden that is now revealed that everybody knows right? It's, it's, it's more like revelation. He's using it the way you, you'd think the revelation of godliness. Great is the thing that God has revealed. And it's that Jesus was manifested in the flesh and all that. But the point is that um, it is not actually Jesus that is great in this passage. I mean, Jesus is great. Don't get me wrong. But it's not Jesus that's said to be great in this passage. It's the mystery of godliness that's said to be great, which is the gospel and the truth of Christ. This breaks the parallel. Meaning that he can't be going, it's not Artemis that's great, it's Jesus that's great. That's how Bartlett seems to interpret Paul here. But Paul's not doing that. His parallel doesn't work that way. The third example is, the believers are con a congregation of, quote, a living God, not of a lifeless idol. Now that sounds like it could be a com comparison, at least to idols in general. Maybe not Artemis specifically. There's nothing specifically about Artemis so far about any of this stuff, but... Maybe, but let, let's let's look at the verse. Let's look at the verse. Verse 3, uh, 15. Um, you know, how you ought to behave in the household of God. Referring to the household of God, he says, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. So, is there any reference to idols here? No. The passage doesn't mention idols at all. If he had said the church of the living God, not of a dead idol, then that would be a reference to idols. And then you could see idols in the passage. But simply calling God the living God does not mean we should read some sort of like Artemis context behind the book of First Timothy. We're reaching here. We're reaching here for things that are just you you can't you can't learn that much. It's kind of like if you if you look out into the night and, and you see almost complete darkness and you're like, well, there could be a gang out there coming after me right now. Like it's, maybe there could be, but you need some sort of positive evidence to see it there. You shouldn't just assume that what could be there is there. There's no specific mention of Artemis. There's no indication that idols are thought of in this passage. And the fourth thing that uh, he gives, I'll put that quote back on your screen, is in chapter four, verse seven through 10, there is an implied contrast of true godliness with false teachings and devotion to Artemis specifically to Artemis. So he sees a implied contrast to Artemis in 1 Timothy 4, verses uh, 7 through 10. The quote is, we have put our hope in a living God who is a savior of all people. 
The contrast with Artemis then would be this uh, idea of God lives and 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 He's the Savior, and Artemis is is called Savior, and so it's a contrast. Paul uses the phrase "living God." I looked up each time Paul uses it just to consider this possibility. Is he using it in a special sense to indicate something more than the fact that God is the God who lives? Um, and he uses it six times in total. Of the six times Paul uses it, only one of them has any clear contrast with idols in general, meaning that the other five times you would have to like assume an idol is in the background of the thinking there. There's no reference to idols. The context doesn't imply idols. Only one time does he actually do that. And none of the six times is there any contrast with Artemis in particular, except using the term savior, which of course is, I think, going out on, on, a, on a limb on a limb it's not like you'd walk up to someone and, and you go jesus jesus is my savior and they go you're insulting artemis like they're not going to think that that it's too common of a phrase savior it's used of all sorts of things how many of these terms that people will say you know artemis is being referenced in first timothy how many of these terms sound to you like they should be specifically considered to be about artemis right it's great lord savior mystery or idol those are the words this doesn't justify putting Artemis an Artemis filter over 1 Timothy 2 so much that it radically changes your understanding of what seems to be the obvious meaning of the passage. Yeah, none of those are specifically about Artemis. So if Artemis isn't the overarching uh, thing, the backdrop of what 1 Timothy is about, if it's not about Artemis, what might it actually be about? There's a bunch of elements that Paul targets. I'm just going to race through, mention a few of them now. I'll go into more detail on this later when we talk about the false teaching theory the bunch of female false teachers theory that comes will come much later in the video. Um, so here we are, um, elements Paul targets. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 3 through 11, he targets non-Christian doctrine. It, generally, that could be anything that's not Christian doctrine, um, so that's not specific. Myths, which could be anything, of course, that is not true stories. Uh, endless genealogies, which is probably a Jewish stuff. There's no known relation to the Artemis cult with endless genealogies. So the first thing he says that's specific relates to Jewish extra biblical Jewish teachings um, and teaching the law of Moses wrongly. Much of chapter one is, is a warning about the wrongness of misusing the law of Moses. That has nothing to do with the Artemis cult. That would seem to be related to a Jewish background of false teaching that Paul is dealing with. In first Timothy four verses one through five, false teaching is dealt with again. And it's the idea of forbidding marriage. Um, now there's a debate on did the cult of Artemis forbid marriage? It's not really clear that they did. It's not clear that they didn't. Um, it seems as though that it's it, it, that's a possible influence. It's underestablished. Okay, so I'm open. The, the jury's out on that. Okay, it's we might show Sandra Glan's working towards that. She's trying to show that she thinks that there was an ascetic influence in the cult of Artemis. That perhaps they require their priests to not be married. That kind of thing. It's just not clear. The eunuch priesthood of Artemis seems to date back further. Uh, previously before the time of Paul doesn't seem to be the case during the first century to my knowledge. And so, yeah, there's a problem with this though. Ascetic influences, people who forbid marriage, this is like a known wide reaching problem in the ancient world, far beyond the cult of Artemis. And so we know, we read about it in first Corinthians. There's other passages in other cities that are dealing with this. Nobody reads first Corinthians and goes, well, there must've been an Artemis cult in Corinth because we're, we're reaching here. We have under established things. Um, ascetic influences were known to be a wide problem. And 1 Timothy 2 verse 18, excuse me, uh, 2 Timothy 2 18 relates to this. Again, he's writing to Ephesus again. He talks about those who have swerved from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already happened. Why do I say that? We know one of the false teachings that was going around was this idea that the resurrection was already happening. That this, this is what some scholars call over-realized eschatology or basically thinking that like you're further along in, in time events than you really are. You may have experienced some people who think that uh, in your life. And so there are some who maybe in Corinth were thinking this. There's a very popular view that this was a major problem in Corinth. It fits the first century evidence as well that basically people were thinking, I'm not going to get married because Jesus said there's no marriage in heaven. We're already, we're already there. We're already, we have our over-realized eschatology. We think we're further along in the end times than we really are. So marriage is no longer a thing. So I'm not going to be with my wife if I am married. I will just stay celibate and that kind of thing. And Paul writes like, don't do that, guys. This is this is not the right time, effectively. Um, what I'm saying is we have this, we shouldn't look at Ephesus and go, 
forbidding to marry. That might be an Artemis thing. It's under-established. But we, it's a known thing that was affecting lots of cities at the time for other reasons, like over-realized eschatology. And we have hints in 2 Timothy that that's exactly what was happening in Ephesus. So not evidence of an Artemis background. Uh, 1 Timothy 4 also mentions forbidding certain foods, forbidding certain foods, and that implies Jewish issues, not Artemis issues. Okay, there seems to be a strong Jewish source of false teaching that Paul's dealing with in 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy 4, 7, it tells Timothy, have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths, rather train yourself for godliness. Again, this is uh, the word myth is warned against, probably extra biblical stuff in general, not specifically Artemis. In 1 Timothy 6, verses 3 through 5, Paul warns against any different doctrine. This is generic, meaning Paul didn't have a specific false teaching in mind. He was worried about any and all kinds of false teaching. Difficult to see specifically Artemis behind that. Teaching that neglects godly living. He also warned against that. And he warned against money grubbing, which is also a very generic statement. And then 1 Timothy 6, 20 and 21, Paul finally warns against any detours into any unestablished doctrine. Sola Scriptura. And he's he giving him giving this instruction, Paul shows us that we see general warnings against anything that's not Christian truth and some specific warnings that connect to Jewish influences and over-realized eschatology. But the cult of Artemis does not seem to be a dominant thing in 1 Timothy. So here's conclusions on the Artemis stuff. If you read the Artemis cult into the background of 1 Timothy 2, I believe it is provably unjustified. It is demonstrably wrong to do so. Doesn't mean it couldn't have had any influence, but it should not be seen to have the kind of influence that would have you reinterpreting the passage to mean something different than what it appears to mean on the surface. We should at least avoid doing this, uh, reading Artemis in the background to the point where it radically changes your interpretation of any of the passages in the text. And that's what egalitarians need to support any sort of Artemis approach to re-understanding this passage. Another conclusion here is we do not see any reason any reason, legitimate reason, to think that in 1 Timothy 2, in these relevant sections, that Paul was referencing the cult of Artemis. I don't see that at all. Uh, such readings make up a fictional, hyper-feminist Ephesus situation that simply didn't exist in reality. Such readings not only add a context that isn't there, but they also remove the context that is there, right? Because Paul's not making a ruling based on Artemis, but based on Eden. And by shifting our focus to Artemis and Apollo and all this stuff, we're losing what Paul's actually talking about, which is Adam and Eve and how that justifies verses 11 and 12 and how he says, I allow women to do this. Don't allow this. These are things that are offensive in our culture. We'll talk more about that later, especially in the next video, but we shouldn't try to change what it means. Finally, even if there was some kind of feminist Ephesus Paul was reacting to, even if you could say that there was women taking charge and this sort of thing, I still don't see how the egalitarian interpretation wins because Paul doesn't establish egalitarianism. He establishes this idea of Adam was formed first and Eve was deceived and Adam wasn't. He establishes this sort of women are to have this role, men are to have this role, exactly the thing that that, that I understand. I'm inclined to try to fight against it too. I just realized that my intuitions being shaped by my culture are wrong. I'm missing something important that God wants us to get, to have healthy churches and healthy families and Christ honoring relationships. The center of the whole debate boils down to this one question. In 1 Timothy 2.12 is the phrase, have authority, a wrong translation. Now, I'm not exaggerating, I don't believe at all, one iota, when I say that this is the hot epicenter of the debate that is really consuming a large amount of scholarship right now. So much so that Craig Blomberg says, that with verse 12, we come to what may be the single most scrutinized verse of scripture in recent scholarship. And he doesn't just mean complementarian egalitarian scholarship, but in recent scholarship, right? Of, of all biblical scholarship, this is like the single most scrutinized verse, which means that there's a massive amount of data about this passage. But the one word in the whole verse, in all of verse 12, that gets the most attention is this one word that's translated, have authority or exercise authority here in the ESV. This word, authenteo or authentain, don't worry about the differences there. They're not really relevant to English speakers anyways at the moment. We'll get into that. But this one word, 
we're going to go over to it, go over it in great detail. And I'm going to be sharing with you even some new scholarship stuff where I even hired a scholar to help translate some ancient stuff just to kind of get a, get the full picture so that we actually have as up to date information as possible. And we'll understand what this word means, but let me <clears throat> explain to you why this is such a hot word or a, a hotly debated word. Um, so it's what's called, the scholars call it a hapax legomena. Okay, what's a hapax legomena? It means it's a word that's only used one time in the New Testament. That that means that what? That means the word's difficult to understand. See, if Paul uses the word 15, 20 times, you have 15 examples of him using it. You can You can see what he means by this word. If one context is unclear, another one clears it up. But what if a word's only used once by that author? What if it's only used once ever in the entire New Testament, then it gets a special name. Oh, Hapax Legomena. It's only used one time. And it's not just the New Testament. In the Old Testament, it's not used at all, not in the Old Testament proper. It's only used even outside the Bible. If you go to like the 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 time the, the time window around Paul the Apostle, basically up until 312 AD, 312, that's a pretty big window, right? It's only used eight times in surviving documents that we have translated that we're, we're aware of right now. Eight times. That includes First Timothy. So this is a super rare word. This this exact word, authentane, the, the exact word that Paul uses. Now, there's other words that are similar to it, that are related to it. We call those cognates. We'll talk about some of those words too. But this has led to a group of diverse definitions. And so different scholars say, well, well it means different things. Th these are actual definitions for authentane that scholars give exercise authority or assume authority. Someone would say incite violence, right? We'll talk about that. Murder. Well, what if 1 Timothy 2 was translated, I do not permit a woman to teach or to murder a man. <laughs> that, would, that would change things, wouldn't it? Then, then we would just be wondering what he meant by teach. Um, others say it means to dominate or to get one's way. Perpetrator or originator or author. Now, these are not all legit in my opinion. Some scholars, they multiply meanings beyond necessity and a lot of scholarship, and I say this as getting your foot in the door on this is a little little awkward at first, but you'll you'll see as we keep going through, and hopefully I can do a good job explaining it, you will see that some scholars, they rope in the largest number of definitions, but then they don't do the proper diligence of weeding out ones that really don't apply to 1 Timothy 2. And they start sort of borrowing meanings from all these different possible meanings. Some of these are not even all that legit. And they sort of bring it into 1 Timothy 2, altering our understanding of the verse. But the, this process is sloppy. It's it's sloppy on the part of a lot of people who are doing it. Not that they're not thorough in their work. Their work is thorough. There's lots of details. There's lots of data. But it's then sloppily brought in without sort of vetting which definitions should actually be applied. Anyway, we're, you'll understand this stuff as we keep going. But you can get how, it, simply put, this would totally change your understanding of 1 Timothy 2.12. Right. This is some of the different scholars and their views. So Linda Belleville, she would understand it to mean, I do not permit a woman to teach a man in a dominating way. Boom. That's egalitarianism because we don't want anyone to teach others in a dominating way. So this has nothing to do with gender distinctions. They're just dealing with some sort of problem. We're not really sure what it was. That's all. Um, Philip Payne says, I'm not permitting a woman to teach and assume authority over a man. Well, if it doesn't mean have authority, but it means assume authority, and Payne translate this, understands this to mean um, to assume to yourself authority that has not been properly given. So we're talking about someone who just sort of tries to take over without permission. Oh yeah, but nobody should do that. So again, changes our understanding of the passage. The Krogers would say um, that a woman is not allowed to teach or to represent herself as originator of man. Um, this is this doesn't work, but we'll get into why later. Wilshire says, I do not permit a woman to teach or to initiate violence over a man. Wilshire, who did an extensive study of, Althen, of Althentane and Althenteo, the related words. Uh, Kostenberger says, I do not permit a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man, which is more of the traditional view. But you get the idea. Totally changes your understanding of the passage. It's definitely worth digging into. The meaning of this word is very important. The meaning is difficult to to ascertain on some level because it's so rarely used. And so it's an important, worthwhile pivot point on how we understand First Timothy and what men's and women's roles are in the Christian church because everyone should agree that this is at least one of the strongest passages historically used to support complementarian or patriarchal views. 
So complementarians, interestingly, if you look at the lay of the land, just like the definitions I gave you, one of them was a complementarian position. And complementarians and patriarchalists, they tend to agree on the meaning of the term. They tend to think it means exercise authority, have authority, or step into authority, though not wrongly, not not self-assumed, but rather to enter into an, a role of authority, like be appointed. Um, but egalitarians, they do not tend to agree on the meaning of the term. Uh, they have a variety of views, as I've showed you some of the views on the screen there. One thing, though, they pretty much always agree on is that whatever it means, it's pejorative. It's a pejorative meaning, meaning that authentane, whatever that means, it's something that is something nobody should ever do. It's not just about women. It's something negative. It's never just, it's not just say have authority. It's rather have some sort of negative use of authority, have some sort of uh, improperly assumed authority. It's something's bad about it. Paul, according to pretty much every egalitarian on this word, not every, but most, Paul isn't forbidding authority from, uh, forbidding women from having authority, but from some specific bad act or bad use of authority, such that would be wrong for a man to do too. So he's only telling women not to do something he would tell men not to do as well. It's not gender specific. There's some situation, whatever's going on. We've talked about some of that. At any rate, two questions then dominate our study. These two questions to try to simplify this super complicated topic as best I can. One, does this word authentane carry the meaning uh, carry a meaning related to authority or is it related to something else like inciting violence or being a perpetrator or something like that representing yourself as the originator of, of something um, or is it somehow related to authority okay then there's the second question and this is this is the, your, the first question helps us out the second question is where really the rubber meets the road and that is does this term have a pejorative connotation is it somehow negative automatically. When Paul uses it, does he pick this word instead of a, another word for authority, exousia or something? Does he pick this word because this word has a negative connotation and he's only saying, I don't allow a woman to have this kind of negative authority over a man as opposed to having authority over a man. So that's pretty. that's a pretty big deal. So first, let's look at a common and rather shocking claim to step into this, to get our feet wet on the, on the issue of authentane, authenteo, all that. Does this mean murder? Um, I've seen not only in scholarly writings, but also on like Twitter and 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 I guess we don't call it that anymore. <laughs> now I'm dating this whole video just by saying that. But at any rate, I've seen on social media, people say things like, well, you know, it's not have authority. It's been translated wrong. It refers to murder. It's about violence. So this passage has nothing to do with authority. Now, usually those people never will answer. Well, then what is Paul saying women shouldn't do? <laughs> because the more they talk, the more... That translation sounds kind of silly. Paul's like, I don't allow women to murder men or something. But the basic idea is they want to say this murder term, if you go to the more scholarly side of things, it doesn't mean that Paul's telling women not to murder, but it does mean that the word authentane has a negative connotation, just like murder has a negative connotation. So they're trying to take the meaning of murder and just take sort of a piece of it, a flavor of it, and bring it into 1 Timothy 2. Is that legit? So does the word mean murder? Um, it really was used that way. We do have examples of it being used that way in a broad sense. Now, I, I have to now just say, hey, we have the, the verb, which is what's used in 1 Timothy, but then there's also the noun, that's authentes. That word was used of murder, and it's related to the verb, right? The noun and the verb are related. They're not the same, though, and that's important to know. Many scholars pass over that issue. But it really was used to speak of murder, specifically a specific kind of murder, not any murder, but a kin murderer, someone who kills someone they're related to or kills someone who has their own blood, so to speak. And that way, it could even be used for suicide for someone who kills themselves. That was the typical usage, a specific kind of murder. Now, the noun is not the verb. I got to point this out again because there are full-on articles that will talk in detail about authentase and authenteo and authentane and all these things, but they don't make any distinction between the nouns and the verbs. And that way, we lose the fact that we just don't see the verb being used in this sense. But it does show up in lexicons. So check this out. In the LSJ, this is a very reputable, useful lexicon for understanding ancient Greek and Koine Greek and it's one of the definitions is one who commits murder for this same word that we see, the same, broadly speaking, the same word in um, 1 Timothy 2. Thayer's Greek-English lexicon says, 
earlier usage is one who with his own hands kills either others or himself and like again more often it would be kin murderer but but still there's some it, it's murder notice how it says earlier usage let's keep that in mind because that's really kind of important um but then the word study new testament dictionary it says murderer a self-appointed killer with one's own hand interesting interesting okay so th- definitely the word has that murder connotation now this might shake you Maybe it doesn't mean have authority or maybe it means something else. We'll apply that later. But we even have some ancient Greek sources that tell us it refers to murder. This is, comes as a surprise to a lot of people. Here is a second century source, Harpocration. He says it means murder. Phrenicus says one who murders by his own hand. Hesychius of Alexandria, murderer. Aelus, the murderer by his own hand. Uh, notice that some of these are near Paul's time. Second century AD, that's pretty close to Paul. He's first, so that's not too far off. Now, what do some people do with this? This is the part that's real important. I think it's agreed on all all counts. Everyone agrees. I don't know anybody who denies that it meant murder at some point. But what did they do with it? That's the important bit. Linda Belleville says, this idea that authentes meant murder should give us pause in opting for the translation to exercise or to have authority over. Simply put, this murder usage should be read into Paul's definition of the verb usage in 1 Timothy 2.12. Leland Wilshire uh, says he rejects the idea that, quote, the idea of murder is not integral to the basic meaning of the word, which which I know this just sounds like a doublespeak, but basically it seems like he's saying the idea of murder is integral, right? He's at least keeping that as something that we have to consider we can't reject. it's, it's It's a soft way of basically saying let's keep that meaning murder on the table when we're in first timothy 2 12 and this weighs in heavily on his translation of incite violence i mean he's one of the only guys who says this and i've seen multiple scholars who are like incite violence but he he would say first timothy 2 paul's saying i don't let women incite violence over men (laughs) okay i'm I'm sorry to to giggle i'm at the i'm at the end of my studies okay when i I was took his all arguments seriously after having studied it and i'll share with you all the stuff that i that I've gone through, um, now I see it as uh, uh, not not good, <laughs> not, not a good not a good thing to do. All right, so Philip Payne he uses this idea that murder was a meaning of authentes to suggest that Paul has a pejorative meaning in mind in First Timothy two. He says, as Shan Train noted, the authent word root, root words are typically strong and emotionally laden words with negative or dominating overtones, such as murderer, domestic murderer, perpetrator, or autocrat. Um, really, the, the the ones we should focus on. Oh, there's so much we could talk about with just this one quote. But notice he takes the idea of murder and he's saying this should flavor our understanding in First Timothy two. I've seen people online say that this alone, this idea that murder is there in the history of the word it proves that first timothy 2 is not complementarian and so i think this is all very clumsy uh, in the long run it leaves out really important pieces of information and the first thing you have to understand is this here's the one of the first really important things to bring clarity into what i think is widespread scholarly confusion on one side of the aisle it's not completely spread through because there's some egalitarians who don't follow this route but it's it's there among a number of them Uh, So the first thing to understand is this. There's more than one version of Greek. Greek is a language that changed over time. There's what Paul was writing in, which is called Koine Greek. Common. That word Koine means common. It's the common Greek of Paul's time. Then there is where we see this word murder used, and that is in Attic or an older classical Greek. It's older Greek. It's before the time of Paul. And then we have to ask the question of whether or not that old meaning had bearing on the current usage of the term in Paul's time, and we're going to get into a lot of detail on that. So let's talk about Greek just a little bit. <laughs> okay, more than just a little bit. But um, but I think you can handle this. I think you got this, all right? I know something of those who are watching, and even if you're watching right now and you're thinking there's parts of this I can't get, you will know so much more at the end of this than you did at the beginning. There'll be parts you got, and those parts will be very valuable to you. So stick with me here even if it's a little bit rough. I understand. I've had to learn this stuff too. 
So classical Greek is not Koine Greek. They are two different kinds of Greek. Here, this is from uh, Bill Mounts, who is a, quite an expert on this area. He says the form of Greek used by writers from Homer, from the 8th century through the 4th century BC, Homer through Plato, is called classical Greek. Classical Greek. Now, if you move forward in time, Paul's group of people, they're not using classical Greek anymore. They're using this koine, this common Greek. J. Treat, another scholar, tells us a little bit about the difference. He says, generally, it may be said that there are many shifts in the meanings of words and in the frequency of their usage. The meanings of words and the frequency of their usage. Now, authentes is definitely one of those words. I'll give you lots of evidence for this shortly. So there were still some people using classical definitions. You got to understand there's a group of people actually in Paul's time even and after Paul who were trying to go back to those old school language, that vibe that they got from classical. You know, if you're writing really like high literature, you might be trying to appeal to the old classical terms, the meanings of the words. It's kind of like somebody today writing in sort of King James English style. It you know, it doesn't mean that people today are doing that, but there's always a group of people who will pray that way, who will talk that way a little bit, who will preach that way, who will write that way. And those people do not represent normal usage. That's the important bit. This is going on in Paul's time. There's a group of people called Atticists, and they do not represent the normal usage. This is, again, where I think many egalitarian scholars have brought confusion to people on the topic of the meaning of authentes and authenteo and authentain and all the authent stuff. Don't worry about each one. All right. Paul says authentain. That's the word that we're ultimately worried about. At any rate, the Atticists, who were they? Um, again, they're not normal Greek speakers. They're writers who try to ignore, catch this, deliberately, purposely ignore current usage of words and not even use them in the way that normal people do in order to resurrect and reuse old classical usage of terms. And they even got this wrong sometimes. Sometimes they misunderstood the classical usage and got it wrong, but it was their effort. It was their attempt to be old school at the time. Every writer we have, here's a, here's a big, here's a big bombshell drop. Okay. Every writer we have who uses authentes for murder that is in the Koine period, every one of them shows signs of being an atticist, of being someone who's trying to get the attic usage, who's trying to go back into the attic, <laughs> pun intended, and pull out these old terms and use them in old ways that are dead to the common people. Paul shows none of those signs in his writings. He's not an atticist. He's not writing classical stuff. He's writing normal language, normal, normal people talk. That's how he's doing it. We need to look at how normal people talked at Paul's time to understand the usage of this term, not how writers with what they call literary pretensions. This is the term I keep seeing in the scholarship with literary pretensions who are these atticists are doing it. That That's not, that's not relevant. So we have uh, Wilshire, who again is an egalitarian, but does point out this distinction. He says, from the end of the first century BC was the Atticist movement or second sophistic movement, whose members argued that the only correct Greek was the kind used by classical Attic writers. Now this difference, again, this is, this is from the egalitarian source here. This difference really matters when it comes to understanding authenteo or authentes. What if only these, it was only these Atticists that used the word for murder and nobody else did. Well, then the word wouldn't really, that meaning of the word wouldn't have any impact on 1 Timothy 2, would it? Or at least you, you'd have to have some other evidence to prove it. You couldn't just drag over Atticist's meanings into Paul when Atticists were the weirdos, so to put it bluntly. <laughs> it's like somebody trying to copy King James English when writing a story. It, it's not evidence of the current usage of the words. So when we're evaluating word usage, it's important to ask if the author has literary pretensions, which Paul does not. But what about the other times we see the, the use of murder? So we'll, we'll look at some of those. So here's the important question that I can ask now that we've sort of laid some groundwork there. Um, who around the period of the New Testament, around the time of Paul, who actually uses authentes, the noun, not even the verb, but the noun, who uses it for murder around the time of Paul? Multiple scholars agree that it was only, quote, writers with literary pretensions. Multiple scholars 
I have agreed on this. I haven't heard anybody disagree or, or anybody make a counterclaim on this yet. Not that nobody does. I'm just saying it wasn't common in there, in the literature at least. Um, here's an example. This is from the Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 12, verse 6. Now, the Wisdom of Solomon is not a first century book, or it's not, excuse me, an Old Testament book. It is written around 100 BC, 100 BC approximately, not properly part of the Old Testament. And they did have literary pretensions, but in Wisdom, Wisdom of Solomon 12.6, it says, these parents who murder helpless lives, you will to destroy by the hands of our ancestors. That word murder, that's authentase. That's that same word, a cognate, the noun version of what Paul says. Whoever actually wrote this phrase in the Wisdom of Solomon was trying to copy Attic people. They, they were really trying to tap into that old school Greek. And here we have Walters offering us a quote to support this, who says, According to Gill, a striking feature of this passage is, quote, the great number of words and phrases reminiscent of the language of Greek tragedy, one example of which is authentase. This, this is basically saying, yeah, here we have an example near Paul, 100 BC, but it's clearly trying to copy ancient Greek. It's not even trying to be relevant. So it, it's, a, it's a scholarly mistake to use Wisdom of Solomon to suggest that this meaning is alive in Paul's time. That's the point. To show how out of date this usage was, we actually have other good evidence here. I'll put it on your screen and I'll walk you through it. See, the Wisdom of Solomon written around 100 BC, but then it was translated a little bit later on into other languages. If those people knew that authentic meant murder, they would have no trouble translating it. But here they are still pretty close to Paul and they can't figure out what Wisdom of Solomon's trying to do because it's like, Someone trying to do King James and you just haven't studied those words. It's probably a little bit worse than that, actually. But the Old Latin, 2nd century AD, it translates it with octoris, which probably means progenitors. So they, they didn't know what authentic meant. So they didn't put murder there. The Peshitta, they just skip it because they're not sure what the word means, or at least that's the impression, is in translating it into the Peshitta. They just said, yeah, just skip that word. I don't know what that means. The Armenian has masters, masters or lords. No pejorative connotation. They're just put masters because that's what the word meant to them. The Attic usage, meaning murder, wasn't alive to those people. The Syro Hexapla, uh, Hexapla um, the Syriac, has rulers. The Arabic has suicides. Again, none of these translations quite understood what was what was actually being said. This explains, this explains actually why I was able to show you guys a, a, a slide here earlier with quotes from people around the time of Paul saying authentic meant murder. Where did those four, I think it was four of them, that, where did they come from? These people are atticists. Even, even these lexicographers, these guys that are writing these dictionaries, they're also giving us attic meanings intentionally. So here's a quote from uh, Walters on this. He says, the former, the use of authentic as murderer, is an attic usage which was artificially kept alive by a few authors with literary pretensions, but which has no longer was no longer understood by the great majority of Greek speakers. Now let's look at those authors, those lexicographers in a bit more detail, because here's what you'll find if you go to say like Linda Belleville's work or someone else, they will sometimes quote these same authors I'm giving you, but they only give you part of the information. This to me is, I'm not saying it's malicious at all. I can't, I don't think it is. I think that it's harmful, whether malice is there or not, is, is really irrelevant for the sake of my study. The point is it's harmful to people understanding the truth when you quote people and you only quote them in part. So we're going to look at them in a little bit more detail. These are atticists. Okay, so Phrenicus in the later second century, he offers not one, but two different definitions. Now, one scholar might say, well, Phrenicus says that it means murder, one who murders by his own hand, but he offers two different definitions and they're not the same thing and they don't overlap into each other. One is murder. And the other one is master, despotes, and this is very important. I know it sounds like despot in English, and you think that that's a pejorative term in English, but we're not dealing with English here. Despotes, this is a Greek term, and it's not a pejorative term in Greek. It just means master. It's just the guy that's in charge. In the New Testament, that is not a pejorative meaning. In the first century, second century, this is not a pejorative sense. I can give you some more info on this, on this Phrenicus guy. The late second century AD grammarian Phrenicus in his Ecloga or Selections writes that one should never utilize the word authentic to mean master as was done 
he says, by the rhetoricians of his day in the courts of law, but one should use it only to define persons who murder with their own hand. Okay, this is interesting. Um, Leland Wilshire is the one who, who brought this quote forward, but this is so much more data than you'll get from most of the works you read on this stuff. What's remarkable here is not that he thinks we should use the term for murder, or people at the time should, but it's that he lets us know how people were actually using it. So here's an atticist who wants to insist on old usage that old uses that are out of date, but he gives us a window into a common use, at least by the rhetoricians. They're using it to mean master. See, there are two very different meanings for authentase, one's murder, one's master, and the two do not overlap. That's actually really important. We'll get more into detail there. The point is, it wasn't pejorative. The term he acknowledges, that Phrynichus acknowledges, is used by the rhetoricians. Master is not pejorative at all. Let's go to another one. This is a guy named Morris. In the early 3rd century AD, he said that authentain in Hellenic speech means autodicane in Attic. All right. I know that just sounds like gibberish. I'm going to walk you through it right now, one step at a time. But first, let's look at a quote from Melinda Belleville, who explains what she thinks of this um, and what she thinks you should think of this. She says, second century lexicographer Morris states that authentase has become commonplace for dictator and is no longer fit for the literary use of murder. Um, okay, so this is super important because Morris is actually telling us that the the old use is the literary use. This old attic usage is no longer fit because what the probably because the people simply don't know what that means. Like, hey, language has moved. Okay, it, it changes all the time. It no longer has that old meaning. In the early third century A.D., it just doesn't mean that. But I think that she skews things a bit. She says it's commonplace for dictator. Now, dictator is a pejorative term in English. It certainly is. When you say someone's a dictator, that's negative. And it's very important for the egalitarian view that authentain means something negative, something pejorative. Is that accurate? Well, the word he actually uses is obviously he doesn't speak English, right? Morris uses the word autodecane, autodecane. Now, if you look that up and say LSJ, a very reputable and reliable source, it defines autodecas, which is just, we're just looking at different endings for the same words here, right? As within your own jurisdiction, not dictator, but being within your own jurisdiction. I don't think autodecane has that pejorative connotation as part of the word automatically. I don't think that's how it works. It could be used as someone who's simply in their own jurisdiction. Now, you could be wrongly trying to claim jurisdiction that's not yours, or you could simply be in your own jurisdiction, whether it's at your house or maybe you're a judge in your own court, you're in your own jurisdiction, making your own judgments. That's not a negative thing at all. So I think that we'll come back to this one later, but it's um, one. this is, of course, Morris is one of the handful of uses of early uses of the verb. So we'll talk more about that later. But again, all arrows are pointing the same direction. Simplify, right? The murder use is outdated and doesn't apply to First Timothy. On its own, it simply doesn't apply. If you want to say that this word is negative, you need other evidence, not just saying that it used to be used of murder. But let's go to the next one. This is Hesychius of Alexandria, Alexandria, uh, late 4th century AD, approximately. And he offers multiple definitions, not one, multiple definitions for a word. Now, you guys know how multiple definitions work in a dictionary. You don't want to make an error, which is called like totality of tr totality transfer, something along those lines, where you take all the definitions of a word and you try to read all of them into a place. No, no, usually you have one meaning or another. And so the verb, according to him, the verb, authentain, it just means to execute authority. This is exactly how most traditionalists have understood the meaning in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 12, to execute authority. And that's the verb. That's, that's the same word Paul uses. The noun, he gives three different definitions. That's interesting. The noun, not the verb, or the verb just got one, and it's the same meaning that conservatives have been saying forever. The noun gets three definitions, and it's in this order of preference. First, one who executes authority. Second, because this is how Hesychius wrote, he would put the most likely meaning first, or the most common one first. The second one is one who does things with his own hand, and the third one is murderer. Okay, so I, I think that that's actually pretty strong evidence in favor of the traditional meaning, at least from this one lexicographer. But we'll, there's so much more data to go over, you guys. It's, it's going to be wonderful or terrible, depending on your perspective. Um, 
So the top one fits First Timothy 2 quite well. Wilshire says, he quote, he gives no reason for his listing, although it may reflect his perception of the common usages of his day. Uh, these definitions do not bleed through each other. It's not as though it's someone who executes authority in a murderous fashion, right? These are different definitions for different contexts. We shouldn't read that through, although that's a common egalitarian perspective is to bleed these definitions into each other. Now, you don't usually do this with other words. We shouldn't do it with this one. Um, another one is a guy named Alias Dionysius, early second century dude, who says that the noun, again, Paul uses the verb, but this is the noun. He says, not the master, but the murderer by Otto Kira, maybe by his own hand is maybe what it's referring to there. He's an example of, of someone fighting against common usage. He's an example of an atticist. This is a perfect example. He, like, for instance, think about it this way. If you're writing to people a dictionary of what words mean, you never say, this word doesn't mean this, it means that. Unless there is a common misperception, in your opinion, that the word actually does mean that thing. He's trying to correct something, a trend in the culture that he doesn't like, because he's an atticist. He doesn't want the Greek to change. He wants to go back to the usage from hundreds of years ago. Wilshire... Um, uh, Walters, excuse me, he says the following. This point emerges clearly from a number of atticistic lexical works, which warn their readers against using authentes in the current sense, master, but are unclear on the proper attic meaning of the word, ironically. One of the earliest of these is the lexicon of alias Dionysius, early 2nd century AD, which explains authentes as meaning not the master, but the murderer by Otto Kira, uh, probably by his own hand, something like that. The definitions here, again, they don't overlap. He, you know, one thing we don't see is Aelicius doesn't do what many egalitarians do, and they go, oh, well, it means, you know, master, who's like a murderous type of master. Like, he's not blurring these together. He thinks these are two different categories that don't overlap. That's interesting. Let me give you guys some more quotes from scholars. Here's from Walters. He says, the lexica and scholia simply illustrate the fact that authentase in the meaning kin murder was no longer a living part of the language after the turn of the era. It didn't It didn't have that meaning. Another quote from Walter says, needless to say, it was a great mistake to take the definitions and usages of the Atticus as a reliable guide to the meaning of authentes and its derivatives in Hellenistic Greek. When you hear quotes from these first, second century guys from the time of Paul saying this word means murder, you think I've just, I've got the golden ticket of understanding First Timothy 2. But when you get the rest of the story, you realize this is this is um, this is clumsy and this is incorrect. And when these quotes are looked at in detail, they prove the opposite is true. It just it just according to them just meant master according to the common people. And since Paul has no literary pretensions, he's not in their camp. He's in the camp they're fighting against. Probably thought it meant master or being in charge or being a, a boss or having some kind of authority. Now could it still be pejorative? It's possible, but not on the basis of this murder connection. So we'll have to look at other arguments for the pejorative nature of the term as well. Another quote from Wilshire, again, egalitarian. He says, the difficulty of using these writers of the atticistic movement is that we cannot tell if they're using meanings that are in, that are still current in Greek vocabulary or whether they are in a make-believe land of earlier pure Attic language. And Douglas Moo says, such condemnation coming from Atticists proves only that the word was part of the vernacular, right? The fact that they're fighting against the meaning master or authority is proof that that's the meaning common people were using. So a lot of New Testament lexicons, lexicons that don't just focus on Greek, where they're looking at, say, classical Greek, but but all, they focus on specifically Greek in the New Testament, they won't even include the murder definition as in the categories of the meaning of the word because the authors of the lexicons know the murder meaning has no impact on Paul's meaning in 1 Timothy 2. That, I think, is the, the bluntest way I can put it. Some may think I'm being too extreme, but I think that that is, um, we have strong evidence to suggest that that's the case. Many scholars will acknowledge this sort of thing. Uh, Marge Mosco, who <clears throat> I think is a more balanced egalitarian scholar in many ways than in a positive way, this is a compliment, okay? Um, and she says, master became the more usual meaning from the first century onwards in ordinary Koine or common Greek, gradually eclipsing any sense of murderer catch that in her opinion any sense 
of murder, not the full meaning of murder, but any sense of murder. Just don't bring the murder meaning into 1 Timothy 2.12. Don't try to bleed over pieces of it. Don't murder the word in your attempt to, to um, get a different meaning out of it. So there are two broad meanings for authentase. We've talked about one, murder. We're going to talk about a second one now, and I've already hinted at it a bunch, right? But it's the word master. So the, the murder meaning faded from the tongue of common people by Paul's time. The master meaning did not. Before we dig into the master meaning, I'll just remind us of a conclusion we've already got in place. The, the murder and master meaning are not merged. These are two different uses, uses of the word. They're just different. They're not merged. And I'm going to build a stronger case for this as we go. So let's talk about master as the second major sense of the word. Um, Al Walters uh, is a scholar who did an extensive study of the use of the term throughout time. There's other others who have, but one of the most updated studies is out from Al Walters, and others will in a few years. It'll be somebody else who's done an even more ex you know thorough study because they're always adding more papyrus papyri to the to the list of documents, and they're able to search and find more examples. But he did a pretty solid job with it. Um, he looked at 30 times that the term was used for master before. 312 AD. He says in his paper, a semantic study, he says, I've identified some 30 examples of this meaning in the extant literature, the extant Greek literature, which predates AD 312. It should be pointed out that in none of these cases is master used in the pejorative sense of autocrat or despot. I'm going to read that part again. In none of these cases is master used in the pejorative sense of autocrat or despot. In fact, it is used twice in Christian context to refer to the lordship of Jesus Christ. Now we're dealing here with the noun, authentes, not the verb that Paul has in 1 Timothy 12, authentain, but that's okay because the verb is connected to the noun. There, you know, It derives from the noun. So if the noun can be shown to be pejorative, the verb is more likely pejorative. If the, ma if the noun can be shown to not be pejorative, the verb is not likely pejorative. We will look at other evidence as well because we're going to cover the gamut. There is, um, in Walter's claim here, there's one of disputed example, and that's in the its use in the 5th century BC. Some say that that's actually a misreading. It's not even in that text at all. Um, it's not super relevant. Like, we don't need it to be there. It's, it helps his case if it's there, but I don't, I don't need it to be there for this case to be solid that you're hearing today. There's four uses in the 1st century AD, only four, 22 uses in the 2nd century, so a lot then, and three uses in the 3rd century in Walter's examination. And... If you look at these words and you try to dig up these uses, you'll see that they seem completely independent of any murder or, this is important, or criminal connotations. Because some egalitarians say the word perpetrator is, is sort of, it went from murder to sort of someone who commits crimes to like someone who's like a perpetrator. And then Paul's sort of borrowing that meaning in 1 Timothy. But we, when we see this use of authentase as master, we don't see any of those connotations. That's important because if Paul's meaning is connected to master, that blows up that connection. These examples are pretty close to Paul in time, and they also exist in Koine Greek. Authentase here being used as master is a Koine Greek thing, these 30 examples. They're not in classical usage or um, ad assists. The egalitarian view, um, however, and I want to be careful to make sure you understand this, it does not require us to think that murder is the meaning of the word, just that it's pejorative. Now, one way of getting a negative or pejorative meaning is by tying it to murder, because that's kind of negative, last I checked. But if the murder meaning doesn't help us, as I think it doesn't, if you can't drag that meaning murder and bring a flavor of it into 1 Timothy 2, there are a number of other pieces of evidence you can bring as an egalitarian to say, see, it's still pejorative, Mike, just because it doesn't mean murder doesn't mean it's not pejorative. So. Linda Belleville, we're going to dig into some ancient examples now. Um, and I had, it sent it, I kind of had fun digging into this stuff. I hope you'll have fun as I talk to you about some very ancient works that we're going to dig into here. So Linda Belleville gives two examples of astrological text. We're talking about ancient dudes in the first century going like, I'm going to write about how Jupiter affects your destiny and your future when you're born. <laughs> so these are astrological texts in the first century and they, according to Belleville, they show the use of authentase in a negative, pejorative fashion. If that's the case, that might mean Paul means it that way too. So here's Linda Belleville. She says, the astrological texts 
Authentase with the commonplace meaning domineer likely occurs in first century AD astrologer Dorotheus of Sidon. And then she gives the quote from Dorotheus. If Jupiter aspects the moon from trine, look, I know that sounds weird. Let's just say if Jupiter does this thing in relation to the moon, if it's like in this position compared to the moon, it makes them people, governors or judges of people or soldiers, especially if the moon is increasing. But if the moon's decreasing, it does not make them dominant, but subordinate. That word dominant, that's where she gets this negative meaning. Um, I'm leaving that on the screen a bit because it is written weird. I know it can be a little bit odd to look at it and try to wrap your head around it. But basically, there's two options. Jupiter's in this relationship to the moon. And if the moon's increasing, like I think it means it's getting brighter and not, you know, it's, it's moving more towards full moon instead of towards an eclipse or, 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 or shrinking. Um, so if they're in that relationship and the moon is um, increasing, then people become governors or judges of people or soldiers. They're, I think they're judging either people or judging soldiers. So they're in this position of what? Authority. But if the moon is decreasing, it doesn't make them, according to Belleville, pejorative, dominant, domineering, negative, but it makes them subordinate instead. I don't know where she gets this negative meaning here. It seems completely important to the text. The parallel, when you look at the passage, if the moon's increasing, people are governors or judges. If it's decreasing, they're not what? What I just said they were. They're not governors or judges. I don't see any reason why why we, we would assume that that's a pejorative thing. What they're not is what I just said they were. Instead, they're going to be subordinate. The negative thing here is being subordinate, at least in the writer's concern. People don't want to be in that position if they can help it. So here, authentas, authentas is being used, authentase is being used in a positive sense. We're not getting this pejorative meaning from anywhere. It's just coming out of thin air. So I got the book. <laughs> this, is, this is the Carmen Astrologicum. This is a translation. Um, and it's a lot of it's, it's been through the ringer a little bit as far as Arabic and, and, and Greek and stuff like that. But I read a bunch of Dorotheus of Sidon's Carmen Astrologicum to try to understand a few things to understand if Althentas, Althentas is being used in a positive sense in this passage, a negative sense or in some sort of neutral sense. A couple things to note, and I'll just summarize, and then I'll share with, with you guys some quotes from an ancient astrologer. Did you ever think I would be sharing with you ancient ast astrologer stuff? Well, I am. So Jupiter is the thing causing the effect in this passage, right? Jupiter, according to Dorotheus, is generally associated with positive things positive things. Jupiter has a positive impact wherever it goes. Here's a different section from the same book explaining that. He says, if Jupiter aspects the moon from trine, notice the language, it's like almost identical. It will increase the praise for the native and he will have rank and status, right? It's a good thing. Look concerning what I told you at the time of the native's fortune. One of these will be a leader, a chief for men, while another of them will be a leader in business, another of them for commerce, and another of them for leadership of armies, especially if the moon is increasing. It's entirely positive. If the moon's increasing, it's an entirely positive thing. They become leaders. They become a very, it, it's used in a positive sense here. So when later he says, but if the moon's decreasing, he will not be, Althentas, he won't be, these positive things, he'll be subordinate. I think that's the most sensical way to, to read the passage. But we see the same idea again here. Jupiter makes men prosperous, right? But if the moon is decreasing, it can result in harm, in harm. Meaning the <clears throat> the thing that they're not, in the original quote, if the, moon, if the moon is decreasing, they'll not be out and tossed. Instead, they'll be subordinate. That thing they won't be, that would have been a good thing. Because when Jupiter when is in the with the moon and the moon is decreasing it brings harm <laughs> i'm sorry guys i know this is complicated stuff okay so if jupiter aspects the moon from opposition while the moon is western and increasing in number then he will be celebrated with respect to his livelihood a famous man and he will be one of those who relies on himself and will not obey another especially if the moon is less in degree than jupiter if the moon is greater in degrees oh so the moon is in a different situation then it's harmful because there will be a decrease in his livelihood and afflictions and agony will come to him. The movement of the moon can can sort of reverse the fate. Jupiter is going to bring something positive, but if the moon is in a certain position, it kind of like reverses, inverts that fate and brings something negative. See that relationship? That means that the first part of the Dorotheus quote, which is all positive things, that's what the Althentas related to. It was being used in a positive sense. 
Jupiter has good effects, but the moon can overpower them. Let's look at another quote. <clears throat> every time Jupiter aspects a star, it turns toward good. In every time and in every situation, Jupiter is good because it increases the properness and good or diminishes from the evil and misfortunes and destroys them. In our original quote, Althintas seems to refer to having authority. And it seems to refer to a positive sense of having authority. Oops, let me uh, bring up the original quote. Here we go. It makes them, if you know, if the if the moon and Jupiter are in the right spot, it makes them governors or judges. That that's a, an authority thing, and that seems to be positive. Then if it flips because the moon's in that other position, then they don't get to have that. They don't get to be authentas governors or judges. They don't get to be leaders. They don't get to be in authority is the idea. Subordinate, in other words, is the undesirable term. But Althentas was the desirable and positive term. That's what you want to be. That's what you'd like to be. According to Dorotheus, that seems to be his view on the meaning of the word. So this is Linda's first example of a pejorative use. And it turns out to be not only not helpful, but actually harmful to that case, because it's similar to how Paul seems to be using it, at least according to the traditional view. Finally, there's a parallel text. <clears throat> this parallel text is attributed to a different ast astrology guy named uh, Vettius Valens. You do not need to remember these names. But he wrote near the time of Dorotheus, and it seems to say exactly what I'm suggesting Dorotheus is saying. Here it is. Slide 103. There is also a text attributed to Vedius Valens, which uses authenticos, that is an adjective, but it's it's related to authentes, the noun, the same way that Paul's word is related to the noun. Um, anyways, he uses this in a, in a context much like that of the just quoted paraphrase of Dorotheus. He says, if the moon waxes, they will be high ranking officers. If it wanes, they will be servants of the leaders. That high ranking, that's Authenticos. It's using another sister word, a cognate, in a way that is just like Paul. Or at least I should I shouldn't say just like Paul. Just like most people have understood Paul throughout time. It's to be talking about some just generally positive or neutral use of authority. Something that um is not pejorative. So Belva's chosen example, her first example just backfires. It actually undoes the case that she's trying to make, I think. A second example from Belleville is Ptolemy. Ptolemy, who we've got right here. There you go. You guys can check out Ptolemy's Tetrabiblos. This one's a bit better known. More people would recognize that name and that work than uh, they would Dorotheus of Sidon. That's for sure. Um, but uh, but that's how it is. So her second example, we will come back to that one later. <laughs> I'm going to come back. But first, I want to talk about this idea of cognates. I, I keep mentioning these cognates. And it's not a toothpaste, that word cognate. Uh, what is a cognate? A cognate is a related word. So let's take in English the word run and running. Run and running are related words. Really, run would be kind of like the sort of mother word, right? Running is, is, a, is a related word. Do you, do you, you catch that feel that you get with these two related words? Um, the word enchantment is a cognate of the word enchant. Same kind of thing. And so in Greek, you have authentes and authentikos and authentain and authenteo. And these are related words. And authentes is kind of like, in a sense, like the core. It's the noun version. But at any rate, we can look at these other cognates. These become kind of important. Because, again, there's so few uses of authentain, the word Paul uses, like eight uses in hundreds of years. But there's a whole bunch of sister words or cognates. And if we look at how they're used, we might see trends. We might get information. Like if they're always used in negative pejorative meanings, then probably authentane is too. If they're always used in other ways, then maybe authentane is too. So you catch the idea. We're going to look at cognates. The reason why this is kind of important is because a lot of scholarship just ignores the cognates. They just don't look at them much at all. And they'll focus on other things. But we are trying to not ignore anything. At least that's my agenda here as you can tell by the length of this video. So I just want you to know that this cognate thing is not an oddball thing that only a couple people do. It's based on scholarly agreement. Okay, scholars are in broad agreement that authenteo, the, the, the verb form, which is related to Paul's authentane, I know Greek's weird, um, it's derived from that noun, authentes. This is, this is where there's broad agreement. 
which which again makes it odd that so many don't look at the cognates they don't look at these sister words when we see them as being connected uh, it would seem to be important to at least take a look at them so we're gonna look at several examples which come chronologically after authentase right which is a pretty old word and they're derived from it just like paul using authentane that comes chronologically after authentase and it's derived from it so this seems like a good thing to look at so here's a few of them i'll just run through them quickly authentikos means authoritative it's used in a, in a sense meaning authoritative its first appearance is in second century bc it can also mean original it can also be used like original as in like a master copy of a document like is that the original or the master copy this this might be related to authoritative as well because the original would have the authority whereas the other ones would not they'd be copies they would have less authority it was especially applied to legal documents in court type settings and here i got a little quote for you on that as a number of scholars have pointed out authenticos meaning original is based on the meaning authoritative that's from al walters and then we have the next one which is authentia authentia the abstract noun authentia according to walters almost always refers to authority or sovereignty and is thus clearly based on authentes as master almost always as authority or sovereignty you, you, you i mean you're seeing it on your screen here there is a strong trend among the cognates i don't know why people reach for murder when we have the obvious parallel to paul's usage here this is a big piece of the puzzle. It's not the only piece. There's going to be several other pieces we're going to go through here. All kinds of stuff you'll see, including claims that there is a conspiracy of patriarchal males messing with our Bible translations. That coming from scholarship. Um, not that it's impossible, but if you're wrong, that's a big thing to say. <laughs> so um, we'll dig into that. So the first attestation, the first time we have Authentia being used is in 3rd Maccabees 229 in like 1 BC or... First century BC, excuse me. First century BC. Um, so that's that's being used even before the time of Paul. Meaning, catch this, that there's a term referring to authority. That's a, that's a sister word of Paul's usage that's used contemporary approximately with Paul and before because there are some scholars who will claim that Paul's use of authentain shortly after Paul used it, people started thinking it meant authority and that happened after Paul, not before. But here we have authentes meaning master. We have uh, we have cognates, but from before Paul, deriving from that same word, also referring to authority. So we have this other quote from Walter who says, <clears throat> to the best of my knowledge, it is never used in a pejorative sense before 312 AD and very rarely thereafter. So authentia, not used in a pejorative sense around Paul's time. Authentate, uh, authent, authent Tesis or tusis, depending on how you want to argue about pronouncing Greek, uh, means exercise of authority. Authentria is a feminine equivalent of master or mistress. These are cognates, and they're all based on the meaning of auth of uh, authentase as master, not murder. The murder meaning has no relation to any of these cognates. Why would we think it's related to authentane? I don't know, but it's a very common view among egalitarians. They're all based on the meaning related to master. The use of cognates is not always helpful, okay? But, and I've seen it abused. I've seen people go, well, cognate means this, and there's another one over here that means this, and, and then dragging those meanings around wrongly. But here it seems to be helpful. And Al Walters summarizes, the senses of the derivatives, these words we just went over, as Chantrain has pointed out, are all based on authentase in the meaning master. All of these common, more common than authentane, anyways, words, they, they, they take authentase to mean master. It seems that Paul, very likely, the only other cognate we've got available to us is probably doing the same thing, and that fits the context of 1 Timothy 2.12 a whole lot better than incite violence and other things like that. These also show up pretty early, too. So let me summarize a little bit, right? Since one, these words show up early, and two, they're all based on already using authentase to mean master, then authentes must be known to mean master by the time these derivatives show up. Authentes meant master real early on. That murder meaning was a different definition that died out, but authentes is carrying that master meaning right on through into the time of Paul and before the time of Paul. This pushes against some egalitarians who will say 
that the, the, the master or the authority type meaning uh, only really came after the time of Paul. The result of our survey, this is what Walter says after going through uh, the, all these cognates and, and digging, and I thought he did a pretty solid job, and I have no, in my notes you can find references to his papers and stuff like that. Um, the result of our study, of our survey of the derivatives of authentase is that they are indeed all dependent for their meaning on authentase master. We thus find further confirmation of the earlier conclusion that it was only in the meaning master that authentase was part of the living language after the classical period right? Murder is a dead meaning. Pun intended, just because it makes me smile. But master is the living meaning of the word at the time. This seems to help us answer another egalitarian method of avoiding authority as the meaning of 1 Timothy chapter 2.12. And which again, I, the methods, I, I don't, I don't, whichever way the scripture goes, I'm happy to go. But as much writing and scholarly stuff there is on both sides here, Obviously, one side is very wrong. Everybody has to agree on that. <laughs> one of the sides is very wrong. And in my own studies, that side that has been very wrong very consistently is the egalitarian side, the scholarship, as I've demonstrated over and over and over again, I think, in this series. And even to the point of people saying I'm biased because I disagree with egalitarians so much, <laughs> as if truth would be found in the middle where you, don't, you, you, just, you just disagree and agree with everybody the same amount. And all I think that I don't think that means anything. That's not that's not how truth functions. Um, at any rate, this helps us answer another egalitarian method of avoiding authority as the meaning of First Timothy two, which is claiming that it's all way too confusing. So this is uh, Leland Wilshire, who, strangely enough, he wrote a paper on authentes and authenteo and authentein and all this stuff. He wrote a paper on it that people thought seemed pretty clear. And a lot of his other scholar, his fellow scholars were saying, oh, clearly he has come down on the side of the traditional view. It just means have authority. He then had to write another paper where he's like, no, I don't. I think that we don't have any idea what it means. From all that study, you set it all aside and you just do an analysis of 1 Timothy 2 and it means incite violence. And it, he just gets, uh, forgive me here, it gets a, gets a little bit wild in some of his claims. And I, I went into him in detail in my notes. I don't remember if I included it in the study here. Uh, we'll find out later <laughs> if it's part of my final stuff or not. I cut out lots of things to shorten the time, believe it or not. But he says, sometimes this type of study yields a coherent picture. Other times, a barely discernible image. I'm afraid with 1 Timothy 2.12, we have more of the latter than the former. He thinks we have a barely discernible image of what Paul meant by 1 Timothy 2 because he blurs the attic stuff and he it, it he caught i think that his his work you read it on its own without his conclusion and you go i'm concluding that it means have authority but then in his conclusion he seems to compete with his own work that's how it comes across i think that the issue here is he had enough scholarly integrity this is a compliment to not skew what he wrote right to largely keep his rehash <clears throat> his rehashing of the data pretty accurate and then at the end, he just skewed the conclusion because it, it didn't fit. Um, so it's really odd that Wilshire says this, right? Because so many have read his own analysis and concluded he supports the meaning of authority that he had to, again, he had to write a whole other paper going, no, I don't. That's not my conclusion. Because it seems like the evidence speaks for itself. Instead, he still opts for in instigate violence based not on any of his study, for the most part, not on his study, but based upon what he sees in first timothy 2 12 we'll get i guess we'll get to that later i think i have i think i have some notes on that we'll see okay zoom out for five seconds with me let's just recap what i've just been telling you we've looked at alphan we saw that this noun version not what paul uses it has a murder meaning and it also has a master or authority meaning we saw that these meanings don't overlap they don't blur into each other we also saw that there's these sister words that are also derived from this noun authentes that predate Paul's usage of the related term in 1 Timothy 2. And those words also relate to authority in some sense and do not seem to carry a pejorative meaning. So we have a case so far for what Paul says being related to authority and not being inherently negative or pejorative. That would be basically the conservative understanding of the term, the largely the, the church's understanding of the term for the past 2,000 years. I say largely, not entirely, but largely. Yeah. 
So let's look at the verb though, because this is what we haven't done. We haven't just looked at all the examples of the exact same word being used around the time of Paul. And there's not very many, there's like eight. So things are kind of going to get complicated right now. Um, that's just the nature of this issue. So one of the ways in which complementarians or egalitarians will build their case for how we should understand this word is by looking at these eight examples with a lot of detail. They'll go through these specific times it's used and they say, this one, it means just what I think Paul means in 1 Timothy 2. So it, it gets a little complicated, but it's 100% worth the work and I'm trying to make it as accessible as possible. So we'll see. You can tell me in the, in the comments if you think I did an okay job or not. Um, I did my best, whatever, whether it was good or bad. It's up to you to decide. So the complementarian view is basically represented by someone like Walters, who would say um, these eight examples, they do not show us a negative connotation for the word. That they'll, they'll support different meanings, but not a negative connotation, not a pejorative meaning. And that is the key thing that the egalitarians need to find in 1 Timothy 2 related to this word for their case to work. The egalitarians are going to say, hey, they are these usages these uses are generally negative or pejorative and therefore first timothy 2 is also likely negative or pejorative as well let me give you a quote and uh this is kind of important because when you hear a scholar say something like this this is cynthia long westfall i'm quoting here um it changes your view of the bible and your view of this passage and your view of this issue but is it accurate in the Greek corpus, she says, the verb authenteo refers to a range of actions that are not restricted to murder or violence. However, the people who are the targets of these actions are harmed, forced against their will, compelled, or at least their self-interest is overridden because the actions involve the imposition of the subject's will over against the recipient's will, ranging from dishonor to lethal force. So meaning that, hey, one commonality amongst the variety of the uses of this word that we're about to look at is that they're negative, they're pejorative. It's a bad thing that's happening. And so therefore, Paul is only saying, don't do the bad thing. Not, not have authority, but don't do the bad thing with authority. Linda Belleville, speaking of these eight examples we're about to look at, she says, in fact, all known extra-biblical instances of Althantain, rare though they be, prior to the second century AD, without exception, have to do with power or domination. Just for a second, if authority has to do with power. I, I don't I don't know anybody who would argue against that, um, reasonably argue against that. Authority does have to do with power. Power is not inherently negative. Christ has power, all power and honor and glory to God. Um, people in authority have a measure of power. Parents have power over their children. This isn't a bad thing. It can be abused. So I don't really know why she chose that word power, but in the quote, she's trying to say it's pejorative. That, that's my understanding. All the uses, all the uses are pejorative and therefore that's how Paul's using it. So are they all pejorative? Westfall says they're forced against their will. Belle, that's not necessarily pejorative either. When, when a parent tells a kid, go clean your room, they're forced against their will. That's not pejorative. I, I, I think we're lowering the bar for what, what we, what we call pejorative or negative. I think we're lowering the bar. The nature of authority is that that person has the decision-making power there. That every time you use your authority, you are compelling others to do things whether they want to or not. That's not necessarily a bad thing. It can be bad. It can be bad, but it's not necessarily a bad thing. So anyway, um, in a modern view, I think we tend to think of these things as bad. I think our modern views, we're weird with authority. We're weird about authority, right? I, I, I'm part of the generation that was like, stop using the term Mr. Like, don't refer to people as Mr. Don't use titles, that kind of thing. Um, makes me feel uncomfortable because it felt somehow wrong to be like an authority, that kind of thing. Um, our modern view of these things does not represent a biblical view of these things. The Bible is not embarrassed at all about someone having authority. It doesn't have any complaints or any apologies for one person having authority over another. It's only the kind of authority and the way it's used, biblically speaking, that we need to worry about. But having authority itself is not bad biblically. It's not pejorative in scripture. Um, the government forces people not to commit crimes. Romans 14 considers this a positive thing. Right? That, 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 that's, a, that's a coercion or forced against their will to not commit crimes or to even be imprisoned if they do. And Romans says this is a good thing, that the government is a good thing. Romans 13. 
I think I got the number wrong. I'm not very good. So let's look at the eight examples. All that being said, now that we've understand use of authority is not inherently bad. The eight examples. So Philodemus de Rhetorica is the first example. Um, and let me just spare you the time. This will not help us. Unfortunately, the text is survives only in handmade, a handmade copy, um, and it has multiple issues. So we got one copy, multiple issues. There's a lack of spaces between the letters, which in this case, it, it that can happen in documents, but here it leaves it open to be reconstructed. Like where, is that the word? Is it this one word or is it these two words? Does the word start here or there? And then this makes it difficult to understand what word is even being used. Okay, the word may or may not really be there. The copy is a copy and it may or may not represent the original. So we have it in one copy. If we had multiple copies, we would say, yes, it represents the original. Like with our New Testament, we've got so many copies that we have such great confidence that this is what was originally written. Here we got one. Um, so scholars, they have a really good reason to question whether the handwritten copy is an accurate reproduction of the original. You can uh, look up the Women in the Church, third edition, page 72, for more details on this. But I will summarize with the following. Walter says, in any case, given the obscurity and fragmentary character of this text, its hypothetical occurrence there cannot make any reliable contribution to determining its meaning. Now, this is not a complementarian trying to get away from it. Linda Belleville agrees. She says, quote, the text is too fragmented to be certain. So, number one, Philodemus, we just set it aside. It's just not going to help us at this stage, maybe in the future. Okay, now we're at something that I'm actually really excited about. It's going to be a lot of detail and stuff, but man, I'm stoked because number two, the second example of the usage of this word before the time of Paul, actually, in this case, is in a papyrus called BGU 1208. Now, BGU 1208 is a papyrus that so far had no publicly available translation into English or with extensive notes where the entire document has translated. But now it does because... Um, by God's grace, I was able to hire a scholar to do a translation on this passage. He did a fantastic job, and I'm going to make it freely available. His notes, his full translation, everything, uh, scholarly paper on it, totally available for you guys to have for free. Uh, it'll be in the link below. But the reason why I had to hire a scholar is because this one was super hard to figure out, and scholars had wildly different claims about it. One of them claims, oh, it means this, and here's the background. Someone else says something totally different. And nobody's providing the proof that at least that I could find the proof. I remember scouring internet forums where you get like Greek nerds arguing about the stuff and they were going back and forth on BGU 1208 and they were like, well, what, which is it? Is it this guy or that guy? Who's right? And someone finally was like, well, until we get a scholar who can actually, tr until we have a scholar who translates this and makes it publicly available, we're not going to be able to decide because everybody's arguing about the verse, but they're basing it off of the rest of the passage but we don't have a translation of the rest of the passage. And this stuff's kind of hard to understand. It has specialized terminology that's not even common Greek. So we just have to wait for that to show up. Well, now we got it, all right? Now we have a publicly available translation by Dr. Gary Manning, who did a fantastic job. Thank you, Gary, for that. Really much appreciate your work on this. I believe he did it in an unbiased fashion. I believe he did it in a thorough fashion. And I'm very happy to present his work for you guys to check out. So... Let me dig into BGU 1208 with you guys. Um, this is the part that everybody argues about. But we'll look at the whole thing. <laughs> okay, so it says here, and you can see why it's hard to understand. It's just written weird, okay? And since I had, and this is the authente word, right? I had exercised authority or asserted authority, or I had incited violence, or I had murdered him. Some people would want you to believe. Um, or one of those things, you know, one of these other things. If I had domineered over him since i had done this he agreed within the hour to secure for catalytus catalytus the boatman at the same fare that is some agreement to pay some guy a previously discussed amount i'm going to give them the money we said we would give them because you authentay me you did this thing to me here's philip payne's theory on what this actually means he says it relates to an incident when a slave of Asclepiades, that's the guy who's reading the letter, refused to pay the boatman Calatidus his boat fare. Tryphon, that's the guy who's writing the letter, he writes an apology to the slave owner, explaining that when he intervened, he acted with self-assumed authority over the slave 
And then that's why this slave. So, hey, I'm sorry I made your slave pay that guy. I shouldn't have done that. That was your slave, not mine. I assumed authority over a slave I have no authority over. And therefore, it's an apology. And therefore, authen, the authent word group here, the verb in particular, it's a, it's a form of the verb, authenticatas. This is used in a negative, a pejorative fashion. And therefore, you can read that negative, pejorative, self-assumed authority, authority you don't really have. So 1 Timothy 2.12 is only saying, women, you can't just make yourself an elder. You can't just put yourself in authority. You have to be rightly brought into authority like everybody else. Totally egalitarian. Is that correct? Okay, well, it's based off four claims. Four claims. The first claim is that the guy is a slave. So that would change our understanding of the passage to be this. I had exercised authority toward him, a slave. Okay, that does give you new new information. Um, interestingly, Philip Payne offers zero evidence to support this claim. He simply says it's the case. He doesn't offer a footnotes or support of any kind, but he says it's the case. His second claim is that it's specifically a slave of Asclepides, the guy who's reading the letter. Okay? So I'll change the text here to add in brackets, slave of Asclepiades. I took authority over slave of Asclepiades. Uh, no evidence is cited for this either. Philip Payne does not mention it. It doesn't mean he doesn't have it in his head. It's just in his writings. I didn't see any evidence support supporting this claim at all. It's just a claim. But many will rely on Philip Payne for their understanding of this passage. Some of you watching this video, you believe in egalitarian views because you read Philip Payne's work and you thought, yeah, he knows what he's talking about. But there's no evidence cited for that. We'll dig into it in more detail as we go. The, th the third one is the idea that the letter is an apology from Trifon, the guy writing, to Asclepiades, the guy reading the letter. Again, there's no evidence cited for this. The closest thing to evidence on Philip, from Philip Payne on this is that um, another scholar, a guy named Werner, he also thought it was an apology. I mean, that, not that that doesn't mean anything, but that's, that doesn't help me know why. Or you know why. Why would I think this letter is an apology? And up until now, you can't read the whole letter in English, but now you can. So you're about to find out. Um, then the fourth claim was that the thing that Trifon made his slave agree to do, made Asclepides' slave agree to do, was to pay money to the boatman. So the, the guy who he used authority on in some sense, he was making him pay money to the boatman. Um, so let's look at these things. Um, in summary, Trifon, the writer of the letter, according to Payne, is something of a stranger to Asclepiades, right? I don't know. I mean, he doesn't work for him or anything, right? Like he's in different businesses, different environments. He's kind of separate from Asclepiades. And he overstepped and he ordered Asclepiades a slave around. And now he's writing a letter to say, hey, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have done that. Uh, Payne, Philip Payne quotes John Werner to support this showing that Werner views the passage this way, but there, other than that, there's no evidence given to support these claims, none whatsoever, as far as I can tell. All this is to show what? That authenteo here is being used in a negative sense, self-assumed authority that was not properly given. It has a very technical meaning. Authority that's not really yours, that you, you stole, you took. So 1 Timothy 2.12 must mean that women can't do that. She could be an elder, perhaps, but not self-appointed. Okay. Let's look at Linda Belleville, another egalitarian who has, again, different claims. And one of the surprising things about egalitarians here is that they often take very different paths to get to their conclusions, whereas complementarians often, not always, often take very similar paths to get to their conclusions. I think it's a result, having done this whole study now, of the fact that the evidence simply doesn't support their views. So they're being inventive and they're coming up with different methods of getting to their conclusions. I, th I, I think that that is the reason why you see so many varied claims among egalitarians and complementarians disagree on certain things but not on the core of the issues and certainly not on the major translations of the passages for the most part whereas egalitarians often do um, and i could back that up <laughs> I, I made a statement like this on twitter the other day and I, a lot of people are like oh, commentarians can't agree on this and that and this and that and i thought it's like people can't see the forest through the trees on this issue um there are of course there are disagreements it's the kinds and qualities of the disagreements that seem revealing on the egalitarian side. And if someone denies that, then I think they're not paying full attention to the actual debates that are going on. Egalitarians, even in their own books, there'll be a book of a gathered group of egalitarian arguments that even conflict with each other. But they're all firmly egalitarian, but the methods they use to get there are sometimes in contradiction of one another even, because there is a problem with the view. So Linda Belleville has a different claim on this. She says that Trifon is not 
unrelated to Asclepiades, but is actually the brother of Asclepiades. His brother, and this is because the opening of the letter of the papyrus, it says Tryphon to his brother. So there, it's, it's a familial title that's given there. And according to her, he's writing to his brother to update him about a payment problem in the family business. Her translation isn't, I uh, self-assumed authority that didn't, that didn't belong to me, but her translation is that in this passage, that it's actually, where is it? Oh yeah, since I took a firm stand with him. So I, I took a firm stand. That, that's all it means is to take a firm stand. She argues that the meaning authority is not in the passage at all. So whereas Philippine says, yes, it's authority, but it's self-assumed authority that doesn't belong. She says authority doesn't belong there at all. I took a firm stand doesn't mean having authority. He's just like, I stood up and sort of took a firm stand with him. That domineering in a sense, you might say. She argues that the meaning authority is not there at all. Just one guy forcing another guy to do something that maybe the guy didn't want to do. So it's about power or control, but it is not about authority. She says the event is, you know, how does she defend this claim? She says the event is too mundane for it to be about authority. This hardly fits the mundane details of the text. The idea of authority being involved her, to her doesn't, it's just mundane. It's just one guy going, hey, you better pay. That's just, that's not authority, it's too mundane. That's her evidence against this. Again, I say, this is not really evidence. It's not mundane. Uh, when we look at the details, it's not really mundane like that, but that, that's the evidence she presents, so I want to share it with you. She says, therefore, there is therefore nothing in the correspondence that warrants a translation such as exercise authority over him. This is part of her ultimate case. How does she use this passage? Her ultimate case is that there's no first century warrant for translating Althantanas to exercise or have authority over her and for understanding Paul in 1 Timothy 2.12 to be speaking of the carrying out of one's official duties. Rather, the sense in everyday usage is to dominate or to get one's way. So Linda Belleville believes, again, like I said, God's trains have conflicting views, right? Philip Payne's view contradicts Belleville's and Belleville's contradicts Payne's. They, they, they can't both be correct here. Um, authority is a meaning that doesn't show up for Althantane until after the time of Paul. However, we've seen that Althantes meant master, that other cognates that occurred before the time of Paul also related to authority. And now we're about to see a text that seems related to authority from before the time of Paul with the exact same word, at least the verb, Althantale. On the other side, there's Al Walters, who is a complementarian. And his translation of this is very different. He thinks it means authority. He says, since I had authority with respect to him, he immediately granted Calatidus the ferryman a concession, which allowed the latter to make a profit at the same rent. He's viewing this as somebody in the government giving permission for someone to charge a certain rate. And that Trifon, the guy that wrote the letter, had some kind of authority in relation to this government official. Um, so there's no mention in, in Walter's writings of Trifon being the brother of Asclepiades. Um, he says Trifon may have instead been a senior official of a Roman taxation bureaucracy. You see why this is confusing? Yes, it'll get clear in a moment. Okay, but first I have to show you the breadth of confusion that's going on in scholarship on this passage. Um, so if, if he's right, if Walters is right, then Trifon is in a position of authority over the guy who's making the decision about the boatman's rates. Right, who's probably a guy named Antilochus or Antilochus. Um, he's also mentioned in the letter. So Walters sees this use of Authenteo as a positive use of authority, at least from Trifon's perspective. And this is something where he's like, hey, look, I'm not a, he's not apologizing for anything. Trifon is, is, is boasting in a sense. He's like, look, I solved the problem. And so it's a positive use of um, Authenteo and it's connected to authority in his view. And he says the following. Um, although Trifon appears to have overruled Antilochus, nothing in the context suggests that he did so without just cause. In fact, he seems to have been protecting Calatidus from the notoriously extortionist practices of the Teloni. Um, just that's a government official. Um, in any case, since Trifon used Authenteo to describe his own behavior, the verb unlikely had a pejorative connotation. I want to highlight that last part right there. Trifon, unless he's writing an apology letter, which he most certainly is not, we'll get into that. Then he's describing his own behavior to others. Most likely he's talking about something he thinks he did good. And that does get, that is the feel you get from the passage when you read it without <laughs> extraneous commentaries. So 
Andrew Bartlett weighs in on this. Um, again, Andrew Bartlett is a egalitarian scholar or writer, and he says, <clears throat> Paine's interpretation and Walter's interpretation are so different, one would hardly know that the same text was under consideration. I 100% agree with Bartlett on this. Like, what? You've got a slave about argument over over taking authority over a slave that's not really yours and forcing him to pay and you're apologizing to someone or you're telling somebody hey i solved this problem look at me i did a good job which one is it nobody provides the full context of the lit of the letter nobody that i was able to find in english anyways i don't speak german <laughs> was able to provide the full context of the letter it seemed like a whole lot of conjecture to me i searched for an english translation of the papyrus it didn't exist and one nerdy website I mentioned before had some uh, Greek guys debating it, and they finally concluded, until we get a translation, we're just not going to know. So I hired a scholar named Gary Manning. Gary Manning, one of those guys who translates ancient Greek papyrus for fun. Okay? That's my kind of guy. I need that guy. That's, that's the guy for the job. And Gary did a fantastic job. For a few weeks, uh, weeks, he worked on this project, and he wrote a paper that you guys have full access to in the links below and you can have for free. Um, absolutely, that's my delight to be able to just give it to you. It contains, um, the letter, by the way, contains a lot of special terms related to business. This made it hard to translate because they're terms, you know, businesses have special terminology they use. Well, ancient Greek, you know, Koine Greek businesses did the same thing. Uh, but the section we care about of the letter is actually largely intact. Here it is on your screen. This is BGU 1208. The part we care about is mostly intact. This might look terrible to some of you guys. This is actually not so bad, okay, for ancient writings. And it's part of a group of seven letters. There are seven letters in this family of letters that together give us a lot of information that clarify the meaning and they rule out some wrong opinions. Some of the stuff I've shared with you, Belleville and, and Payne and even Walters got some stuff wrong, I believe, on this. So Manning provides a full translation of this entire thing that you're seeing on your screen and you have it for free in the links below and a full commentary and he even interacts with philip payne and linda belleville's work and walter's work the people i just quoted to you so this to me is is a super valuable thing it's a contribution to scholarship i think it's taking knowledge of this letter to the next level and this letter weighs in heavily on, on our understanding of first timothy 2 12 and what it may or may not mean because you have the entire paper you can read for yourself i'm going to just give you a summary now okay Here's what's going on with BGU 1208. This guy, Trifon, he does call Asclepiades his brother, but this is probably an informal title. Another letter in the collection, BGU 1209, it shows they're not literally brothers. Not literally brothers. But Trifon works for Asclepiades in his family business. Understandable why he's like, to the brother, Asclepiades. He's the brother in the family business. Trifon seems to work for him in some way. Um... These seven letters that give us a good deal of info, but you'll have references and translations of those letters as well in the document that I've linked below. And full commentary, all this stuff, really great stuff. Three of the seven letters in this occasion, of these seven letters, this group, are between Trifon and Asclepiades, between the two of them, from one to the other. That's kind of neat. We have three letters from these guys. This letter is about resolving business disputes about costs related to ferrying sheep across the Nile. So that could be hiring the boat. That could also be docking prices. So there's multiple costs, paying a ferryman. There's multiple costs associated with these things. Here's what it looks like was going on. Asclepiades had some sheep that he was shipping across the Nile. But after the fact, after they had already agreed and done the shipment of the sheep, his bill was bigger than they thought it was supposed to be. It seems that somebody increased the costs after the fact, didn't hold to what they had expected. This is probably, we're not sure, but it's probably a guy named Ant Antilochus, who's also mentioned in the letter. In the letter, he imposed fees related to shipping sheep across the Nile. But according to Trifon, the payment they previously read on after it was increased, he's like, I'm working on resolving this issue. That's why he's writing this letter. This is to update Asclepides. Hey, what about those increased charges? You know how business is. They're trying to overcharge me. What's going on with that? He's giving him an update. And he wants Asclepides to know, not an apology, to know that he's achieved some success. He's boasting. He's not apologizing. That's huge for understanding whether he thinks this is a good thing he did or not when he authenticated this guy to mix languages together in a very clumsy and offensive fashion. He authenticated. Um, so this letter is not an apology. It's a report of some measure of success about the business problem. 
In the letter, we learn that when he found out the rate had been increased, Trifon told Asclepiades, hold back payment, don't pay it yet, stall the payment while I work on getting the rates reduced back to what we think they should be. So he's using this as some leverage, just like you might stop payment on a bill that's over the agreed on amount. This may have been, again, just to give him time and leverage to get the rate back down to the lower amount previously agreed on. During this time, Trifon went to the cops. <laughs> you can actually see this in the letter. He talks about going to the police. He says, Trifon to the brother, greetings and good health always. This is quoting from BGU 1208. After arriving from the inland or upper regions, I acquired through Soterikos the note which you had sent by his people in which you asked me about the error slash fraud of Catalytus, which after reading, I informed the Strategos, that's a cop, because of the hatred of evil he has. Remember Linda Belleville saying this stuff was too mundane? This issue was, it's a payment of a boat first, too mundane for the use of authority to be involved. Yet here, it's obviously not too mundane for him to involve the authorities. The Strategos is basically the ancient magistrate or police officer, the guy who's going to come and make it, make it straight. Then Trifon talks about a meeting he had to resolve the issue. Let me give it to you now. This is the meeting he has after getting the Strategos involved and all that. And then he goes and he meets and says, since I had exercised authority, and that is Manning's translation, which seems to be right, either exercised or asserted authority toward him, he agreed within the hour to secure for Catalytus the boatman at the same fare. That phrase same fare is referring to the fare we previously agreed on. Not the raised fare, not the new fare, but the old, the same fare. He agreed that we would pay the lower amount. It seems that Catalytus got a bad rap, like it was his fault, but it was really this other guy, maybe Antilochus, who is Antilochus, who is causing the problem. So he tells Asclepiades that the lower payment has been agreed to by the person in charge of setting the rates for such things, probably Antilochus. Trifon used some sort of authority he had over Antilochus to get him to agree to the lower payment. What authority did he use? Well, based on the letter, there's only two things that we see that might have been the authority he used. One, the stopped payment. They're, they were refusing payment. Who has authority over their money? They do. So he's using the authority of that. That's possible. What seems may, maybe more likely to me is the strategos. He brought the police in. So that's how he asserted authority, the authority of the government, the ruling Romans, to say, hey, you need to stick to the bill, the price you had already agreed on. Maybe Catalytus was brought in to be a possibly... This is conjecture, right? Just to be a witness to say, yeah, no, we agreed on that rate to show that the rate had been increased after the fact so that the um, rate could be pushed down to what it was previously. So that could be one of those two things. Now, Authenteo here is in the perfect tense. Let's consider that for a second. Here's the kind of a long quote. Sorry, it's so small on your screen. A common way that a perfect tense functions is to describe a condition or state that exists because of a prior event. That seems to fit the context here. So when he says I often teo, uh, he did it in a, I, I know, I know for people who know Greek, I, I'm butchering it. I'm doing it on purpose for people who know English to understand it better. Forgive me, you guys. Like When he says I often teoed, <laughs> I know I'm butchering Greek, but I'm not trying to teach Greek here. I'm trying to understand the passage. Um, when he says this, he says it in the perfect tense, implying that it's some state that had pri existed prior, meaning the authority had been asserted already, perhaps when he called the strategos. He brought the cops. That was the authority he had asserted. And since he had brought them, it forced them to pay the right rate and they couldn't play their little game anymore. So he said Trifon did not inherently have authority over Antilochus, which is against Walter's view that Trifon was like a government official. Um, and the letter doesn't seem to support that either. But in the recent past, he brought to bear two means of authority. He made a complaint to the Strategos, and he and Asclepides withheld payment on this contract. These two actions result in him now having some ability to push Antilochus to agree to terms that Trifon thinks are fair. The translation, since I had exercised authority and since I had asserted authority, thus seemed to be consistent with the sense of the passage. So, it's not that Trifon was using authority in that moment, it's that he had already used it. He had gained it somehow. What about Philip Payne? Philip Payne, who said that this is about a, the, you know, one guy taking control of another man's slave, and now he's writing a letter of apology. The letter does not at all justify it. You read this thing in context, no, I don't know where that came from. Okay, that, it's weird. 
it's it's a weird interpretation. You can look at the translation of the letter yourself. It's very ta- challenging to translate. I grant it. I, I see that, but I don't know where this came from. So Manning says that Payne's analysis has a number of mistakes. He says that when here, this is a quote actually from Philip Payne, who says it relates to a, an incident when a slave of Asclepides refused to pay the boatman his fare. Or that, that's not true. Um, Asclepides is the guy who has to pay, and the the man is not anybody's slave, as far as we can tell. So Manning points these things out. He says uh, no slave is mentioned in the in the papyrus. Um, and he apparently, the man apparently sets prices over docking and negotiated other aspects of the contract and is not a slave. Incidentally, he doesn't need to pay Calatidus. It's somebody else who has to pay. And um, we don't even know if Calatidus gets the payment or not. It's that some rate related to shipping and Calatidus was brought in because he's related to the issue, but we don't know for sure who even got paid. Philip Payne, in addition to this, he claims that Asclepides is the owner of the slave. Again, there's no slave, but here's what Philip Payne says. Just as Americans normally refrain from disciplining other people's children, so Romans ordinarily refrain from commanding other people's slaves. That is why the author feels a need to send the slave owners the, to send the slave's owner an apologia, an explanation of the circumstance. This reconstruction is completely wrong, yet it's published and it's believed by many. So his interpretation of Authenteo ends up being wrong. The guy, Antilochus, is not the slave of Asclepiades. He's a third party who sets rates for shipping costs. If anybody works for Tryphon or works for Asclepiades, it's Tryphon, the writer of the letter. They have some kind of business relationship. Possibly Tryphon works under the brother Asclepiades because he seems to be the, it's a family business. It's his family that owns it. Third issue with Philip Payne. Philip Payne claims that this letter is an apology from Tryphon to Asclepiades. Remember that? That was an important claim because if it's an apology, he feels bad about this thing he did. But if it's not, if he's boasting about it, he feels good about it. All of a sudden, Althenteo has a positive meaning instead of a negative one. Further, this is not an apology letter at all, Manning says. It would be more accurate to say Tryphon is reporting some limited success in resolving several business difficulties. This is important because Payne bases his claim that this is a negative use of Althenteo on the idea that the letter is an apology for which there has been no evidence and now there is evidence against. Tryphon is saying he's sorry for doing Authenteo, according to Payne, but when you look at the letter, he's happy he did it. It's like, here's the crowning achievement of what I've done so far to resolve this issue. What's the next quote? Philip Payne says, his letter of apology to the slave's owner confirms that he had no such authority. This completely changes Philip Payne's understanding of the of the term in this passage, and it's completely wrong. Manning's analysis flips that upside down. And again, that analysis is transparent and open and available for you to read, unlike every scholar I've read on this particular passage. Um, you, they just It's not like they're trying to hide things. I'm not saying that. They don't give you the ability to check their work. Now you can check it. Manning responds. He says, Payne suggests that Tryphon did not have any authority over the mislabeled slave, and so he must have assumed that authority improperly. Without assuming much about the meaning of Athenteo, it is clear that Tryphon's previous legal actions explain Tryphon's authority. Tryphon's overall tone suggests that he believes his actions were correct, and he believes the other side is guilty of fraud. That's huge. Okay, this is huge. Athenteo is being used here in a positive, not even neutral, but a positive sense. That's big because, again, the egalitarian's number one issue with Athenteo is that it's pejorative. It's got to be negative. Whether it means incite violence or murder or just have authority, it's got to be negative in some sense. If it's not, then their, their, their whole view is in question because there aren't any other... You'll see there's no other avenues to find 1 Timothy 2.12 to mean something different. They're going to try them, but we'll, we're going to examine them all and they all end up being dead ends. What about Linda Belleville's view? Linda Belleville has different claims. She says that Tryphon is the brother of Asclepiades, but that's probably an informal title. When you look at not just the one letter, but the seven letters and the three correspondences between these two guys, you see they're not literal brothers, it seems. Um, It's an informal title because he's the brother in the family business. And um, yeah, Um, but that's not super significant. It's just interesting. Um, He writes to update him about a payment problem in family business. That's true. Linda Belleville got that totally right. That's why he's writing. Her translation is, since I took a firm stand with him 
And that's true-ish. Um, obviously, Trifon did take a firm stand. It's true that he took a firm stand, but the way in which he took a firm stand included authority. And that's Belleville's real point with this passage is that authority is not present. She is going to look at all the meanings of the word and try to say authority is not there. So that when Paul uses it, it's not there either. And that the meaning authority is super common after Paul, but it just popped up after Paul. It's not there in his writings. That's Belleville's, one of Belleville's points. Again, egalitarians have these conflicting views um, on this particular thing, as well as other things. Yeah, lots of things. If you pay attention, you can see, you go, wait a minute, that would conflict with the other thing they said. Um, but then they're not all in the same interpretive camp. They're just in the same conclusion camp. So, yeah, her translation is true-ish, but it's only ish because her translation is to exclude authority. It's not took a firm stand with him on the basis of legitimate authority or something like that. It's to the exclusion of authority. So Manny responds to that as well. He says, Belleville suggests the translation, since I took a firm stand with him. Although firm stand gives the general idea of what Trifon did, it does not adequately account for the legal steps that Trifon has taken. It is not merely that Trifon spoke firmly on this occasion. He had previously taken legal actions that gave him the advantage. This is to prove that it is not, like Belleville says, too mundane of a situation to mean authority. No, it's based upon how it's not mundane at all and how he brought in authority. He brought in leverage and control into the situation. Um, nor is it about forcing his way without rightful authority. The other thing that Belleville and others like Westfall will say is that it's always negative. Look, Trifon is forcing his will. This is what Westfall might say. Okay, my pitiful version of another person who's very intelligent human being, right? But what she might say is that Trifon is here forcing his way against an, an unwilling person who's being forced to change rates and basically not make as much money. Of course, that's against their will. But it's not pejorative. That's the point. They think this means that that makes it pejorative. That It's not. Trifon thinks it's a good thing. And so do you and me. If, if you believe the story that Trifon's telling, that they raised the rates after the fact, and then he brought in the police, and then he got the rates put back down, we're like, yeah, the good guys won. That's at least how Trifon is intending it, and that's what matters for understanding the meaning of the term in this passage. Let's look at the next quote. This is from Manning, who says, many of Walter's, he's talking now about uh, Al Walter's and his view, many of Walter's comments on BGU 1208 are quite reasonable. However, there's a, there's a correction. His hypothetical background does not seem to fit information found in the rest of the letter, of this letter, or in other family letters. Walters acknowledges that his reconstruction is tentative. Actually, Walters does do that. So let me tell you how this works. Walters suggests, he goes, I think it means this. Now, here's some hypothetical reconstruction of a potential background. He doesn't rely on it, though, but he puts it out there. He suggests that Trifon was a senior Roman official in the taxation bureaucracy. Um, that's wrong because, one, such officials tend to use their titles when writing letters like this. And this letter and the other two in the collection between Asclepiades and Trifon, they prove that he works for Asclepiades in the family business. So again, it's not, not, not as a government official, but as an, an employee of some kind or a co-worker of some kind. Walters thought um, Antilochus was a tax farmer, uh, but Manning says he's a government official who sets rates for dock rentals and ferry charges, but isn't a tax farmer. And these are differences that probably don't matter to you. Just to bring the clarity there, see page seven of Manning's paper if you want to learn more about that. Walters said that Trifon was keeping was trying to keep Calatitis from losing money, like he was just doing a favor for this guy. But the letter seems to show his primary concern is saving money for Asclepiades, paying the lower rate. Um, so just a, a minor difference there as well. And then while Manning corrects Walters, a hypothetical background for his letter, it's important to point out he thinks that Walters is correct, that this use of Althenteo is positive and is a use of authority. So it means authority and it's a positive use of authority. It's not negative. It's not, it's not usurping authority, like wrongly claiming authority that's not yours. It's not domineering or using authority in a negative fashion. It's not anything like that. It's a positive use of authority. That's huge. This is before the time of Paul. This is the verb. This isn't a noun. This is the verb being used. And it's being used as a positive use of authority. That it was not presumed or anything like that. So here's a little side issue. Um, Linda Belleville and Philip Payne also have claims that 
toward him or over him is incorrect. Um, in the passage, here, I'll put it up on your screen. Since I had exercised authority toward him, that word toward, right? That preposition that's right there. They're like, that's not right. You, you're misunderstanding it. it it's pros auton in the Greek. And I'll just say this. Uh, Manning deals with this on page six in his paper for the, for the tiny percentage of people who need to know this information. It's in his paper. It's dealt, thoroughly dealt with and it's for free in the links below. I'm not going to go over it in, in all detail here because it's just TMI. Um, totally dealt with in the paper. Here's conclusions on BGU 1208. Oh, I'm so glad I got to share this with you guys finally. It's been so long in the making. Conclusions on BGU 1208. Um, this phrase should be translated this way, or at least this is good, a good translation. And since I had exercised authority toward him, or perhaps asserted authority, though rightly so, he agreed within the hour to secure for Calatetus the boatman at the same fare. Uh, basically, it's a use of authenteo from before Paul that is a positive use of authority. It might be ingressive. What does ingressive mean? Asserted. I didn't just have authority. I asserted authority. It might be ingressive. That's why he goes back and forth. Right? And here's where Manning, I was like, just share what you really think about this. And I mean, not that he would do anything else, but I, I just want you to know, like I, just like you, I don't want some skewed version of anybody's anything. Um, we want to have the purity of the truth here. Um, it could be ingressive. Um, if it is ingressive, if that is the meaning here, asserted, and maybe Paul meant, I don't allow one to assume authority. Ah, and if he did, if he meant that, was it negative or positive? Did he mean she can't enter the role of elder or that she can't put herself in the role of elder? Which one is it? We'll, we'll address that in more detail. We've sort of been dealing with it as we go. But if it's ingressive here, then it's rightful and not the egalitarian view. Okay because it's positive. He didn't assert authority in some negative fashion. He went to the proper authorities and brought them in. And so this would be not be the egalitarian view of taking authority without it being properly delegated. It is not that. That's super important because they use the term asserted in their writings to mean that all the time. Um, so if, if it has the same meaning as 1 Timothy 2.12, then it's become, I would not allow him to become authority over a man, not presume authority. He's not refusing them, presuming it but he's saying he wouldn't appoint a woman into that position of authority. That's what Paul would be saying if it has the same meaning as that and that it means asserted. There's a ton more that I've left out for simplicity's sake. You can read it for yourself in the link below or on biblethinker.org or send us a message through the website if you're having trouble finding something. Anybody reading Al Walters on this should absolutely be reading Gary Manning on this because it's just gonna add a lot more data even though they fundamentally come to, this, to the same conclusion. There's a lot of other data that's there that's missing until Manning's paper. So good job, Gary Manning. Thank you very much for your work. Um, I appreciate it quite a bit. But let's talk about the third. That's just the second. There's eight of these, but they will not all take that long. But we'll talk about the third one. The Astrological Treatise Methodi Methodus Mystica. <laughs> okay. This is a approximately first century AD um, document right around that time. Some people have neglected this because George Knight, from what I understand, had mistakenly dated it to the 1500s, but a number of scholars before and after have shown why it's from far earlier. You can see Walter's paper in my notes. I got a link to it right here in my notes, right on page 55 of my notes of 121 pages. Um, so the larger section, the larger section that this word is found in, it gives seven different fates for people depending on where planets are. You're catching the vibes. Again, it's astrology stuff. It's like the planet's over. If Jupiter's over here, you're going to be a king. If Saturn's over here, you're going to be a loser. Like this is, this is what they do with these astrology things. So they're going to give seven different fates for people. You know, if the, if the planets are like this, you'll be this. If the planets are like that, you'll be that. They're going to go through seven options. The first one is... If they're here, you'll be a leader and ruler. The second one is a royal man. The third configuration of planets gives you, you'll be a great man. But then the last four of the seven are in this quote that I'm about to put on your screen. But the list of seven fates seems to flow in a generally negative direction. The worst one being the seventh, the best one being the first, right? So you'll either, you'll be a leader and ruler. Second one, not as good, a royal man. Third one, you'll be a great man. Not royal, but you'll still be great. But what if... We keep reading. Nope, that's not it. 
what if we keep reading? What do we get for four, five, six, and seven? Hermes is in the in the post ascension of the place of access. Signifies a common laborer. That's the fourth. You'll be a common laborer, not a great man, not a royal man, not a leader, just a common laborer. If it's in the bounds of Aries, it signifies one making a living from fire or iron. Okay, so not just a common laborer, but one who makes a living from fire or iron. Um, this makes sense because of Aries. Okay, but we're talking about someone who does hard backbreaking work. Uh, not really something you'd like to be. But if in the bounds of Kronos, it signifies a manager making a living from theft or waterside trades. Interesting. So he's a manager, but why is it below the others? Because he's making a living from like bad things and waterside trades, like stinky people and all kinds of stuff. And then we have, if in the benefic, if the benefic planets are in the quartile aspect. You don't even know what that means. Don't worry about it. The one who is superior to the foregoing in his occupation yet earns nothing. That last one, that seventh one is weird, right? This one is superior to the other six jobs in some way, yet he earns nothing. Why is that? Because it seems to describe a slave. From leader and ruler at the top to the very bottom, a slave. The worst one, the last one, that's where we get this word, authentunta, which is, we'll say, and it's fair to say this in Greek, that's authenteo, that is the verb. Okay, it's a verb usage of the term. Um, this is the worst one. There are two different translations I've seen for this. They're not significantly different, but he's superior, authenteo, he's superior to the people in the first six people in occupation, when he's got a better job than them or better skills than them, he's more capable, but he earns nothing. Or his work is higher, higher quality than their work. His work is superior to the work they do, but he earns nothing. Either way, he's got some nice quality and then he gets nothing because he's a slave. So it's a weird text, but it shows a contemporary usage of Alfenteo and it's not a negative connotation. That's the summary here. It's just not negative. It's saying something positive, though what follows is negative, right? There's a plus and there's a positive and downside. Plus side is his work or his labor in some sense is highly skilled or a great job, but he doesn't get anything from it. That's the downside. So this is authenteo positive being used around the time of Paul. That's another checkbox in the same category that we saw for the noun and for the cognates. Um, it's positive, not negative. There's no negative connotation here, minimally, whatever else you want to say about the passage. All right, let's look at the fourth example. Example number four, this is Astronicus Alexandrines, and we'll just be on this for a second, but it's in the book you've heard of probably, On the Signs of the Iliad, or okay, you may have heard of it at least. This is authentone, which is again, a verb usage of the term. It's use of the person speaking to describe them as the one from whom the words originate, right? Like, I'm the speaker, I'm the person who is talking, so the the words are originating from me. Um, Al Walters translates this, the originator of the speech. Walters says this occurs in later Greek as well. That, Like we use the word author to refer to someone who's, who's writing things. Well, the, the speaker, they have a term that's not just about the guy speaking, but it's about the words originating with that person. He's the source. Um, now, Belleville translates, it, translates this as author, but I would say that that's kind of a strange translation from her because she said that every example has to do with power or domination, but this one does not have to do with power or domination, so her summary of the data seems wrong. It has, on her own translation, it has to do with authorship, on, Walt on Walter's translation with authority, or origination, excuse me. Here's the point. While this is a very different usage than Paul, referring to the speaker that, that Paul's not talking about that at all. Like that, there's no connect. Nobody that I know connects this to first Timothy two, but it's not negative. That's my point. It's the verb being used and there's no negative connotation. We're just trying to say who is the source of those words. And it is possible that author is related to authority because the person speaking is the one who is primarily responsible for those words that were spoken. The person who's the author of the writing is the authority of the one of the writings in themselves. So this word might relate to authority itself. Um, several scholars actually say yes. Check out Walter's semantic study, page 154, footnote 55. Check that out. 
This doesn't seem much like First Timothy 2.12 at all, but again, it's not negative. So fourth example, not negative. We had one example that was useless, three examples that are all non-negative or in fact positive, such as BGU 12.08. Now we go to example number five of eight, Ptolemy, Ptolemy's work, Tetra Biblos. All right, here, bringing this book back up for you to check out. This was written around 140 AD. It's one of Linda Belleville's examples of Authenteo being used in a negative way to mean domineer. Does it hold up? And the answer is, well, you already know. You already know what I'm going to say <laughs> because um, it's been consistent. I went into egalitarian scholars and I even have it in my notes. I may have mentioned this previously where I'm saying, in my notes on Kindle, where I, I study these things on Kindle all the time so I can take notes in, in line with the books. And um, I'm writing like, boy, that's a really bad argument. I was hoping to find better arguments among egalitarian scholars. I mean, I was genuinely hoping for that. This was, you could see me getting more and more disappointed in the scholarship as I went along. And at this point, I basically um, am about to show you why. Okay, so the, 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 the work from Ptolemy. This is one of Belleville's examples of domineer. And let's look at a quote from her related to this. She says, the context in Ptolemy's second century work, Tetra Biblos 3.13 is clear. The verbal adjectives, authentesis with the sense domineer, parallels dictatorial. Okay, so in the context, she's like, hey, when you look at this paragraph, you've got the word here and there's a parallel. There's like a, a sort of a poetic or verbal connection between these two words and domineer is the parallel. Since domineer is the parallel, then the verb is being used in a negative sense. That sounds good, right? It appears on paragraph 158, page 341. I've got, I've got the book, but I also got a link in my notes to take you right to it. You can read it yourself in English. Now is where it gets a little weird. This is the F.E. Robbins translation of Ptolemy. That's the one I just showed, showed you. It's also the one Linda Belleville references, but she doesn't use it. This, which gets a little weird. <clears throat> so if Saturn alone is ruler of the soul and dominates Mercury and the moon, that word dominates, that's that's where we get our Athenteo there. If he has a dignified position with reference to the universe and the angels, he makes his subjects lovers of the body, strong-minded, deep thinkers, austere, of single purpose, laborious, dictatorial, ready to punish, lovers of property, avaricious, violent, amassing treasure, and jealous. This is like one of those things where astrologers throw out, throw out a list of things so that they can't be wrong, <laughs> I think. But basically, if you've got Saturn, who's in this position related to Mercury and the moon, then it has all these effects. The word authenteo relates to Saturn and the moon. She thinks the parallel is dictatorial, which comes far later. That word relates to people. She picked the word dictatorial I hate to say this, but it appears because it suited her purposes. But when you read the quote in context, you're like, hold on. If Saturn is ruling the soul and dominating the moon or however you want to translate this, then it has all these effects. It makes them lovers of the body, strong minded. Why isn't dominates connected to being strong minded or deep thinker or austere or single purpose or laborious, right? Why is it related to dictatorial? Because that's the word that confirms her theory. This is, this is not proper. What's the, now, is there an actual verbal parallel here? There is. If Saturn is what? Ruler of the soul and dominates Mercury and the moon. There's the parallel. Ruling is parallel to Althenteo. And ruling here is not some pejorative thing. It's just ruling. I see no reason to, to interpret it otherwise. This seems that that's the parallel. That seems to be the natural parallel that's going on in the text here, not, not something else. I think that we should acknowledge that. And if that's the case, then that just pushes that Althenteo means what? Authority. It has, it has to do with having authority. I see no reason to think any word in this list of attributes that goes, when you go further down the quote, this list of attributes that a soul gets from Saturn, that it's paralleled in the relationship of Saturn with the moon and Mercury. I don't see any reason to think that, which seems to be the assumption she's making. Saturn having influence over or being in control of the moon and Mercury is just the precondition for the list taking place. It's not that the nature of Saturn's behavior towards those other planets becomes one random element in the list of things that people become. It, anyway, that just seems strange. 
Belleville adds another support for a pejorative meaning though, and that is right here. She says, the extended context makes plain that Saturn's domination results in abusive, not beneficent consequences. So she's going to say, hey, that list of attributes you get when Saturn's in control, this shows that what Saturn was doing to the moon and Mercury was bad, right? It's just like, because this list is full of bad things, but the list isn't full of bad things. This was confusing to me when I first read it, because when you look at the list in in the F.E. Robbins translation, you're like lovers of the body that if you dig into the Greek on that, that basically means people who are healthy, people who are health minded. They take care of their bodies. They're strong minded is on the list. Being a deep thinker, being austere and being of single purpose. These are part of the list is split. Part of it's positive, part of it's negative. So you can't, in, you know, when you say the list is negative, where are you getting this from? Well, where is she getting this from? In Linda Belleville's footnote, she references the F.E. Robbins translation. But when you actually read her work, she has some other translation. I don't know where it comes from. I think it's her own. And what she's done is she's retranslated all the things that Robbins translates as positive. She translates them as negative. So she says that um, it makes them lovers of the body obstinate, which some might think is negative. But here I think I think it's positive, having looked into it. Obstinate, harsh, opinionated, troublemakers. All those that I highlighted, these are things she translates differently than her footnote says. When you when when it's footnote 35 right there, she says, yeah, that's the F.E. Robbins translation. That's what I got right here. That's what I put on your screen earlier. This is a big oopsie because it's not just, oh, that's this typo. This is like your point is wrong and you've translated strangely to prove your point and then attributed that translation to somebody else that it didn't come from when it seems like it's really your own. This is what she did. She took strong-minded and turned it into obstinate, took deep thinker and turned it into harsh, austere, became opinionated, and of single purpose became troublemakers. That's her own translation. Um, make of that what you will. The point is, um, based on at least Effie Robbins' translation, she can't import a pejorative meaning here. Okay, you remember how there's the cognates? Well, Ptolemy doesn't just use authenteo, he uses the term authentikos the adjective five times. Now, clearly these are closely related terms. How does he use it? Now I checked all five and you can get them in the notes and all that, but none of them are pejorative. Here we go. In his five uses, he uses it to refer to independence as contrasted with dependence. And this has a positive connotation because you, you want to be an independent, self-dependent person. Um, he uses it again a second time as independent contrasted with subordinate. So it has to do with someone who has control over their own lives. He uses it to refer to authority or a principle, referring to a principal city, like a city that is like the, the city that's sort of above the other cities in the region, principal city, not a pejorative meaning. Every time it's a positive connotation. And the fifth time he talks about the mastery and direction of its actions or referring to control. Um, this is coupled with mastery, an, an authority term here. Again, a positive connotation, and it's not the noun here, but a cognate related to it. This is an uh, an adjective. But if Ptolemy is using this cognate of it in these senses, and then you look at the full context, it seems like Ptolemy isn't going to help the case here that Belleville is making, but heard it. Ptolemy doesn't seem to use the term in a negative fashion. Walters adds to the case that this isn't negative in use with the following quote. Because Saturn's rulership in this case is associated with making people lovers of the body, some have argued that Authenteo must have a pejorative connotation. But this is not the case. Since in astrology, the same words for planetary influence are used regardless of whether it has a positive or negative effect on people. Besides, in this case, Authenteo describes a relationship not between Saturn and people, but between Saturn and other planets. And I think that this is kind of an important point. Here's how the astrology stuff goes. Ooh, when this planet is, is having influence over that planet, this is what happens to you. And when that planet has influence over the moon, this is what happens to you. Then when the moon has influence over this, this is what happens. But these, in, these influence terms aren't usually being used in a, in a you know, if it's going to have a positive influence, we'll use a nice word. If it's going to have a negative influence, we'll use a negative word to talk about the planetary interactions. 
It doesn't seem to be the case. So it, it just seems weird to read it in there. He further says that this usage is a lot like 1 Timothy 2.12 because Saturn is being spoken of with anthropomorphic terms. So it's a personal use of the word rather than a non-personal use of the word. Technically, he says it's a genitive of the person, not a genitive of the thing. Um, at any rate, from what I can tell, here's the summary on number five. Fifth example, this one is not pejorative or negative. It's just factual. Uh, you might suggest it's positive. I don't think it's positive. I, I think it's just factual. It's just moon influenced this, Saturn influenced that. That's, that's all it is. And it is relating to authority or control, at least control, you might say. Of our eight uses of the verb before 312 AD, the sixth one comes from a guy named Morris. And we briefly mentioned him earlier. Um, he basically says the following. He says that auto decaying is effectively the same as authentane. And so that that's the verb in the Greek. So he's relating two different Greek words together. The real question we have is what does auto decaying mean? Linda Belleville suggested it meant to be a dictator um, and that it has a pejorative meaning, but there was no, I don't believe there was any justification given for that definition. Um, Walters offers three other ancient lexicons to support that it's, this is actually a non-pejorative definition about someone acting on their own in court, like representing themselves in court, that type of thing, acting on their own in court. So being sort of under their own authority, you might you might say. Maybe you think I'm stretching it a bit, but it, it would seem to fit in that broad category. Um, for more details on that, just see uh, Walter's work. But here is a quote for you. On the basis of the foregoing evidence, I would submit that authenteo in the Morris entry means act on one's own, as we shall see in that this is, in fact, a common meaning of the verb in later Greek. Now, is that related to authority? Again, I say plausibly, plausibly. Uh, one who pleads his own case, like in court, they represent themselves, they're acting on their own authority, right? They're, they're taking their entire case, their life, and putting it in their own hands. They're acting on their own authority. That does seem plausible to me. But here's something that is more than plausible. This does not have a negative connotation. This this entry in Morris is not dictator with a pejorative meaning, as Belleville says. It's, it's just acting on their own. It does not seem to have any negative connotation. This is super consistent. Have you caught this? We've all these examples. We have not yet seen a pejorative usage of the term authenteo. Let's look at number seven, and this one will be quick and easy, right? This is the papyrus P. Teptunus, if, if I, unless I typoed that at any rate. This papyrus is an uncertain text. Uh, it's damaged. It could be reconstructed in a number of different ways. It could be a noun. It could be the verb. It's not really clear, but we're going to skip it as most do in this discussion. We could talk about it, but it's ultimately a waste of time because we end up saying it has no bearing on our understanding of the term, which brings us to the last of our eight examples. And this one's kind of important because it's the only time we have the verb, not the noun, but the actual verb, right? Just like Paul used a verb being used to refer to murder. This is the one time. So that's kind of a big deal. Uh, now I've said the evidence prior to this suggests that the murder meaning does not overlap into authentase meaning master or any of the cognates that we looked at or any of the examples we've looked at. In fact, none of them are pejorative at all, but hey, murder's pretty pejorative and it means murder. And there's no way Paul meant murder in 1 Timothy 2.12, but could there be some sort of negative connotation that we're borrowing from that? So you can actually view this example um, in a link I've got in the notes that you can get down below. Uh, in English, you can read it, but it's the only use of the verb to mean murder. And here you go. Here's the quote. This, this scholion reads as follows. Um, this word vividly portrays one who has just committed murder. And that word murder is where we get the verb being used in that sense. Now there's two different sort of sides, the egalitarian interpretation of this and the complementarian interpretation of this. I'll just put it that way to you. Not that everybody has to be one of those camps to have those views, but for the sake of our study, they do tend to fall into those sides. There's a guy named Orestes um, and he has just committed murder. Linda Belleville translates it this way, the murderer who has just now committed an act of violence. The egalitarian side, it, it he would take perhaps this as trying to expand the meaning of the term beyond murder to general violence and general bad, maybe illegal or illicit behavior. So like a perpetrator. Um, Will Shire does this too. I haven't so far spent much time on this, but I, I don't think it works. I think that almost every example they have of it being general criminal behavior 
is just an example of it being murder. I mean, they're trying to take the word, expand its meaning, and then bring that over to First Timothy, but it doesn't quite work in my opinion. On the complementarian side, it's not just an act of violence. Orestes is the guy who's being talked about here, and he has just killed his own mother. If you read the text itself in English, he just killed his own kin, his own blood. Therefore, this is a singular singular use of the verb authenteo to mean what authentes meant in ancient Greek, in the Attic Greek, in the older Greek. Kin murderer. Kin murderer. Someone who kills their just you know, kills their own blood. Um by not, here's another quote for you guys on this. By not recognizing the connection with the Attic sense of authentes, some scholars have mistakenly translated the verb here more generally as commit an act of violence, so Belleville, or have even given it the meaning initiate, so hutar. And actually, Wilshire seems to lean on that concept, at least, because he takes initiate violence in 1 Timothy 2.12, which I think is not reasonable at all. Um, so the context really matters. This is not just any old writing. It's a scholarly commentary on an Attic Greek work. So it's a guy who's writing about Attic stuff, right? Where the person is using the verb authenteo in a singular odd usage connected to the older Attic use of the noun for a kin murderer. What does this mean? It means it doesn't simple. It just doesn't apply to 1 Timothy 2.12 and doesn't seem representative of any typical usage of the verb in Paul's time. There's more troubles with it, though. So it may be like an addis, an addisist thing going on. And they even made mistakes sometimes. So he may be trying to channel something that simply didn't exist. He knows authentic meant murder, so he takes authenteo and uses that non-standard meaning there. But the dating and authorship are also in question. Uh, Payne says scholars generally view it as being just before Paul, but Walters makes a case, and he's not alone, that it's a good deal later. And for that, see women in the church... Third edition, I believe it was. Yeah, third edition, page 82. So Walter's opinion seems plausible. I'll put that on the screen to understand this. I'm not disputing that it means murder here, but let's look at what he says here. I think it seems reasonable. I myself am inclined to believe that the Aeschylus scholion is late and represents an example of an atticistic hypercorrection. That is, a mistake in usage by an atticist purist who assumed because the noun authentase and attic meant murder and because the verb authenteo is derived from authentes, that the proper attic meaning of the verb must be murder. In fact, however, there's no evidence that the verb ever occurred in attic and no evidence that it ever had the meaning murder anywhere outside of Aeschylus, the Aeschylus scholion itself. I think that seems pretty reasonable. Um, but if, let's suppose though that the egalitarians are right, that this represents a known use in Paul's time. They're wrong in translating it act of violence because the specific thing there fits kin murderer and it's an attic, an attic usage that it's connected to of authentic. So this is wrong to sort of generalize the term and, and do what Wilshire does where he says, hey, it meant murder and then it sort of turned into perpetrator, this sort of general bad behavior thing. I don't see that in the examples he gives. Almost every example of where it supposedly meant perpetrator or act of violence is just murder. Meaning the word is not opening up to a broader usage. It still has a special meaning that Paul is definitely not tapping into in 1 Timothy 2. Uh, on the other hand, if Walters is right, then it, it's just one author being confused and it doesn't really weigh in on 1 Timothy in any way. Or, or even our understanding of the verb at all, because it's just one author who got confused. So here's some conclusions. All right, in case I lost you in the mix, conclusions on the eight examples of the verb before 312 AD. This is my summary. We ignore the first one. It wasn't helpful. It's It's got corruptions and stuff. The second one, authenteo meant uh, superior, and it's a positive use of the term. The third one, it meant asserted authority. And again, it's a positive, not negative. It means a positive use. Um, it could also have just meant exercised authority. In the fourth one, we have author or originator, and that's neutral. It's not positive or negative. Then mastery, and it's neutral. In the sixth one, to act on one's own, perhaps on their own authority, and it's neutral. Um, and then finally, seven we ignore and because it's 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 unhelpful. And the eighth example, it's kin murderer, and it's very negative. Summary: the term does not automatically imply a negative connotation, which is one of the most important talking points for the egalitarian interpretation. A regular egalitarian talking point about authenteo is entirely wrong, and it's in almost all the writings. 
That's huge. Okay, this is really big deal. And this is stuff that most normal people have no ability to research and get into. They just are going to read the egalitarian and go, it says here that it's generally used in a negative fashion or always used in a negative and domineering fashion. And that is simply not the case. Or Philippine, it says here it's not related to authority. Or it's going to be Belleville who says it's not related to authority at all. And that is also not the case. Um, 1 Timothy 2 would need to provide context. Here's where we stand. 1 Timothy 2, the passage itself, would have to give us context that shows us that Paul means it in a negative way. You cannot just say the word itself creates the negative meaning by itself because it doesn't do it anywhere else. Why would it do it in 1 Timothy 2? So to put it conservatively, authenteo does not carry an automatic or implied negative meaning. It doesn't. And it seems to be connected to master or authority in some fashion especially when you look at 1 Timothy 2.12's context. In my large amount of studies on the topic of women in ministry, especially on this passage, 1 Timothy 2, especially on the word authenteo, I found there's a lot of myths out there. Myths in scholarship, myths on the popular level, myths on the social media level, myths, sadly, that people are believing as they make decisions on their local church government and offices and who can do what. And they're believing things that simply aren't true about this ancient Greek word. And this is like a really big deal because this one word can can flip your understanding of not just 1 Timothy 2, but it can be like the lever that you go, wow, if I can reinterpret that passage differently, then really I, I, I feel so much more open to all these other interpretations that may not have seemed likely on the surface, but... <sighs> Now I'm more open to them. And this is what I've seen. I've seen people who they're they're complementarian or patriarchalist and they're holdouts on 1 Timothy 2. And they're thinking, if I could just find this something else for this one passage that I felt good with, that I felt was legit, then I would change my view on the rest of the Bible. Um, I've seen people like that. And so that's why myths about this word authenteo are a really big problem. So before we move on, onto the next section on Authenteo, which is about how early church writers understood Greek ones in particular, like early Christians who spoke Greek. What did they think this word meant when they were reading Paul? Before we do that, we're going to talk about a problem that I've seen in Linda Belleville's work on Authenteo. Um, and that is, the reason why I want to cover this is, again, it's not some kind of assassination. I've heard others say, Linda Belleville's well-known, she does great work. And I believe that. Like, there's many areas where she does great work. But every one of us can make mistakes. I can make mistakes. Someone will be going through this with a fine tooth comb and they may find mistakes I've made and good, those should be exposed, any mistakes that I've made. And so these should be as well for the sake of truth and to help people not be basing how they run the church of God off of myths, things that aren't true. So we have seen a number of good reasons already and we'll see more uh, to conclude that the word Authenteo has the word authority, has the concept of authority in the meaning of Authenteo. Not just control, not just power, but actually authority. Um, but Linda Belleville seeks to deny that meaning in the first century and to say that that only popped up after the time of Paul. But when Paul wrote it, it never, never meant authority. And then all of a sudden, after Paul, suddenly it meant it kind of to everybody. Here's a quote from Belleville that explains this. I've shared this before, but we're going to examine it in a bit more detail because her sources that she uses are a real problem for her actual case. Note that her case relates to the meaning authority. This is super important because I've seen others who read her work and just missed this. Uh, so there's no first century warrant, she says, no first century warrant for translating authentane as to exercise authority over and for understanding Paul in 1 Timothy 2.12 to be speaking of, of the carrying out of one's official duties. Rather, the sense in everyday usage is to dominate, to get one's way. There is no warrant whatsoever, zero, to translate it as to exercise or have authority over. Now, the problem there is not in exercise or have, okay, that's not the problem, but rather the word authority. That's what she's denying. Now, Linda Belleville, again, I, I gotta stress this, her point is authority is not a meaning of the word in Paul's time. She uses two sources to support this idea, the first of which is a uh, work from James Moulton and George Milligan. It's a lexicon. And this is where she footnotes or ref refers to this as a source to prove the point she just made. She says, James Moulton and George Milligan state that the authent word group is very well established in the popular vocabulary of despot autocrat. Two meanings, despot 
and autocrat. They're both pejorative, which is, of course, Belleville's point, and most egalitarians, they want to say this word is pejorative in meaning. But if you look at what Mo Milton and Mulligan, Moulton and Milligan, <laughs> it's hard to say their names, Eminem, we'll just call them Eminem. If you look at what Eminem have actually said in their entry on the Authenteo part of their lexicon, it actually says this. It's on your screen there. You can look at it in detail, but I'm just going to point out a few details. Uh, this is on page 91. Uh, Authentes, the noun, means master, according to them. Master, which is an authority term, and that's the connection to 1 Timothy, according to them, so that the verb is coming from the noun that means master or authority. Uh, 1 Timothy 2.12's usage comes from master or autocrat, but the word despot is not anywhere in Moulton and Milligan's work here. I, not, not that I can see. Look, if I'm making a mistake, I just went to her reference, found the exact entry that she referred to. The word despot does not occur in the entry any, anywhere whatsoever. And the word master does, which is really strange because she's trying to deny that master meaning. Right now in English, modern English, master has a pejorative connotation. It didn't to them. Okay, It didn't in, in ancient times and it didn't to most people throughout time. This is just a modern thing. We don't want to be anachronistic and read a pejorative meaning into a term that they didn't think was pejorative because what we care about is what they thought it meant not what you think it means now. <laughs> so that's really important. What about the term autocrat? Um, so autocrat is there, and autocrat is a pejorative term. That is a negative term. So there's two terms they use for 1 Timothy 2.12. One is simply a neutral term referring to authority. And the other one is a, uh, a, a term that also includes authority. A despot is one who has authority, of course, but is a pejorative one. Uh, I will argue against the pejorative meaning and I think that th this this whole video that I'm doing, this giant section on Authenteo, is going to argue against the pejorative meaning there. So I think they're incorrect on that, in my opinion. You'll make up your own mind. But the authority, authority is the common meaning. But in, on Eminem's resource here that she uses to say authority is not the meaning of the word, authority is the meaning of the word. It's the commonality between the two possible meanings. You can read the entry if you have really good eyesight or a computer screen or something else. Uh, but again, you can check it in my notes. Read it for yourself. It's on page 91 of their work. So Belleville makes two major mistakes that can mislead people and cause myths that then lead churches astray, I think, on this particularly important issue where culture is clashing with Scripture in a big, in a big way such that the church is very confused. First, she claims that authority is not part of the word while quoting a work, a source that says that it is. Second, she removes the term master from this source that she's quoting and replaces it with the word despot in order to argue for a pejorative definition that their work does not support, at least not in that way. Oh, and here on your screen, you can see this is the little section from Eminem where they put master and autocrat, not despot and autocrat. Again, this is um, a big deal, actually, uh, as far as it possibly causing someone to misunderstand the meaning of the term. And she's basing an argument on this that's obviously incorrect. Uh, the second quote, her second source for claiming that Authenteo didn't have the, the meaning of authority as part of the word in Paul's time, is the UBS handbook. And this is the United Bible Society's translators. The, okay, this is like considered a very respectable, very high up there source. So Belleville's claim about the handbook is that Daniel Archaea, Archaea and Howard Hatton translate Authentane in 1 Timothy 2.12 as to control in a domineering manner. And again... We just have to check the sources. Okay, so here's the UBS handbook. Here's a highlighted section from that. I'm just going to go ahead and read it for you. And it shows that, here's the issue, they do think authority is part of the word's meaning, which is what Belleville seeks to deny. And finally, women should be submissive and should not have authority over men. That's clearly their understanding that Authentain means authority here. Submissiveness includes the elements of recognition, subordination, and obedience. The, the addition of all indicates the intensity and extent of the submission. Hence, the NRSV, learn with full submission. Or one may translate, be completely submissive to the authority of the men as teachers. Teaching and authority are, are, are there, and they say that's a legitimate translation. Uh, this perhaps means that the women shouldn't submit to the authority of the men as teachers should submit and should accept with humility and obedience what is taught to them. The logical offshoot of this is that women should not teach men or have authority over them. Th this is their commentary on this, which she seeks to, to say 
doesn't mean authority, but instead means to control in a domineering manner. Well, that phrase comes up, but what she's done is she's pulled it out of context to make it sound as though they're agreeing with her that the word doesn't mean authority. So as we, as we read on, they say to have authority translates a Greek verb that means to control, to dominate, to control in a domineering manner. Now, I, again, because I've, of all of the extensive studies I've done on Authenteo and all the evidence I'm sharing with you, you make up your own mind. I don't think that that's a good translation to control, to dominate, to control in a domineering manner. I don't think that that's the best translation and pretty much no translators have, have gone down that road, right? As we look at translations, even throughout time, we're going to see that almost nobody goes that way. Almost nobody. So I do think that that's incorrect, but that doesn't mean that the UBS handbook is saying authority is not part of the word. That's the big point here. Belleville is trying to say authority is not part of the word and quotes two sources who both say that it is. There's just so many myths about Authenteo and about First Timothy and about ancient Ephesus and w the cult of Artemis. And it was supposedly it was a sex cult, some say, and others would say, oh, supposedly it was it was a, a virgin chaste cult. And others will say it was um, the worship of Artemis was a feminist environment and Ephesus was a feminist thing. And there was a slew of female false teachers and you can get hints of it in First Timothy. There's so many different things going on out there I understand why people are confused. I understand why, and maybe you understand why, I need to make this ridiculously long video to go through all the evidence because in the end, it kind of means what it looks like it means <laughs> and, and has looked like it meant and how people have basically understood it throughout time. And this is really no surprise to most of you. You're like, yeah, I guess I should have expected that. I should have expected that. But we want to do our diligence and go through all of the evidence. So let's keep going through the evidence. Um, me and you today in the 21st century, we are very far removed from Paul. Uh, we're also far removed from the language that Paul spoke, Koine Greek. Doesn't that make you wonder, how did people who were alive around the time of Paul or maybe just after him, how did they understand what Paul wrote? So if we could interview people who were alive 100 years later, 200 years later, and they're writing in response to us going, answering the question, what do you think Paul meant when he said, Authenteo, Authentain? What do you think he meant when he used that word? What would they say? Well, this is actually an exciting and sometimes neglected piece of evidence from the church fathers, from these Greek speaking, in particular, Greek speaking church fathers. How did they understand this term that Paul used? It doesn't mean that they're 100% right, but hey, if they're largely in agreement, that's a big piece of evidence that we can add to a lot of other evidence to help us be fairly confident about the meaning of the word, at least I think so. So the Greek church fathers, this is where um, Leland uh, Wilshire, who again is an, is an egalitarian, he will say that the word authenteo takes on the predominant meaning of authority. That's a quote from him. The predominant meaning is authority amongst the church fathers. I would say that word predominant is an understatement. It is just dominant. It is the meaning uh, of the word almost exclusively amongst the church fathers. So these men are important because they represent how fairly early Greek speakers, compared to us anyway, um, understood the term. Let me talk about a few of them, and I'll, I'll put up a chart that shows you a bunch of them as well. So Irenaeus, you may have heard of Irenaeus, right? He lived around 115 to maybe 202 AD, right, right in that region there. He writes a book in about 180 AD called Against Heresies. You can still access it online in English for free. It's, it's, it's pretty easy to get to. Um, but Wilshire says each of the contexts in which he uses this word three times in his work against heresies seems to demand the meaning of authority. Irenaeus even uses authenteo of God, which some have taken understandably to, to mean that the word can't be pejorative. It, it must not be controlled in a domineering manner or be a despot or be an autocrat if it's used of God, at least when Irenaeus uses it. Let's go to the next one, Clement of Alexandria. Clement of Alexandria is a special case because only Clement, among all of the church fathers we're going to look at, had classical training. He had classical training, in, not in Koine Greek, but in classical, right? that old Attic Greek we talked about earlier. He had training in that those old usages of terms, not just the current ones during his time. So this makes him more, uh, more likely to be aware of the Attic usage of the term. And sure enough, he's the only one who uses uses. Uh, Authentase and Authenteo and this sort of word group, he'll also use it to refer to suicide. So five times he uses he uses the term. Uh, twice it means authority. Uh, one of them is the authority of the Lord. 
the authority of the Lord in Clement of Alexandria. This is, you know, 150 to 215 AD. So right, right around the end of the second century, he's writing. Three times he uses it to refer to suicide or murder. And here's a quote from uh, Wilshire on this. He says, in the Stromata, he's responding to the religious and the religions and philosophies of his cl this classical background. Possibly the multiple meanings of the word come from this complex intellectual involvement. Basically, he's saying, hey, you know, here we have one work where Clement refers to it, uses the word to talk about authority, and he also uses it to talk about murder or suicide. But he had that classical background, and in this particular work, he's responding to people who are familiar with and tapping into that classical background. So it makes sense that he uses the terminologies they lean on as well. Here's one of the reasons why Clement's super interesting, though. He's aware of the murder meaning. This is huge. I don't see many people talk about this. He's aware of the murder meaning, but he doesn't seem to bring that negative connotation over to the normal usage of the word when he talks about it being the authority of the Lord. It's not the negative or des despotic authority of the Lord or autocratic authority of the Lord. It's not pejorative at all. Here's a church father who's fully aware of the suicide or murder meaning, does not think it impacts the meaning in 1 Timothy 2 or the meaning, I should say, the meaning of the word when it's used of authority. Um, this is huge because I showed you a list of scholars that thought that it should do exactly that, but the evidence for that is lacking. In fact, there's evidence against it. Let's talk about origin. Next Church Father, Origen, you've heard of these ones probably, right? I'm going to talk about some you maybe you have never heard of as well in a second. But Origen, writing 185 to 253 AD, that's his life lifespan anyways. He has it twice. He uses the word authority twice, or um, uses the word for authority twice. And that's it. He only uses it for authority. Uh, one of them, it, this is super cool, it actually shows his interpretation of 1 Timothy 2. Let me let me put um, that on, on the screen for you. There we go. Origen says, I do not permit a woman to teach. And now what, why is he saying that? He's quoting Paul and then giving commentary on it. So he's quoting 1 Timothy 2.12 and then talking about what he thinks it means. I do not permit a woman to teach, not without qualification, but nor to have authority over a man. I will demonstrate this point from elsewhere as well, even though that that text stands as a rather secure statement about the woman not being the man's leader in the ministry of the word. He thought that this was, um, in particular, it seems, origin from this quote, thought that it meant a woman couldn't be in, in that sort of role of basically like an elder teaching a man with that authority. The, the, clearly, he thinks that Paul simply sees it as meaning authority. He does not interpret it to mean abuse of authority, domineering authority, inciting violence, committing murder. He doesn't see any of that there. Origen is an interesting case because he's an early person commenting on 1 Timothy 2. Origen did not see it as assume authority either. Origen didn't see this as a person taking authority that wasn't rightfully theirs. He just saw it as that them, uh, as a person simply stepping into that role or being in that role of authority um, while teaching or with coupled with the teaching, meaning that maybe it wouldn't apply to a woman being a boss. It wouldn't apply to a woman being overseeing other things perhaps in the church. I don't know what origin would have thought of that, but he, he doesn't seem to think this passage is saying something about that. All right. The word authenteo, let's just, let's just jump ahead to a bunch of church fathers all at the same time here. In its various forms, it's always found to mean authority in this big laundry list of church fathers. All, every, except for one exception I'll get into in a minute. So, in Philakius, right, uh, six times he uses it of authority. Asterius, seven times it means authority. Athanasius, eight times it always means authority. Basil, 15 times it always means authority. Gregory of Nazianzus, Nazianzus, <laughs> not in Kansas, Nazianzus. It means authority twice when he uses it. Six times Gregory of Nyssa uses it for authority. Pseudo Justin Martyr. Um, third to fifth century AD. We're not sure, right? Uh, nine citations, always authority. Palladius, three citations, always authority. Sozomenus, two citations, always authority. Epiphanius, nine citations. It always means authority. Sometimes he uses it of the apostles, meaning it, it wouldn't be pejorative. Sometimes he uses it of Jesus or of the Godhead or, you know, the, the Trinity. Other times of the fathers, of other people who uh, he sees as authoritative from the past. 
Eusebius uses it 26 times. It always means authority. John Chrysostom, John Chrysostom is an exception. Now he uses it 124 times. <laughs> like that's just a lot to go through. He used 124 times and he uses it to mean authority most of the time. Either it's human authority or divine authority, but it just means authority. And again, this, this is the summary of uh, an egalitarian scholar, uh, Leland Wilshire who doesn't want it to mean authority from all I can tell from his works because he writes a paper that seems to conclude it means authority and then writes a second paper to say, but it doesn't mean that um, in 1 Timothy. My my admittedly personal opinion about, about what's going on behind the scenes there. Um, so John Chrysostom, uh, 24 times in spurious works. Th- so out of this 124, 24 of those times, it's works that are attributed to him but they're probably not written by him, but they're classed as you know, pseudo-Chrysostom or something. Um, also, always authority in those passages. There is debate on one passage in Chrysostom, and this gets a little bit detailed, so let me put it on your screen. Philip Payne writes about Chrysostom, and they'll often egalitarians will skip over all these fathers and they'll jump to one quote by Chrysostom. Um, so Philip Payne, he writes in one of his works, Homilies in Ephesians and, and Colossians, do not therefore, because thy wife is subject to thee, act the despot. This is a quote from Chrysostom. He says, just because your wife is subject, don't act the despot. That's actually, that word there is the authenteo word. Authenteo. And he says, don't do this. Two husbands, don't do this just because your wife is subject to you. This is I, it, actually, when you understand it properly, I think this is a very complementarian feel to it. But we're trying to figure out what the word means. And here's a guy using the word standalone by itself in a pejorative fashion. This is a rare exception, rare exception to the overwhelming number of uses where it's not pejorative at all. So, of course, you see scholars grab onto it and go, see, it's pejorative. But when they don't give you all the other church fathers and all the other ex- examples of usage, and they're not distorting some of those handful of times we see it used outside of reference to the New Testament, then... Um, then that can be misleading. So, Payne goes on. Uh, PGL 262 translates this, play the despot or act arbitrarily. As in 1 Timothy 2.12, being subject contrasts with authente or authenteo. Except here, it is men who are not to authente. If it means to have authority, then Chrysostom wrote, do not have authority over your wife. Um, obviously, this is the kind of quote that unsettles people. They go, wait, wait, I thought I had this really secure understanding. The word always means authority. Actually, I'm not saying that if you got that from me. <laughs> um, uh, it, it always means authority in these examples. It doesn't mean that it simply always means authority. Um, but the word authority is part of the word inherently, it seems, uh, for a number of reasons we've covered, from the, the noun to the cognates to the examples of usage to the understanding of the church fathers to translations we'll get into in a minute or in, in an hour, however long it takes to get there. Um, so is this pejorative? Um, people on both sides agree that this Chrysostom quote, the little section you've got here that's from Chrysostom, that that is pejorative. They, it's using the word and it is pejorative. Okay, there's no, there's no real debate on that. I don't think there is. Um, so some egalitarians, they don't mention the following. Chrysostom also comments on 1 Timothy 2.12. Why is that important? Because what they'll do is they'll say, hey, we're trying to understand what it means in 1 Timothy 2.12. Now we'll quote Chrysostom. He used it to be pejorative. So therefore, it's pejorative in 1 Timothy 2.12. Based on what? On Chrysostom's understanding of the word. But this is the quote you don't usually hear to follow up in this discussion. And I'm surprised. I look through egalitarian works. They just don't, they just don't bring it up, generally speaking. So here Chrysostom is explaining what some might see as a contradiction. Okay, he's resolving an issue. And the issue is that when Paul says women shouldn't uh, shouldn't uh, teach in 1 Timothy 2.12, but in Titus 2, he says that women should teach. Now he says for them to teach other women. But he's like, is this a contradiction? So here's his quote from Chrysostom. But I do not permit a woman to teach, but listen to what Paul added, nor to have authority over a man. For to men, it is permitted to teach both men and women from on high. That means with authority. To women, he permits the word of exhortation at home, but nowhere does he allow them to preside 
or does he let them hold an extended discourse? For this reason, he added the words, nor to have authority over a man so that they can instruct, he says, the young women. So Chrysostom, we don't need to worry about how, you know, whether you agree with his, 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 you know, way of joining together these two ideas. I, I would, I would change it to a degree, you know, I don't fully agree with that. But the point is this, he clearly thinks that Paul's using the term in 1 Timothy 2 in a non-pejorative way. So how can we quote Chrysostom to think that the word just has always got a pejorative meaning when Chrysostom doesn't think it has that in the very passage we're debating? At least egalitarians in their writings, if they're going to quote Chrysostom, they should quote this part of him too, because otherwise it is misleading. So my point here, Chrysostom shows us the word can, can carry a pejorative meaning. Can. The question isn't can it, the question is does it always? Is it consistently pejorative such that when it appears in First Timothy, you should just assume that's negative? It's domineering, it's being, it's play the despot, it's something like that. And I don't think that we can say that. Um, Scott Baldwin uh, says that Chris Austin's probably using hyperbole here. And he says this is the only time we see it used in a hyperbolic way that in his, his ex, he's done some extensive studies on Authenteo. He's never seen another example of it being used in, in this fashion. Every other time Authenteo is used in a negative sense, it's the context that shows us it's negative. This is the one time where it's like there's very little context. You only know it's negative because he tells them don't do this. Like it must be something he doesn't like because he says don't do it. At any rate, one example that's hyperbolic that we would be going against Chrysostom if we used it in 1 Timothy 2. That's the point. Chrysostom's own understanding of the word, which is what egalitarians are trying to point to, is that it's not pejorative in 1 Timothy 2.12. It's something that's positive when a, when a man does, as far as he knows, it's positive when a man does it, but not every time a man does it. I, I think that would be a summary of Chrysostom's understanding of the term. Uh, Payne's application of Chrysostom's first quote to 1 Timothy 2 contradicts Chrysostom's own commentary on 1 Timothy 2. This is uh, not good Bible study. So a third quote from Chrysostom shows he doesn't see the term as inherently negative. Let me give you one more quote. Uh, Daniel Doriani points this out, uh, that in Chrysostom's homilies or his commentaries on Timothy, he says this about the fall in Genesis 3. Here's the quote. Chrysostom says that Eve exercised authority once wrongly. And he uses that, that word group for authentes, authenteo. Uh, the implication, obviously, is that Chrysostom could not make the negative force felt without the addition of kakos, which is to say wrongly. She used authority wrongly. And therefore, he did not regard the verb authenteo as negative in itself. This is actually a really good point. If if the verb was bad, inherently bad, he wouldn't have to say wrongly. Like I wouldn't say he stole that car wrongly. <laughs> I just go, he stole that car because the word stole just implies that was that was a, a, an immoral act. If authenteo was automatically bad, you wouldn't have to add Eve exercised authority once wrongly. And um, again, you don't have to agree with his understanding of Eve here. The point is, his understanding of the word does not fit what the egalitarians are saying his understanding of the word was, apparently. So Walters adds another example that people tend to overlook. And this, again, like everything else in the world, when you talk about this stuff, is debated. But I won't get into the debate. I'll just say the Cyrilli lexicon about 5th century AD, um, it's ascribed to Cyril of Alexandria, this, this section of it. Um, and it's overlooked because some people doubt that it's really from him. But is more complicated than that. It's more like it survives in a document where some stuff goes back to him and some stuff doesn't, and there's a debate. Um, but Walters makes a good case for it on pages 79 and 80 of Women in the Church, 3rd edition. You can check that out on your own. Here's the main point. Let's add this as soft evidence. Walters explains um, that 1 Timothy 2.12, the meaning of Authenteo here is explicitly equated with exousiazo. Now, this is super important because... Exousiazo means authority. And here in this lexicon, this well-respected church father, if it does trace back to him, which seems like it does, this particular entry, um, they this church father says, hey, I know that I'm the scholarly guy. I know the Greek stuff. I'm telling you, this word in this passage 
it's connected to the word authority, exousiazo. This is exactly the thing that egalitarians say it doesn't mean in many cases. Um, so that word exousiazo, it's not pejorative, it's not negative, and it's not aggressive. It doesn't mean taking authority that doesn't belong to you or even just taking authority or stepping into a role of authority. It doesn't mean that at all. So check that out on your own if you want to get more details. That's another one that people tend to overlook. Here's some points, some, some conclusions on the church fathers. Church fathers who knew Greek thought the word referred to authority consistently. They did not, even Chrysostom, they did not think the term Im generally implied negative or ingressive connotations. It didn't mean domineer, nor did it mean assume or presume or take, nothing like that. It didn't mean those things as far as their writings go. In the book, Paul and Gender, Cynthia Long Westfall never covers these quotes from Chrysostom, which shows that Chrysostom doesn't see this as a pejorative meaning, even though she leans on him to say that it is pejorative. I think that that's actually pretty significant. Myths on top of myths, it is egalitarian scholarship has a lot of problems and they're problems that are at the foundation of the view. Um, and I think I, I think this has been demonstrated throughout the, I did not expect this, okay? I, I thought higher, I assumed better of that side of the aisle. And I came in open-minded, ready to change my view, as far as I know, okay? Unless I'm lying to myself and if you know my heart better than I do, then congratulations, come and let me know what else I've got going on that I don't know about. Um, but as far as I know, I, I was not only willing to change my mind, but wanting to change my mind and move away from complementarian views um, to egalitarian views was willing to pay any cost that would have for ministry connections and stuff like that. There was, there's just, and I don't think this is because of some godliness in me or some proper moral drive. I think it's just the influence of my culture weighing on me and, and me just going, man, it would be so much easier to not have to deal with this. <laughs> I think that might've been the reason. I'm not sure. Um, at any rate, I'm, I was willing to go there. Did not expect to find such, um, such a weak foundation for so many strong claims. But that's how it is. And weak foundation is probably an understatement. One of the surprising things about the historical usage of authenteo is when it's used of God and when it's used of Jesus. And you might wonder, what, what do egalitarians say of that? Like, surely if you're going to use the word of God, of Jesus, it's not a negative term. It doesn't mean like something cruel or something abusive or something domineering. It's God. You know, this is, he, he, he's holy. He only does good. He only does what is right. But there's an egalitarian response to this that you might want to be aware of. And it comes from Cynthia Long Westfall here. She says, forcing a person against their will, which, you know, different egalitarians have different understandings of the word. She sees it as um, its usage always implies forcing someone against their will. And so that's part of the meaning of the term on, on her theory. So forcing a person against their will in a destructive way, in a destructive way, is appropriate for divine sovereignty and righteous judgment. Sodom and Gomorrah and the wicked, and it was believed to be appropriate for absolute authorities and government officials who were enforcers, such as an executioner. But if it is unauthorized, it is almost always inappropriate. Um, there's a few things I want to point out here. Um, that that's it's 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 clever. It might work. Like that might work. This, of course, requires that we consistently see authenteo being used as forcing a person against their will in a destructive way. And we don't see that in the examples that we've looked at in the past. We do not see that in the examples of even the church fathers, the one, she, the example she's talking about, we do not see any consistent usage that implies against your will in a destructive way. For instance, it's used multiple times in these examples she's responding to of Jesus when he commanded Lazarus to come forth from the grave. How is this against Lazarus's will? How is this a destructive in a destructive way, it's neither of those things. It's very positive. It's it's and it's used in that exact connotation. So it doesn't mean that is the thing. It just doesn't mean that. Um, but also to say an unauthorized use of authority is bad, which is what her quote above requires, isn't saying anything at all really about authenteo if it's used about authorized authority, which it is. And so it just seems like. It just seems like we're throwing confusion into the mix here to avoid what seems obvious. The term is often used in positive ways, especially in the church fathers, very consistently. It's used in positive ways, not in negative ways at all, um, for the most part. 
So believe it or not, there's a ton more information on this word. I'm not going to get into all of it. Um, studies, we could talk about studies of how it's used after 312 AD. And in, in if you go past 312 AD, there's more variety in the usage of the word, a lot more variety. And I think that that is interesting to study, but also we're getting further and further from Paul's time. And so we're interested in how Paul meant it. We're not just studying the word for the fun of it. But for that, I'd recommend you look at Women in the Church, 3rd edition, pages 89 through 110. There's a pretty good survey of content that you can look at there. But we can see, to reverse Linda Belleville's claim, we can see there is first century warrant for authority being part of the meaning of the word, but not for any assumed negative connotation, nor can we push that it's ingressive, that it's assumed authority or stepped into authority. It's possible but it's not something that you should just assume is always present in the word. That's what we, I think we've seen so far. Let's move on to the next subject, which is early translations. And I think things will get easier uh, soon. <laughs> maybe maybe you're tracking along fine. Maybe I'm doing hopefully a good job communicating this massive amount of information, but there are harder sections and easier sections. I think this one's easier. Translations is something that's more understandable to us. We sort of get that a little bit easier than some of this other stuff. <clears throat> At any rate, Early translations of 1 Timothy 2.12. Okay, so we're not just talking about a church father quoting or talking about a passage or using a word, but rather we're talking about when they took it from Greek and they translated it into Syriac or they translated it into Gothic. We're going to look at some really a lot of details about some ancient, ancient translations of 1 Timothy 2.12. When we got these first translations, what did they do with the word? Because it's at least a piece of evidence to support a view. It doesn't mean it proves it entirely by itself, but... But it's very helpful. And in our case, it will be very, very helpful. So we will see that there are some claims by egalitarians that are simply not accurate. Uh, one of them is that in translations, it's a modern and newer convention to translate 1 Timothy 2.12 as have authority. That ancient translations, early translations, they consistently thought it meant something else. Okay, that's a claim that we see. The second claim we see is that male patriarchalists, male, you might say chauvinists if you're a little uncharitable, uh, who are opposed to women teaching, they've manipulated modern English Bibles so that it shows up wrong in our current Bibles. That's a huge claim. And you're like, Mike, it's huge that you're even saying they claim that. Here's Linda Belleville. She says, in fact, there is a basically unbroken tradition stemming from the oldest version and running down to the 21st century that translates authentane as to dominate and not to exercise authority over. That's a huge sweeping claim about ancient translations of, of which you probably know almost nothing. Most of you, most of the audience, you guys will be like, I don't know anything about ancient translations of First Timothy 2. So you would just take her word for it. Oh, so you're telling me that in the landscape of history, this word has been translated as dominate, a negative, a pejorative thing that isn't, maybe isn't even about authority. It's just about taking control of people's lives. I don't allow women to do that. Oh, pfft, fine. I'm egalitarian now. Um, it's just the new people. <laughs> well, she offers four examples to support this. And she gives us the Geneva Bible, the Cassiodoro de Rena, the Bishop's Bible, and the King James Version. Note that usurp authority, this is her four examples to support this sort of unbroken tradition that she gives in this particular work. We're looking at two views on women in ministry. She does this again in another book and has more details. Um, these examples don't match the claim. The claim is it means to dominate. Yet what we see here is um, authority, usurp authority over a man, usurp authority, take authority, usurp authority. We see these things over and over again, but usurp is not dominate. It's actually more likely, and we'll get into this in more detail later, but it's more likely that when they said usurp authority back then, they just, they just meant to step into a role of authority, but didn't mean um, taking something that didn't belong to you forcefully like that. Um, even if they did mean take something that didn't belong, they probably didn't mean it the way that Belleville does. They meant simply authority doesn't belong, so you can't have it to a woman. That's probably what they meant, to be honest. But we're going to get into more. Um, is Let's just pretend, though, that her claim is right. Unbroken tradition, there's all these translations throughout history that that support the dominate view but reject the authority uh, interpretation. What changed? 
why do modern Bibles say what they say? Well, here's what Linda Belleville says about this, and I've seen this repeated by others as well. English translations from the 1940s and early to the early 1980s tend to obscure this. A, hi a hierarchical, non-inclusive understanding of leadership is partly to blame. Women aren't supposed to be leaders, so the language of leadership where women are involved tends to be manipulated. 1 Timothy 2.12 is one of the primary places where this sort of bias surfaces. So here's clear claim, scholarly claim. Bias and manipulation in 1 Timothy 2.12 in English translations from the 1940s to the early 80s, that is why you're seeing have authority there because we can't have that. That's huge. Okay, this is huge. Th this is part of why this discussion on women in ministry is so heated because the 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 complementarian side will feel that that the egalitarians are undermining scripture are undermining the word of god are compromising a faithful reading of the bible and and the authority of christ in order to push their social agendas and so they'll feel like you know you guys are really messed up <laughs> and then on the egalitarian side they'll look and they'll say you guys are the ones that are messed up right it's your bias it's you guys have been hijacking you you male like domineering guys you you basically hierarchical uh, patriarchalists have been dom have been taking over the, the scriptures and twisting them so that you could promote your own power and rob the, the body of christ of their rightful place of, of so half of the body of christ of, of serving in the ways that god has called them to and so they feel now if you believe that's true you feel that these people are i love them but they're the enemy in a sense you know and then the same can happen on the other side my view is that a lot of the egalitarians are well-intentioned and misinformed. That's what my studies have shown me, well-intentioned but misinformed. And that they have chosen to fight a social battle, but they've planted their flag in the wrong spot. And so that's, it's a sad and unfortunate confusion. Some, some are actually malicious. Some on the egalitarian camp, which I've not been dealing with these scholars or these people, are just like, yeah, Oh, the Bible, sure, the Bible's complementarian or whatever, but but that's evil. The Bible's wrong. We know better. I'm not dealing with that side of things. I'm dealing with people who actually believe the scriptures are the word of God. I think we need to try to hold hands as much as we can on these issues to not vilify each other. But we got to just genuinely expose the errors in thinking and the errors in research that we see. All right. So what about those errors? Did patriarchalists change the translation of the bible in the 1930s up through the 1980s um, or 1940s through the 80s i've seen this all over the place this is one of the more common egalitarian claims on twitter uh, especially on twitter <laughs> i've seen this a lot belleville's not alone in these comments in a brand new book uh, on this topic from an egalitarian who I actually really like nijay gupta he had, he was one of the best scholars to help contribute to my passion project and i did an interview you can check it out it's on my channel between me and him and great friendly, wonderful time with him, actually. And he did such a good job. His paper was so accessible, really great, great things to say about him. But his brand new book is egalitarian. He's a strong egalitarian. And his book is called um, Tell Her Story. And in it, he says the following. But consider this, the King James Bible in the early 17th century translated authenteo as usurp authority over the man, taking this verb with a negative meaning. That's an important claim we'll come back to. In fact, that has been a more historical approach to the meaning of this verb until the late 20th century. For example, Linda Belleville has traced a unified reading of this verb through the centuries. That it's negative, 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 negative. Um, that's slightly softer than actually Belleville's claim. She said more than it's negative. Also that it doesn't imply authority. Um, that it implies domineer and not authority. But there's two problems with Belleville's, quote, basically unbroken tradition. There's two problems with this. Well, first... She says that early modern Spanish version is pejorative when it's not. That's a 1560 translation that I showed you on, your, on the screen earlier. But the word take, that's ingressive, take authority, that is not inherently negative. That's one of the problems. The second, there are non-pejorative readings in other early versions that she overlooked. Now, here are some of those readings. The Sahidic Coptic, second century work, it translates it as Lord. The Boharic Coptic, third century work, translates it as head or meaning leader, the person who's in charge. The Gothic fourth century translation translates it as Lord. 
Parclean Syriac, a 7th century work, translates it as ruler. Not take authority, not usurp, just ruler, head, lord, not to be in charge. That's that's these things. You can see Women of the Church, page 84 and 85 for more details on this. But the problem is she's been selective in her, in her choice of which translations to use and to show people and then calls it an unbroken tradition, implying that these little sort of pieces that she's pulled out of history represent the whole flow of history. That's incorrect. And a thorough study of these things makes that clear. According to Al Walters, the only exception, the only one that gives a pejorative reading is the Peshitta. The only one that doesn't give the standard, you know, have authority type of reading is the Peshitta. So the trend, this is important, the trend that Belleville talks about is actually the opposite of what she says. It's against a pejorative reading. This seems very important. If trans, okay, egalitarians here, Gupta and Belleville in particular, seem to think that how early translators handled it is important, yet the way early translators actually handled it is the opposite of what they claimed. If it's still important, now if it's only important when it helps your case, that's a problem in itself. So if it's still important, it backfires and it pushes stronger for the traditional meaning of the term. Um, in her newest work, uh, Discovering Biblical Equality, published in 2021, she dropped the unbroken tradition claim, but she reproduced her previous claims almost verbatim. So she just dropped the term unbroken tradition, but she's still making these types of claims almost word for word. She still claims modern translators are manipulating the text. This is a massive, massive claim, and it stirs up animosity from egalitarians to those complementarians, patriarchalists, um, because they think, yeah, you guys are actually part of a misogynistic conspiracy, basically. So here it says, English translations stemming from the 1940s to the present tend to gloss over the difficulties. A hierarchical, non-inclusive understanding of leadership is partly to blame. Recognize those terms, it's almost the same. Women are not supposed to be leaders, so the language of leadership where women are involved tends to be manipulated. One of the primary places where this sort of bias surfaces is 1 Timothy 2.12. Post-World War II translations routinely render the clause as I do not per permit a woman to teach or to have or exercise authority over a man. However, earlier versions and translations were not so quick to do so. That phrase there, they were not so quick to do so. It's difficult to pin that down. Not so quick. Like, how do you evaluate how quick a translation is to do something? But the impression the reader gets, so you can't like put a number on that, but the impression the reader gets is that early translations were skewed very much in favor of Belleville's interpretation, when in reality, that's not true. Um, another quote from Belleville, she says, in fact, there's a notable translation history beginning with the oldest versions that translates Altentain negatively as to domineer, usurp, lord over, or dictate. So it's implied old translations have a negative reading, new ones don't. And why is this? Manipulation by men who want power. That's the implication. I can't overstate how big of a claim this is. It influences people who don't remember the details. They don't remember the studies of Authenteo, they, but they remember this. Translators lie. That's what they get out of this, and that's what they remember, and that's what they carry forward. And I'm not saying Belleville is going to use those phrases. I'm saying that's why Twitter is the way it is. That's why social media is the way it is. That's why the, the, the argument is so heated is because people, their takeaways are those types of things. And that's simply not true. Hey, if you're right, then yes, we absolutely, we absolutely look, I, I did a whole series on a bad translation, um, the passion translation and about how he was twisting the word of God to suit whatever his desires were at the time. It was misrepresenting scripture, misrepresenting language, misrepresenting historical research into these things. And, um, oddly enough, it was egalitarian, but, but that wasn't, that wasn't the core of the issue. It was just the handling of scripture that was altogether wrong. So this is a big deal. So what follows then from Linda Belleville are 29 examples of negative readings throughout history. Now she really expands her examples in discovering biblical equality. Lots of details here. She gives five ancient examples. We're going to go over them all in, in some detail here. Um, five ancient examples. These are supposed to be, quote, early translations. This is, this is just a screen capture from her book from the 2nd to 5th century. There's two that are Latin, the Old Latin and the Vulgate. Two are Latin. They fail. Okay, these are bad examples. She reads the Latin translations as if they're pejorative or negative because, and, and you'll understand why, in English, it sounds that way. 
because it uses the Latin term dominari. Dominari sounds like dominate, sounds like domineering. Sounds like, okay, that's fine. Um, you know, but abogado sounds like avocado, but it means lawyer. <laughs> so just because it sounds that way doesn't mean a whole lot. So domineri at the time was not pejorative. So these two Latin translations show a neutral, not a pejorative reading, but she uses them exa as examples of a pejorative understanding, a negative reading. Walter's response to this, he says, but the Latin verb, um, there we go. Yeah, but the Latin verb, though it can occasionally carry such a negative nuance, regularly has a neutral or positive sense, simply meaning rule, reign, or govern. That's the normal sense. As, as examples of its positive sense, consider the places where the Vulgate, the Vulgate, her same source, uses Dominor to describe the rule of God. And he's got several references there. Or the rule of Messiah of Old Testament expectation. He has several references there. Or the rule of Jesus Christ in the New Testament, Romans 14, 9. A remarkable example of this positive use is found in one of the letters of Jerome, the translator of the Vulgate, the guy that wrote that. In discussing the difference between a king and a bishop, he writes that the former subdues by intimidation, the latter, the good guy, the bishop, rules dominator by serving. In Jerome's usage, the ruling indicated by dominor is consistent with, not that it means, but it's consistent with servant leadership. I checked a couple different Latin dictionaries. I won't put on your screen for you. I checked multiple Latin dictionaries, which confirmed that dominar, dominari did not generally imply a negative connotation as Belleville asserts. It just sounds that way in English, guys. Like, so I understand why you would think, but it, it doesn't. So, so the two Latin ones that she gave us, um, we should scratch those off her list. Those actually go against her point. Then she neglects several Latin translations with have, which have three other Latin words used for authentase, none of which are pejorative. So let's look at those. These are old Latin versions where they have other terminologies. Right? The so-called Vedas Latina, dating from the 3rd century on, have four different translations. Commander, Lord, Lord, and Ruler. Not pejorative, not ingressive, none of the things that she says the word means. Why does she ignore these four Latin translations and pick the other two? Because they said dominir, dominari? That, I, I don't know. I mean, one of these says dominari, one says dominare, dominare. At any rate, these things should be brought in as well and considered if we're going to have an unbroken tradition. Belleville's third example is Coptic. So it's the two Latin ones, they don't work. The third one's Coptic, and she says it's negative, but it's just be lord of him. Be lord of him. That's the same as have authority over a man. Be lord of him. That's all it means. It's not negative. You can actually look up this word in Coptic in a Coptic dictionary. I've got a link for you in my notes because I got links to all kinds of things. You can read the entry yourself. It's not a negative term. It's not a pejorative term. So our third example fails. Belleville's fourth example. Now this is super interesting. Set me off on a whole little journey, whole little tangent that I thought was worthwhile and I got some really great information for you guys. It's about Gothic. Her fourth example is the Gothic. Here's what got my attention. She uses this to show the Gothic demonstrates a negative meaning for authentane or authenteo. Yet Walters, who's, the, who's a complementarian guy, right? He thought the Gothic was an example of it just meaning Lord, right? You see it here in his third example. Why is it that I see both scholars using the same translation to prove the opposite things? What does the Gothic really mean? This really led me into that. Now in her footnote, because remember, check the footnotes, check the footnotes. This is this is the mantra of research. Um, she refers to two things. Uh, uh, I think it's two. Let's see. Project Wolfilla. Or maybe it's three things. Project Wolfilla. Um, then she also refers to uh, Gotish's Warderbuck. I'm not even going to try to pretend I can pronounce that. And, and also a comparative glossary of Gothic language with a special reference to English and German. These are the sources that she refers to. So I looked up all three of them, and I'm going to share with you what we found in the footnotes for Linda Belleville's point about the Gothic being a negative translation. Here we go. This is the first one. Project Wolfala, which you can access online, which is really great. It shows the Gothic, but the English, okay, what it does is it just shows, here's just for you to have an online resource that shows the Gothic, and then they put English beneath it. It, it's it's easy to think that this English is their translation, that Project Wolfel is translating it into English. It's not. They're not translating here. What they're doing is putting the King James Version underneath the Gothic. But the King James does not come from the Gothic any more than the Greek between them comes from the Gothic. The Gothic is just being put there next to these other two so you can compare. 
So Project Wolfula uses usurp authority, but it's just because the King James uses usurp authority. That is not their translation of Gothic, but it seems that Belleville thought this was. She misunderstood the, the nature of the resource she was looking at. The site does not, again, does not offer definitions of these words. It just gives you the King James. But it looks like it's where her translation actually comes from. Because when we looked at her um, her statement about the Gothic, it, she put usurp authority. So what she did was she took Gothic, gave you the King James Version, which comes from Greek, and acted like that was a translation from Gothic. That's just a, a blunder that will affect people's understanding of things. It's not a good thing. Now, the second one's actually pretty interesting. Uh, Gerard Kobler, who wrote a Gothic dictionary that Linda Belleville quotes... He was actually accessible, actually was able to get a hold of him and talk to him. Here's his entry, though, from the uh, from the, the dictionary that he wrote. And he has in here, you know, he'll have the work, word in Gothic, and then he'll have the word, uh, a translation into German and a translation into English and a translation in Greek. He'll, he'll relate these words in multiple ways. And so that's a very interesting thing. And I, mean, I imagine a very challenging thing. So he says it means here, lord it over, rule over. That's the Gothic word Fraugenon that we see in the Gothic translation of 1 Timothy 2. So it's instead of Authenteo, it's Fraugenon, Fraugenon, which is a more fun word, if you ask me. At any rate, I'm like, wow, that does seem pejorative. And then it's right after that, it, it gives the Greek Authentane, and then it has more information there. And so I studied this entry, and I was even able to email Dr. Kobler to ask him what he thought about this. So I was very happy. And I'll just, here's the email I sent him. Um, he said, I, I wrote to him, Dr. Kobler, if someone were to quote your work on this term as a way of affirming that the Gothic writer interpreted Authentane to mean usurp authority, would they be correct? That was what I was looking to find out. Like, hey, is this a correct understanding of your work? Here was his response. And yeah, it's all in German. <laughs> <laughs> and so I got to translate it translated and here's the translation. So um, he says that he only did his work out of general interest, not as a German philologist. And that's interesting because it, that seems to, to lower the sort of re, perhaps the reliability of the work if, if he wasn't doing it in that fashion as a German philologist. But then he says, reading his own entry, he doesn't know. He's not sure if reading his own entry, the same thing Belleville can read and you and I can read, if he meant that to be in a pejorative sense or not. He's just not sure. He says uh, he mainly used the dictionaries and in cases of doubt, the texts of the Gothic, Latin, and German Bibles, which I unfortunately do not have at my disposal. So maybe it's not as reliable. Then he says, so I can't really say yes to your final question, but I can't say no either. When in doubt, I would prefer the simplest rendering. Okay, th that wasn't incredibly helpful, but it did give me some information. Kobler isn't perhaps wanting to be cited here as an authority on this. He's just sort of saying, I sort of relied on other things, and I'm not really sure if even reading it now, if that should be taken to be pejorative or not. But there's more. We don't have to leave it there. Let me put his, his entry up again and show you that he has a number of languages here. He doesn't just give you an English translation. He gives you... A, a, a modern German translation. He gives you an, an an alternate Greek translation for the term. What do those mean? Because if the if it's supposed to be pejorative in English, if that's what he meant by lord it over, because he's not a na native English speaker, if he meant that in a pejorative way, then surely he would have translated it into pejorative meanings in Greek and in German. But he didn't. So the German is herrschen and herrsen. I probably said that wrong. But it basically means to be ruler be lord or be a mister like that place of respect and authority i find it hard to believe that the term fraugenon means something in english lord it over in a negative way that it doesn't mean in german in german it's just a neutral type of authority uh, the greek he put it could also mean cat epiktage which means in authority it it doesn't mean something pejorative it, it just it could mean in greek being in authority I find it hard to believe that Fraugenon translated into English is negative, whereas in German and in Greek, it's not negative. I'm thinking that what, what happened is Belleville read a whole bunch of Gothic dictionaries. She found one that had this lorded over phrase and then said, that helps my case and brought that in. 
Um, that's my theory. Maybe I'm wrong in how many she read or whatever. But the point is, this dictionary doesn't actually give that much confidence in a negative meaning. All right, let's look at the third reference that Belleville has for giving, saying the Gothic is a negative meaning, even though someone else like, say, Walters is going to say it was, it was a neutral or positive meaning. Here we go. Third reference. This is a comparative glossary of the Gothic language by Gerhard Hubert Balg, who is the grandfather of the albino orc from The Hobbit. Um, here it is on your screen. This is the entry from his Gothic dictionary from 1887. And in his dictionary, it just means to be lord or king, to rule over. And in 1 Timothy 2.12, he translates it as lord. Think about this. This is be lord or king, rule over. That's the actual quote. But in the quote in Belleville's footnote, she has this as lord it over, which of course was from one source that seems like it was probably just a bad rendering into English that he didn't intend because he didn't do that into Greek or German. Now you can't actually find other Gothic dictionaries online, this Germanic language, and I've got a link below to a place where you can find several of them in my notes, not, not in the description, but in my actual notes file you can download, which you can find in the description. Uh, one of them was this one right here. This is the Gothic Etymological Dictionary. Um, this entry just says it means master or rule. It's not negative, it's not ingressive, it's not assuming or usurping or something like that. Um, let's see. In another one is the Mesogothic glossary from 1868. It just means lord or master, right? With 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 Fraugenon in the description here as well. That specific term that we find in the Gothic one. There's others, and you can get access to a, a bunch of them in my notes below. Um, the fifth and final example Belleville gives. Now these are her chosen examples. One through four have failed. Every single one of them is not a pejorative meaning and it's not in ingressive in that sense. We'll, we'll get into more details there later. But every one of them has significant issues. The last one is the Syriac Peshitta. What's the issue there? No issue. It works. Her example of the, of the Syriac Peshitta is actually a negative meaning of the term. That's That's correct. Let me put it back on your screen so you can see. There you go. So we have one example, assuming over the man. And that fits her view, it really does. But because the overwhelming number of other translations go the other direction, this says a couple things. One, we would probably think is the Peshitta, of the Peshitta as being more of an anomaly. Two, this proves wrong her claims about this sort of constant early trend that was overturned by sort of chauvinists in the 1900s that's simply not true and we're going to look at more of these translations to demonstrate this as well so four of the five ancient translations backfire if trends matter then non-pejorative reading is very well supported by even belleville's own examples the next eight translations belleville gives in her large list of over like 60 examples of translations is right here so these are called english translations from the 16th to early 20th century. English translations. The first two on her list are not English. They're not English. Erasmus and the Complutensian polyglot, polyglot. Notice how she has to put the Latin in there because it's not English. She's giving a... Trans, it, it's, this is, it's not a big deal. It's, it's just Let's just be clear. These aren't early English translations. These two are not. Uh, most of them... Uh, well, let me let me talk about more. Um, the second one is not negative. Uh, dominari from the Complutensian polyglot is not negative in Latin. It's not a negative term inherently. So that's not a negative example. Uh, most of them just have the term usurp, which is not very strong support, as we'll get into more details later when I'll quote Dan Wallace to talk about why did they use the word usurp when they translated this word. Um, so that's not very strong support for her negative connotation. Uh, only two of the six have domineer, which strongly supports her view. Two of the six have the word domineer, the, the rest do not. So the Bishop's Bible has usurp, Geneva has usurp, King James has usurp, Webster's usurp, Fenton has dominate, Goodspeed has domineer. Those are the two that have that, that strong support for her view. So the trend, again, in her own examples is not supporting her, her, her claims. She selectively uses translations though. These are not like every English translation. These are just a selection of 
eight, <laughs> two of which are not actually English. This is her notable translation history. To, I put it in quotes because that's what she said. It's a notable translation history. But again, it's just not the case. This is, I don't want to be spending my time on this. I'd rather have scholars who all agree on the data and then argue about what it means. But instead, the, the debate over 1 Timothy 2 is largely arguing about the data. And that's why it's so complicated. And that's why it's so detailed. We, we have to say, was there a feminist thing going on in Ephesus? Was it even there? Does this word have a negative connotation? That's based upon an argument about the data, not even the passage, not, not necessarily interpretation even. So it ends up being this long-winded video. But it gave me something to do for the last many months. So Belleville selectively chooses translations to get her notable translation history of a negative meaning, but she leaves out other versions from the same time period that are not pejorative. So let me give you some examples of those. Here are an even longer list of all English translations. They're all actually English. 11 other ones that are from the same time period that she quotes that do not have a pejorative meaning. Look at the meanings. Have lordship. Have authority over. Have authority over. Use authority. Rule. Have authority. Tell them what to do. That one that one feels a little bit more, more negative. It, it does, to be honest, right? There's one. Exercise authority to rule, have authority over. So almost all of them, not negative. Um, Luther, Martin Luther translated it as be the leader. That was his translation, which was overlooked by Belleville. I have links to most of these as well in my notes. Um, Calvin, he has a Latin translation that also breaks the unbroken tradition. Uh, Luther, Tyndale, Calvin, all of these were left out from Linda Belleville's analysis of early translations. As scholar Denny Burke points out the following, she has also downplayed versions from three leading Protestant reformers, Luther, Tyndale, Calvin, all of whom disprove her thesis of a virtually unbroken tradition of translation before the 20th century. I can't say how important this is. I am not here claiming there's an unbroken tradition of positive translations. No, there's no unbroken tradition here, but there's a strong trend towards um, not negative or not pejorative and not ingressive and when there is ingressive meanings i think that we we would do well to not think it means what the egalitarians think we'll get to that again later i'm trying i don't want to get ahead of myself too much here it may feel as though i'm laboring this point about the translations but it's such a big deal i know normal people okay i deal with normal people and i make my videos for mostly normal people not just scholars and right scholars you, you probably don't need my help that much i don't imagine but Maybe some do, <laughs> but but here's the thing. Normal people won't follow all of the Greek arguments, but they will follow this translation argument. And when they start to believe that there is intentional bias and misogynistic Bible translations, that's all they need. Anytime they read a Bible translation that says that women this and women that, they're just going to ignore it. Like, oh, that's just misogynist. This will bypass all of their proper Bible study, you know, all their proper thinking and turn them into conspiratorialists about patriarchalists manipulating scriptures. And it's not true. It's not true. So this is why I labored this point so much. Okay, let, let's finally go to this usurp thing. Um, the usurp idea. Why is it that so many English translations put usurp in there, even if it's not all, right? There's been a lot, certainly King James Version, like a lot of us know that. So did those translators think usurp authority meant what some egalitarians think it means today? That's the real question. When they go, see, they said usurp. Yeah, but did it mean what the egalitarians are thinking? Such that, for instance, a woman can take the position of elder. She can't just take it without permission. She has to be rightly appointed. In which case, the passage means nothing. Because no one's allowed to do things they're not allowed to do. That's, that's like a tautology. You can't do stuff you can't do. <laughs> you're not allowed to, to, to take things you're not allowed to take. Um, it ends up not having much application into, into the church, actually. Um, Certainly not in a, not a complementarian one. So Blomberg responds to Belleville on this point, and here's a quote from him. He says, citing English translations that render the verb usurp authority can be a bit misleading, for this expression probably means usurping the authority that belongs to the men rather than just exercising authority in an improper way. And I think that this is actually pretty profound. That probably is what the King James translators meant. They didn't mean what egalitarians will use their translation to mean. And, and you you should never take a translation and interpret and interpret it in a way that that very translator didn't intend. That that would be 
bad Bible study. So the egalitarian view is so often this, a woman can be an elder. She just can't abuse that role, right? Have it do it in a domineering fashion, or she can't claim that role without proper appointment. That's not what they meant by usurp authority. It seems even for the translations that did do that and said usurp authority. So it seems likely that many of them thought a woman taking the role of an elder was by its nature a usurping of authority. That this is simply because they're patriarchal or because they're complementarian, whether you want to argue whether they would have been considered that back then or not, I don't care. So let's say because they're patriarchalists, because they're that that way, they translate usurp, meaning it's affirming their view, which is the opposite of the egalitarian view. And the translation doesn't mean what the egalitarian is using it to mean. This is bad Bible study. In addition, if usurp meant what egalitarians often think it means, it doesn't make a lot of sense in the passage when you consider the following. Why is it only directed from women over men? Why is it women can not usurp authority over a man, but the implication is they can usurp authority over other women? <laughs> that's, that's strange. This seems very odd. Why is it, second point, why is it coupled with teaching? Why is it women can't teach or usurp authority? And we'll, we'll talk a lot more about that as we go, because there's there's more to talk about on that, um, a whole bunch of stuff. Why is it based on creation? Third thing, there's no reason to base a command not to usurp authority that doesn't belong to you on the created order of male and female. The, the logic of the passage falls apart if we take usurp authority in the way that egalitarians do. Uh, Greek, Greek scholar Dan Wallace, well-respected guy, he says the following, and I think that is a long quote I got it all on your screen, but I'm going to read through it because it, he just did such a good job explaining this issue. The King James Version translators, he says, mistranslated this verb. They made a mistake. They shouldn't have said usurp, he says, because they knew Latin better than they knew Greek. And in the 16th century, Erasmus of Rotterdam, the man who was the first to publish a Greek New Testament, rendered Authenteo this way. He produced five Greek New Testaments. All of them were Greek Latin diglots, meaning they had Greek and Latin right alongside each other. Right, that is, the, well, I guess he says this in the quote. That is, the Greek was on one page, and his Latin translation of the same was on the facing page. But by the fourth century AD, Athenteo had come to mean usurp, but it didn't have this force earlier. Remember, I told you Athenteo changes meaning over time. Fourth century and on, it does does take on other things, including usurp. But we don't see that in the early examples that we looked at. We didn't see usurp as being some consistent thing even if it occurred on, on rare occasion, it wasn't consistent. So this is what Wallace says. Consequently, I read on, Erasmus translated the verb as usurpare, from which obviously English gets usurp. His translation was based on Greek usage that was 300 plus years after the time of the New Testament. Remarkably, Erasmus produced his Greek New Testament as a way to correct <clears throat> Jerome's Latin Vulgate. Jerome was the fourth century scholar who brought uniformity to the Latin versions of the Bible by gathering them up. Along with several Greek copies and trying to discern what was the original wording. In other words, Jerome was much closer to the time of the original than Erasmus was. And in Jerome's Vulgate, which became the official inspired version for the Catholic Church, he translated Athenteo as Dominare. Dominare. Sound familiar? We've talked about that. This Latin verb means principally to exercise authority. Only secondarily does it have a negative force. It was probably the best Latin verb to use for authenteo. Okay, in case you got lost, here we go. Here's the summary. Wallace says, okay, if you're still tracking with me, let's go back to Erasmus. He based his translation on his reading of gr Greek writers who lived during or after the time of Jerome. That's late. And because of this, he didn't grasp the actual meaning of authenteo. And since authenteo is a rare word in Greek literature, the King James Version translators simply consulted the Latin in their Greek Latin diglot to discern the meaning of the verb. And what did they find? Usurpare. Hence, an illegitimate translation made its way into the translation of the Bible. But today, the vast majority of English translators understand the term to be neutral. This is why my version, my short summary of all that, King James Version used Erasmus. When they came across Greek words that were really rare, maybe they looked over at his Latin instead and borrowed that. Because guess what? We've got more information about Greek today than they did when they did their translation. And because we've dug up more papyri and stuff. Well, they looked at the Latin and they had usurpare there. So they put usurp authority. The thing is, 
That was Erasmus. Jerome, who was closer and better, had the, the earlier understanding of the Greek word and didn't translate it that way. This isn't them giving us the Greek. This is them giving us Erasmus's Latin, which we can know better today because we have better research into the original languages. The stuff I show with, showed you, Erasmus didn't even know. Those eight examples I could give you today, he never saw those. That's a big deal. So Belleville's account, which is followed by many other egalitarian scholars, seems quite wrong. Wrong on many points. It's disappointing. But what's encouraging is that the truth of 1 Timothy 2 is not so obscure and difficult as many people have pretended it is. Next, Linda Belleville gives us 16 contemporary translations. That's what she calls them. And here they are on your screen. And we're going to analyze them in just a bit of detail, not too much. 10 of the 16 are, in my opinion, are actually negative. That's my short summary. Only about 10 of the 16 are actually negative, though they're kind of cherry picked. And we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, two of them are Spanish. Four of them are French. Two are repeats. Um, that's the King James Version is in there twice. It's not. It's a new edition, not a new translation. The Webster is also in there twice, uh, not a new translation. One of them is Latin. Uh, again, it uses the word dominari, and that is not pejorative. Um, that's the Nova Vulgata, not really a contemporary translation. Uh, one's Italian, could go either way. One of them is the NIV, the TNIV footnote. Now, that's super interesting. Check it out. She says the TNIV 2005 footnote. Her point is contemporary translations support her view. Why is she appealing to a footnote and not to the actual translated text? Well, the answer for that is because the translated text says, I do not permit a woman to teach or assume authority over a man. She must be quiet. Now, the NIV translators have actually come out and said they use the term assume here, and they did not mean for people to interpret it as negative or pejorative. They wanted to leave it ambiguous, as in it's not clearly negative. It, this is not in support of her view. Um, so the, the footnote is it's just strange to include the footnote, but not add the fact that the translation itself is actually in support of the opposite of her view. When we actually go to the footnote in the TNIV, this is what it says. Here's the actual footnote or teach a man in a domineering way or teach or to exercise or have authority over a man. They are not weighing in that this is the right translation. They are trying to be inten intentionally ambiguous. And then in the footnote saying, ah, you could do it either way. Now, I think the domineering way is not a good translation based upon all the research I've done, but we should be open that these are this is not an example of a translation that's going her way it's it's an example of one that says assume authority and doesn't mean that in a pejorative fashion the niv translators have come out and said look we don't mean it that way if people interpret it that way that wasn't our intention so about 10 of the 16 that she gives though are negative she does not here's the important bits <clears throat> she does not mention a single outlier she gives 16 that she she thinks are negative i'd say about 10 of them actually are and on her telling, it's a pretty simplest, simple, simplistic understanding of history here. Early translations are negative. Modern manipulated ones are not negative. Modern non-manipulated translations, honest ones, are negative. It's a negative term. Uh, it's, it's authority or, it's, in her view, it's not really even authority, but, but even if it is authority, it's negative. It's a negative concept. Women are being told not to do something negative. They're not being kept from any sort of proper position of authority, or at least in a position that would be proper if a man had it. I've heard that there are over 500 English translations of the Bible. Do I know that for a fact? I don't know. I mean, do you? <laughs> I've heard there's over 500. So a selective list of 16, um, many of which are not English, it doesn't seem that impressive. I'd like to see at least a longer list. Um, so I did an English translation survey. Uh, BibleStudyTools.com offers a good resource there that lets you survey of, of 30 different English translations. At least that's better than 16. And they're not being selected because they're on my side versus their side. They're just being selected sort of at random. Of the 30 translations, 30, seven of them had a negative meaning in 1 Timothy 2 when it refers to authority. 23 do not have a negative meaning. 23 of the 30, not negative. What does that say about modern translations? I think that it says that the story is different than what Belleville has been implying. 
But here's a better question, I think. Rather than serving random translations or serving selective ones as Belleville did, what if we just took a group of specific kind of translations, translations in English that are what we would call not sectarian, right? That are well-respected. They have those two qualities. One, they're not sectarian. A sectarian translation is one that is, it evidences bias towards a particular camp within Christianity. And then a well-respected translation shows that people from a broad scopes of research and scholarship and stuff say, hey, yeah, that's a pretty good translation. Of those translations, this is what we see. The, and here's the ones I've included. NRSV, ESV, NASB, New King James, NIV, CSB, NLT, NET. These would be considered non-sectarian and well-respected. And they translate it as neutral, having authority. One of them, NIV, says assume authority. And the NIV translators, again, have expressly said they did not mean this in a pejorative fashion. They, they just thought it might have that aggressive connotation, which could simply be stepping into a role of authority. When someone becomes president, they have a coronation or not coronation <laughs> feels like it, <laughs> but they, 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 they have an inauguration where they become president. That's become or assume authority. They're assuming it. They're taking it on. So it, it's not negative. None of these are negative. None of these support the egalitarian view. It actually looks to me the trend is very different than what Belleville claims. Generally in history, there's a non-pejorative translation throughout time. Generally, not always. It's not unbroken, right? But it's generally the case with reasonable explanations for exceptions. Like in the Peshitta, there are reasonable explanations for why that showed up. It wasn't revealing the true meaning of the word. Um, dominate is a more recent trend. To dominate is actually the recent trend, but it's not present in the most respected translations that we have in English. It's just occasional and more recent. Some egalitarians are propagating falsehoods about this stuff and it's misleading people about the nature of men and women and about what God has revealed to us in his word and about how churches should function and it's causing a lot of division. The church has been fairly unified on this topic throughout history. This is a recent blip, to be honest. It's a recent, it's more, it feels like bigger than a blip, but it's a recent issue. Uh, where we should fight I think, biblically speaking, we should fight against hyper-patriarchal views, against abuse of women, against uh, deriding women and disrespecting them and treating them like they're lesser Christians or lesser humans. Absolutely, we should be fighting because that is that is a, a problem throughout time and we should fight against those things. But egalitarianism isn't the way to do it. That would be my conclusion so far. Here is yet another entirely different route for finding a negative meaning in the word Authenteo, and it's etymology. Etymology is not about the meaning of a word. So we're not going to look at uses of Authenteo through time. We're not going to look at translations of Authenteo or how early Greek speakers understood it. We're, we've done all that. Now we're asking, where does the word come from? So etymology, that's that. It's like, where does this word come from? What's the origin of this word? Not what does it mean, but what is its source? Where, how does it start? How does it get there? So etymology would be like the word disaster. Um, disaster is a word that in English, it likely comes from dis and aster, meaning bad star, bad star, disaster, bad star. So this is, has astrology connotations in its, in, its, in its history. Oh, there's a disaster, kind of like the stars are influencing your life and bad things are going to happen. Um, something cosmically bad in a sense in your life. So that's the word disaster. Well, an example of, of this how people take the word authenteo and they go, what does it mean? What does the pieces of the word mean? Where does it come from? It would be the following. Here's an example of different people and their view on this. To thrust out. Some would say authenteo comes from words that basically mean to thrust out. Others would say it originally meant achieving or arms, Robertson there, or effect or accomplish. That's a more common theory since the 19th century. To let go or the word motion is there at the core of it all. Um, this is, again, not definitions of the word, but the origin of the word. I share this with you so you could see there's a lot of variety here. They do not seem to be in agreement. And there's two big problems with etymology, two big problems, especially with this word. One, etymology is often an unreliable guide. Just and, and this is a mistake new Bible study students do all the time. They open up a Strong's Concordance and they look at the, the relations of a word. This comes from this word, and the root word means this. And then they read that root word into the, and they have a new interpretation of a Bible passage. This is a mistake. Like, 
You, you want to know what the word means, not what the root means. As a general rule, the root may be informative, but more informative is this word used in context. Let me give you an example. Um, and this is why, uh, here's a quote from Linguistics and Biblical Interpretation, page 132. They say, appeal to etymology and to word formation is therefore always dangerous. Always dangerous. It's actually called in language studies, the etymological fallacy for a reason, because it so often leads people to wrong understandings of words. Take the word orchard in English. Orchard, you know what that is. It refers to like a, a garden or a, a a area of grass full of trees, or you know, basically a bunch of trees, fruit trees, really. Orchard once meant treeless garden. That's what, that's what the term actually meant, treeless garden. If you trace back the original meaning of these words, its source, you would completely misunderstand its actual meaning current day. The Latin root of the word December, December, the 12th month of the year, the Latin root of that word, etymology, it means 10. So is December the 10th month of the year? No, it's the 12th month of the year. We just, we can't trust etymology because words change and meanings change over time. Etymology is not that reliable of a guide. Um, the second issue of why you shouldn't go down this etymological route, and I won't spend the next hour and a half talking about the etymology of Athenteo, you're welcome, is the following. The trouble with such proposals, even apart from the dangers of falling into the etymological fallacy, is that in the case of authentase and its derivatives, scholars cannot agree on what the etymology is. This is the second issue. Scholars aren't really in agreement. And so you have, in the previous uh, image I showed you, um, here it is, Where there it is, sorry. Um, these are different scholars who are all presenting different approaches to the understanding of the etymology, and then they apply that differently in their interpretation of the word. The whole thing is very sketchy. This is this is what you call reaching. This is grasping for straws. We, we should not be trying to get there with etymology. We have a lot of other evidence. We should rely on that instead. Do you know what's a better guide to the meaning of a word than etymology? Context. Context is king. Context is like uber king. The words used directly with that word tell you often a lot about what that word means. It can tell you if it's positive, tell you if it's negative, tell you if it's serious or sarcastic or whatever. So this is where we get a lot more light shed onto the meaning of Athenteo in 1 Timothy 2.12. And it's a study by a guy named Kostenberger. Now, Kostenberger has done a very impressive case, and not just impressive to me, but impressive to many people, even on the other side of the aisle. Even many egalitarians have changed their positions because of the stuff that I'm about to share with you right now. He builds an impressive case that the phrasing of verse 12, which says, I do not allow women to teach or have authority, that coupling of those words along with the whole thing do not and allow and it's something that's not being permitted and all this you're about to find out but basically the phrasing the way it's phrased it forces us to believe that the two terms teach and have authority right or didaskein and authentain these two words are either both positive or both negative in their meanings that's huge because then we can look at didaskein or didasko and we can ask if it's positive if it's negative then that's what the other word is too, authentain. It's either positive or negative. Okay, so we're going to dig into this because this is good stuff. I mean, this is not just random information or information dump. This is rather pivotal issues that cause us to interpret the passage, hopefully appropriately. This is good stuff. Hope you're taking notes. If not, I got, I got notes. I'm giving you my notes. You got all my notes. Have I told you enough times? All right. <clears throat> this is found in uh, Women in the Church, which has been the best resource. Is for, if you had to pick just one resource on First Timothy 2, it would be the current edition of Women in the Church. Um, it's a good work. Uh, plenty of egalitarian uh, scholars have been persuaded by this chapter, by this work, by Andreas Kostenberger. And... You can read it yourself, and I would recommend it if, if you have the time. But I'm going to give you the full summary here, and I'm also going to share pushback, pushback from different egalitarian scholars who don't agree and who think, no, no, here's where he got it wrong. We'll look at all of that today. You can make up your own mind. So this might seem overly involved and a bit long, but I want you to know this. 
I cut out about 14 pages of my own notes from just this one section on the mean on, on this complex sentence chapter of Kostenberger. So I, I had over 14 more pages about Kostenberger's argument, pros and cons and different things that I removed because I'm trying to cut it down as much as possible. So as long as it seems, it's a lot shorter than it was. So I'll just summarize his work and then I'm gonna deal in detail with the pushback that people give to his work. So here we go. This is the verse that we all are very familiar with at this point. I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. Now he, this is where you got to hang in with me, okay? It's going to get harder, then it, then it will get easy. He says, look, there's two infinitives here. That's teach or exercise authority. And when you have those two infinitives joined by a specific Greek word, ude, which we have translated or, well, when you have it joined by ude and there's a... Um, prohibition or permission, either you're being told you, you can do this or you can't do this, that this structure, there's a like say a prohibition, two infinitives joined by ude, it's always both of those infinitives are positive or both of them are negative. Infinitive here's just a type of verb. So teach or exercise authority, it's either a positive teaching and a positive exercise of authority that's prohibited, or it's a negative kind of teaching and a negative kind of authority that is prohibited. Those are the options. That's his claim. Now, he examines 42 times that the New Testament uses this similar construction, right? Two infinitives joined by Uday, either permitted or forbidden. And in every single one of the 42 cases he gives, he says the terms are always positive or always negative. Both of them, they're coupled. They're, it's a coupling of terms, both positive or both negative. Let me give you one example that you can look at. Romans 14.21 where it says it's not good to eat meat or drink wine or do anything that causes your brother to stumble. So there's something that's being prohibited. Here's how, how the formula works using the same color scheme. We have the prohibition in red there. We've got the two infinitives, eat meat and drink wine. And then we have the ude, which is in blue. All right, so this is an example of the same kind of thing. Eating meat and drinking wine are inherently good things in Romans 14. So Paul thinks they're good. These are things God has given us to enjoy. They can be abused. They can be done wrongly. So gluttony or drunkenness, but they're inherently positive things as far as Paul's concerned, but they're prohibited on the condition that they might cause a brother to stumble. So the two things that are coupled are good things that are prohibited in this example in Romans 14. So Kostenberger didn't just look at the New Testament. He expanded his search to include documents from the first century outside the New Testament. And there he found dozens more examples. So not only are the 42 times in the New Testament, but he found dozens of examples outside the New Testament in other works right, right there in the first century. And this is the remarkable part. It's totally consistent, according to him anyway. Some will push back. In every case, these two words, these two verbs are, are both positive or they're both negative. This is super big because remember the egalitarian claims, like 90% of the claims here are going to rely on the idea that authenteo is negative. Well, if they're both positive or both negative, that means we can just ask one simple question. If we can prove that teaching is positive in 1 Timothy 2 or that the teaching is negative, then we can also prove that authenteo is going to go the same way. So this becomes really significant for um, whether there's a pejorative meaning. Again, all examples support from Kostenberger, support the idea that if teaching is viewed positively in 2.12, then having authority is also meant positively as well. This rules out a massive number of egalitarian views, if it in fact is true. How did scholars respond to this? How did they react to Kostenberger's work? Well, there was wide agreement about Kostenberger's work. The pattern, quote, has been accepted as valid even by virtually all other egalitarian scholars, including Marshall, Keener, Paget, Giles, and Webb. That's Kostenberger. He's doing a, he, he's talking in response here to Linda Belleville's work. But the point is, um, it doesn't prove it's true. This isn't like a slam dunk thing to just say egalitarians agree, but it means something. It's not without meaning or significance that a bunch of people in the camp that strongly relies on this not being true, <laughs> um, have said, okay, yeah, it's right. Let's find a new way to argue for our case. Let's look at this in some more detail because while the majority of scholars um, are persuaded by Kostenberger's 
work and by his research, which I'm not going to go over in detail just to cut 14 pages out of it all. You can check it out in Women in the Church um, and you can see all that stuff on, on your own. Let's just skip right to the pushback. Okay, so most people are convinced by his work. You'll want to know about the people who push back. So surprise, Linda Belleville pushes back. Philip Payne pushes back. These are two well-known people who push back. Linda Belleville says that Kostenberger makes a mistake because he only looks at verbs and he doesn't look at nouns. And that what he should have done was he should have looked at nouns because didaskein and authentain, those two words in 1 Timothy 2, teach and have authority, they're infinitives. And this is the tricky part, which Linda Belleville calls verbal nouns. Now, an infinitive is a verb that functions kind of like a noun. But she calls them verbal nouns and says you should have researched not just sentences that had, you know, verbs, but ones that had nouns. This is a bit tricky, but the answer, I think, in response is going to be pretty simple and pretty, uh, pretty much closing the case on it. So Belleville says the following, it behooves us, therefore, to correlate nouns and noun substitutes in addition to verbs. This greatly expands the possibilities. Interesting here, she's not, in this part anyways, not arguing that Kostenberger misunderstood all those examples, 42 New Testament and dozens of other first century examples. She's not saying he got those wrong here. In this, in this argument, she's saying she he should have had a wider example database. He should have surveyed a larger number of examples using nouns and noun substitutes, not just verbs. But Kostenberger responds um, because what Linda's doing is, is, is ultimately a waste of time. Here's his response. He says, I've taken pains to ransack first century Greco-Roman literature, not just for verbs or nouns joined by Ude, but very specifically for infinitives joined by Uday. And thus, I find Belleville's objection difficult to fathom. I mean, Belleville's basically saying, look, you did verbs when infinitives are kind of like nouns. You should have done nouns, but that's not accurate. He didn't just do verbs. He did infinitives. And so there's nothing more like an infinitive than an actual infinitive. What Kostenberger did was find the most similar things he could have, expanding to nouns or to all verbs even, would not would not uh, be as helpful as finding these infinitive examples. That's a huge deal. I, I don't understand why this showed up in the newest the newest edition of Discovering Biblical Equality, 220, 2021. That just seems difficult to fathom. I agree. So she also offers here. Let's say that let's say that uh, you know path didn't work for objecting to Kostenberger's work. She also offers an ex- examples that are meant to break the pattern to say, hey, you're not you're not right about this. You say that your pattern is always both positive, always both negative, but that's not true. I can give you examples where that is not the case. So here we go. Linda Belleville says, Kostenberger has recently argued that positive and negative pairings of either nouns or verbs cannot be found. However, such pairings do in fact exist. Revelation 2.20 is a key example. So here's the key example from Revelation 2.20. But I have this against you, that you tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. So I, I'm not convinced by this example. I don't think it breaks Kostenberger's thesis. What we would need is for, say, teaching to be positive here and seducing to be negative. One of them is good, one of them is bad. And one she's doing is is teaching, yay, we're happy about that. Um, seducing, no, we're not happy about that. That may sound that way to somebody. You might think teaching's you know automatically good. Um, but against this, the teaching and seducing or deceiving, you could translate, are both negative in this passage. They're not both positive. For they both qualify, are qualified with the phrase to practice sexual immorality. What is she teaching them to do? to practice sexual immorality, to eat food sacrificed to idols. She's teaching them to do bad things. She's not just teaching. This is very different than 1 Timothy, which is just simply not to teach or have authority. This is to teach to do this bad thing. So teaching here is negative. Seducing here is also negative. Both examples are negative. Also, uk and ude, which which are two Greek words that are present in 1 Timothy 2, are not used in this passage. Teaching and seducing is just used as the word chi, which is like a generic, generic, very, very common Greek word for and. But the point is, chi is not ude. This is not the same as what Kostenberger is actually saying. So here's an example that doesn't relate to his case. And it's it's not even a counterexample because they are 
both negative in this passage. So that doesn't work. She also says 1 Maccabees 2.36 proves a second example. Let's look at that one. Linda Bevel also provides what she says is a second example, although the first example I don't think works, that this shows, you know, a break in the pattern. And this one is from 1 Maccabees 2.36. Now, this example is also problematic for her. I'm just going to put it on your screen right now. 1 Maccabees 2.36, here where it says, but they did not answer them or hurl a stone at them or block up their hiding places. This actually gives three different things, right? Answer, hurl a stone, or block up hiding places. Uh, these are the three things that were not done, that were, in a sense, forbidden or basically rejected, these, these three things. Okay, so what do we need to see here for Belleville's thing to work? Well, some of these have to be positive and some of these have to be negative. Perhaps answer could be seen as positive. Answering people is positive. When you answer those who are maybe accusing you or something, that's a positive thing. Hurling stones at people, that's negative. Maybe blocking up your, your hiding places is, is neutral or positive. And so we have this sort of variety there, sort of breaking the rule. So for her example to work, not answer is positive. Hurl a stone is, is or block up. One of those at least has to be negative. Let's look at this in a little more detail now. The word not answer in Greek, um, which that you know, this this actually is Greek. This is this is in the Old Testament for say Roman Catholics, but it's not part of my Old Testament. I don't think it's part of the proper Old Testament. It's a, it's a important book. It's a worthwhile book, but it's not. I don't think part of Scripture. But this word here written in Greek, not answer, uh, merely means didn't react. If you look it up in say. BDAG, which is a very reliable, respectable resource for Greek New Testament studies, and in this case, 1 Maccabees, which was written around that time as well. Not answer just means didn't react. It doesn't, it's not positive, it's not negative, it's simply a statement of didn't react. Now, in this passage, you'll find it's actually negative, but the word itself doesn't automatically mean something positive. In this particular passage, all three of these things, though, are negative, because not answering not hurling stones and not blocking their hiding places would all be violating the Sabbath. In this section of the text, it was the Sabbath. And any of these things, answering, hurling stones, blocking up hiding places, would be work, would be doing something on the Sabbath when they were just like not going to violate. And that's what Antiochus and all these guys were trying to get them to do was to violate their commitments, their Jewish commitments. And so they refused to do that. The passage, the point of the passage is showing the piety of the men, that these men were the good guys because they're unwilling to submit to activity on the Sabbath. It doesn't pair a positive answering with a negative casting a stone. A casual reader might assume one of those is positive and the other is negative, but the writer of 1 Maccabees doesn't appear to assume that as far as I can tell. Outside the context of the Sabbath, doing all three of those things would actually have been good, not bad. Because they would have been uh, casting stones at enemies who were coming to kill them. They would have blocked up their hiding places to protect themselves from murder. And they would have answered to respond false accusations. So these would have all been positive things. In the context of the Sabbath, they're all negative. They're all things they don't do because they're honoring the Sabbath. The, um, the, the, the example doesn't work. It, it also backfires. It just shows the piety of the men, unwilling to do stuff on the Sabbath. Those are her only two examples given to say that Kostenberger's thesis doesn't work. They both fail, and therefore it reinforces Kostenberger's idea. If we take those examples and add them in, then we, we just see more evidence. Um, yeah. Blomberg says the following, and I think that this is pretty, pretty strong words coming from scholars who are usually pretty not strong with their words. They usually try to be very balanced and careful. Uh, Blomberg says that despite Belleville writing extensively on this topic, quote, to my knowledge, no one has yet discovered an example, one example, of a pair of verbs, including infinitives, correlated with the Greek conjunction ude, in which one of the actions is positive, like teaching here, and the other negative, as in domineering. Not a single example. Now, for a rule to exist that consistently in language, it feels like a real rule. I mean, what rule or at least a real um, reliable thing so that you can use to interpret a writing. Hey, they seem to always do this. When they pair these words this way, they're either both positive, both negative. You don't have a mixture of positive and negative. That's really, really significant. This is why it has impacted scholarship and changed a lot of egalitarians' minds. 
Let's talk about Philip Payne, though. Philip Payne pushes back on Kostenberger's idea. He gives another counterexample that's meant to break the pattern, and this one comes from the New Testament. Supposedly, this is one positive and a negative term being joined by ude. Let's look at it. 2 Thessalonians 3, verses 7 and 8. Paul writing says, for you yourselves know how we ought to, how you ought to imitate us. We were not idle when we were with you. They were not idle when we were with you. And we did not eat anyone's bread without paying for it. There's another word that should stand out to us right there. But with toil and labor, we worked night and day so that we might not be a burden or not burden any of you. Notice there is no prohibition here. In this example, it, it's there's something we didn't do, but there's no prohibition. Nothing's being permitted or rejected. It's just something that was or wasn't done. Um, just a description. Idleness is obviously negative in verse 7. Idleness is obviously negative. I think we would agree on that. Okay, so we won't even argue about that. Philip Payne, you're right. <laughs> it's negative. But Payne goes to lengths to say that eating anyone's bread without paying for it is positive. And he's already lost, like 30% of you are like, oh, <laughs> but let's listen to his argument. Let's work through it thoughtfully. Okay, he gives a few reasons. I'm going to list five of them right now. In fact, I'll put them on your screen. In fact, I would put them on your screen. All right. First, cultural convention supports that Paul would have shared meals without financially reimbursing each host. That's true. Paul would have done that. So eating without paying people is, is good. Uh, two, 1 Corinthians 9 argues that Paul should have this right. Paul says you should have the right. Although he doesn't say eating anyone's bread without paying. He just ha should have the right to be paid for the work he does. It's a little bit different. Um, Philippians 4 praises the Philippians for sending him aid, which would imply he's eating their bread without paying in a, in a very stretchy rubber bandy kind of sense, I guess. Fourth reason is Romans 12, 13 commands hospitality. So that's giving people food when they haven't paid for it. 1 Corinthians 10.27 commends acceptance of hospitality, which is even more on point because if you're being commended for accepting hospitality, that's exactly what is being discussed here. Or is it? Kostenberger actually answers Philip Payne directly. Uh, he looks at Payne's work here and gives a response to it since it's a response to his work. And I'm not going to read this whole quote. I'm just going to include it because it answers him thoroughly. I'll summarize a few of the points while I just leave it on screen here. Um, in short, Payne gives several examples of eating which are positive and concludes that eating someone else's bread in this passage is also positive in the first, uh, second Thessalonians passage. However, Payne's examples boil down to only really two things, either eating as pay, his five examples, either eating as pay or eating as guest. You're either being paid or you're a guest. Should we assume that's the context of 2 Thessalonians? When he says we weren't idle and we didn't eat other people's bread without paying, is the context payment or being a guest? And the answer would be no. There are other contexts. So eating anyone's bread without pay can be positive, but it can also be negative. And here are some examples. Um, it can be applied to a hosting situation. That's positive. Payne admits that. He talks about that. Within that, it can be applied also to a situation where you overstay your welcome and you mooch off your host too much. Proverbs talks about that. Proverbs 25, 17. Put it on your screen here. He says, let your foot seldom be in your neighbor's house. Otherwise, the neighbor will become weary of you and hate you. <laughs> this, is, this is taking advantage too much of other people's hospitality. So perhaps... That's negative, and that may be what Paul's talking about. We didn't take too much advantage of others' hospitality. It seems like Paul did do eating at other people's houses in the positive sense, but he does not do it in the negative sense. It could also be the result of theft, eating someone else's bread without paying. That could be theft. Proverbs talks about that too. It can be eating bread in relation to idleness, which is directly what Paul's talking about. Here's an example from Proverbs 31, verse 27 that the, the the good woman, she looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. That's interesting. She doesn't eat the bread of idleness. This is when you're not just having a meal someone invites you over to eat, but rather you are habitually not working and then mooching off of others. That's the thing Paul's talking about in 2 Thessalonians. That much is very clear. Let's look at 2 Thessalonians with a bit more detail as if you needed my help on this part. For even when we were with you, we gave you this command. Anyone unwilling to work should not eat. That's the bread of idleness. 
For we hear that some of you are living in idleness, mere busybodies, not doing any work. We command, now uh, such persons we command and exhort in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their own work quietly and earn their own living. Brothers and sisters, do not be weary in doing what is right. This is clearly uh, an issue in 2 Thessalonians in the same context that Payne is quoting, where eating bread without paying is a result of idleness and mooching, so it's negative. Conclusion, right? It's a neutral term that can be used positive or negative ways. Eating other people's bread can be positive. It can be negative. This doesn't seem that complicated. But Paul's context in 2 Thessalonians dictates a negative meaning because it's about idleness. Therefore, we do not have a single example joining a negative with a positive infinitive in the construction that Kostenberger is talking about. Not one. But there are more that Payne gives. So there's more pushback from Payne. He offers nine examples where he says a positive verb is joined to a negative one in the New Testament. Nine examples. This is in his paper, 1 Timothy 2.12 and the use of Ude to combine two elements to express a single idea. Interesting paper. There's some worthwhile stuff in it, but there's also some other stuff in it. I reject all nine of his examples. And I'm not going to go over every example here. Um, you can do it on your own just fine. But here, let's just look at one. Usually people give their best example first. Like if you're going to give 10 examples in a paper, especially you tend to give your best one first and your last ones are kind of like, meh, maybe not as good. Here's his first example, hoping that it's his best example. He says that in 2 Corinthians seven twelve we have that coupling, positive plus negative. It was not on the account of the one who did the wrong, nor on account of the one who is wronged. Paul's talking about the reason why he wrote to the Corinthians and he goes, yeah, there was a problem that you guys have. There was somebody was wrong and somebody else was the one wronging them. And he takes these one as positive, one as negative. And, and you know, there's a few things going on here. Um, Payne makes it look positive by changing from wronged, which is negative, to innocent, which is positive. Look at his way of rehashing it. Payne describes this verse by saying, here, one of the two parts joined by Uday elicits sympathy, the innocent wronged party the other an antipathy the one who did the wrong he does the changing in the wording there i think is significant it does make one look good or positive you're innocent that's positive and innocent is positive but being wronged is not positive do you feel the difference if i declare you innocent that's entirely positive but what if someone declares you wronged you were just wronged that's negative i don't like that i don't want to be that i want to be innocent i never want to be wronged you catch the difference? The changing in the wording is really significant here. The reason um, the one wronged elicits sympathy is because it's negative. Like the one that got beat up, that's negative, right? Like if I just beat you up, you're the one that got beat up. It's both negative. There's the guy that got beat up, that's negative. The guy that beat him up, that's me who beat you up. That's what you get. Don't mess with me. And they're both negative. I, I, get, I think you get the point. Everybody wants to be innocent. Nobody wants to be the one who is wronged. Um, so that's, that, that, I assume, his best example. Um, and they're all like this. Just, just no, that's not quite right. All this brings us to an incredible moment, a, a, a pinnacle moment of great clarity, like, like when Bilbo climbs up to the top of the trees in The Hobbit and he looks out and he gets the clarity. And all the arguments about Othenteo below him were, were all the fog and confusion of this enchanted forest just clear away. And you go, wait a minute. This means that if if Althantane could even potentially go either way, if maybe it could be positive, maybe it could be negative, it'll definitely go whichever way teaching goes. Didasco, a word we know a lot about, a word that's used all the time in the New Testament, a word with a bunch of context. Paul uses it a bunch too. We could look at didasco, that word for teaching, and we can say, is that positive or negative? And then conclude that Othenteo probably is the same thing. This is a pinnacle moment. Do you hear the music? There's no music. Do you feel it building? You just imagine music, okay? Imagine something good is happening. Because it is. Don't you're not even imagining, you're just recognizing something. Okay, I'm I'm a little I'm a little tired of talking. Forgive me. Don't worry, I did not record this all in one setting, just with one shirt. Okay, here's the clarity. Is Didasco positive or negative? Didasco, and this isn't going to take too long, it occurs 97 times in the New Testament. That word for teaching that we have in First Timothy. 97 times. Kostenberger summarizes the data really well. Here's a quote from him. We find that the vast majority of its usages 
are positive. In fact, when the evangelist used the evangelist, that's the guys that wrote the gospels, when they used Didasco in connection with Jesus, they will at times clarify the content. You teach the way of God. That's ad, adds context. That's positive, right? Or manner. He was teaching them as one who had authority. So those are examples of additions to the word teaching so that you know it's positive because they added something to it. But more often than not, Kostenberger says, they speak of it in a rather absolute sense. Jesus went about among the villages teaching. He taught in their synagogues, being glorified by all. The chief priests and elders of the people came up to him as he was teaching. Those are quotes from the Gospels. In cases where the content is not specified, the context assumes a positive connotation. This is actually a pretty significant claim. We're saying, hey, Didasco is almost always positive. More to the point, though. Every time it occurs without some specific qualifier, without some clarity to show us it's positive, it is positive. Meaning the default for Didasco is positive in the New Testament. And that is consistent. I surveyed 97 examples of Didasco in the New Testament. I looked through every single one. I categorized them. I made file notes and highlights and all this stuff and put them in groups. And I won't show you all that. But the point is this. It's usually positive. It's very much positive. But let me give you some specifics. It's used 40 times 40 times with no qualifier, where the word itself is not teaching good things or teaching wonderfully or something like that, right? It's just teaching. Every one of those times, those 40 times it's used without qualifier, every one, it's positive. Every single one. This is feeling like really good evidence right now. Not one example is there in the New Testament where the word is used in a negative way and it doesn't have a qualifier. For example, the Revelation one where she was teaching them to commit sexual immorality. That's negative, but it's the qualifier that makes it negative, not the word. When the word stands alone without some kind of qualifier, it's always positive. Paul uses the term 14 times outside of 1 Timothy 2.12, aside from that one example we're arguing about right now. He uses it 14 times. Only one of those is negative. So 13 of the 14, all positive. One is negative. What's the negative one? Well, it's Titus 1.11. Here it says they must be silenced since they are upsetting whole families by teaching for solid, for sordid gain what is not right to teach. That couldn't possibly be more negative, but the context proves it's negative. There's qualifiers, right? They're teaching for sordid gain. So they're, they're teaching for, for money. Um, they're teaching wrong things to, to get money, right? You think of uh, uh, basically TV, TV and preachers and stuff like this, you know, those guys then they're, they're teaching what is not right to teach. That's the second issue with their teaching. The things they're saying are wrong. So he expressly calls out that what they're teaching are falsehoods and they're doing it for financial gain. So Kenneth Copeland. <laughs> so that's, that's what's going on there. And um, that's the one negative use. Every other time it's positive, including three times where there's no qualifier to prove that it's positive, three times Paul uses it positively. And I would say four times if you count 1 Timothy 2.12, but we're making the case for that, so I won't count that yet. Teach, anytime it comes up, didasco, without a qualifier, is always positive in the New Testament in every example. There is pushback to this. Okay, there's pushback to this. Alan Paget, another scholar egalitarian, he pushes back and says the following. Kostenberger is wrong to assert that to teach is always positive in Paul, as Titus 1.11, 1 Timothy 1.7, and 6.3 make clear. In the pastorals, at least, to teach can indeed be negative. This fact undermines a major point the book seeks to make. Alan Paget, um, th this, in this article, The Scholarship of Patriarchy, is literally a response to Women in the Church, the book that I've been quoting a lot today. But there are four problems with what Paget says, and I... I I grieve because I know a lot of people would grab this quote and run with it. Ah, see, Kostenberger ignored these examples. Here's the four major glaring problems that anybody who's paying attention should notice. Kostenberger first, he did not say, teach is always positive. That's not what he claimed. He said it's always positive when it's standing alone without some specific qualifier forcing a negative meaning. Like teaching bad stuff. Like that's not positive, right? But that's a qualifier that forces it. Paget didn't respond to that. He responded to an imaginary view that every time teach is used, it's always positive. Second problem with Paget: Titus 1.11 is a perfect example of exactly that. We just looked at it, right? This is the verse we just looked at. It's still highlighted. Teaching for sordid gain, what's, what's, what is not right to teach. 
this is qualified and negative because of the qualifier. This is consistent with Kostenberger's thesis. First Timothy 1 Timothy 1.7 is his, his next example. Desiring to be teachers of the law without understanding either what they are saying or the things about which they make assertions. They're desiring to be teachers of the law. This one isn't didasko, by the way. This is this is not the word didasko. Teachers of the law is uh, nama didaskalas. It, it is a different word. But more importantly, it's not negative. Does, what they desired to be was a positive thing. Teachers of the law. This is something that Paul thinks is good. He continues to go on about how you can teach the law properly, how you can be a good teacher of the law. So teachers of the law is not negative. This is not a negative example at all. Being a teacher of the law is not inherently bad. Paul thinks there's a right way to do it. He just thinks they're doing it wrong. The fourth problem with Paget's pushback is 1 Timothy 6.3. In 1 Timothy 6.3, it is negative, but it's not didasco. This is not a use of didasco. So 1 Timothy 6.3 says, um, if anyone teaches a different doctrine and does not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the, and the teaching that accords with godliness. This is a warning about false teachers, but the word is heterodidaskale. Hetero meaning other or different kinds of teachings. It's if anyone teaches something that's other than Christian doctrine. If Paul didn't want women to teach other than Christian doctrine, then 1 Timothy 2.12 would not have said didaskain. It would have said hetero didaskain. It would have been a different word. So this, this doesn't work. Um, Paget's pushback is sloppy and wrong. And people grab onto these things and run with them. And this has just been what I see over and over again uh, on this debate, unfortunately. There are more reasons to say didasco is positive. Uh, women can do it to children and other women, um, and men can do it. Do you catch this? Because in 1 Timothy 2.12, that didasco word is probably positive because women are forbidden from doing it to men, don't teach or have authority over men, but they're able to obviously do it to other women and children. There's no prohibition there. So if it was negative, you wouldn't. it's not like you could do false teaching to women and children, but not men. That doesn't make any sense. And also men can do this. Women are forbidden to do it, but the implication is that men can do it. This is a gender difference. That's the, I think, a natural reading of the passage and would, would present that as at least soft evidence for Didasco being positive. And if Didasco is positive, Authenteo is positive. Think about this. If Authenteo means authority and it's positive and women are being told they can't have a positive kind of authority, then your options for an egalitarian reading have shrunk by quite a lot. There's not very many options. There are some options. We're going to talk about them. But there's, there's, you're running out. You're running out of things to grab onto in order to actually make this thing work. So there's also, before we move on though, contextual clues in 1 Timothy 2, 11 and 12 that add more to the case for taking authentain or authenteo as a positive thing. Let's look at those real quick before we move on because I want to make sure we don't neglect the actual context of scripture right here. So verse 11 let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. That word learn, it corresponds with teaching in verse 12. Let a woman learn. I do not permit a woman to teach. There's a corresponding connection that's there. Verse 11, there's another correspondence with submissiveness and authority. So she's to learn, not teach. She's to be submissive, not have authority. That parallel between verses 11 and 12 helps to assure us that we're properly understanding authenteo as have authority, that that, that is the connection because it's a flow of thought where, where there's sort of this counterpoint, you know, two examples of the positive, two examples of the negative, two examples of the permitted, two examples of the forbidden. I should put it that way since I'm using negative in a different context here. So the contrast further supports exercise authority as the right meaning of authenteo. Um, and if Paul was okay with women teaching good doctrine as opposed to false doctrine, and having authority that's approved as opposed to domineering or self-assumed, then we, we wouldn't expect to see learning and submission as the alternatives. That just doesn't fit that context. The interpretations of verse 12 that I see egalitarians give, they don't work with the whole passage. It's You have to isolate verse 12 and forget everything before and after it for it to work. We'll talk more about that and all the craziness of Adam and Eve stuff that's going on here and childbearing and being saved. And we'll talk about that as well. We'll go through all kinds of that stuff in this video that was perfectly the right length. <laughs> um, okay, before we move on though, to the next section, Kostenberger's study also rules out another egalitarian tactic that I sometimes see. And it has to do with that word ude, that word or. So T 
teach or have authority. That word or, some egalitarians abuse the term or and they make it change the meaning of the passage. So it doesn't say teach or have authority. It's more like teach in a out and tail way. Let me give you an example of what I mean. This is another relatively common thing I see, actually. Um, Belleville says, I do not permit a woman to teach so as to gain mastery over a man. Notice that I highlighted there, so as to. She's interpreting ude as so as to. That's not really how ude works. She goes on and says, or I do not permit a woman to teach with a view to dominating a man. Again, treating ude as though it's about the manner in which you do something as opposed to it being like the English word or, teach or have authority. She translated, translates it as, as to gain, so as to gain or with the view to. Um, Philippine does this as well. And Keener is an example of a scholar who used to do that. He used to have that view. This is him in 1992. He says, we could thus read Paul's phrase as, I'm not allowing a woman to teach in such a way as to domineer over men. Now, I think that word domineer is a misinterpretation of authentale, but that's not the point at the moment. In such a way. It's what they do with Uday here that's actually important. But in 1998, he looked at Kostenberger's work on Uday and on the joining of these two terms. And this is what he says. He, Kostenberger, this is, this is Craig Keener, He's changed his mind. He, Kostenberger, is probably correct that have authority should be read as coordinate with teach rather than as subordinate, teach in a domineering way. So it should be or. It should just be teach or have authority. And in the Two Views book that most recently came out in 2005, he said the following. In contrast to my former position on this issue, however, I believe Paul probably prohibits not simply teaching authoritatively in such a way, but both teaching scripture at all and having or usurping authority at all. In other words, women are forbidden to teach men, period. Now, he then goes on. He's not, he's not, he's, he's egalitarian through and through. He goes on to make a case that this only applies to uneducated people, not to women in general. Okay. And I deal with that elsewhere in this video. The point is you shouldn't take Ude and turn this into like an adjective relationship where, where it's teach authoritatively or teach in a way that is whatever I think authenteo means. Instead, it's teach or. Teach or authenteo. Said in the most simple of terms, what are the conclusions we have on authenteo? Have we mistranslated the phrase have authority? And, and that has perhaps been some recent misogynistic Bible translation stuff going on. I think the answer is no. Have authority is the right translation. It's possible that one could say stepping into authority is a, another translation that works. Possible, though I don't, I'm not personally convinced of that. I'm fine if someone wants to leave the door open for that. It wouldn't be in a pejorative or negative sense. It would just be the kind of thing that, that if, in Paul's view, that if a guy was doing that, then it would be okay. But for a woman, he doesn't want them to. This is the view that many of us, myself included, didn't want to have in our conclusion. Yet, I think it's what Scripture is saying. And the reason why we don't like this view is because something's wrong with our understanding of gender relationships. Something's wrong with the way that we value the connection between men and women and the roles that God has given us. We're wrong, which is why we didn't want Scripture to say what it said. Let's talk about application. If a woman was to teach in some way in a church that does not relate to church authority, so she's teaching in a way that isn't connected to authority, is it is it okay? Is it the woman can't teach or have authority as though they're two completely separate ideas? Or is it that there's one basic idea connecting the two? And I, and I did a lot of work on this and I, I didn't include all of it in my notes, but there's agreement. Even Kostenberger agrees, right? That there is a single idea behind these two, teach or have authority, that in the many uses of the coupling of these terms, when you have the Ude connection going on, you have one idea, one single idea behind them. Now, the, the single idea doesn't eliminate the two concepts completely and replace them, but it joins them and adds context to them. I'm summarizing here many pages of stuff that I decided not to share with you guys because of just how, yeah, there's lots of bloat that I had to try to get rid of in sharing all this work with you. But let me put it this way. Ude does seem to connect two terms with a single idea behind them. Teach and have authority, teacher have authority, is, there's a single idea behind them. Ude implies teaching and authority are connected here. The immediate First Timothy context that connects them seems to be eldership. 
I'll talk more about this later and in the next video, the final video in the series where I just summarize and talk about application. But eldership entails teaching with authority, teaching and authority, I should say. It entails teaching and authority. And that's the thing that's being rejected or forbidden. Um, so I think we can fairly see that teaching is in relation to authority, even though authority isn't turned into an adjective. I hope that makes sense for those who are following me. Here's the main point. If a woman were to teach in some way that doesn't relate to church authority, it would seem to be a different issue, uh, a different issue that Paul's not talking about, that Paul's not writing about, that Paul's not addressing. This is where complementarian breaks off from patriarchalists, at least one of the areas where many of the complementarians break off from many of the patriarchalists. If a woman taught in a way that didn't relate to church authority, it's a different issue than what Paul is talking about in 1 Timothy 2. That's consistent with a lot of biblical examples. Priscilla did teach Apollo. She wasn't alone, but she did teach him. Right? And Paul didn't write in Timothy, she could do this as long as her husband's there. He said, I don't allow a woman to do this. Priscilla taught Apollo's theology, but outside of the environment where it would include authority. It was at a, in a home environment, but it was, it was definitely there, but she had no sort of eldership role, no sort of authority that was going on at the time either. It's also consistent with 1 Timothy 2 being a precursor to discussing who can be an elder, because if there was no chapter break, the very next thing Paul talks about is who can be an elder. And then seems to only indicate men can be elders. So here we say women can't do this and then men are qualified for eldership. That's what Paul is talking about. It's challenging to think then of how this applies outside of the environment of the church. So the, the, the local gathering of the church, I mean, we're all the church. So the, but the local ministries where there are official people serving in official positions, for example, um, seminaries, seminaries aren't what Paul did in, in the first century, that's a totally different kind of thing. Um, can a, a woman teach in a seminary, in a Bible college? Is that environment okay? Well, you know, it. I'm going to deal with this all in the next video, but do you understand that these are challenges we need to ask? These are different situations than what Paul is directly addressing in 1 Timothy 2. Some will want to draw out for safety, draw out the application and apply it to those areas too. And others will say, no, no, we don't want to overburden people with extra rules like the Pharisees did with the Sabbath or something. So we're going to stick to just what was clearly stated. We'll talk more about that next time. But I would suppose in my own opinion here, I'll spoiler, um, that if there's some way of doing teaching, even the theological things without entailing eldership type roles, then I can't say it's forbidden in scripture. And if it's not forbidden, then I'm not going to make a rule about it for anybody. In my view, this would allow those types of non elder type teachings without um, without violating any of the text of scripture here. And it would seem consistent with at least some of the examples like Priscilla that we have with teaching Apollos. I'll tackle more application questions in the final summary of this video series. But what should be agreed on by everybody, even though we'll debate some of those things, is that the eldership role and the eldership function, catch that, this is two things. The eldership role, that is you having the title and official position, and the function of elder, that is the things the elder does as an elder that represent that role. These are both things which Paul is setting aside for men only in 1 Timothy 2. So you can't just say, well, I'll just have women do everything men do in my church. I just won't call them elders. Mm, that would not be consistent with 1 Timothy 2. He doesn't say not be elders. He says not teach or have authority. So there's it's the function, not just the, the title. There's more reasons, though, to reject what I would call an over-application of 1 Timothy 2.12. Um, I hope the patriarchalists who are listening to me right now, um, that you'll just hear me and, and think these things through and consider them. If all teaching is off-limits, if all teaching of women teaching men is off-limits, that there's there's no way to explain Priscilla teaching Apollos. Like, this is a big deal. Okay, look, I'm here I am. I'm not a Galatarian. I've just made a whole series de debunking effectively, not my intention, but that was the end result, just debunking a Galatarian views. Um, but there's some of your views that maybe I've pushed against as well. And here's one of them. If all teachings off limits, Priscilla could not have taught Apollos. You can't say, but her husband was there. So it's okay. You're totally adding that. Paul doesn't say anything in first Timothy two about her husband being there being, oh, I'll allow a woman to teach a man as long as the husband's there. He's recovering. These are all nice poetic things you've added. Women not being able to teach men in any capacity or in any environment, or maybe not teach any theology to men in any way, that would violate an example we have in scripture that seems to be lifted up as a good example in Priscilla. If all teaching's off limits, then guess what? All authority's off limits too. If a woman can't teach man, period, 
then a woman can't have any authority over man, period. And if we take it out of the context of eldership and apply it to everything globally, then that means all authority is off limits for women. Guess what? That means women cannot have male employees. Yet, women did normally have servants, and Paul even told servants to obey their masters. When Paul wrote in Ephesus, servants obey your masters, many of those masters were women, even Christian ones. And he was telling them to obey them. Do you get what I'm saying is you're expanding the meaning of Paul way beyond the context of 1 Timothy 2 into all realms of life. And this is a mistake. It's inconsistent with scripture. More importantly, Deborah couldn't have been a judge in Israel if women couldn't have any authority over men in any context. Deborah was not only a judge. And I I, I went over this when we talked about the Old Testament examples of women in leadership. Deborah was more than what most complementarians and patriarchalists make her out to be. She was less than what most egalitarians make her out to be. But the truth is there that you can't dodge. She could not have been in that judge position. She was actually making judgment calls over men. And if you look at the rules about how judges worked, when a local government had a case that was too challenging, the men of the city sitting on that city council would go and bring the case up to this judge, Deborah who made a decision over the over this over this high profile case like a supreme court okay that's authority over men no matter how you slice it so that wouldn't have made any sense queens couldn't have commanded any men and they did have a, some authority to command men but that couldn't have happened if this was some biblical rule about women never having any authority I think the point is here, we don't want to overapply or underapply 1 Timothy 2. The have authority thing is in relation to teaching and in relation to eldership. And I don't think we should be expanding it into all realms of life. I think we should focus on there's something iconic about the moral fabric that, that exists when we have men in the proper roles in home and in church ministries but that that doesn't mean you have to try to expand that into every realm. And scripture doesn't seem to push it into every realm. And I think that we are smart to do that as well. So authenteo means either have authority or it means come into a position of authority, less likely. But either way, it wouldn't mean wrongly usurping authority and all other meanings, all other meanings I think should be set aside for this passage. Egalitarian views do not work. There are other ways they'll have to try to rescue their views. It will not be reasonably, it'll not be by reinterpreting the meaning of authenteo to mean something other than have or exercise authority. So let's look at the next view. Now suppose for a second that you're an egalitarian scholar who realizes that you've been sort of brought by argumentation like the one, like the arguments I've just shared with you. You've been brought to the place of thinking, yeah, um, Paul really does forbid women in general from teaching or having authority and those are both in the positive sense. And so it's, yeah, what, what am I going to do with this? What other options do I have? Maybe, just maybe, um, I can find evidence that there was such a problem with women false teachers at the time that Paul had this sort of temporary band-aid he put on the issue by just not letting any women teach at all. And so this is the bunch of female false teachers view. And that's the basic idea. Women were forbidden to teach or have authority from Paul because they were a particular source of false teachings at the time, possibly due to women commonly having less education at the time. So this is coupled with a historical argument that women were less educated and therefore more prone to teaching false things and therefore don't let them teach until they can get better educated. So the conclusion is not that women shouldn't teach if you take this view but that people who aren't ready to teach good doctrine, people who aren't properly educated, they should be kept from teaching. So 1 Timothy 2 limits women incidentally, but really it's only limiting people who simply aren't ready to teach good doctrine. This is Craig Keener's position, and he represents it pretty well. Um, here's a quote from him. The one passage in the Bible that specifically prohibits women from teaching is addressed to the one church where we know false teachers were effectively targeting women. A primary problem in Ephesus was false teaching, and he lists several scriptures to support that. And the primary false teachers who were men hmm, were exploiting the women in order to spread their false teaching. How do we know this? If women as a rule were less educated than men, they would become a natural target as those particularly susceptible to false teaching. Thus, it isn't surprising to learn that these false teachers targeted women in the household 
who were providing, proving to be incapable of learning correctly. We're going to look into this in more detail, but I think you get like the, the broad outline of the view. Ah, women, we know historically, th these, are, these are the bits that make it reasonable, right? The historical bit is they were less educated. And in 1 Timothy, there was a problem of false teaching. So we know false teaching was an issue. And those false teachers, while they were men, they were exploiting women. And we know that from specific texts that talk about them targeting women. So women who were less educated were a select group of people that were proving incapable of learning correctly and they were spreading false teachings. So Paul forbids them from teaching. Philip Payne has a really similar view. Here's a quote from his work. Paul's primary concern in 1 Timothy is not the original false teachers, but with the impact they've made, especially on women. Paul wants Timothy to address a second round of false teaching, particularly by women in the Ephesian church. Thus, although Paul's letters affirm many women in church leadership, here in Ephesus, false teaching was by false teaching by women was a big enough threat that Paul restricts teaching by women. So now we're focused we focused a lot on authenteo, and now we're focusing a bit on the teaching word there. Why does Paul restrict teaching? How can we explain him targeting women? As, as a group that needs to not be teaching. And, well, we've seen many other attempts. Here's another attempt at, at an egalitarian interpretation. Here are some points in the egalitarian case, just so we can have clarity on it and really make sure we understand it and what it relies on. Point one is that 1 Timothy is primarily concerned with false teaching. And there's several scriptures given. Second point is that women were targeted by those false teachers. And there's usually one scripture given for that. There could be a couple others. Point three, generally, women were less educated than men, so they were more susceptible to false teaching. So it's situational and not gender-based. Point four, women became false teachers in Ephesus. Not only did they receive false teaching, this is super important, they actually became false teachers. See, if they didn't become false teachers, if they were just believing wrong things, Paul would never have to forbid them from teaching. We have to have a problem not of women going astray, not of women being tricked by false teachers, but of women being false teachers and having so many women false teachers that Paul puts a gender barrier on the entire gender from teaching. At least that's one way of doing it. Uh, and number five, Paul solves this problem of women false teachers by forbidding women from teaching or having authority temporarily, it seems, until they are educated enough and able to teach properly. I would have to say, in my opinion, every step of this argument has serious flaws, but steps three, four, and five have fatal flaws. The, the argument won't be able to get off the ground. But let's look through each step and let's consider them one at a time. First step is the claim that 1 Timothy is primarily concerned with false teachers and false teachings. Um, this is not entirely false, but it's not quite true in my opinion. The implication here is that there's enough of a background of false teachers in 1 Timothy that we can see false teachers as the unstated issue in 1 Timothy 2.12. You catch that? that? That's the important part and that not everybody spells it out that way. We see so much false teaching going on in Ephesus that we can just assume or we can sort of imply, infer that that's what Paul's talking about in 1 Timothy 2. Not women teaching, but women teaching falsely. Catch that? Uh, even though that's not what he says. He says teaching, and it seems to be in a positive way. Um, and so that's important. But nothing in the passage talks directly about false teachers. Nothing directly in 1 Timothy 2.12 talks about it. Nothing in the direct context around it talks about that. But false teaching is a major issue in 1 Timothy. So is it pervasive enough? And this is a tough decision to make. Is, is false teaching so pervasive of an issue that you can read it into chapter 2, which isn't about false teaching? Can I assume it's in the background there? So here are ways to see false teaching behind 1 Timothy 2.12. And we're going to run through a few specific ways. Let me see. I've got, mm, well, two. I've got two ways they're going to try to see false teaching. The first one is this, and you'll see this across many egalitarian writings, is that the stated purpose of Timothy's book of, of 1 Timothy is to deal with false teaching. Here we go. This is uh, Cynthia Long Westfall, who says in her book, Paul and Gender, if we treat 1 Timothy as a real letter, we will look for its purpose in the beginning of the body of the letter. According to John White, the body opening is the point at which the principal occasions for the letter are usually indicated. The body opening lays the foundation from which the superstructure may grow. Sounds 
overly complicated, but, <laughs> but there it is. So she concludes, and well, she points to 1 Timothy 1, verses 3 through 20. I won't read it all right now, but we'll look at, we'll look at it as we go. But this section, and then she concludes the following. The purpose of 1 Timothy is to, quote, instruct certain individuals not to spread wrong teaching and to not, not to pay attention to myths and endless genealogies. There are some problems with this. I, I think what we're taking is something that's true. False teaching was an issue and we're turning it into the whole deal so that false teaching was the issue. Um, it was an issue, but I don't think it was the issue having gone through this with a fine tooth comb. At least I believe I have, and I will demonstrate it right now. You can take it in and think about it and make up your own mind. First Timothy three verses 14 and 15. Paul actually says why he's writing the letter. And it's not exactly the first verses. No, it's in chapter three, but he tells you why he's writing. I hope to come to you soon, but I am writing these things so that if I delay, you may know what? How to do with false teaching? No. How one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. It's much more broad than false teaching. False teaching obviously is one issue in the church. It always it always has been and always will be, but it's not the issue in this book. His stated purpose is much more broad than false teaching. It's about proper Christian behavior. I think that Paul's stated purpose trumps any sort of implications you get from chapter 1, verse 3. For instance, the verse that she leans on is in verse 3, where according to Cynthia Long Westfall, Paul is saying why he wrote the letter was to instruct certain individuals not to spread wrong teachings. But this was actually why to Paul told him to remain in Ephesus. That's not why he wrote the letter. That's why Paul left Timothy in Ephesus initially. So this is just a slight skewed interpretation of the passage, whereas Paul actually tells us why he wrote in chapter 3. So the purpose of the book keeps us open to verse 12 of chapter 2 being about false teaching, but it doesn't push the issue. 2.12 could be about proper Christian behavior which is what the broad, broadly what the book is about. Maybe it's just not proper Christian behavior for a woman to teach or have authority in that eldership type environment. So we need more evidence. So is Paul's main charge to Timothy, as some, some will say, is his main charge to Timothy to deal with false teachings? Um, no, it's one of his charges. So in verse three, this is a charge. I, as I urged you or charged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus, that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine. That's very true. It's one of the issues. But there are a number of other examples of things that Paul urges Timothy and charges him for. So here's a list. He charges them him to command and teach things, not about false teaching, but about proper teaching. To set the believers an example, to devote himself to the public reading of scripture, to practice, to live out the Christian faith, to keep a close watch on himself and the teaching, which is would relate to false teaching, but isn't exclusively about it. So this list of charges shows us that Paul, yes, he deals with false teaching, but 1 Timothy has a, a breadth of topics that relate to proper behavior in the body of Christ. A number of things. So again, that's kind of strike two on saying that we can just assume false teaching background um, into a passage, in a section of a passage that doesn't actually talk about it explicitly. The book talks about false teaching a lot. Uh, Linda Belleville makes this claim and says that false teaching consumes 35% of Paul's explicit attention. 35% of 1 Timothy is about false teaching. Then she says, all told, 20% of the letter focuses on women. So 35% is about false teaching, 20% is about women. And then she says, some are quick to point out that there are no explicit examples of female false teachers in 1 Timothy, and they are correct. No woman, no women, teachers or otherwise, are specifically named. Yet this overlooks the fact that attention to false teaching and women occupies about 60% of the letter. It would therefore be foolish not to mention misleading to neglect considering 1 Timothy 2 against this backdrop. So 35% is about false teaching, 20% is about women, and then somehow 60% is about false teaching and women, which of course implies that there's an extra 5% that popped in there somewhere, and also implies that all the false teaching stuff isn't about women, because somehow these numbers separate, I don't know, anyway... The conclusion that she makes is that it's foolish and misleading to neglect considering 1 Timothy 2 against the backdrop of women and false teaching. 
I think that this is unhelpful as far as uh, evaluating First Timothy. Throwing up percentages and then saying 60% of the letter, it seems like a great exaggeration to me anyways, but it just doesn't seem helpful. What we're doing is we're trying to find ways of reading a context into First Timothy 2 that isn't clear in First Timothy 2. So we're getting it from other places by saying, well, percentage-wise and this and that. I'm not saying that's always illegitimate, but it's definitely sketchy territory, right? Because that, that type of approach to biblical interpretation is so easily misused. I could do that with anything. I could say, well, this percentage of John is about this type of subject. So I could read that into a part of John that may not be about that issue. And so that, that can be a problem. How many verses, at least in my opinion, okay, this is my study of First Timothy. These are verses in First Timothy that clearly relate to false teaching. These verses, 28 verses, um, look at them. Um, this can give a, a false impression because if you only look at the verses that do relate to false teaching, you miss the ones that don't. Here's a list of verses that don't show any obvious sign that they're about false teaching at all. 90 verses. You could easily say in response to like Belleville's percentage point, well, the majority of the letter is not about false teaching and the majority of the letter is not about women. And if you combine false teaching and women and add the numbers together to get the majority of the book, you're, you're actually doing it wrong. Like that's not how this kind of thing works. <laughs> um, almost all of these verses, these verses that are not about false teaching are either about proper Christian behavior or proper Christian beliefs, not false teaching, proper Christian beliefs. First Timothy two feels like a behavior passage. As you read the whole passage, just re just stop the video, go read First Timothy two. It's about behavior all the way through. This is proper Christian behavior. This is how Christians ought to act and live. These are things that they should do and not do. It doesn't appear to be about false teaching. Remember the point that some egalitarians are making here is that they want to say we can assume a false te that false teaching is what's behind First Timothy two twelve in particular, even though that passage doesn't indicate it. The way they do this is by suggesting that the whole letter is about false teaching, so you could just see it in the background, even if you don't see it in the foreground. But that's just not the case. The majority of this letter is not obviously about false teaching. Nothing in chapters, this is a whole section, nothing in chapters 2, 3, or 5, to, to my reading, nothing in those chapters is directly about false teaching. And that's the relevant chapters, chapter 2. What else does First Timothy talk about other than false teaching? Here's a list of things. Um... I'll, you can, I'll just let you read it. He urges prayer, Christian lifestyle, men not being angry or quarreling, women being modest, respectable, having a lifestyle of doing good works, elder requirements, deacon requirements, what do we do with widows, um, providing for your loved ones, payment for elders, dealing with elders who are sinful, all, all sorts of different things. Should we assume false teachings behind any of those things as well? Paul urges prayer. Do we assume, well, there was a false teaching at the time that people shouldn't pray? No, that would be silly to just project something into the background that we don't see. Should we, uh, you know, it says men don't be angry or quarrel. Should we assume there was a false teaching that was leading men to be angry and quarrel? Or should we just assume that men being angry and quarreling was like the normal reasons because we're like sinners and we just get angry and we argue and fight and we get div divisive over things because we got the old man. Um, deacon requirements. Should we assume that deacon requirements were given because there was a false teaching about wrong requirements for for deacons it would be weird to assume that anywhere else but that's what we're doing with first timothy 2 12. not only that again i'll, I'll say the entire section around first timothy 2 12 is not about false teaching all of chapters from beginning of chapter 2 all the way through chapter 3 nothing there that indicates it's about false teaching nothing not in my reading maybe you could go with with a magnifying glass and try to find something but at least you'd have to agree that it's basically not about false teaching <laughs> It's in the middle of a section of 31 verses that don't appear to be about false teaching. We shouldn't assume that that's the issue in the passage. So step one uh, is not going to work. Step one, just to remind us where we're at, is to say that 1 Timothy is primarily concerned with false teaching and false teachers. I've seen this over and over again across all kinds of sources. Step one doesn't work. It's not primarily concerned with that. It's secondarily concerned with that. Number two, the second point for this multi-case for that Paul's only saying women can't teach for this because there's a bunch of female false teachers effectively. Um, women were targeted by false teachers. Is that true? Were women targeted by false teachers? Um, sort of. Yeah, let's look at that. This is actually from 2 Timothy. And here it says, 
For among them, these sort of false teacher types, are those who creep into households and capture weak women, burdened with sins and led astray by various passions, always learning and never able to arrive at a knowledge of the truth. So it's true that women did were targeted by these false teachers, but I would say um, it's not exclusively. We don't want to exaggerate this and think that like these false teachers just focused on women, like they they had a gathering of all women. They, in addition to affecting men, they affected women, and not just any women, but specific women, women who were probably single. They were probably with unmarried or or husbands who were who were dead or off on journeys or something like that, because they're creeping into their households. And these women are sinful and they're led astray by passions. These are wicked women. They're not just women in general. They're specific kinds of women that are evil. They're, they're, they're compromised morally. And that's why they're prone to these false teachers. The false teachers use their desires for sin as a way of enticing them. Perhaps prosperity is being promised. Perhaps materialism is being promised. Kenneth Copeland. I'm sorry. That he, he just It's not my fault Kenneth Copeland fits so well the warnings against bad teachers that we have in the scripture. It's Kenneth Copeland's fault. <laughs> um, so what were they targeted for? Probably these women are, are targeted to pay the false teachers. They're looking for people to give them money. Kenneth Copeland. But here's the Priscilla problem. Priscilla is still in Ephesus at this time. Priscilla is present. I say this time, I mean 2 Timothy. In 2 Timothy, when this problem's going on, where there's, we're, let me, let me br- break it down this way. Here's the logic. There was such a huge problem of women false teachers, Paul just made it so no no women could teach. And we know it because in 2 Timothy, which came a little later, Paul writes about this problem of, of, of them targeting females, targeting women, these false teachers. But in 2 Timothy, that's where Priscilla, we know Priscilla was in Ephesus because he greets her in 2 Timothy. So here we have Paul forbidding all women from teaching due to a problem that we're aware about in, in a time when we know Priscilla was present and Priscilla was certainly a capable teacher. If Paul was going to let any woman teach, it was going to be her. So egalitarians will use the circumstances of 2 Timothy to show support for female false teachers such that Priscilla would be forbidden from teaching, yet Priscilla's present and every egalitarian agrees that she was a capable and solid teacher. So their view doesn't fit the evidence here. It, it's being patchworked together, I believe. Um, but... But I'm not done, okay? And maybe you disagree with me on one piece of this puzzle here, but I think you're going to find the puzzle irrefutable. Um, So number three, the third thing that is used to suggest women false teachers were the problem. Generally, women were less educated than men, so they were more susceptible to false teaching. Therefore, it's a situation, not a gender-based requirement, and the application is just don't let uneducated people do things in ministry like teaching. Let's look at a quote here from uh, Dr. Keener. This is his application of 1 Timothy. And it is generally true, women were less educated. Okay, generally true. Um, so if the problem with the Ephesian women was their lack of education and consequently, consequent susceptibility to false teaching, the text provides us a concrete local example of a more general principle. And here's the principle. Those most susceptible to false teaching should not teach. 100% agree. Like we all would agree with this. This is this is perfectly fits egalitarian views. No problem. Women can teach. It's just people who are susceptible to false teaching shouldn't be up there teaching. Okay, this leads us into a new historical research area. How educated were women in ancient Rome? <laughs> and this is something we've had. To, I've had to dig into and spent a good amount of time on. But I'm just going to summarize because it ain't going to matter all that much when you get to the end of this. You'll understand. Okay, everybody agrees. That on average, typically, women were less educated than men. Of course, there were men in the congregation in Ephesus that had just as little education as women that were there that had no education. But generally speaking, women had less on average than men. Uh, That's definitely true. Everybody seems to agree on that. But some scholars uh, paint a picture like women were totally ignorant, like they had no education of any kind um, or they were just really very ignorant. Um, it's it's more likely that the real education divide, the real extreme difference, is when it came to the smaller group of men who went to advanced studies and they were doing philosophy and they're doing medicine and they're researching those sorts of things. That's where you would just see like no women doing that or almost no women doing that. But then amongst the more general populace, like the workforce, you're not going to see as much of a difference in education in those groups. 
Jewish women had the least education, it seems, at the time. Greek and Roman women had more. The rich women had the most. So they're kind of an exception. Uh, Ba, who specializes in in the historical study of Ephesus in particular, he points this out. Here's a couple of quotes from him. Upper class women participated in other forms of education in Ephesus, particularly private lectures in salons. As for women's literacy, daughters of the upper classes needed some level of education for their duties in managing large households. And though they were not commonly found in fields like philosophy, women did read and write literature and poetry during this period. We actually have a number of poems from women in Ephesus from around the time of Paul written in devotion to the goddess Hestia. The hearth goddess. Why do I know that? Because I had to read too many things. Paul's warnings about the elaborate clothes and hairstyles of women implies some of these upper class women were part of the church in Ephesus, right? He warns against gold and braided golden hair. So that means that probably some very educated women were part of the church in Ephesus, pushing back a little bit on the idea that he would have to have a whole like sweeping bar on all women. And certainly there were some educated, uneducated men but he doesn't bring up, why doesn't he focus on the issue of education? Why does he target women? There were at least some highly educated women. There were there were at least some, probably quite a few, very uneducated men. This just doesn't make sense. But it, it doesn't make sense for even more reasons that I'll get to in a second. Um, Sharon Hod- Hodgen Gritz, who wrote uh, Paul, Women Teachers, and the Mother God at Ephesus, um, she says women had more education than some have commonly thought. Now, I'm not here suggesting women were highly educated or, or equally educated as men. I'm not. I'm just trying to push back at something that seems like a common misunderstanding, and that is that there is just this complete, complete diametric opposite levels of education. All right, so here are some quotes from Grintz. Uh, grits on this. She says, Rome did educate its daughters. Women, again, especially the rich women, were probably not as ignorant as some writers have portrayed them. She goes on to say, the Hellenistic period brought the widespread practice of education for younger girls. Plato encouraged the intellectual training of women, as did the later Plutarch. The Stoics especially stressed the need to educate women. But she says this was different in the Jewish context of the time. Is, is that quote on there too? Yeah, there it is. First century Judaism limited the education of women, particularly to domestic arts. They had no other formal education. Um, though we know, I'll say this, because this is a, also a common myth about history. We know women did attend the synagogues and they did get to be part of the lectures and the teachings that re- they received in the synagogues. Um, but the more advanced stuff where they follow a rabbi around and stuff like that, like that was not common. Although Jesus... How do women do that with him? Ah, that's right. Because you do not whip, limit the education of women in any way, shape, or form um, in theology and stuff like that. Like, biblically speaking, let her learn. That is, I'm, I'm going to sound like I'm egalitarian, but I'm just being biblical here. <laughs> the egalitarians are right about that. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Um, so I, I don't want you to think that this means women were, like, highly educated I just want you to know it's 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 more varied than a lot of people paint. There is definitely, I could put up quotes of lots of people talking about women are ignorant and women can't be educated and they shouldn't be educated. And there's quotes from, then there's quotes saying they should be and they can be. Um, but in practical daily life, you had men and women, if you if you had a, a, a spectrum of totally uneducated, highly educated, you'd have a, a more women than men, but you'd have a bunch of both down here. No, educa- no education. Up here, you'd have almost only men and it would just be like more men less women the further you went but it wasn't this strict thing where you've got educated men uneducated women that's the rule meaning that the interpretation that says paul's just forbidding women because of their education it looks like it's difficult to apply that to real life in the first century yeah let's now address the bigger issue with the education argument, um, which which is this. The level of education of women is, is a dumb thing for us to think about as Christians. Paul didn't care. The New Testament didn't care. Jesus didn't care how educated you were. It just didn't matter. The idea that you need education in schooling and high education in like what, philosophy or something in order to be a teacher in the body of Christ is a very unchristian, unbiblical idea. Now, I understand that there's value in going to seminary and receiving theological education. Well, none of that was available in the first century, right? We're not talking about any of that kind of education. We're talking about what you might think of a secular education and then 
thinking that that is required for you to be a teacher in the church. Um, education only matters as regards to Christian theology. A Christian teacher in the New Testament had to have a theological background, a understanding of scripture and the teachings of Christ. They did not have to have any kind of educational background beyond that, starting with the apostles themselves. Let's look at some examples from scripture here. So this is Acts chapter 4, verse 13. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated, common men, they were astonished. This is Jesus using the apostles who are uneducated, common men. They're on that spectrum, right, of edu highly educated, no education. They're down here. They have relatively little education, very small amount, enough to be called uneducated, common men. Jesus picks them and he trains them himself. He gives them the teachings. He gives them the, the examples and the experiences and sends them out and makes them his voice to the world. Jesus chose fishermen and mostly, mostly uneducated people to be his apostles. To think that Paul is now requiring worldly education for someone to be an elder when, when the apostles, other than Paul, for the most part, and maybe Matthew, didn't have that is, is weird. Jesus actually loved this fact that he had uneducated people. I don't know how people miss this. Like, come on. School children know this stuff about Jesus. <laughs> At that time, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you've hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. He's speaking to about the uneducated and the simple of the world, not the not the brainiacs. Paul loved it too. It was Paul who supposedly is limiting who can teach based on education. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? Paul did not require you to have education to be a Christian teacher. You just had to have Christian education. Bob points out that ancient education focused largely on public speaking. That was, that was a large focus of ancient education. I mean, it sounds weird to modern ears, but that was a major focus was speaking well in public. But he clarifies that this was not an important thing for Christian teachers. That is the main concern of uh, secular education in Paul's time is something Paul wasn't worried about. Paul himself specifically rejected the showy devices of the sophists and the rhetoricians as the essential component of his own preaching. 1 Corinthians 1, 17 and 2, 1 through 2. And he never required such qualifications for male teachers and elders. 1 Timothy 3, Titus 1. It, you know, when he talks about what it takes to be an elder, a teacher, a leader in the church, he never says education. Why think that Paul's forbidding women on the basis of something he doesn't even use as a qualification for people in ministry? It's really weird to suddenly interpret Paul like he only wants to have teachers in the church who have a high level of education outside of Christian doctrine. So what mattered, this is, this is where we get to the real issue, what mattered was not general education or the ancient equivalent of a college degree. What mattered was Christian education. Catch that? I'm not saying Paul doesn't care if you have a brain or if you know how to use it. What mattered, though, was Christian education. Did the Ephesian women, here's the big question, did they have Christian education? Did they have the kind of education that if they were um, skilled in it would have, would have allowed them to step into that role of elder if there was, in fact, no gender issue in Paul's mind? And in under according to the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, I'm not going to, I don't want to talk like some people who act like Paul's on his own here. He's speaking by the leading of the Holy Spirit, of course. So let's talk about the history of Ephesus just a little bit, just briefly, the church in Ephesus, right? The church in Ephesus started, it seems, about 52 AD. 52 AD, Paul, he stays there in one place for two to three years teaching them. Two to three years of him. I don't know if you had Paul for two to three years. That seems like a pretty good Christian education to me. I mean, seriously, that's, that'd be amazing. That would be, I would pay money for that. Not that, not that Paul would be interested in that, but that would be just so amazing. Um, how well did Paul teach them? Was he just occasionally teaching those two to three years? Was he teaching a lot? Well, in Acts 20, Acts chapter 20, he talks about this in his farewell address to the Ephesian elders. He gathers the elders at Ephesus and he tells them, and I'll read a few quotes, I didn't shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public and from house to house, meaning he was a very involved teacher. He goes on, Therefore, I testify to you this day that I'm innocent of the blood of all. Why is Paul innocent of your blood? For I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. If, if someone didn't finish really teaching through 
the needs, the, the theological important issues, the, the, the gospel and its connections in the Old Testament and things like that. If they didn't teach through those things, they couldn't say, I declared the whole counsel of God to you. Then in verse 31, he says, therefore be alert, remembering that for three years, I did not cease night or day to admonish everyone with tears. Paul didn't just teach on Sundays. And guess what? There were women in Ephesus who were taught by Paul for as long as the apostles were taught by Jesus. And Paul says not to let them teach or have authority over a man. The education view falls apart completely when you apply it to what matters, which is Christian education. Now, it's not even done. We're not done yet because after Paul left, he left Timothy in Ephesus for a long time, for years, just to ensure proper teaching continued. We also know that Apollos ministered there and he encountered Priscilla and Aquila, and I'll bring them up again. There's obviously one woman educated in Ephesus who's able to teach Christian theology to Apollos. And we even know she was present when 2 Timothy was written because Paul greets her. So typically egalitarians will say that the same problem of female false teachers, and in say Keener's case, based on low education, was happening in 2 Timothy. And yet we know Priscilla was there and we know she was educated and we know she was able to teach, capable of it. Whether she was approved in that elder role, that's that's where 1 Timothy 2 weighs in. Then we get from 52 AD when the church is planted to around 62 to 64 AD. So about 10 plus years later, Paul writes 1 Timothy. He's then writing this letter that we're arguing about right now. And the uneducated women, like who could they be 10 years later with so much Christian education and so much background and so much nurturing that happened in that church? The only way uneducated Christian women could be there is if they just showed up. They're new converts or they're those people who show up like for Christmas and Easter, you know, <laughs> the C&E Christians. That's, that's it. If that was the concern, Paul could just say not to let new converts teach. Just like he told Timothy, and he did tell him this, don't lay hands on new believers to appoint them to new ministries. Wait till they're like a little more mature in the Lord. Don't, don't lay hands on anyone too quickly, he said. So many educated women, we have every reason to think a large number of very educated, very well-taught women were in Ephesus when Paul said, I do now do not allow a woman to teach or have authority over a man. This this is, this is where I say fatal flaw. Step three in this case is a, is, a, is a genuinely a fatal flaw. Let's look at step four. Okay, kitty cat. All right, look, you got You can't walk on my keyboard right now. No. Don't walk on my keyboard. There you go. Just sit down so I can start recording. Meek is cramping my style. Here's that list of claims one more time on your screen. We've gone through the first three of them. Uh, the claim about First Timothy being about false teachers. The claim about women being targeted by those false teachers. The claim about women being less educated. That one has serious problems. And then number four, here's the idea. Women became false teachers in Ephesus. And this is, of course, absolutely crucial for the egalitarian argument to take place if they're going to succeed, at least in this line of argument, uh, to interpret 1 Timothy 2 as an egalitarian text, then they really need this to be not only a little successful, but for it to be monumentally successful. Let me explain. So if there are, let's say, a handful of female false teachers in 1 Timothy in that setting in Ephesus, this doesn't give you enough like leverage to say, yeah, that explains why Paul forbids all women from teaching. Because a hand, it's just unreasonable to think that that is the explanation for a wide, just complete barring of women from teaching and having authority over men, if it's a handful of women. So you need such a huge problem of female false teachers that it's it's a solution to actually borrow women entirely from teaching. That's what egalitarians need. Uh, Wayne Grudem puts this correctly when he says the following. Unless women were primarily responsible for spreading the false teaching, Paul's silencing of the women in the egalitarian view would not make sense. And this is significant because the only false teachers we're, we're aware of specifically are men. At least that is what I've thought. That has been my impression as I read First Timothy, as I read the related passages. But there are some egalitarians who say, no, no, no. We have indications that there are female false teachers 
that are going house to house, that are spreading false teachings, and that he talks about this in 2 Timothy. So we're going to read about this in uh, well, 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy, places where supposedly there are female false teachers specifically called out by Paul. Let's talk first about 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 13. I'll put that on your screen now. Here it says, besides that, they, here, you know, most people think that they is referring to uh, widows, younger widows who get on the roll for financial aid from the church, which is a beautiful thing. And then they end up having problems because they're young and because they start basically living bad lives. And so here it says, besides that, they learn to be idlers going about from house to house and not only idlers, but also gossips and busybodies saying what they should not. Now there's three ways in which an egalitarian might use this verse to say, here are women false teachers that Paul specifically calls out in 1 Timothy, giving them that leverage to reinterpret 1 Timothy 2, to interpret it in a different way than uh, at least what I think an honest person would say seems obvious from a from a simple reading of the text. Here are the three ways. Let me put them on your screen. So the first is that phrase, house to house. They'll think that when the women go about from house to house, that that is a reference to going from church gathering to church gathering, not just building to building, home to home, but local church gatherings that are happening across Ephesus, that they're heading to one to perhaps be kind of like a, a teacher, then to another, then to another. So house to house refers to that. Also the phrase saying what they should not, Paul says they are saying things they shouldn't say, that that implies teaching. And the third way is they'll say that the word gossips in 1 Timothy 5.13 has been mistranslated, that it actually means false teachers. Now that's a, a surprising claim that we actually see, and you certainly wouldn't have expected this. Uh, that doesn't mean that it's wrong. I'm just saying that, hey, surprise, there are egalitarian arguments that most of you have probably never heard of, and we're evaluating those as well. So that word gossips, it's just a mistranslation that it refers ultimately to, or indicates, perhaps I should say more cautiously, it indicates false teachers, even if it doesn't mean that exactly. So we'll tackle the first two issues first, the house to house phrase, and then the saying what they should not. We're gonna tackle those two topics first. And here is a quote from Linda Belleville where she makes her case from those two phrases. She says, further, the parallel language between the itinerant women at Ephesus, quote, going about from house to house, saying things they ought not to, and the false teachers at Crete, disrupting whole households by teaching things they ought not to teach in Titus 1.11 is striking. So here you take these parallel passages, you hold them up and you go, hey, we know Titus 1.11 is about false teachers and it uses households and saying or communicating things they shouldn't communicate and so does first timothy 5 13 and so it's striking now belleville doesn't really say what her conclusions are from that she just says it's striking so forgive me if i respond as though she's implying more than perhaps you might think she's implying it's not clear what she's implying she just says it's striking I think that what she intends us to see and what probably most readers of her book are going to think is that uh, women false teachers are in 1 Timothy 5.13 because of the parallel language with Titus 1.11. None of the parallel language, though, in response to this, I have a couple things to say. First, none of the parallel language in these two passages actually indicates false teaching. There is a term house, house to house, versus disrupting households. Okay, it, it's possible that in Titus 1.11, the household's language refers to churches. It's also possible it just refers to people's homes. We're not even sure if that refers to churches in that passage. Uh, the house to house there, there's nothing in that that indicates house churches. That's why Paul doesn't say greet the house of so-and-so when he's talking about the church that gathers in that house. He says greet the church that gathers in that home. They are not uh, synonymous with churches. Then the other parallel language is things they ought not to saying or teaching things they ought not to. Uh, that doesn't really indicate clearly in any kind of teaching thing. I think that this is impressive on a surface level, but when you really look at it carefully, you go, you know, if these passages weren't right next to each other, which they're not in the Bible, right? These are, these are in different letters of Paul, different occasions, different topics they're dealing with. If they're not next to each other, then the parallel language becomes just more coincidental than anything else. Uh, more to the point though, the non-parallel language is something we need to acknowledge. So sometimes uh, skeptics will do this. I've, I've seen this, even skeptical scholars. They'll grab parallel stuff from, say, Homer, his writings, and compare that to, say, Genesis and the flood account. 
and you read about like say the epic of gilgamesh or something you compare that to the flood and they take only the parts that are parallel and they hold them up to each other and it creates an artificial sense of sameness but not until you gather the parts that are dissimilar that are not parallel and you bring them in then you see how radically different how utterly different these stories are that you know these aren't these aren't borrowing one isn't based off the other and it's the differences that help you understand whether or not these parallels are legitimate and so the non-parallel language indicates that first timothy 5 13 is about idle women is about women who are being idle and so let me walk you through a little bit of that briefly before we move forward so the non-parallel non-parallel language is that paul is explicitly in titus 1 11 dealing with teachers who are teaching false things explicitly clearly yet in first timothy 5 13 he's not dealing with teachers he's not dealing with teachings he's dealing with young widows who there's a, there's a whole list of things young widows who get financial aid because they're widows which there's nothing wrong with that that's a wonderful thing but because they're young because they have all that energy because they have so much life ahead of them they end up becoming idle and then here this is in the context of young with financial aid and idleness then they go house to house as an expression of their idleness their lack of working they're they're just being lazy right they're not traveling false teachers going house to house to teach they're bored idle um moochers who are going around from house to house probably spreading things like gossip and this is why he calls them busybodies so th this this the, the non-parallel language shows the difference these aren't false teachers read first timothy 5 in detail read the whole chapter and you'll see this clearly these are not false teachers it's just such a stretch to suggest that they are in my opinion uh, let's look at the next quote here uh, linda belleville says the phrase saying things they ought not to points to a teaching role perhaps along the lines of what is found in titus 2 verses 3 and 4. saying things they ought not to is it a teaching role or is it more generically saying things you ought not to like just literally taking the phrase that just refers to you're saying stuff you shouldn't be saying it doesn't inherently refer to teaching. For instance, in Titus 1.11, when Paul's clearly talking about false teachers in what she calls a parallel passage, it says teaching things they ought not to teach. If saying things they ought not say meant teaching things they ought not teach, why didn't Paul use the same language in Titus 1.11 when talking about teachers? He didn't. He uses the word teach because he doesn't want us to be confused, it seems. It seems these are two different phrases to refer to two different types of speaking, one teaching, one not. This is an expression of idleness. Again, not false doctrine. Let's look again at the verse. The immediate context is going to guide us here. But these women if you if, here, refuse to enroll younger widows for when their passions draw them away from Christ, they desire to marry. Enroll means enrolling them in financial aid from the church because they were taking care of the older widows. But he's like, hey, if they're young, just tell them to get married. And so incur condemnation for having abandoned their former faith. Besides that, they learn to be idlers this is besides that. This is less than re abandoning their faith. There's other issues that, that go alongside of just taking care of them in that situation. They learn to be idlers going about from house to house, not only idlers, but also something and busy bodies saying what they should not. So I would have younger widows marry, bear children, manage their household, and give the adversary no occasion for slander. Do, do you see this is this is about Christian behavior? It's not about false teachers. I think that seems obvious from the passage. Obviously, some are going to see what they're going to see in the passage. And um, i am just put it out there for you to consider. Does saying imply teaching? No. Uh, the word saying does not. If if he had said didasco, teaching, then that implies teaching. Teaching implies teaching. Saying does not. The context then would have to push teaching onto the word saying. But the context pushes idleness, laziness, and being busybodies. It pushes those other concepts onto it. So yeah. Another problem with this egalitarian view is the following. It seems likely that whatever they were doing in verse 13, whatever these women were doing, it was directed towards other women. They're going there. These are women going house to house. They're not guest speakers at local church gatherings. They're probably women visiting other women in other houses. And I'll actually quote for this Cynthia Long Westfall, again, egalitarian commenting on this exact same verse. Cynthia Long Westfall, uh, whether intentionally or not, seems to counteract the claims of Linda Belleville about this, this uh, 
going house to house being about churches. It's really about what Westfall would say, the women's network. And I think that this actually makes a lot more sense historically. So here I quote from her work, um, Paul and Gender, page 302. Although the women are not singled out for abuse in public teaching, they're not, she says, they are criticized directly and indirectly for repeating influential narratives, myths and genealogies, and spreading gossip and slander from house to house. That's in 1 Timothy 5.13. This reflects a very real social pattern among women in a semi-segregated culture where women communicate, educate, and socialize with women. The women's network was a primary way that news spread and communication occurred in the community. Follow with me here. Don't get ahead of me just for a second. The reason why this is significant is not because I agree with everything Westfall says, but this one fact, if it's, if it's accurate, going house to house women, widows, is about women visiting other women in the women's network, then Paul couldn't possibly be correcting that problem in 1 Timothy 2. Why? Because Paul forbids them from teaching and having authority over men. It wouldn't have even stopped the problem that he supposedly is talking about in 5.13. Do you see that this is why these things are not connected? If 5.13 was about women teaching, then they're teaching primarily other women. They're not doing it towards men, and so Paul forbidding them from doing it towards men is irrational. It doesn't make any sense. These two are being artificially smashed together. It's not a teaching problem in the first place. If it was, then it was something women did primarily with other women, and the egalitarian explanation of 1 Timothy 2 no longer works based on their own theory. It's it's It doesn't get off the ground, okay? This is a failed rocket launch. That's what it is. Um, okay, let's talk about the word gossips. In 1 Timothy 5.13, there are some who claim that the word gossips, when Paul says they're gossips and busybodies there, that it refers to false teachers. And for this, we'll have to get into a little bit of detail here. It's the word fluaras, and this in the NIV is translated as busybodies. So if you have the NIV, it's not the word gossips there, it's busybodies. If you're looking at, say, ESV or a lot of other translations, it's going to show up as gossips, that word gossips. The following quote actually is of Craig Keener. Um, relying on Gordon Fee, who is a very respectable source on this kind of stuff. And he says, as Gordon Fee has demonstrated to me, a survey of every use in extant Greek literature of the word translated busybodies or gossips in 513 reveals that the word was used for those speaking nonsense and in moral and philosophical contexts, it typically refers to those spreading false or improper teaching. This is, this is heavy because it, this is exactly how we establish the meaning of a word. We look at all the different uses and we find commonalities. And then we go, yeah, well, if it's used that way there, it's probably used that way here too. Unfortunately, uh, Craig Keener, who I love and appreciate greatly, he's got a great book on miracles. He's got a great commentary on Acts. It's cool stuff. Anyway, he, said, he doesn't give the data, uh, unfortunately, in this case. He doesn't give the data or reference it in any specific way. He just says that Gordon Fee showed it to him and that the evidence is overwhelming. I don't I don't have that data. I couldn't go and look up all these all these references or check out any sort of work that validates this. This is why he just refers to say to Gordon Fee has demonstrated it to me. I'm not saying Gordon Fee didn't. I'm saying it's hard to double check that work and look for maybe a, a different ways to interpret the same data. So he doesn't give that data. Uh, unfortunately, I wonder if uh, if I could go back and look at all the different you know, quotes and times that it was used, if the phrase moral and philosophical contexts, if that phrase is creating a category that isolates the wrong bits of data, that's what I'd be wondering. How does someone determine a moral context and what bits are left out, which might apply to First Timothy 5? Those are good questions to ask, but we'll have to move forward. Here we go. This is the word and its entry in the LSJ, um, which is a, a very well-respected Greek lexicon. I've, I've referenced it many times in this series. It Fluoras refers to silly talk, foolery, nonsense. It can be a tattler or a babbler. That that doesn't seem to refer to teaching, false teaching in, in and of itself, at least not in the LSJ. I didn't get a screenshot of this from BDAG, but another well-respected Greek resource here. It says that it's related to pluo, which is to babble, used to describe mediocre writers. It's often used to describe writers who aren't very good. Um, so you, you get the idea. It's, it's kind of an insulting type of thing to say that someone is doing those things. In other words, what I'm suggesting is we're taking, hypothetically, we're going to take Craig Keener saying, you know, Gordon Fee showed me privately, this word has these connotations. It's not in the standard lexicons. We don't have sort of a peer-reviewed work that I'm aware of. Maybe it's out there. 
I would I would evaluate it before accepting it. I think it's highly unlikely that this passage is talking about female false teachers. Um, but you, you know, we're trying to chase all the rabbits. But Wayne Grudem responds to this and says the following. The standard lexicons do not mention the sense to communicate false teaching, and such a verbal idea would be surprising to find for a definition of an adjective in any case. The BDAG definition is simply gossipy, and LS says silly talk, foolery, nonsense, tattler, babbler. No English translation known to me, no English translation known to me, gives the sense to communicate false teaching, and the sense gossips is the near unanimous sense in modern translations. And I'll say this because when I when I read uh, some egalitarians in their writings, even in even in like in thoughtful scholarly type works, they'll really make a lot of noise about this. And they're like, "Gossips is a wrong translation," and they're very strong and confident about it. But I think that the data is not there to back up those claims. It's possible that gossip is not the best translation. It's possible that it could be foolery, foolish talk, or something along those lines. It is something of an interpretation to suggest that the kind of foolish talk that these women are doing is gossip related. That is that there may be a case for that. But to then take another step and say it refers to false teaching, women who are false teachers and they're being called out doesn't make sense. Even if it did, they would be false teaching other women and Paul's prohibition against them doing it to men wouldn't make any difference. So this, this just doesn't connect. John Stott responded to these views and he offered the following statement. Dr. Gordon Fee identifies these young widows with the weak-willed women of 2 Timothy 3, 6 and 7, whom the false teachers had won over. They're going about from house to house and they're saying things they ought not. He then interprets as they're disrupting the house churches with their heterodox views. It is an ingenious reconstruction, but Paul gives no explicit indication that they're doing more than wasting time in frivolous talk. I think that's 100% correct. I think Stott is right. 1 Timothy 5.13 is just about widows who are wasting time. We're going to read it now in context. Okay, if you don't know about the Greek, you don't need to, right? We're going to read it in context. You can catch the context verses 4 all the way through 16. Who do you think this is about? Do you think it suddenly becomes about false teachers? He says, honor widows who are truly widows. But if a widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show godliness to their own household and to make some return to their parents. For this is pleasing in the sight of God. This honoring of widows, by the way, is about giving them financial aid, giving them financial aid. She who is truly a widow, left all alone, that's someone who's really a widow, they're completely left alone, has set her hope on God and continues in supplications and prayers night and day. But she who is left, self, she who is self-indulgent is dead even while she lives. Command these things as well so that they may be without reproach. But if anyone does not provide for his relatives and especially for the members of his household, what's a household there? It's not a church, it's a home. He has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Let a widow be enrolled if she is not less than 60 years of age. So now he's going to give qualifications like what you need to be to get this financial aid from the church, from the local church. The wife of one husband and having a reputation for good works. If she's brought up children, has shown hospitality, has washed the feet of saints, has cared for the afflicted and has devoted herself to every good work. No mention of teaching there. But refuse to enroll younger widows for when their passions draw them away from Christ, they desire to marry and so incur condemnation for having abandoned their former faith. Besides that, they learn to be idlers, going about from house to house, not only idlers, but also gossips and busybodies, saying what they should not. So I would have younger widows marry, bear children and manage their households and give the adversary no occasion for slander. This isn't about false teaching. For some have already strayed after Satan. If any believing woman has relatives who are widows, let her care for them. Let the church not be burdened so that it may care for those who are truly widows. This is why they are added to the list. Or not added to the list. The list of widows who actually get aid, financial aid from the church. The list is clearly a financial support list. The responsibility for those who are on it is that they are in prayer and hospitality and care ministry type activities, you know, just taking care of the needs of those around them. These are the things that they're supposed to be doing. Note the requirements. I'm actually going to enumerate them for you here. Here's the requirements. The woman has to be alone and without financial support from family, consistent in prayer, 60 or older, was faithful in her prior marriage, was a good mother, is hospitable, washes the feet of the believers, takes care of the afflicted, has a history of devoting herself to good works. What's missing from these requirements? Teaching. 
It doesn't say knows great theology and is able to communicate it to others like it does with elders. Like this is not a teaching role that she's being brought into or that he's worried about. It's true that requirements like these are said for potential elders like these, right? But they're not uniquely elder things. Taken as a whole, they indicate good Christian women, not not specifically elders. Like good Christian individuals would have some version of this list going on in their lives, most of the items. Bottom line is they're not itinerant false teachers. And it's it's funny that that people are trying to promote it as though they are. This is weird. This is just odd. And you know it and I know it. Okay. And if you don't know it, you're you're hiding it from yourself, I think. It's it's weird. It's weird. These are the lengths that are being gone to to reinterpret First Timothy 2, probably the most clear passage in the New Testament that really limits the function and role of women as far as leadership goes in the church, whether we like that or not, whether we understand why it's going on or not, whether it makes us mad or not, whether we care that God might be preserving some beautiful and wonderful thing that's inherent in the natures and the creation and the purpose and roles of men and women. It's just there. It's just there. It's just very clear and I don't see any way around it. We're checking all the ways. We're looking for all the paths, but um, I'm not finding them here. First Timothy 4, 7, though, that's another passage that we can look at. And this is a, a verse they'll say, hey, this indicates that there were female false teachers. Let's look at that now. Here we go. Same text, First Timothy. Have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths. Rather, train yourself for godliness. And you might think, what does that have to do with female false teachers? Well, it's this phrase, silly myths. That, were, that phrase, silly myths, here in the ESV, in other translations, it would say things like old wives' tales. And that's actually kind of what it says in the Greek. It's a, sort of literal to take it that way. Cynthia Long Westfall sees this term as indicating, and I'll quote a, a couple things from her, the women are the source of the myths. That's in Paul and Gender, page 308. So not only are they old wives' tales, but that the, the phrase indicates women are actually the source of the myths, meaning that there must have been active female false teachers in First Timothy's time, in the time of the writing of that letter. Also, in, on page 312, she says, it's the source of the stories are from older women. Others do this as well. Here's a quote from Mary Conway. And this is important because when you say old wives' tales, you may not actually be saying old wives are telling the tales. You might just be saying it's that kind of category of tale. It's like saying you play ball like a girl. It doesn't mean, I, I mean, you learned how to play ball from a girl, <laughs> right? These are very different claims and they matter for the sake of this... Uh, this tactic of understanding first timothy 2. mary conway says women may have been the originators of some of the false teaching as is suggested by paul's warning against quote myths char characteristic of old women now if you look at the lexicons and you check out the greek is it true that this 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 word old wives tales that that in the greek means myths that are sourced from old women or does it mean something a little different? The lexicons are actually consistent. It means myths, quote, even oddly enough, it's what Mary Conway says, but it's not what Mary Conway meant. Myths that are characteristic of old women, it does not say in any of the lexicons, I checked a whole ton of them, none of them say myths that have old women as their source. Catch that? Meaning you don't need women to have old wives' tales based upon the actual meaning of the Greek word, whereas the egalitarians, some of them, are suggesting that's exactly what you have. When Paul says, ignore, ignore these old wives' tales, that he's actually indicating there are women who are the source of them in the time of Timothy, right there, and he's got to deal with it in chapter 2. Does the term imply stories that literal old women are telling? No. Again, it's like the phrase, you play ball like a girl. Okay, this is, this is a phrase many of you are familiar with, and, and we're not allowed to say anymore. Um, but I, without trying to be controversial, but inevitably it's going to happen. Um, boys tend to play ball better than girls <laughs> tend to. There's always girls that are better than some girls that are better than some boys. But generally speaking, boys play better than girls. It's not a compliment to tell a guy, you play ball like a girl. But in no way does that mean your, your ball playing skills literally originated with women. Women must have been around teaching you how to play ball, and that's how they taught you. No, no, it has nothing to do with that. This is It doesn't mean anything like that. Philosophers in ancient time used this old wives' tales phrase like an, the intellectual version of you play ball like a girl. It was like, you do argumentation like a girl. That's how they used it. Is it is Was it rude when they did it? Yeah, it was rude. 
but the meaning of the term is to is not anything about women directly it's really about the nature of these myths these are the kind of myths that paul doesn't want timothy getting himself involved in has nothing to do with women directly there are indications um, that in first timothy the false teachers Paul's concerned about are male, not female. We've just looked at some indications that are supposed to say there were female false teachers. I think they're very weak. I think they, they're very, very weak. There are, however, clear indications that there are male false teachers in Ephesus that Paul is actually dealing with. So let's look at some of those. In Acts chapter 20, verse uh, 29... We have, I know that after my departure, Paul talking to the Ephesian elders. Okay, so it's the same place, Ephesus. After my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Who will rise up? Not people, but men. Now in in the Greek, that is the plural of aner, a man as opposed to a woman. So he warns that he knows men, males, are going to rise up teaching false things to draw people away. Later on, in 2 Timothy 3.6, For among them are those who creep into households and capture weak women, burdened with sins and led astray by various passions. These are men who sometimes target women. Men. Now, some try to take this as evidence that there must have been female false teachers then, but again, again, this is getting the cart before the horse. The male false teachers are the threat the, the women are the victims, and Paul isn't here dealing with, uh, dealing with that in 1 Timothy 2. That just seems strange. What gender are the false teachers that Paul actually mentions by name? Well, here's an example. Um, 1 Timothy 1.20. He mentions Hymenaeus and Alexander. There are others he mentions by name. Every single false teacher Paul mentions by name is male. Every one. Every single one. Male. So forbidding all women from teaching falsely seems weird in the extreme. The historical records in Ephesus help us too. So those are scriptures that give us indications that we have uh, men false teachers, but none specifically that say there's women or that there's a big enough problem of women false teachers that Paul's got to ban all women from teaching. That just seems super extreme. And you might be like, well, maybe he just did that. And I'm like, yeah, but maybe you just want to believe he just did that at that point. This is not a natural outgrowth of Bible study here. This is something that's being forced. It's eisegesis, they call it, the fancy word for it. When you're when you're reading into scripture, your own ideas, instead of pulling out the ideas that are actually there. The historical records in Ephesus help us too, though. So they show us that male teachers were present in Ephesus at the time, not female ones. Let's look at what Ba says about this, who been specialized in this area. He says, we have no direct evidence that women taught in any official or public capacity at Ephesus. Do you catch that? None. Zero direct evidence that any women taught in any official capacity at Ephesus. And Ephesian women do not appear as the sophists, rhetors, teachers, philosophers, or their disciples in our ancient sources, whereas several men do. There's a very helpful men, uh, men helpful article that I've linked below that this is from. This is his work, The Apostle Among the Amazons. It's a little difficult to find, so I have a link for it in the notes that you can get down below. It sure would be strange to see a massive problem of female false teachers in the Christian church in Ephesus, where we don't seem to see any female teachers in this city at all, even in its non-Christian circles, let let alone false teachers in the Christian church. We don't see any clear indication of that either. In the book of Acts, we get some indications of male religious influence, not female. Let's look at the quotes on that from Ba's same article. Demetrius the silversmith and his guild, whom he addresses as men, males, were in the marketplace deriving a lucrative profit from the Artemisium tourist trade in Acts 19. Luke also mentions the male Asiarchs who were members of the premier social circles in the province of Asia in Acts 19.31. Males who were in leadership in those positions in Ephesus. Here's another quote for you. When we look further into Acts 19, we find hints of male involvement in Ephesian religious affairs. It was the secretary of the people, the grammatus, grammatus, excuse me, a certainly a man who diffused the excited mob in the theater by defending the goddess's honor in Acts 19, 35 through 40. The secretary mentions that Ephesus itself was Neokoros of the great goddess. This term, Neokoros, is frequently used for the individual or group charged with oversight of a cult. Catch that. The Ephesus, 
who it, which is run by men, is in oversight over the cult of Artemis. We talked about this earlier when we went through the Artemis claims. Since women were not citizens of the Greek polis like Ephesus, it was the male citizen body of Ephesus acting through its municipal officers, the grammatus, and the all-male boule, the state council, who claimed the oversight of the cult of Artemis Ephesia. We can safely infer from this slight New Testament evidence alone that religious affairs at Ephesus were not exclusively in the hands of women as the authors of Suffer Not a Woman allege. The reason why I bring this quote back to us at this stage is to see we're taking the tiniest little scant evidence in 1 Timothy 5, twisting the meaning of words, I, I believe this is what's happening, in order to fabricate a, a massive number of female and a massive problem of female false teachers that simply didn't exist, not outside the church, not inside the church. As far as we can tell, the problem was male false teachers. Paul's prohibition on women teaching men and having authority over men cannot be explained by some massive problem of female false teachers. It just doesn't make any sense. There's other egalitarian claims uh, that go by implication. So one of the ways you'll do this is you'll see, say, Philip Payne's work or someone, they'll put a list of things that are similar between false teachers and women in the letters of Paul. And so false teachers, they deceive and women are deceived, right? Deceiving and getting deceived. Okay, so Eve, she was deceived in, in 1 Timothy 2. What we're doing, though, is we're chopping the bits of Scripture into puzzle pieces to create a puzzle they're not making. We're pulling these parallels out of context and smashing them together in a way that I think is unfair. It's very weak argumentation. Um, and the list can be as long as you'd like. But unless the list includes false teachings, false teachings, <laughs> then it doesn't include things that actually equate to women false teachers. The criticisms of false teachers, they'll say, are similar to statements about some women. And that's true-ish. But again, none of them imply those women were actually false teachers, nor that barring them from teaching men is going to help, nor that barring all women from teaching all men is going to be the solution for this problem that we're just sort of, we're sort of finding like some sort of advanced detective work <laughs> from the 21st century. It's just no clear indication in the text. All right, let's talk about the final claim about false teachers before we figure out why Paul appealed to Adam and Eve in 1 Timothy 2. That's going to be an interesting section. The fifth claim that they will make that they need to be true, egalitarians need to be true, and the final claim is that Paul solves the problem of women false teachers by forbidding women from teaching or having authority until they are educated enough and able to teach properly. This is Craig Keener's view, and it's other people's view as well. It's not necessarily, there's, there's a lot of divergent views about this amongst egalitarians. But there is a, a, a group that take this view. I think that um, we've demonstrated that this doesn't, just doesn't work. It's, it's, a, it's a chain with several broken links. It just doesn't function. Uh, some would say perhaps he temporarily is limiting all women. Um, I do not permit you know, implies both that it is ongoing and that it's his practice in all churches as an apostle. That's true. We talked about that early on in this video. So yeah, it would be a a, a limit on all women, but he, they're saying maybe it's just temporary. There's nothing about it that says it's temporary, but maybe that's the case. It's just temporary. Or perhaps they'll say he's limiting a subcategory of women. There are some people who say this. Um, uh, let's see, uh, Bartlett says this, Andrew Bartlett, and, and his interpretation is, I'll briefly mention this because I don't want to spend another 20 minutes on it. Andrew Bartlett suggests in 1 Timothy, you read this list of things a woman shouldn't be. And then he says, I don't allow a woman to teach or have authority over a man. It's really Paul's only talking about that kind of woman, the one woman who does those bad things in 1 Timothy 2. Except this misconstrues 1 Timothy 2 a lot and the passage itself um, in 1 Timothy 2, uh, 12 and 11. The reason is because Paul doesn't give a list of bad things. He actually just gives a list of things women should do they're not bad things. He doesn't give a description of a bad woman and then say, therefore, don't let that kind of woman teach. That's fabricated and pushed onto the passage. If you read it, you'll see it just doesn't read that way. At any rate, Paul clearly stops all women from teaching all men in particular, and it's his normal practice as an apostle, and he expects Timothy to continue it. And the, the five-link chain of saying that Paul's just stopping a bunch of female false teachers, every, every link in the chain has problems. And the last several links are just dust. They just have really fatal problems. That is my honest understanding. Let's look at the next issue, which is why does Paul appeal to Adam and Eve? Why does Paul appeal to Adam and Eve? This is a very uh, interesting section in First Timothy. We're going to look at it and ask that question. And I'm, gonna, I'm not going to 
dodge any issue here today. And here we go. I do not permit a woman to teach or have a, or exercise authority over a man. Rather, she's to remain quiet. Quiet? I don't know what that is. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. And we'll get we'll get back to this later. Yet she'll be safe through childbearing. We're going to tackle that after this. Okay, so Adam wasn't deceived. The woman was deceived. Adam was formed first, then Eve came next. Here's some important questions about this reference. What is the basic purpose of verses 13 and 14? Like, what is the main point Paul's trying to drive at here? Number, question number two, why does he bring up that Adam was formed first? What is the meaning behind Eve's deception? Does that mean that women are more easily deceived than men? Is this something that we should conclude? I've heard others conclude this, and we'll talk about that. I'm going to ha- tackle that face on, and I hope... I hope, I hope I got it right, and I hope that you'll hear me, assuming that I do. Um, what is the basic purpose of verses 13 and 14? I, I think that the simple answer, and this should be very obvious, right, is just to provide an explanation or a why or a support for verses 11 and 12. He goes, hey, let a woman learn with all with, quietly with all submissiveness, and I don't permit her to teach or have authority over a man. And here's why. For Adam was formed first than Eve, and Adam was not deceived. This is the reason. It's justification for verses 11 and 12. The Adam and Eve reference is support for the ruling or the the decision about the, the, the role and the appropriateness of what women do in verses 11 and 12. It goes back to Adam and Eve. This is, it seems to me, the most obvious thing. This is one of the things I was very interested to hear um, alternate views on. And we'll talk about some of those alternate views but i wanted to know like why why do people have a different view on this because this would seem to make whatever paul says in verses 11 and 12 lasting and permanent and something that should go throughout the church because if it comes from adam and eve and creation and 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 perhaps partly the fall but if it comes from that and paul's applying it to new testament christians it would certainly apply today as well that seems like a no-brainer it's going to be continuing and ongoing Keener, Craig Keener, says as far as why Paul brings up the creation order, Adam was formed first, then Eve. Let's talk about the creation order. Uh, Keener says it's an analogy about uneducated people. Uh, We already dealt with that. Um, When Adam was formed first, then Eve, it's because, according to Keener, his view or people who hold that, that direction, they'll say, hey, Eve didn't know as much as Adam. She wasn't there receiving the instruction from God directly. So in a sense, she sort of is a metaphor here for the uneducated person. But we've already shown the uh, the education view falls apart before we ever get to verse 13. This doesn't seem to be the case. See video number two for how that and other things in Genesis 2 indicate the reality that Adam being formed first is about him having a higher position of authority than Eve. This, I think, is inescapable. It seems to be the indication of Genesis 2, even when you aren't looking at 1 Timothy. But when you add in 1 Timothy, and he's like, hey, here's an authority difference between male and female, and it's rooted in the created order, this is this is the Holy Spirit inspiring us, to, giving us inspired interpretation and explanation of the Old Testament. So we can't get it wrong. Not that it won't stop us from getting things wrong, because nothing ever does, but, but that's, that should be the idea. It indicates Adam has a greater authority in some sense than Eve. In some sense, I say, it doesn't mean Eve doesn't have authority. See video number two, please, on this, because uh, some will only, if they hear any difference between men and women, then all they hear is is chauvinism and misogyny, and they're not actually hearing sort of what is being explained. Women have a massive amount of authority. They have dominion over the entire earth, and nobody should limit that in any way, shape, or form. But in the relationship of marriage, and here, 1 Timothy 2, in the relationship of eldership in the church, there is a difference that should be observed and should be preserved, and it is something that God intends. Schreiner and many others, including myself, see this as transcultural, and here's the explanation from Schreiner. It should be said in reply that an argument from the Old Testament is based on the, based on the created order is almost certainly transcultural. Jesus argued from creation in defending monogamy and God's intention that husbands and wives should not divorce Paul argued from creation in prohibiting homosexuality. There is no reason in the case of 1 Timothy 2.13 to think Paul is only arguing analogically. 
Paul prohibits women from teaching and exercising authority over men because of God's intention in creating men and women, or I might add to this, in creating Adam first and then Eve, that that was intentional, that was deliberate. It's not a bad thing. The conclusion there would be, simply put, verse 13 is, is and verse 14, but verse 13 is showing us that verses 11 and 12 are transcultural and that they apply still today. It's, it's exactly worst case scenario if you were trying to get away from the complementarian understanding of these things. I don't see a reasonable way around this. There's lots of ways people have. I don't think they're reasonable. If you think about them long enough, you should see right through them. Um, the view that the Artemis cult had a creation story and that Paul is refuting, that doesn't work. We already talked about that. We mentioned, we went over that when we talked about the Artemis cult. There's the view that this is just an analogy for uneducated people. That doesn't work. It's very straightforward. It's about different roles because of the, different, the order of creation. That's, I think, just the reality of it. And where we're uncomfortable with it, I think we're uncomfortable with something that's actually beautiful and good. Let's ask the next question. Are women more easily deceived than men? I have heard this taught. I've heard this taught by even leaders in my own life, men who I very much respected, looked up to, and, and, and looked to for guidance and wisdom. You know, where you go, people you go to where you go, I don't really know about that stuff, but whatever you say, I'm just going to trust it. And that was my relationship with these guys. And I remember hearing them say, never from the pulpit, <laughs> never from the pulpit, but hearing them say in other situations, well, you know, women are more easily deceived than men. And, um, and that's really why women shouldn't be teachers is because they always are going to lead those groups of people astray because they're going to fall into false teaching because they're so easily deceived. That's verse 14. Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. So is the prohibition on women, you know, having that, that role, that, that leadership role of, of eldership in the church, that particular one, is that because they're more easily deceived? So it may surprise you that there are actually multiple ways of understanding them. Uh, one of them is the first way I just outlined that women are more easily deceived, and that's an additional reason why they can't teach or have authority. Um, that, of course, can radically impact the way that men and women interact with each other, what they think of each other, how much respect in particular women are given, not only from men, but from other women. This can be very, very impactful. Uh, another option is that the reason Paul mentions the deception of Eve is because one of, not the only, but one of the consequences of Eve being deceived is additional problems in marriage and a reiteration of a husband's authority. I say that this is an additional reason because it's not the only reason in scripture. There's a creation related reason for that role, that husband's role, and there's a fall related reason and if this, if the B theory here is correct, then both of those are still active today. And now some will say, I, I have an objection to that, Mike, you're, you're promoting the fall. I'll come back to that in a minute when I vet these different options. A third option, C, is that Eve is simply a representative of anyone who can be deceived. And it's not any kind of comment on women or their role. This is kind of an egalitarian view. You couple this with the idea that women are less educated. And then you say, well, Eve is brought up only to say, Anybody who, like Eve, was less educated and perhaps is more prone to deception due to their education level, then they shouldn't be in that role of teaching and leading men. That fails for a number of reasons, but you can see the logic, how the education view is, is important for interpreting not just verse 12, but verse 13, verse 14, as you keep going on. And the fourth option is that it's just showing that Eve isn't greater than Adam. It speaks of an egalitarian view. And the reason for this is, uh, some will claim wrongly, and we've already talked about this when we talked about the cult of Artemis, that there was an Artemis creation story and the woman is made first and then the man. And so the woman has authority over the man. And these are just scholarly myths about ancient Artemisian beliefs. And we should, we should dispel them. I think, I think that I've done that at least to the best of my ability. So you can see how this becomes a corrective. Paul only mentions Adam being formed first, not to say Adam is, has any higher role, but only to say, therefore, Eve doesn't, therefore, he's establishing equality. And I don't know if you can feel the, it, you know, if there was like the Avatar cartoon, right, where you have like the earth bending and the fire bending, this is Bible bending. This is like a Bible bending skill. It's egalitarian now. I do not have a lot of respect for that view. I think that it's um, embarrassingly bad on multiple levels. And... First Timothy 2, this is one of the reasons why people camp out on it so much, why complementarians or patriarchalists camp out on it, because it's so clear and because the alternate views are not good. You're not really on the fence if you look at them straight faced, I don't think. Um, and I know I know, you're, you might think I'm biased. Maybe I am. 
but is it factual? Okay. Is this factual? I think it is. I think it is as far as I can tell. And I'm going to be honest about that. And I don't think it's respectful to God to pretend that his word is less clear than it is. I, I think it builds bridges. If I say to everybody, well, you know, who knows? It could go either way. All four of these options, they're out there. Just pick one guys and let's just hold hands. Hey man, I'll hold hands with you. Even if you pick the wrong option, but I'm not going to pretend that a, a wrong view is equally valid because I feel as it's as though it's disrespectful to the word of God and to the clarity we have in scripture. There are hard to understand things. There are clear things. I've looked at the alternate explanations and they've only made it more clear in my opinion. So here's how context pushes against wrong views. I think this is hopefully going to be very helpful. Uh, number one, four things. Eve is contrasted with Adam. The context we have in first Timothy two, Eve is contrasted, contrasted with Adam. So it's about a difference between men and women, not just between educated and uneducated people, but between men and women. Further, it reads into the text to suggest that Eve was uninformed. That is not something Paul talks about. He doesn't say anything about her education level or the things that she knew or didn't know. If you read Genesis, you know, chapters two, chapter three, Eve is aware that she shouldn't be eating. Okay. She's aware of that. That much she's aware of. It's not like she had this massive, like she didn't go to the full class. She didn't get the whole semester. She just got the Cliff's notes about not eating from the tree. I don't think that, I don't think that the text is actually saying that we're reading into it. So Eve's contrasted with Adam. Therefore, it's a difference between men and women, not education and uneducated people. Number two, Eve is being used as a representation of women specifically. This is clear in first Timothy two. Remember the shift from women in verses nine to 10 to singular, a woman in verses 11 and 12. I don't know if you've really been thinking about that, but we're going to come to it right now. This is pretty, uh, pretty significant. Verses nine and 10, he's talking about women in plural, plural terminology. Women should adorn themselves in this way and not that way. What's proper for women who profess godliness, good works. Then he switches verse 11, let a woman, I do not permit a woman. She is to remain. It's all singular. And what happens right after? For Adam was formed first, then Eve. It went from plural to singular because Paul, when he says this in verse 11 and 12, he's he's setting it up so that when he brings up Eve, Eve is the representation of a woman because Eve is the woman. Just as Adam is a representation of a man because Adam's the man. He's the first man. So this is, in other words, a gender-based comparison. It's not an education level comparison or anything else. There's something fundamentally different between the genders based upon this passage and the created order as well as the fall. Number three, this is the third observation that keeps us from picking the wrong interpretation. This is not introducing a new idea, but defending a previous idea. That's huge. We shouldn't lose this. Verse 11 and 12 is the thing that's being defended or supported. Paul's not teaching something new here. He's not talking about anything new. He's rather just offering support for what he already said. When you realize this, I think it changes your your options for how you can interpret these verses. The idea here, what am I trying to push against? The idea that all women in general are more easily deceived than men is a brand new idea Paul has never talked about anywhere. It's not supported anywhere in scripture. It's not taught anywhere in scripture. It's totally brand new. In the middle of 1 Timothy 2, he says, I don't allow women to teach or exercise authority over man. And then he says, for Adam was formed first and then Eve and Eve was not to see. The only result of Eve's deception is here part of the role difference between men and women. It doesn't therefore start a new idea and all women are more easily deceived than men. Remember in in, uh, the Gospels, the women came to tell them Jesus had just risen and they're chastised for not believing these women. That doesn't make sense if they're supposed to theologically think women are more easily deceived than men and therefore less likely to be believed and less likely to to be trusted. That doesn't seem consistent with what we see in scripture. It just really doesn't. I don't think a new idea is being introduced. I think an old idea is being explained. The first statement on Eve is about something that's only true of Eve. Huh? Check this out. The first statement about Eve, that is... Here in verse 13, Adam was formed first, then Eve. Who's that true of? Only Eve. Only Eve was formed first. Not all women, or formed second. Not all women, right? If, if your wife is older than you, guess what? She was formed before you. Your mother, she was formed before you. Lots of the women in your life that you know, they were formed before you. 
before lots of men in your lives, right? This idea is only true of Eve, but the impact of that truth ripples down and affects other women as, as, as due to their role. But it doesn't, like, Eve being formed second doesn't make all women formed second in some sense. That doesn't make any sense. It's not the point. And therefore, I think that the same is true in verse 14. The woman was deceived. That's Eve. She was deceived and became a transgressor. Other women were not deceived, okay? And it, it's silly because then it, we would have to actually think that Adam being uh, not deceived means that women uh, are, while they're more prone to be deceived, men are more prone to do it wrong on purpose. And how could they qualify for leadership if this is in, in, in fact the case? That doesn't make any sense to me. So the first statement to summarize that, the first statement on Eve is about something that's only true of Eve and which has an impact on all women. The second statement is likely the same rather than something that's true of all women. I think it has an impact on them. It's not true of them, if that makes sense. Third issue, there is not a single place in scripture that teaches that women are more easily deceived. Nowhere that I know, and I would think that this is a pretty big deal to talk about it at some point before 1 Timothy 2 shows up. Abigail, in scripture, saves her husband's life because she knows that he's in danger, even though he doesn't. He's deceived. Deborah is a judge of Israel, and a rather good one, at a time when Barak, the man, was deceived by fear. Huh? Holda, the prophetess, she speaks truth to the king. She was entrusted with a prophetic role by God, which is a really strange thing if universal female deception is a problem. We know from scripture that prophets can become deceived. Surely women would be barred from the role of prophetess if they were so easily deceived that they couldn't have the role of elder. Think about this for a second. If you're one of those who's like, no, Mike, women are more easily deceived. Like, no, you're deceived. <laughs> you're being deceived easily right now. Think about that. Let me say it again. It's a strange thing. If universal female deception is a problem, because we know from scripture that prophets can become deceived, read Jeremiah. Surely women would be barred from the role of prophet if they were so easily deceived that they couldn't have the role of elder. Why is it that we can have female prophets even in the New Testament, but not elders? Because deception is not the, not the issue. Female deception is not the issue, even if it results from Eve's having been deceived in some fashion. I'm just trying to do Bible study here. Something I'm trying to backpedal. Uh, make excuses for the Bible. Um, your bias is skewing your ability to think about these things. When Amnon forced himself on Tamar in the Old Testament, she was the one with truth and wisdom, while Amnon was so deceived that his love turned into hate for her. He was deceived. She was not. When nobody knew what was going on with Jesus, nobody knew, right? For the most part, pretty much nobody. A woman anointed him for burial, and she had more clarity than anyone else there. These examples of scripture really push against the idea that we're supposed to believe some sort of universal deception problem of women, and that's why they can't be elders. Uh, surely not all of them are like that. But if, but if women inhabit a role that is to be preserved and honored and shown that respect and dignity that it should have, then it makes sense to have a rule for all women, regardless of their education level, regardless of whether they're deceived or not, because it has to do with their gender role, which is what Paul's really talking about in 1 Timothy. The passage never even says that Eve was more easily deceived by nature. Check this out. I don't even think Eve was more easily deceived by nature. At least you don't have scripture that says that. Where in Genesis 2 does it say that the reason why Eve was tricked is because she was more easy to trick? We read that into the text. You can assume that if you want, but I don't want to base a belief about women universally, about billions of people off of just that kind of a guess. We just know she was deceived. Paul uses Eve... If Eve represents female problems of deception, why does Paul use Eve's deception to represent all people in 2 Corinthians 11? Here we go. 2 Corinthians 11.3. And I do think that some men need to, and women even, need to repent over this issue of treating others as though they're more easily deceived by, by nature of their gender. This is a real not good thing. Um, but I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. He says this about both men and women. It would be at least confusing, to say the least, if Paul is going to use something that's true of women universally as, a, as an example of something he's worried is true of all people, men and women. It, it just would be confusing, to say the least. It's soft evidence, but it seems unlikely that Paul would use Eve's deception as something we're all to watch out for. If the point of the passage is to teach that women in particular are easily deceived, blah, 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 words.
I've noticed something. Um, this can cause men to be arrogant and overconfident because they aren't as prone to the deception that women are. At least that's what they believe. This causes some men, even and some women too, to be dismissive of women as wrong-headed by nature, and then they become punks. Okay, look, they men, you, you guys, biblically, you are not the superhero. You are the two-edged sword, okay? You can cut towards the ways of God and you can just as easily cut and fight for the enemy. And we have to always be aware of this and be aware that you have the old nature and the new and and your wife has the same thing and your sister has the same thing and that none of us is, is better than the others in that regard. And it it's just creates arrogance, I think, to do this uh, and pride. Yeah, all people can be easily deceived and anybody who, who thinks otherwise is setting themselves up to be deceived because pride is 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 the pathway for deception you know the dark side and all that stuff let's talk about more stuff um if women are more easily deceived than men are then men are then i kind of mentioned this earlier but men are more likely to rebel intentionally it, because it, what's if it's true of eve therefore true of women then, it, then what's true of adam is therefore true of men specifically which is we're just more likely just to deliberately disobey god knowingly with our eyes wide open how can anybody be qualified to be elders in that case it doesn't make any sense uh, i don't think paul was making that point at all the differences between adam and eve are not balanced let's talk about the fourth thing that will help us interpret this properly and not get it wrong the differences between adam and eve are not balanced this pushes against egalitarian views okay what i just said was pushing against complementarians and patriarchalists all over the place who suggest women are more easily deceived this is pushing against uh, egalitarian views there are many who conclude that this passage, whatever it means about Adam and Eve, it's just saying that men and women are equal. Men and women have equal roles. Men and women share all the same, 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 same. That's not the passage. It's very, it's very clear that's not the passage's purpose or point. Adam was made first. Eve was made second. This is meant to be shown to be imbalanced. Adam was not deceived. Eve was deceived. This is meant to, to show an imbalance an imbalance. Why? Because Paul has just said there's an imbalance in roles as well. I don't know. Maybe the word imbalance is offensive to some here. I, I'm, I'm running out of vocabulary to describe some of these things. Forgive me if I didn't pick the best word there. But the conclusion is this. It isn't responding to a hyper-feminist Ephesus by restoring egalitarian views. It's showing an unbalanced authority relationship between men and women. Even though women have being made in the image of God, being given dominion over the earth, having authority in the home, having authority with their children, having authority in so many ways, maybe being a boss, being having employees, having a bunch of stuff going on, being intelligent, thoughtful, capable people. That doesn't mean that there's no difference in the husband-wife role or in the elder role. Elder and not elder <laughs> role. Okay, so the differences between them are not balanced. The fifth point and final point that I think will keep us from misunderstanding this issue of why Eve's deception is brought up is in Genesis, we're told the consequences of Eve's deception will reverberate into the male-female relationship. In Genesis, we are told that the consequences of Eve having been deceived and having partaken of the fruit and becoming a transgressor, it will reverberate into the male-female relationship, which is what Paul's really getting at. Not that it results in all women be more easily deceived. If you go to Genesis 3.16, it does not say the following. <laughs> Let me read to you the, the not correct version. To the woman, he said, I will surely increase the amount of times you get deceived over stuff so that you will have to rely on men who will tell you the truth about all things because you silly lady. Like, it doesn't say that at all. He says, as a result of this, her transgression, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing and pain you shall bring forth children. That's one. And two, your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. We learned in our Genesis 2 study, video number two in the series, that this is not introducing a new idea, but introducing conflict into an old idea, Adam formed first than Eve, where Adam has a higher role of authority, though both authorities, but Adam's the higher one in the marriage. And that it's going to introduce conflict and problems, but it will sort of re-up the idea that Adam is the one who's going to be the leader there. Um, it won't be the same kind of quality relationship as it would have been before the fall. So, bottom line here, Paul is not introducing a new idea that all women are more easily deceived than men. Therefore, they can't be in certain roles. He's just doing what we did, what we talked about in video number two, seeing that both creation and the fall give role differences between men and women. 
please repent if this has been your attitude towards women. Please repent. There has been tons of, here's what the egalitarians are 100% right about. There's been tons of chauvinism and arrogance and pride and mistreatment of women and protecting powerful men who have been abusive towards women in keeping their role, whoever's in power ultimately, which is, is in church leadership men, right? That's predominantly. They tend to be the ones we protect at the expense of the sheep when there are abuses going on. And this kind of thing helps keep that happening because a woman comes forward and says, hey, this is what happened to me. So-and-so did this to me. And if you believe in your head, well, you know how women are. You know how women are. Now, I don't believe in the whole, and we shouldn't believe in this whole me too thing where, where you take it to the extreme level where you say, oh, I'm just going to believe whatever accusation any woman comes up with, I'll wholeheartedly believe it no matter what. That's foolish. You shouldn't wholeheart, you should test everything and hold fast to what is good. But what we can't use to evaluate the the, the claims of others is a rule that women are just more easily deceived. That That's just evil and wrong. So here's a potential objection you might have to me. Mike, this means you're supporting the fall instead of reversing it. Um, this is an objection I hear consistently in egalitarian writings, and, it, and man, it feels very powerful. I feel that. I don't want to support the fall. Jesus came to reverse the fall and to undo the fall, and we're overcoming the fall, right? And, and in principle, in general, I agree with that. But is it possible we're having too shallow of an understanding of this? I think it is possible. So rhetorically powerful, yes. It feels like you're fighting against the very purpose of Christ's sacrifice if you then support complementarian views. Um, oh, then the, the heat goes up in the conversation. My response is simply this. It's not me. It's God. I'm not the one promoting this. I'm just saying, look, the, if this is what the text of scripture says, don't then say to me, no, you can't, because I'm going to call that supporting the fall. Scripture says, here's the reasons. And one of them is, par- is related to the fall. One's before fall, one's after fall. They're both supporting the ruling that Paul gives on women. God still has us die. Have you noticed this? <laughs> um, God overcame death in the death and resurrection of Christ, but he still allows us to die. That's a result of the fall. I, as a Christian, believe in Jesus. My sins are washed away. I have eternal life in Christ, yet I will still die before the, before the resurrection. And so that's a result of the fall, is it not? But it's still something that I'm under. So God hasn't just completely undone right now the fall. It's kind of an already not yet sort of situation for those who are you're, you're into that kind of theological stuff. You know what I'm talking about. God still has men who work hard and have to deal with thorns and thistles and by the sweat of their brow, they make their living. God still has women in, in pain in childbirth. He hasn't reversed that even though that's part of the fall. God still has role distinctions even though it's part of the fall, but it's not from the fall, right? It predates it and postdates it. These are all true for Christians and they don't get overturned until the resurrection. So we do fight against the conflict in marriage and relationships that comes from the fall. A woman's desire to overly control her husband, his perhaps oppressive treatment of his wife and unloving like behavior where he's not self-sacrificial like Christ. We're called to change that, take away the sin parts, but the role differences are still in place. In addition, Paul gives two reasons, right? One of the reasons is prior to the fall. The other is a reason that's post-fall. Um, the fall statement in Genesis chapter 3 is likely just a reiteration of a prior state of affairs with the addition of conflict. I won't explain all that. I went into it in, in video number two. You're welcome to check it out again. Um, long story short, no, I'm not supporting the fall instead of reversing it. I'm not fighting against the purposes of Christ. You're just having a shallow understanding of the things you're saying. I, I don't mean that to sound mean. I think it's just factual. and Hopefully you'll think about it. Conclusions on Adam and Eve. Here they are before we move on. The rules that we see in verses 11 and 12 about men and women, teaching and authority, are supported by transcultural principles we find in Genesis 2 and 3. It still, therefore, applies today. What Paul wrote to Timothy, it's still something we got to deal with today if we're going to be honoring God's word in this area in our lives and in our churches. But what then does saved through childbearing mean? This is probably one of the number one things people ask about. Let's dig into it. I don't need to tell you how interesting and confusing it is when Paul says, yet she will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control. I mean, is Paul saying that a woman is saved like salvation by having kids? Where did that come from? Why is he bringing this up? Verse 15 of first timothy 2 is genuinely the most difficult to understand part of the entire chapter 
Fortunately, your understanding of the whole chapter does not depend on your understanding of this verse. And if you pretend it does, it's because you're trying to leverage an unlikely interpretation using a confusing verse so that you're making the whole passage turn on verse 15 when you really should be relying on the clarity you've already got before 15 for understanding 15. But let me tell you some options and how they impact your interpret your interpretation of the passage as a whole. So the word saved, all right, the word saved, uh, it could mean eternal salvation, or it could also be the same word could mean harm of some kind. Okay, it might not be salvation, salvation, it might be something else. Um, also the word she, who's the she? She could refer to Eve, since he just talked about Adam and Eve in verses 13 and 14. Some people think, think it refers to Mary, the she is being saved through childbearing, that that refers to Mary. Others think she refers to women in general. Then we have uh, the word childbearing. Childbearing could refer to giving birth. It could refer to raising kids, or it could refer to a woman's role in being a wife and mother. Three different options there. And so here's what it looks like when you sort of chart those out. Here are five different views, and we're gonna look at each one of these views in detail. Save through childbearing, what does it mean? Is it possible it means saved from physical death in childbirth? Maybe that's what it means. I'll give you, we'll give you the reason why a lot of people think it is. Um, and I think that's not the case, but I'm going to build the case. You make your decision. Second option, saved spiritually, a spiritual salvation in spite of the pain they experience in childbirth. Okay. So saved kind of in spite of pain in childbirth, although it says saved through childbearing. So it's kind of like, is that really what it meant? Third option, saved spiritually by having kids. Literally Christian women, like you're going to go to heaven because you had kids. That was part of the deal. It was like a requirement for salvation. That is a view some people, very few, actually have. Fourth option, you're saved spiritually through pro proper female roles. Not by those roles, but through those roles, meaning it like sort of accompanies salvation or maybe even gets you saved. And we'll talk about different thoughts there. But basically your spiritual salvation and the phrase childbearing really refers to just the role, the proper female role, which Paul has been talking about in the passage. And then fifth option, saved spiritually through the Messiah. That the phrase, she will be saved through childbearing is a reference to the Messiah, Jesus. And that is not the most popular view, but it is my view, and I'm gonna be giving you the reasons for it. So others are not worth the time. Um, there are other views, other interpretations of this passage. I genuinely think they're not the worth time. This not worth the time. This was a tough choice to just overlook several interpretive options that people put forward. Uh, some will think as you're watching this, but Mike, you didn't cover my view. You didn't cover the view that I think this verse means. Most likely, here's here's the one thing I'll throw out there. Most likely, the tools I'm about to give you as I explore the other five options will answer any view you've got that I didn't expressly talk about. Those tools will answer those views, even if I didn't get into them in detail. That was my way of saving time by just cramming the data into five views instead of 10. All right, let's talk about view number one. Saved from death in giving labor. Here is an example of this. The third position is that this verse refers to women being brought safely through childbirth. So the childbirth in this case is not what actually saves a person, like brings them salvation, but rather childbirth presents dangers to the woman and she will survive those dangers. She won't die in childbirth. And here's a few reasons why you might consider this view. Here's some pros, some support for this view. The first is that the word saved from childbirth, saved there is sozo. Okay, that's a Greek word. And if we look at what it means, here we go, according to Craig Keener, saved means delivered or brought safely through more often in ancient literature than it means saved from sin. Well, that's true. We need to ask the question of what it means in Paul, not just what it means in ancient literature in general, but it's true that in it often means brought safely through or delivered as opposed to saved from sin. So maybe he's just saying saved from that. This was, this was my old view uh, um, at one point. Uh, I've, you know, like many people, I've gone, I've had different views on this verse because it's a very challenging verse. And even my conclusions are just, I think so. I don't have the same level of confidence as I do in perhaps verse 12. I think that we can have much more confidence about the meaning there. Okay, second support for this view is extra biblical quotes show the following. This is interesting. Women at the time in ancient times, then I'm just summarizing here, uh, Craig Keener's work. Women felt the need for help in child labor. 
They were known to call on pagan gods for that help. And they may have been accustomed to calling on Artemis, a known cult deity in Ephesus. Jewish beliefs at the time also connected the possibly fatal dangers of childbirth to Eve while appealing to God for help. The bottom line is there's a cultural context in the first, in the first century that can show us something the passage doesn't clearly indicate. And if that's true, it helps us go, oh, we see the background here. There is a legitimate historical background that women were scared of giving birth and they would call out to various deities, including the true God, for help in giving birth. It is generally accepted that death and childbirth was far more common at the time and was on the minds of women and men at the time due to diets lacking in iron and less advanced medicine and perhaps other factors. This was something that was going on. It was a real thing. Um, for the idea that women would call on pagan gods, here's one example. Plutarch in his Roman questions too says, Diana, whom last named women in their labor and travel or travail of childbirth are wont to call upon for help. Plutarch says that this is that this Diana, this is Diana of Rome, by the way, it's not the Ephesian one. Okay. There are differences, but, but they would call upon her for help. And so, yeah, that's something that was known. Maybe Paul's trying to keep them from calling on this Artemis thing. And Hey, maybe that's giving us evidence that the Artemis cult really is in the background of first Timothy two. And that's how people use this their interpretation of verse 15 as leverage to change how they understand the whole passage. Um, for the third one that he, uh, Craig Keener says, it's not unlikely that the Ephesian Artemis also absorbed this function, this idea that um, women would call upon Artemis for help. Uh, there is actually good support for this. Uh, Marge Mos uh, Mosco, 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 I think it's Mosco. I've, I suddenly forget how to pronounce her name. Marg Mosco. Ah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry doctor <laughs> forgive me it's unintentional um and you have a link to where she talks about this but she says that in about 100 a.d plutarch plutarch ancient dead guy right plutarch who wrote bun a bunch of stuff uh he wrote about the destruction of the ephesian temple of artemis that happened to have burned down he says on the same day that alexander the great was born in 356 bc that that was when the temple burnt down in ephesus so here's the debate why didn't artemis protect her temple from being destroyed and he uses this idea, this leverage that, well, that was when Alexander was being born. So Plutarch records that a man named Hegesius wanted to explain why Artemis of Ephesus didn't protect her temple. Here we go. It was no wonder that the temple of Artemis was burned down since the goddess was busy bringing Alexander into the world. This is a quotation that shows that Artemis in particular was seen as helping people through childbirth. And she went because this really important person was being born to help Alexander, and of course her temple was unprotected and was destroyed. There are also two solid quotes that she gives from the third century. I won't bore you with them, but they show that by the time, by the third century for sure, uh, women were calling on Artemis specifically of Ephesia for this sort of thing. So that seems reasonable. We sh I wouldn't fight against that in one bit, right? And then for the idea that Jewish beliefs did the same thing, they called on God for help. It's reasonable to think Jewish women called on God for help in childbirth. It is reasonable to think this. Uh, Keener offers a number of ancient quotes that help establish that as well. Uh, Jewish connection between Eve's sin and pain and death in childbirth are talked about. And so, of course, they're appealing in connection to Eve, in connection to the fall, calling on to God for help in childbirth. So this saved in childbearing, perhaps it refers to simply you're physically brought through, you won't die in childbirth, or maybe even your pain will be decreased because you're calling on God. All of those points seem solid enough to me. There are, however, some challenges to this view. And so if you look at only the points for view, but not against it, you know, it can skew your understanding. So why wouldn't we hold this view? Why don't I hold that view? Paul, in all of his uses of sozo, the word for salvation, he never uses it that way. He uses sozo 28 times in total, and he never uses it like that to mean like delivered through uh, childbirth or something like that. Never. So here's a quote talking about this. Uh, Craig Keener responds to this idea. He says, it is true that Paul nowhere else uses saved to mean saved in childbirth, but it should be kept in mind that Paul nowhere else speaks of coming safely through childbirth. Okay, <clears throat> that's true, but I don't think it's very forceful. And here's a couple reasons why. Dia, the word saved through childbirth, that word for through, it very rarely means during the time of. In other words, the phrase saved through childbirth probably doesn't mean saved 
in the midst of or in the time of childbirth, but rather that childbirth is somehow contributing to the salvation, that there's some contributory thing, some connection between the two things. It's not being saved in the midst of giving birth. Uh, Stanley Porter puts it this way. Although this is a grammatically po- a grammatical possibility, the major difficulty with this view is that the most convincing examples that grammarians cite of the temporal use of dia have clear temporal words. For example, day, year, night. Now, I'm trying to skip through a lot of stuff that you'll just feel like I'm bogging you down. Basically, the examples of this word, whenever you're using it for in the time of, which is what Keener's interpretation requires, you always have things like 40 days, in the night, several years, 14 years. There's always time indicators to indicate that dia or through is referring to time. In the case of 1 Timothy 2.15, there's no such indicator. Dia probably means through in the natural sense, saved through childbirth, not saved during childbirth. Keener's rescue is to say that this is the only place where Paul speaks of coming safely through childbirth. Um, that is what, that this is, from what I can tell, this is what we call, oh, hear me, sorry, let me put it back on your screen. This is what we call circular reasoning. Um, how do I know Paul's using sozo for being brought safely through childbirth here, even though he always uses it for salvation in the spiritual sense elsewhere? Answer, because this is the only time Paul uses it that way, Mike. You see how me being right is, is, is proven by the fact that I'm right. <laughs> That doesn't really work. Uh, as far as I can tell, it looks like circular reasoning. It also doesn't acknowledge the depth of the problem of saying Paul uses sozo this way here. It's not just that we don't have examples of Paul using it to refer to childbirth. Paul never uses sozo, never, to mean anything that is about coming safely through anything. He, he always uses it to refer to salvation in the ultimate sense. That's 28 times, seven times in the pastoral epistles. I've a look, checked every example. He's always referring to like a spiritual kind of salvation. Like when we tell someone, hey, buddy, you need to put your faith in Jesus and get saved. That's how Paul uses it every time. So it would be very strange to see him suddenly use it differently. It's possible, but it's not likely. Gordon Fee adds the following. Moreover, he uses an entirely different word for the idea of being kept safe through his letters. So not only does Paul use sozo for spiritual salvation, when he is talking about being kept safe in the other sense, in the natural sense, He uses a different term for that. I counted eight times um, of those. So this looks like circular reasoning. And for that reason, I would set it aside and say, yeah, um, the Sozo thing's pretty powerful. Douglas Moo summarizes and opens the door to another problem with this interpretation. He says that uh, this Keener's option of being saved physically in the midst of giving birth to children uh, can probably be excluded. Also, sozo consistently indicates salvation from sin in Paul, which I've sa- I've stated, and the conditional clause is hard to explain on this reading. And that brings up the third problem with Keener's interpretation. And there's many who, it's not just his, he's just an example of someone who holds to it. The third problem is the conditional clause. If you go back to the text, it says, she will be saved through childbearing if... They continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control. This is something I think people don't think about very much when they have this view, have Keener's view, or they don't talk about it. I'm sure they think about it. They don't write about it. They sort of skip over it for the most part. I'll have one brief little sentence about it. This interpretation implies that women will not die in childbirth if they're genuine Christians. They continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control. Really? Think about that. That, that's huge. That, that, here, here's a quote on this um, from George Knight. But this suggestion also raises the question of how Eon cl- the Eon Clause functions, the if, if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with self-control. Is the clause saying that all who come through childbirth do so because they believe, implying that all who die in childbirth do not believe? This seems extremely unlikely. That phrase, if they continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control, I mean, why did your your wife, someone watching this video, you've probably lost a loved one who died in childbirth or you know somebody. Is that because she they weren't a believer and now you're thinking that and then, and then it's in your head that this is like a, a failure of faith and now it's leaning into the weird, the prosperity and like hyper charismatic stuff about, about getting healing all the time that leaves people utterly unprepared to deal with the hardships that will confront us in life. 
when you get cancer and when you die, when you suffer, and those things will happen. And the miracle healing is, it seems to me, the exception to the normal thing. And we need to be prepared for both the normal thing as well. So it doesn't fit reality. It also doesn't fit the rest of the New Testament. As if in Paul, we have this teaching that like, if you believe enough, bad things aren't going to happen to you. It's the opposite <laughs> in scripture. Um, you may not suffer judgment from God because of sin, but you will still suffer in this world, in this brokenness, in the fallenness of your own body, as well as in the uh, persecutions or harms that may come upon you as a result of your faith in Christ. It doesn't fit Paul's own theology about suffering. This interpretation has a lot of problems. And so I, I think that the problems are are bigger than the um, than the pros. I think the cons are much bigger than the pros. Uh, does Keener react to this? Does he respond to these these problems that I've just raised? Uh, no, not not that I've seen. I've read his works. I've read a few different things from him on this stuff, and I haven't seen him respond to these issues. This is a view, it seems, many embrace without working through the implications. Most I've read on this don't really talk about the fact that they're telling people, like, if you just believed enough, if you just were good enough as a Christian, you wouldn't have died in childbirth, you wouldn't have suffered that much in childbirth. Uh, needless to say, what about bringing the children safely through? I don't know how they would talk about that. Women who've lost a, a child very commonly struggle with all kinds of guilt, thinking, what if, what is there something I did? What else could I have done? I would never, I would want to alleviate that and not add to it. Um, oof, that's, that's rough stuff. Finally, what do we make of the point that death in la the death in labor view, that's this view, keeps you from dying in labor, that it fits the context of 1 Timothy 2, where Paul alludes to the curse, which increases women's pains in labor. This is a pro for the view. Hey, Paul just talked about Eve and the curse. The curse is really related to labor pains. And then he says, ah, oh, but she'll be brought through childbearing safely. Um, as with the messianic interpretation we'll talk about later, this one is consistent with the idea that Paul has Genesis 3 in mind. That is a positive thing. Okay, hey, that's actually a pro for the view. It's about Genesis 3. It feels like that is the subject Paul's talking about. Here's the con. Here's why this doesn't work for me fully. Those who hold this view aren't saying women will be saved from increased pains in labor. They're not saying that. That's what Genesis 3 says. They're saying women won't die in labor. That is not what Genesis 3 says, right? So it is actually a break from Genesis 3. Similar, but not the same. So this interpretation has a flaw. It takes Paul to be alluding to increased labor pain, which women will not be saved from, when Paul is actually thinking of death in labor, which he promises women will be freed and saved from, even though they're not in reality. We don't have some statistic that says that women who are Christians just don't die in labor. So the Genesis 3 connection doesn't seem to work on the uh, death in labor view. In summary, here we go. Before you... Uh, um, before we move on, here's, here's a summary of what I've shared so far about this view. It doesn't fit the use of sozo, saved. It doesn't seem to mean that in Paul. It doesn't fit the word if. No, it doesn't seem to fit that. It doesn't fit Pauline theology or the New Testament theology in general. It doesn't fit the use of the word dia or the word of uh, the through, the use of the word through childbearing. And it doesn't fit Christian experience. It doesn't fit Genesis 3, the context of increased labor pains, which Christian women are not kept from. Um... It feels like an idea that's adjacent to 1 Timothy 2 or somewhat off topic doesn't quite connect to the things that Paul's talked about. So it seems a little bit odd. Some people make too much of this view. They take this view and they say saved in death and they go, therefore, women called on Artemis and therefore I'm validating, I've mentioned this, but I'm validating that my Artemis backdrop for 1 Timothy 2 is valid. Um, I think in reality, uh, there is, a, there is a, they did call on Artemis for this stuff. They called on gods in general for this stuff and Artemis in particular for this stuff. Okay, so that, that is a reality. But they'll want to show that it means the whole passage relates to Artemis. And this affirms that women are just being kept from copying the Artemis cult behaviors, such as a woman domineering over a man through, uh, though her leading a man is actually okay. The problem with this, of course, is that it's fabricated history about the Artemis cult. We talked about that earlier. So I'll say people make too much of that view. Um, others will say this is about a reversal of the curse. Um, it is, speaks of the reversal of the curse. Okay, the pain in childbirth, but Paul's saying you're not going to experience death and labor. Of course, that's not a reversal. These are two different issues, even if you take that view. Uh, and they'll say, therefore, we should continue reversing the curse, which is, of course, let's, let's roll that ball downhill a little further and say, therefore, women shouldn't be in any subordination towards men in any way. And therefore, we're reversing the curse. This strikes me as obviously false. I see this as unevidenced or unsupported. Uh, the death and labor view doesn't seem to weigh in at all on the complementary and egalitarian debate. 
uh, whether you want to use this for your case or not. I think that if you take the death and labor view, there's problems with it, but none of them are related to complementarian or egalitar egalitarian views. I think it just doesn't fit the passage. Either side could hold to that view and it wouldn't change the rest of their interpretations. But this, this then rules out some other views as well. Any view that takes sozo or the word saved to refer to something less than Christian salvation does not seem worth the time. This is a pretty big deal. It's Paul so consistent in his use of these things and he connects salvation here. Let me show you. Saved in childbearing, if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with self-control, there these these are this salvation seems to be related to like actual eternal life type salvation. And so um there is a, a view pr pr promoted by a guy named Jeb, S. Jeb, a scholar, who, who says that by observing her proper role as childbearer, right, which refers to a role here, and maintaining Christian virtues, the woman will be kept from the error just mentioned of lording things over her husband and being deceived. And this is kind of a complicated view. Again, I don't want to spend a lot of time on it. Let me just say, any view that takes sozo to not refer to salvation, but to refer to like an error in thinking, like ruling over your husband or, um, or salvation from physical pain or something, I think that those views should be set aside. So moving forward, the views that we're going to promote or consider, I should say, I'm not really going to promote them, is that a person, a woman can be saved spiritually. And the, the question is from what? Right. And so the second view is saved in spite of pain in childbirth. That is that a woman can simply be saved spiritually, yet she'll still have to suffer pain in childbirth. Here's an explanation from a scholar named E.F. Scott. It seems best to take the Greek preposition in the phrase through childbearing, not in the usual sense of by means of, but as denoting a condition. She will be saved even though she must bear children. You catch that? So it's not saved by having children, but saved in the consequence of still having children. So she'll be saved even though she must bear, ch bear children. That is Eve, the representative woman, was condemned to painful childbirth as the penalty for her sin, and this penalty is still ex exacted. But woman, no less than man, will be saved in spite of the continuing mark of divine displeasure if women live the true Christian life. Um, this is appealing. Okay, this view, it might seem a little complicated, but it's, it's appealing because it's a simple resolution. I take sozo in its natural sense. I'm just saying, yeah, you're still going to suffer pain just like you still have role differences, but your salvation is the same. And that theologically, that fits, that works as far as the known theology of the scriptures. Saved is taken the right way. Bear children, it refers to giving birth. Okay, that seems solid. And then the she here represents Eve. She is saved. Eve will be saved through childbearing in spite of the, the suffering of childbearing if they continue faith love. Um, then we have the word through and that's where it, that's where it has a problem. The word through is changed saved through childbearing has a very unnatural meaning instead of saved through it just means saved yet she must or saved in spite of childbearing or saved even though she will have pain in childbearing you feel that we're adding stuff into the into the passage here it disregards the woman is saved through childbearing uh, which seems that it must either mean the childbearing saves her or she's saved from some danger related to childbearing Tom Schreiner says that Scott's view has been con consistently rejected. I, I think it's appealing, especially to those who are looking for a resolution. But um, Schreiner says, unfortunately, this interpretation violates the semantic range of Dia through. And thus, Scott's proposal has been consistently rejected. It, it's it's just not a known mean of the term, meaning of the term. Dia just doesn't really mean that. This is a big enough issue, that one issue by itself, that most people would reject this view. So let's talk about the third view. View number three is that a woman is saved spiritually by actually having children. Okay, this is a view that you're going to say, that could not possibly be right, Mike. And, and and you're not being like too presumptuous to say that. If you know Paul, you know the New Testament, you know that the idea that a woman can be saved by having kids is in conflict with the teachings of the scriptures in, in many different ways. So this is, of course, not a popular view. But it does seem to take the passage in a straightforward way if you ignore the rest of everything Paul says. And this is kind of like, well, literally, that's what you said. But sometimes, you know, you say things and someone goes, well, literally, and you're like, yeah, but you know me. You know that I didn't mean it. That 
Sometimes you have to bring in your full understanding of a person to be able to understand what they're saying. But it does seem to take it in a straightforward way. Dia has different possible meanings, that word through. Okay, here are legitimate meanings. It can mean through as in what's caused, uh, called an efficient cause, meaning it's causing a thing. Um, Romans 3.20 says, through the law, dia, the law, comes the knowledge of sin. So the law literally is bringing you the knowledge of sin. If it meant that, it would be like you're spiritually saved through kids. You're going to have kids and that's going to save you. But dia can also mean through as what's called attending circumstances or situationally. That's a legitimate meaning of the word. We're not using illegitimate meanings. An example of this is 1 Corinthians 3.15. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. I should really put this one on your screen. 1 Corinthians 3.15. 3, if anyone's work is burned up, he'll suffer loss, but he'll be saved but only as through fire. Did the fire, this is Dia here. Did the fire save him? No, he was saved through the fire. The fire was the thing that removed the, the, the ungodly works and in a sense cleansed away. And some will say this is purgatory. That's another video. I have a video on that. It's not purgatory. These are his, he's not being burned. His works are being burned. And then he's not carrying with him ungodly works into heaven. He's only carrying godly things that are left. So he saved yet as through fire. The fire here is what's called an attending circumstance. The fire didn't save him exactly, but it was part of the situation in which he was saved. That seems to be a legitimate use of dia. Um, so there are other meanings for dia, but none of them seem good candidates for First Timothy here. Either one of these is possible. The Greek resource BDAG, BDAG, says that either one of these could apply to First Timothy 2 in particular. It could be saved by having kids or saved with the attending circumstance of having kids. It could be either one. How do we decide? How do we pick which one of these is the right one? Are they saved spiritually by having kids like view number three is gonna suggest? Well, Jared August, associate professor of New Testament Greek at North Northeastern Baptist helps us out. He says the following. The phrase sozodia, saved through, and genitive is used seven times in Paul's epistles. Ah. Oh, we're not just getting sozo or dia, but actually a phrase with a genitive used by Paul seven times. Of these instances, only 1 Corinthians 3.15 uses this phrase to indicate attendant circumstances. The other five, or six if you include 1 Timothy, all use the phrase to indicate instrumentality or like it's this the kid having kids is actually going to save you. This does not prove that 1 Timothy 2.15 indicates instrumentality, but it certainly provides evidence in favor of this understanding. That would be probably like the reason, the best reason to take this as the view. Paul m most often uses this to refer to like, hey, he'd mean having kids is saving you. But he doesn't always do that. We have one clear example where he doesn't do that. So a reason to reject this view would be the obvious. It radically contradicts Paul's own theology. Radically. A, a massive contradiction of Paul's own theology in a number of ways. Let me let me spell out a few of those ways because I know some are going to think, Mike, you're reading your own theology into the text. And no, 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 I'm not. I didn't say it con contradicts my theology. I'm saying it contradicts Paul's theology. Paul's clear teachings express that this is not how he views things. So I'm going to use his clear teachings to understand an unclear passage. Right? Because it will help rule out a false interpretation. Because I go, well, he probably doesn't mean that. Because he says opposite clearly elsewhere. So I'm not saying it's it violates my theology, but it violates Paul's. I'm saying Paul has very clearly laid out his understanding of how we are saved. And how we should give weight to the idea that he won't contradict his own views. For more information on this, I recommend you check out the Romans series. I did a verse by verse series, spent a year going through the book of Romans. It's all free and available online. Uh, if I can remember, I'll put a link in the description below for the Romans series. Check it out. Paul clearly lays out that we are justified by faith apart from works. There aren't these activities that you have to do, these check boxes of do this good thing and then you can get saved. Um, not to mention in 1 Corinthians 7, this is, a, this is clarity here. Paul makes it very clear that singleness is a good thing. And for the sake of the kingdom, if you can stay single and pure in your heart, not dealing with sexual temptation and stuff and falling to it, if you can stay pure and single and use that to serve in the kingdom of God, that that's actually better than getting married. If you had to have kids to be saved, Paul would be damning the women that he's telling 
yeah, if you can handle this, singleness is great. Read 1 Corinthians 7. The clarity there overrules uh, the confusion that people have on 1 Timothy 2.15. Am I being consistent here? Am I being consistent when I say I can use Paul's teachings in 1 Corinthians 7 and Romans to rule out this interpretation of 1 Timothy 2.15? Uh, frequently people do this and it's not right, okay? Uh, hermeneutics, the study of the Bible, is there's an art to it, there's a science to it, there's, it's both. Here are some principles that help us to not do this the wrong way. First, clear teachings rule unclear ones. Not the other way around. You don't use unclear ones to rule the clear ones. You use clarity to bring that light into an unclear area. That's the first principle. Um, nor do I take clear teachings to refute other clear teachings. Instead, I would go, look, they're both clearly taught. I should be trying to understand and harmonize these views, not use them to fight against each other. Number two, there's a reasonable interpretation of the passage in question that harmonizes with the clear passage. This is absolutely present here. Dia, it's a legitimate meaning, attending circumstances. It's not as common, but Paul does do it for sure in 1 Corinthians 3.15. Therefore, it's something Paul does. So it's legitimate. It's something Paul does do, though it's not common, and it harmonizes perfectly well with his theology elsewhere. So an example of this could be um, the following. I got in a lot of, uh, I should say trouble. I don't know if it's real trouble, but I got in, uh, in, in someone made a reaction video to me, and they were saying that I had promoted the prophet of Bethel, and that I had affirmed Chris Valatin. I always say his name wrong. I had affirmed Chris Valatin was the prophet of Bethel, and that I affirmed that he was a real prophet, that I endorsed, they used that word, endorsed Chris Valatin, the prophet. And they showed a clip of me saying, Chris Valatin, who's the prophet of Bethel Church in Redding, California. And therefore, they, they took that as me affirming his prophetic status. Now, is that a, a correct interpretation of that phrase? I mean, when you say Chris Valatin, the prophet, literally, I called him a prophet. That's 100% true. But you can also be using that to refer to someone who merely has a title and has a position, but isn't a real prophet. If you actually look at the rest of the video, that same video where I talk about Chris Valentin, you'll see, I don't think he's legitimate. I don't think he's real. I don't think offering real, he's offering real prophecy and proper guidance to the people of God. I think there's problems that are going on there. Um, but this person took my words out of context. Here's where my clear teachings can help to clarify a single clip out of context and I think that's a good example of exactly what we're doing with Paul here. Paul didn't mean saved through childbearing in that sense. If you take sozo to mean Christian salvation and childbearing to mean the act of having kids, then you should take dia to mean attending circumstances. It's open in the Greek and it's consistent with Paul. Therefore, I reject view number three, that women are saved spiritually by literally having children. I absolutely reject that and you should too. All right, let's talk about the last two views. These two both seem viable, okay? Pick one is my advice. <laughs> Here are the last two views of safe through childbirth. Number four, safe through proper female roles. Um, this is uh, Douglas Moo's preferred view, and he explains it right here. It is not through active teaching and ruling activities that the Christian woman will be saved, right? Me talking here, that, that's what Paul forbids in verses 11 and 12. But, Moo talking now, through faithfulness to their proper role exemplified in motherhood. So he takes the phrase childbearing to represent a role, not an act. That's the controversial part of this one. It, 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 the rest of it, it, it interprets it fine. Childbearing, can it be used to refer to a role and not the act of bearing children? Most views take it as the act. So the woman, therefore, will, will honor Christ through being godly in her own role, not the man's role, which would be that part of eldership in the church, which Paul has just said he does not permit her to perform. It's an affirmation of role differences, which is a very complementarian thing. Now, this actually fits the rest of the passage. It, it doesn't require reworking your understanding of anything. It still seems to connect theologically and all that. It doesn't feel like it connects too well to the Genesis reference and the Adam and Eve references, right? Do you feel that disconnect? You're like, but he just said Adam and Eve and the fall and deception and then mentioned childbirth. It's it's just odd that this isn't also connected to Genesis 3, which also, also mentions childbirth. Instead, it just refers to roles. Uh, but it, you could say it kind of refers to childbirth in a roundabout way. I'm just saying it feels weak. It feels kind of weak. So here's his case. Douglas Moo's case for this view is that saved is in the spiritual sense. 
He says, Sozo retains its natural Pauline sense, deliverance from sin and its condemning power, perhaps especially here in the ultimate eschatological sense. I think Paul always uses it in the ultimate eschatological sense, even though I think Douglas Moo doesn't. That's just my opinion. Then we have the, the, the second point in his case, which is that it suits the context, verses 9 through 14, where the issue is obviously the proper sphere of women's activities. But that also works. We're still on the same topic. Okay, that helps. Third reason why he'd suggest this view works is that this view finds support in the larger context for a frequently recurring motif in the pastoral epistles is the need for Christian women to devote themselves to care to the care of homes and the raising of children. Ah, okay, so this actually connects with something Paul's concerned about elsewhere, which is not just bearing kids, but raising kids. Uh, he's he's affirming a woman's role here. The, you, you get the idea. Let's look at a couple verses that Mu would use to support this. First Timothy 5, um, 10. Speaking of women, having a reputation for good works, if she's brought up children, has shown hospitality, has washed the feet of saints. These are qualities that he would consider good qualities to look for in a woman. She has a reputation for what? Bringing up her children. She's brought them up, in other words, properly. That's something that is good. In verse 14, he also says, so I would have younger women, younger widows marry, bear children, manage their households. Okay, so yeah, Paul in the same book is concerned with women inhabiting a role that includes the raising of children, bearing children. That's interesting. Fourth point in favor of this view is that false teachers were counseling abstention from marriage, so this teaching was needed. We can see this here in 1 Timothy 4.3, that there are these false teachers and they forbid marriage. They also require abstinence from foods. It's like an ascetic type of life, but they're forbidding marriage. And that was something that was not to be done. Oh, you have permission not to get married, but to forbid marriage, to make rules about not getting married, that is an ungodly thing. That is ultimately a, a doctrine of demons, actually, according to scripture, pretty big deal. So Paul then might be counseling these women, get married, right? Have kids, do this. This is your proper role. This is this is fine and good. Here's how he handles Dia. Um, Dia, he says, the word uh, through, he says, will indicate not the ultimate cause, but the efficient cause, or what I've been calling the attendant circumstances. Uh, Schreiner further explains this in his writings. He says, since Paul often argues elsewhere that salvation is gained not on the basis of our works, I think it's fair to understand that the virtues described here uh, as a result of new life in Christ, understand the virtues as a new life in Christ. That is, these things are simply attending their salvation. She will be saved through childbearing and attendance with childbearing. It doesn't mean she has to do that in order to get saved, but it's something that's going to happen as a natural result of her inhabiting the role God has called her to. Schreiner goes on to say the following. What Paul means is that abiding in godly virtues and obeying apostolic instructions are necessary for salvation. They are necessary because they function as the evidence of new life in Christ. Um, so the, the necessity is... Uh, in the same sense that Jesus says, hey, if the, if the tree is good, its fruit will be good, right? That this idea of the fruit, the grapes of, of the vine are necessary to show that it's a grapevine. Do the grapes make it a grapevine? No, they're a result of it being that kind of thing. And so that is the interpretation here. Uh, childbearing is one of the good works through which the Christian woman preserves her place in the salvific scheme. That's how Mu puts it. And that is, I, I admit, that, that phrasing feels like we're playing with like, just it just feels a little bit like would I put it that way, um, but they're very clear. Mu Schreiner, others are very clear. These, are, these guys are very much in the reform camp. They're like this is not something that you do to get yourself saved. It's something that attends with salvation. Just like Jesus said, if you don't forgive others, you will not be forgiven. This is something that attends salvation. If you're genuinely saved, the work of the Holy Spirit in your life brings these things out. So lean into them. So Mu acknowledges though there's a serious difficulty with this view. And this is the serious difficulty with this view. He says, does verse 15 imply that women experience ultimate salvation only insofar as they beget children? And Mu responds, um, big, big question, right? Yeah. Yeah. Do you do, do you know, I've, everybody has to forgive. Does everybody have to have kids to be saved? Is this what he's saying? Uh, he says, one, that would be incompatible with Paul's clear teachings. First uh, Corinthians seven. Right shows, as I mentioned, shows singleness as a positive thing. Mu says it's typical and representative of a woman's role. It's not comprehensive in application. Mu's theory is, 
and others like him would say, hey, few women were actually called to singleness. He, Paul can speak with a generality, safe through childbearing, because most women are going to get married and have kids. And so it's a general statement, but not a requirement for all women. It's just a general reality. Uh, still, it makes it awkward, to be honest, to see such emphasis in relation to salvation's fruit, because forgiveness, everyone's called to do, but, but singleness is lauded as a good thing. It just seems a little bit odd. So it is a serious difficulty with the view. Uh, why not just say women will be blessed or they'll be honoring God by having children? Why attach salvation to that issue? So the final issue in relation to like uh, difficulties with this view is sort of a rescue for the, the tension that you feel, the awkwardness that you feel about like, oh, it feels like you're, we're making having kids important as like something every woman has to do. You know, how is singleness lifted up in 1 Corinthians 7? And it's tied into this word, uh, synecdoche. Okay, you may have heard this word, but it's when you take a piece of something and you use that to represent the whole thing. A piece of something to represent the whole thing. And that is this word childbearing. Childbearing, usually the term in Greek, technogonia, it refers to like literally giving birth, like that moment of, of being in labor and a, a baby comes out, right? That's what it's talking about typically. But he's saying, yeah, maybe the word means that, but maybe it's referring to that merely as as like a synecdoche or a representation of all of the female role things because it is a very pinnacle thing a woman can do that name something a woman can do a guy can't like pff, that's like the number one thing right there right and and find stuff that we we lose as men but yeah so bear children refer, re, really refers to proper female roles and this is maybe why paul can tell all women to do it he doesn't really need all women to literally bear children he just wants all women to be in their proper female role that's an attendant circumstance of salvation. Then it feels softer. Then it feels more applicable to all people, even single ones, to be honest. So yeah, um, it can stop the challenge that women don't all have to have kids because it's just a stand-in for female roles. Here's a problem with this view, though. Um, and it's not fatal, but it is it is an issue. It's a pushback. I don't know of any example of that word technogonia being used that way. I don't know of any example of it being used that way. And so then it's, it doesn't mean it's impossible, but it just, it's, yeah, it just makes it a little bit questionable. Stanley Porter says, apart from later Christian writers in all four extra biblical contexts in which this word is used, which by the way, that's not very many. We only got four. So we don't have a lot to pull from. He says, where the meaning can be determined with any degree of certainty, it denotes the specific act of bearing children, right? Specifically bearing kids. It's never used in that other way. Uh, Paul suggests... Uh, excuse me, Moo, Douglas Moo, suggests that Paul might be using it that very way in 1 Timothy 5. So let's look at it here. He says, I would have younger widows marry, bear children, technogonia, manage their households. He's like saying, hey, this is it being used in the same way. Paul's using it to represent them being in that general female role. Um, others point out that this is actually a chronological sequence. It's not representing a role, right? You get married, you have kids, and then you manage your household. So it's actually meaning bearing kids, like having kids physically, not something more abstract. And um, I would agree with them. I would agree that that is what that seems to be there. And I would disagree with Douglas Moo on this. In addition to this, there are other Greek words Paul could use that would actually mean child raising and not child birthing, right? There are other words for that. Paul uses one of them in 1 Timothy 5.10, where he talks about a woman who has brought up children. That has to do with raising children and not just giving birth. So... We have very few examples to pull from uh, in the end. Four to look at. Uh, it makes sense to see it as representing a uniquely female role. Like mentally, I go, yeah, I get that. Childbearing, female role. Yeah, that that seems connected to me. Um, but I don't know. I don't know. I'm a little bit on the fence on this particular thing. So there's, there's a weakness that's there. Um, it is therefore, on this view, something godly women do, having kids, raising kids. It doesn't earn them salvation, but it exhibits a person who has genuinely received salvation. They have these attending circumstances of living out the proper role God's given them. So there are some weaknesses. Uh, childbearing is being seen as child rearing or, or as women's roles in general. That does seem unlikely, but not impossible or not, not, not definitely false. It just seems somewhat unlikely. Um, it seems to connect too strongly genuine salvation to marriage and kids. It does feel that way to me. When Paul sees singleness as a rare gift, but one that fully honors God and one that is actually better than marriage. And he would still have those women in their roles. So I don't you don't need marriage and kids to be in your female role. It, it, see, it just it just feels a little awkward. It feels a little bit like a square peg in a round hole. 
but it doesn't violate any clear teaching of scripture and it has less problems than all the other views. So I would go with this one. This would be my view if I wasn't convinced of view number five. I would hold this view and say, hey, verse 15, here's my interpretation. It doesn't change my view of the rest of the passage and it shouldn't. You shouldn't take the uncertain to change the certain, the unclear to change the clear. But here's the view I'll hold for now. So it might be right, but I actually hold the final view, the fifth view, that this is about a woman being saved spiritually through the Messiah. So let's talk about why I think that is the right view. And it's the view that I like to try to talk you into if I can. I mean, that, of course I should. If I think it's right, I should definitely try to talk you into it. She will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control. We haven't talked a whole lot about the they yet, but we'll, why does it go from she to they? What's going on there? Um, we'll talk about some of that now. So here's an explanation of the fifth view. That we are saved spiritually and it's through the Messiah. And this is a reference to Eve. And then it spills into all of us if they continue, all women in particular, in faith, love, and holiness with self-control. So Eve, in verse 14, Eve fell, she was deceived, and she became a transgressor. So Eve needs salvation. This comes through the text in 1 Timothy. I'm not borrowing context from any other place. It's right here in the place that we're reading right now. Um, That salvation that she needs right? Because she's a transgressor at the end of verse 14. It's going to be responded with this being saved through childbearing. And that's through the promised Messiah. What ver- What is Paul talking about in this passage? Adam and Eve, Genesis 2. And then what in verse 14? Genesis 3. And what is also in Genesis 3? The promise of the seed of the woman crushing the head of the serpent. This is the childbearing that saves her. You get it. It makes sense. The question is, is it legitimate? Right? And then it goes on to say, if they continue in faith and love, because all women will be saved by that same childbearing Messiah or childbearing of the Messiah, if they have genuine faith that shows itself out in godly living. So in this case, you're literally being saved, like salvation in the eternal sense, through a specific child being born. That is Jesus. So she then refers to Eve, which is what he was already talking about in verse 14. It was Eve. I think that this seems really strong. I like this view a lot, and I'm going to try and talk you into it. All right, here we go. So in verse 14, Paul mentions Genesis 3 and the ultimate problem of sin. Become a transgressor shows up in that verse. This brings up what Paul, what is always on Paul's mind, ultimate salvation. And if you haven't read much of Paul, I'd recommend you do it. Paul, when he brings up salvation, he often goes on to some digression, some little chat about the glories of Christ and and the accomplishments of Jesus or the prophetic truths about Jesus. This is something he commonly does. So he connects it with the gospel. Paul takes a breath of fresh air in the midst of this discussion about male and female roles, and he connects it to the gospel of Christ. That seems consistent with with Paul. Specifically, through the concept of the very first prophecy, which is where? Which is in Genesis 3, which he's just been quoting from. Let's look at that prophecy, Genesis 3.15. I will put enmity between you, the serpent, and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring, that would be Jesus, he, singular, shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. This, I would, <clears throat> I would agree with others who say this is ultimately the first prophecy of the Messiah. The, the, the beginning of these amazing prophetic truths about Jesus and his salvation that he brings. That's what Paul's tapping into. This is why we have in, <clears throat> in 1 Timothy 2, the she and they experience. So the she, they that we have in verse 15. This makes a lot of sense with that. The she is Eve. Eve will be saved through childbearing. That's the Messiah. If they, that would be either everyone else, right? Or all women, because he's talking about a woman to talk about women, or he's referring to even Adam and Eve. Some might say Adam and Eve is being referred to here. Um, I would be inclined to think it refers to women in general, and I'll explain why. But the she they makes a lot of sense on this interpretation. A lot of people are saying the she refers to women in general, but what was the last woman to be discussed? It was Eve. And when you have the she here with no other indicator, with no other explanation of who she is, that meaning is usually borrowed from whatever was just being discussed. And so it'd be referenced to Eve, the woman. And the problem of the woman is she became a transgressor. That's a big issue. And she is, yet she'll be saved. How? Through childbearing, right? The Messiah, which is what was prophesied in Genesis 3.15. I think this fits perfectly. I don't think this there's any issue with that whatsoever. So verse 15, 
again, does not indicate who she is. So she will be saved refers to whoever was just being discussed. And that is Eve. This seems a lot more likely than skipping over verses 13 and 14 to connect she to verse 11, right? Let me zoom up here. A woman. That's the she? I don't think so. I don't think so. All the connections seem to be connected to Eve. It also makes sense of what problem is being solved in verse 15, What the sal why salvation is being brought up. It's the transgression of Eve. So again, Eve transgressed. Eve has to be saved. Verse 14 and 15 make a lot of sense that way. There's more support for this in that Genesis 2 and 3 is clearly in Paul's mind. He has just referenced it in verses 13 and 14. And so saved and childbearing is in Genesis 3.15 about the Messiah who Paul loves to talk about and interject randomly into various other subjects. That just seems really consistent to me. So we see not only um, Eve's creation, deception, and transgression, which is in the context of Genesis 2 and 3 and in verses 13 and 14, but we also see Eve's salvation connected to the same Old Testament passages by recognizing that Paul isn't referring to childbearing in general, but the childbearing that relates to the fall in Genesis 3, the promised Messiah. Another benefit of this view is it takes Dia in a natural way, right? Either, either the childbearing is, I will say this, others would disagree, but either the childbearing is causing salvation, like actually you're going to be saved through how? Because you're going to bear a kid and that kid's going to bring salvation. Or an attending circumstance so that, yeah, a, a unnecessary inclusion of the events that lead to your salvation is, of course, the childbearing that leads to the Messiah. It also takes sozo in the natural way. That's important. Okay, a soft evidence, and I'll have to admit this is soft, but it is evidence, so we should present it, is that there's a definite article before the word childbearing in Greek, and like, like the word the. Now, the in Greek does not function like the word the in English. There are similarities, but there are dissimilarities that are numerous. It gets kind of complicated. But one reason why you might have it be the childbearing in the Greek there is because it's referring to some iconic moment of childbearing. That is a possibility. It definitely, we should keep the door open for that being the explanation there. The article in Greek, it doesn't have to specify something in, the, in English like the childbearing, but it can, it can. Um, it seems the article doesn't force the interpretation I'm suggesting, but it is consistent with it. So I wanna point that out. Also, I will say in benefit of a pro of my view is it's a super early view. This was held by several church fathers. This is a very early view. It's not some new invention coming later on. The childbearing in verse 15 was thought very early on to refer to the Messiah. Now, why don't other people agree with me on that? Why don't they take my view? Why, aren't all these scholars like checking my videos to see what my views are? And the answer, of course, is no. Uh, but here's some reasons why they push back. Tom Schreiner offers the following points against this view. And I'm going to go through three that he offers, then I'll talk about Stanley Porter. Number one reason why Schreiner does not support this view, he says it requires interpreting the she of verse 15 as Mary. That might catch you off guard. It caught me off guard as well. But let's try to understand his, under his understanding. Let's try to understand his understanding here. All right, here is actually the quote from Schreiner. <clears throat> he says, one must also slide from seeing the subject of she shall be saved as Eve to Mary, but to read the latter into the verse is highly arbitrary. Now, I know some early church commentaries did say this. Some of those who saw Jesus as the Messiah here, they saw the she as Mary. And the the the, the focus that the church increasingly has on Mary over hist hist historical time, as you get further on, there's more emphasis and focus on Mary. That might be part of the reason for that. I just don't agree. I don't see any reason to see Mary in this passage. Um, any good reason. I, I understand. Here, let me put it on your screen again. I understand why someone says, <clears throat> hey, Mary is the one that gave birth to Jesus. So the she here has to be Mary. But in ancient times, like they're thinking of Eve as the mother of all. And in Genesis 3.15, Eve is described as being the mother that, you know, Jesus is describing the seed of Eve and then crushing. And so his connection to Eve is the focus in Genesis and his connection to Eve is the focus in first Timothy. That's consistent with viewing this as his, um, Paul's elaboration explanation, borrowing from Genesis chapter three. Um, she as Eve makes sense. I agree that seeing she as Mary does not make sense. You're suddenly adding a brand new idea at the conclusion 
Now, this is this is a time for conclusions. This is a time for ending up his thoughts, right? Because then he talks about qualifications for overseers, which is, again, fully in line with what he's discussed so far. But he's concluding this Eve stuff. Eve is the subject here. Okay, so first objection from Schreiner. My view here, um, the messianic view, requires us seeing the she as Mary. I say, no, it doesn't require that. You're right, that would be weird, but there's no reason to think that we need to do that. Eve can be seen as the mother of Jesus, not in modern English sense, but in their understanding. Yeah, right. They would call them our fathers, even though, no matter how many generations back they went, they're like, that was my father. So Paul never teaches that salvation comes through the incarnation. That's the second objection. Um, this is, is, is an interesting objection that Paul doesn't teach us that we're saved through the childbearing of Jesus. And I think that we're just being a little too wooden here, but let me explain this objection more. Tom Schreiner puts it this way. Those who posit a reference to Jesus's birth have subtly introduced the notion that salvation is secured as a result of giving birth to him. Whereas the text speaks not of the result of birth, but of the actual birthing process, right? That word childbearing technogonia speaks of giving birth, not the results of the birth, the, the Messiah's works later on. Let's read another quote on here. <clears throat> Nor does Paul elsewhere say that salvation comes through the incarnation. The noun, technogonia, childbearing, emphasizes the actual giving birth to a child, not the result or effect of childbirth. So maybe that rules it out. Uh, Gordon Fee says the same thing. He says the incarnation does not save people. No one's saved by merely by the incarnation or by the giving of the birth of the giving of birth to Jesus. Um, so I would say the incarnation is not the whole story of salvation, but my response, my rebuttal would be that it's part of it. Um, without the incarnation, we do not have salvation. With it, we do have it. Right? It's 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 not that the incarnation by itself saves us, but it's certainly an essential element of our salvation tied to the work and person of Jesus Christ. It's not the whole story, but it's necessary. So perhaps childbirth is focused on because it's about Eve's unique contribution to the prophecy of the Messiah. Because Paul is trying to reaffirm, while he's, this is important, Paul does this over and over. When he ever talks about some sort of difference in roles where like women have some sort of lesser authority than maybe a husband does, even though they have very high authority and respect and dignity, he then goes on to do this complementarian thing of going, ah, but they're equal co-heirs in salvation and don't you dare disrespect them or, or your prayers will be hindered, things like that. He raises up to, to react against what is the natural, sometimes patriarchal, diminishing of women because a difference shouldn't be a diminishment. Paul focuses on childbearing because childbearing connects it to Eve because Eve is the one who transgressed. And as a result of that, partly of that, there's a difference in roles. And that's going to be observed today as well. But he wants to then affirm a fullness of salvation, a fullness of inheritance, a fullness of being sons of God in Christ and all that. So <clears throat> perhaps childbirth is focused on, in other words, because it's Eve's unique part in Christ's coming. So it's emphasized. Still, and this is a bigger pushback, I'd say, to these points by Schreiner and Gordon Fee. Why not just take Dia as what they called attendant circumstances? See, when Schreiner has his interpretation of verse 15, which is the last one I gave you, the fourth interpretation, about it being a woman's role, that she saved not by her role, but, but with the attendant circumstances of observing her role. That's part of the results of salvation and stuff. Um he takes Dia as attendant circumstances, but then when he rebuts this view, he refuses to offer that as an option for interpreting Dia. That doesn't make a lot of sense to me. So Schreiner does this on his view, saved by proper female roles, attendant circumstances. Uh, George Knight says that this the construction of Sozo with Dia means that salvation is coming through, but not by childbearing. So I think the first two objections don't really work. Uh, I don't need to see the she as Mary, that she is Eve, and it works perfectly consistently that way, as far as I can tell. And the second objection, you could simply see Dia as attendant circumstances, and that is a, a completely viable option as Schreiner himself takes that view, so this wouldn't be a good objection to the uh, messianic interpretation. Uh, the third thing is that the objection here is that the presence of the article isn't strong evidence for this view. And here I'd say Tom Schreiner's right. Just because it says the childbearing in the Greek there doesn't give strong evidence for the view. 
but I wouldn't present it as strong evidence. I would present it as soft support. And so I don't really see that as an objection. It allows for the view, hey, this may be a particular moment of childbearing in view. Stanley Porter, he says that the tense, he has his own objection here, the tense shall be saved doesn't work with Eve as the woman. Shall is a future thing, but Eve died a long time ago. So this doesn't function. That, that violates the interpretation. Here we go. Here's his quote. Although it must be conceded that the woman of verse 14 could be Eve, the inferring of Eve as the subject of the future verb in verse 14 does not carry great conviction. So she shall be saved, shouldn't be Eve. The attitudinal force of the future form of the verb in verse 15 is one of expectation. That is, it grammaticalizes or conveys not a temporal conception, past, present, or future, but a marked but a marked and emphatic expectation toward a course of events. In other words, it's about something that's going to happen, not something that's already happened. Since Eve's fortunes have already been determined, they are beyond any further expectation, so this solution is unlikely. I don't know why there's so many typos in this particular quote. You're sorry about that. At any rate, here's my pushback on that, my response to the idea that it can't be Eve because it's a future tense of salvation, and Eve, any salvation she experienced, must have therefore been what? Past tense. Romans 5.9. Paul uses salvation in multiple ways. Sozo shall be saved. He uses that in, in that sort of expectation sense all the time. Here's those who have already received Christ in Romans 5, 9. We have been justified. Therefore, we've experienced salvation in a sense, but much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. There is yet a future day coming, the final judgment, the final judgment that has not yet happened even to Eve, and we shall be saved in that future time. So that shall be saved here in Romans 5 in Paul's theology would apply to Eve as well. So I don't really see that the force of that objection from Stanley Porter. Even for Eve, the fullness of salvation, the finality of salvation is a future thing. And since Paul intends to rope all women in as included in the results of the stuff with Eve, he speaks about it in a future tense. That's why he goes, let's look at the verse again. She will be saved through childbearing if they, now we're bringing all women into the mix, which is what I think he's doing there. Continue in faith, love, and holiness with self-control. He finally transitions back to all women to finish his statement about the roles of men and women in 1 Timothy 2. Jared August responds to this objection. He says, although it may appear odd that the future tense is used in reference to this salvation, especially in reference to Eve's salvation, this is characteristic of Paul's writing in the pastoral epistles. In both 1 Timothy 4.16, and 2 Timothy 4.18, sozo is used in the future tense in reference to final salvation or sanctification, that ultimate sanctification. The, what, what about, is there good pushback? Okay, I've just dismissed all this pushback and said, nah, 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 I, don't, I think all these don't work. Is The best pushback I've heard is that this is a weird interpretation of the word technogonia. Again, that's the word childbearing. So this comes from Guthrie. Let me put it on your screen. Guthrie says, if that were the writer's interpretation, he could hardly have chosen a more obscure or ambiguous way of saying it. That is, to say childbearing and be referring to the future birth of the Messiah is just a really weird way of using the word childbearing. Like this, is, there, there had to have been plenty of other ways to say this. Yet, Guthrie, the same guy that put this quote out there in his work, Pastoral Epistles, he thinks this is the right interpretation. He admits that this is a challenge, but he doesn't think it's overwhelming. Uh, childbearing is a noun, not a verb. I'm just going to throw that out there. This is an interesting thing. It's not a verb, like a moment of childbearing, but childbearing is a noun, almost like it's an idea. And in, indeed, that, that to me feels like it does connect to Genesis 3.15. But at any rate, the general idea, though, is that technogonia is too odd of a fit for the messianic application. Okay, this is this is something I have to say. It has more weight to to people in general than it does to me personally. So maybe I'm missing something that's entirely possible here. I don't know. Maybe they'll find more uses of technogonia since there's very few um, examples to pull from that will help us to flesh that out more in the future. But here are some things that really help us. Here's the pros, right? Genesis 3 is on topic. It connects perfectly with Genesis 3 to see this as messianic. It logically flows, number two, it logically flows as far as how the transgression will be will be dealt with and salvation will finally be achieved. Eve was deceived, transgression, childbearing, crushed the serpent's head. It logically flows as far as not just in Genesis, but in 1 Timothy 
what Paul is saying. Um, in the New Testament, in, and Paul in particular, he will often use Old Testament typology. It happens all the time. Think he uses Hagar and Sarah as an allegory. He uses Christ as the rock. He frequently talks about things like the child of promise. This is in the the background of Paul's writings frequently is these, these messianic understandings of the Old Testament and even allegorical understandings of the Old Testament as they apply to the Messiah. Fourth support for this is that Paul is speaking of Christ like this in this very context. Let, let me show you what I mean by that. First Timothy 2 is the passage in question. If I back up just a little bit to verses 4 through 6, here's what we see. God, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth, for there's one God and there's one mediator between God and men, the man, the human, Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. This is just dripping with Old Testament theology and teaching and prophetic expectation. This is something that's already in the very passage. Jesus, And look at the words that are used. God desires we're what? Saved. And how are we saved? We're saved through the mediator. And what is the mediator? He's a human. He comes the man. And so he's now applying this. It applies to women too. She will be saved through childbearing. That's that mediator. And I think that makes a lot of sense. Paul here speaks also of Eve in a typological sense. It makes sense to me that he is also then going to speak of childbearing in a typological sense, because that's the part that I think rubs people. They're like, you're kind of forcing this typology thing here. But Eve is spoken of typology, typologically as representing all women, and her transgression is the issue, and childbearing can tie into that and be typological. Uh, I, I think that there's at least some soft evidence there. Paul also, number six, my argument in support of this, Paul does emphasize the humanity of Jesus and his birth as important in our salvation. While he doesn't mention childbearing by name in 1 Timothy 2 verses 4 through 6, it's the humanity and the, 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 the human nature and his birth and all that. This is him being the man Christ Jesus. In Galatians 4, 4, we have the following. When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law that we might receive adoption as sons. Obviously, the, the, the incarnation and the birth of Christ are very important in the theology of Paul. That's all I'm saying here. Also, uh, here's a, another soft support, because um, I, I do. And, and, and I, full, full disclosure, I'm excited about this interpretation. That could skew me and make me even more perhaps gullible to my own, my own view here. I, I hope that's not the case, but of course, that's always a possibility. I can sense my joy at thinking that this is a messianic understanding. And of course, I don't. I want to guard myself against following that joy into a distorted view of anything. But Paul may have a shorthand with Timothy. Um, I think that that makes a lot of sense. When you spend a ton of time with somebody, you can develop a certain, there's certain background knowledge you both have. Uh, marriages, you get this all the time, right? There's things where you could say a word or two to your spouse and they know a whole lot of what you mean, whereas somebody else wouldn't quite understand it. Well, here in 1 Timothy 3.16 is an example of Paul using something like shorthand related to the gospel with Timothy. He simply says, Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. You know, vindicated by the Spirit? Timothy knew what that meant. Manifested in the flesh, seen by angels? What does that mean? I puzzle over that. I wonder, Timothy knew there was enough background knowledge between the two of them that he just knew what Paul meant. And it may be that Paul doesn't fully explain what is something he always talked about, the gospel, the, the son of God, the incarnation, the Messiah, salvation from sin. Um, so yeah, the, the vindicated, by the way, is interesting. Vindicated probably refers to the resurrection of Jesus. And you get that from Romans 1.4. That he was declared to be the son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead. That was a vindication of the son of God. Now, you, you can know what this means through other scriptures. You would never know what it means through 1 Timothy. Timothy knew what it meant because he traveled with Paul. Paul also loves typology. Have you guys missed out on this? Paul loves typology. Let me just give you one more example of that. He says, I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud. And all passed through the sea and were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and the sea and all ate the same spiritual food, spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink for they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them. And the rock was Christ. 
Paul is into typology and things that are pictures of Jesus in the Old Testament. And I'm into it too. And I, I think you probably are too. If you haven't checked out the Jesus in the Old Testament series, I highly recommend it. Because um, once you're done with this, you're going to have tons of free time. <laughs> so um, a vague reference like spiritual food, rock of Christ, that was Christ, it fits the kind of vague reference of childbearing. I think it's okay to look for clues of messianic meanings into something vague like that that Paul says. So what about application? How do we apply the interpretation that I just gave? I think it's pretty simple. Women's status, this is, it's a very complementary interpretation. Women's status is different in role, equal in salvation. And that Paul is going through lengths to say, hey, I just outlined, not teacher have authority over man, but guess what? That salvation that we have, it's equally theirs. It's the same that same salvation that they have. This is actually an important New Testament teaching, which Paul cares about. When he calls us all sons, he does so because he wants to show there's no male or female in Christ in regards to our inheritance in Christ. Not in the egalitarian church leadership sense, but in a better and more, more important sense. Uh, Peter does this as well in 1 Peter 3. When they affirm something different about the roles of men and women, they regularly do something to, to lift women up from some diminished respect or anything else that might come as a result and frequently does come as a result. One of the reasons why I would call myself complementarian and not patriarchal is that the complementarians have built into the very name of the, of the view that, that there's two sides to this coin. One is different roles and the other is equal in value and dignity and salvation and inheritance in Christ. And this has to keep being brought alongside the different roles, lest we turn into like oppression and abuse and that sort of thing. In other words, verse 15, how are women saved through childbearing? What does it mean? It means women are fully saved just as men are through Christ. No difference in salvation. Complementarians or egalitarians, their views should not arise from their interpretation of verse 15 their views on this passage and relates to their claims should be from verses 11 through 14 and verse 15 a difficult passage should come along secondarily it doesn't actually give you leverage to turn the whole passage based on a very challenging and difficult statement we're almost there i'm about to give you conclusions for the whole video <laughs> but before i do it there's one view i want to cover that i didn't know where else to put and it's, I'm just going to call it the elders don't have authority anyways view. This is something that is pervasive in uh, Linda Belleville's writings. It's very much something that she relies on. And th this is a view that I just didn't know where else to put. Um, so before I give you the final conclusions on 1 Timothy 2, let's tackle this one. This idea that really nobody in church leadership has authority, not even the apostles. This idea promoted by Belleville and some others, it works this way. Once you say that nobody has authority... Then you say, so if a woman is being told she can't have authority, she's not really being told anything, is she? Because elders don't have authority anyways. It's kind of spread out amongst all the people equally. Therefore, you can be in that role of eldership because that just has no impact on you because there's no authority associated with that role. Um, in short, that is basically the idea. They're saying um, elders in the New Testament didn't have any religious authority. Therefore, authority is basically spread out amongst the people. Um, to paraphrase paraphrase dash from the movie Incredibles saying that everyone has authority is another way of saying that nobody has authority catch that this is the point elders didn't have any particular authority so any statement limiting women's authority should be seen as not affecting their ability to be elders interesting um, logically this seems to work like that logic works but when you actually it, it, it fails on multiple points but let's walk through it biblically here we go Linda Belleville says, quite frankly, one is hard pressed to find a biblical link between local church leadership and authority. And she specifically says exousia. Uh, we don't need a specific Greek word here. We just need the idea of authority, though. I, I don't want to narrow our search too much. The New Testament writers simply do not make this connection. In fact, no leadership position or activity in the New Testament is linked with authority with one exception. In 1 Corinthians 11.10, Paul states that a female's head covering is her authority which is a wrong interpretation of that passage. I already dealt with that in a big six hour video to pray and prophesy in corporate worship. Um, see video number 10 for the head covering claim. But what is her support? She says the Greek word exousia authority. Well, that word occurs about a hundred times in the New Testament. 
but it's never linked with local church leadership. This is what you call an argument from silence. A specific word that I've chosen out of a hat does not occur in relation to church leadership. Therefore, church leadership doesn't have any kind of authority. Here we go. Another quote from Belleville. She says, a look at relevant New Testament texts shows it is the church that possesses authority and not particular individuals or positions for that matter. She goes on to say, the church possesses authority, church leaders do not, be they male or female. Uh, this is an either or fallacy, in my opinion. Uh, the church has a certain amount of authority and its leaders have more authority than individuals within that church. This, these are both true. It's not either or. It's not like, which one is it who has authority? Well, they both do. It's just like in marriage, uh, men and women both have authority. But there's differences in the authority. So why is this wrong? Uh, let's walk through a few of the reasons real quick. Um, in Matthew 18, elders make the decision about excommunication. Not the congregation, not the people. When you have a problem with someone, they sin against you and you can't resolve it, you bring it to the elders. They make a decision about excommunication. What does that indicate? They have authority. In 1 Corinthians, why is it that Paul decides against the choice of the Corinthians to kick someone out of the church. It's because Paul has authority that they don't have. He just straight up says, I decided, kick them out. I'm deciding for you. When you're gathered, you kick that person out of the church. They're living in gross, unrepentant sin, sleeping with their father's wife, mother-in-law, and you're going to kick them out. Why? Because Paul has more authority than them. Uh, let's see. Here's another one. Uh, why does Paul tell believers he could command them if he chooses? such as in Philemon. He tells Philemon, I could just command you if I wanted to, but I, I don't want to do that. It's not optimal. It's not the best for you. I want you to do the right thing because you want to, because you see that it's right, but I could command you. He could only command you if he has authority to do that. Bosses do this all the time. I like come to an employee and be like, oh, do, you, do you feel like you did a good job there? And they're hoping the employee's like, no, you're right. I should probably do that again. Now the boss could just say, do it again. He doesn't because he's trying to nurture some good quality but he certainly can because he has the authority. Why does Hebrews 13, 17 say the following? I don't understand such wacky interpretations in scholarship. Obey your leaders, obey and submit to them for they're keeping watch over your souls as those who have to give account. Notice the word exousi is not used. This is what Linda Belleville relies on. Relies on. Exousi is not used, authority. Yeah, but you're to obey and submit to them. I mean, the implication is they have authority. These leaders, these elders, they have authority. Now, Belleville counters by saying that the submission the church is told to give is voluntary. Therefore, its leaders don't really have authority. You know you're told to submit to God, right? Um, the authority of the New Testament itself is based on the authority of the apostles. Historically and biblically speaking, it's based upon their authority. Paul's defense of his own genuine apostleship is because it means that he has authority related to his teachings and that the gospel he proclaims is authoritative. That connects to his authority. Belleville isn't even consistent on this stuff because check this out. She says that Nympha, in a previous video we talked about this, Nympha who was a homeowner and the church met in her house, that therefore Nympha had authority in that church, a unique authority in that church. Let's look at the quote from Linda Belleville. 323, here we go. Patronage of a house church was an authoritative role. The householder in Greco-Roman times was automatically in charge of any group that met in his or her domicile. Now, don't miss this because you might think she's only saying that Roman law required that. No, it's more than that. Under Roman law, Nympha had legal responsibility for and his authority over the church that met in her house. Her conclusion in this section here, in Discovering Biblical Equality, pages 87 through 89, her conclusion about Nympha is that Nympha is an elder in the sense, in the biblical sense, of being an overseer of the church. Catch the logic. Roman law says you have authority over those who meet in your home. Therefore, you're in the church position of elder because what? Elder has authority. So this is just weird. Um, you can't claim no one has authority and then claim Nympha's an elder because she had authority in the church when Nympha wasn't really an elder. But the point is their logic is inconsistent. I could I could literally go on and on and on on scriptures that demonstrate this. How big of a deal is this? This is a really big deal. This is one Egalitarian scholar and many others would follow in her footsteps who will sacrifice the nature of God's appointed authorities in his church in order to support wrong interpretations of scripture to defend egalitarianism. It's true that people overemphasize authority, but it's also true that we cannot forget 
there is real authority in the church. Now, we also need to remember Jesus's concern that we see greatness as servanthood, but that doesn't mean we don't have authorities. It means that those authorities seek to serve others with that authority. Yeah, these things inform our view of authority. They don't remove our view of authority. Elders have authority. You cannot get around the New Testament teaching on gender roles by denying that elders have authority. And now we get to the conclusions. This is the end. Conclusions on 1 Timothy 2. You may have skipped right here. Here it is. The complementarian position does not depend on 1 Timothy 2. That's super important. That is why I waited till this last video in, in my series. I'll do one more video. It's a summary, just a quick short summary, and then application, a bunch of tough application questions. I waited to talk about 1 Timothy 2. I did not make any interpretation of any other passage of the Bible in my many hours of research depend on 1 Timothy 2. I may have brought it in to say, hey, and think about this. I never depended on it at any point. That is to say, the complementarian position is firmly established even if you removed 1 Timothy 2 from the Bible. But 1 Timothy 2 fully and clearly supports complementarian views, not patriarchal as I understand them views not egalitarian views, most certainly, as anyone understands them. Women are to fully participate in Christian education. This is a huge thing in 1 Timothy 2. Let her learn. Fully participate in Christian education. This is a really big deal against some of the stronger patriarchal views that would limit what kind of theological classes a woman should take, what kind of books a woman should be told to read, or asking her husband permission to read theology and stuff like this. Eh, nah. It is also not just Paul's personal opinion. <clears throat> While some complementarians or egalitarians will say this is Paul's personal opinion, it is not. It is his ruling as an apostle, and it is his cons constant and consistent teaching in all the churches that he has influence over. Paul doesn't have limited jurisdiction either, which no longer applies to us today. No, this is um, apostolic instruction for the church, widely speaking. It's also not time-bound. Where some would say, I do not permit, means... I don't permit for the time being, but rather Paul is saying, I don't permit it, period, as my apostolic ruling. That 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 interpretation is how we got to go with it. It's not about some particular problem in Ephesus. It's not about a slew of female false teachers. It's not about some quirk related to the cult of Artemis. There's a ton of false claims, false claims, genuinely wrong claims about the cult of Artemis floating around in egalitarian writings, even the most recent ones, even very well-respected scholars. There's no false creation narrative that Paul is fighting when he talks about Adam and Eve. There's no hyper-feminist Artemis teaching. There's no hyper-feminist Ephesus. The Artemis cult is not the key to understanding 1 Timothy 2, at most certainly up through verse 14, and I really don't think it is about verse 15 either, my personal opinion there. It's not about wives and husbands, like Cynthia Long Westfall would suggest. The passage is about men and women. It's not, it's not, we don't relegate it to only talking about marriage. We've got to confront it and apply it to our local church government. It's not, it's not about all social settings. Here I'm going to push against many patriarchalists. First Timothy 2 is not about all social settings. It's just about church leadership and in particular eldership, not only the title elder, but the function of an elder. The things an elder does that nobody else does, that stuff, teaching and having authority in the church. A woman can be a boss. A woman can teach men in other contexts. A woman can have authority in other contexts. This is just limiting the church leadership thing um, relating to eldership as as it was being as it was functioning in the church. I don't mean elder the way your church uses the term or deacon the way your church uses the term. I mean you got to look at the scripture and come up with their definitions of these words and apply it to that to those concepts. Senior pastor is not the only thing that's being addressed. It's not like you have. Um, you have the, okay, well, you don't have the title of senior pastor, but you're still functioning as a teaching leadership role in the church for men and women, like as a mixed group, this is not, that Paul, it seems, would be forbidding that. We'll talk about tough application questions next time. This is at least the general application answered, I think, very clearly. The term quiet does not refer to total silence. A woman should not be kept from singing in church or from worshiping out loud where men can hear her. That's not teaching and having authority. That's not an issue there. Uh, it's just contrasting teaching. A woman can speak prophetically in church. She can make announcements. She can worship. She can be part of the worship team. Um, and we'll talk about some of the more challenging questions about that next time around. Um, have authority is the proper translation for verse 12 right? For authenteo, right? She can, should not teach or have authority 
over a man. Have authority is a proper translation. It's not all authority, but authority that's similar to the eldership role in the church, specifically relating to teaching and having authority in that in that context. If assume authority, if and, and many of you th- would think this like with the NIV, which is a rare translation to say this, but if the word assume should be in front of authority there, this is super important. It's not pejorative. It doesn't mean she's taking it on herself. It just means a woman isn't to step into the role that is being described in 1 Timothy 2.12. It is not just saying she can't take it on herself without proper authorization. I know that's a tempting thing for many of us to grab onto. It's just not valid. And even the NIV translators have said that this is this, they weren't trying to communicate that with the word assume. So don't, don't grab the NIV and think it's supporting that point. It's, it's not. And just a reminder, we looked at ancient uses of the term. We looked at related words, ancient translations, the very context of 1 Timothy 2, and a slew of evidence that seems to be very strongly confirming this. It is not a conspiracy of chauvinist men to translate it have authority. It's, it's, it's just good research and good, good studies that have led us in that direction. The teaching, let's talk about the teaching in verse 12. Uh, I don't allow women to teach a man. Um, The forbidden teaching is not false teaching or a bad kind of teaching. Obviously, no one's allowed to do false teaching or bad teaching in the church. At least they're not supposed to be. But that's not what it's talking about. It's he's forbidding the kind of teaching that comes with authority that's that's coupled with authority that's to the local church on a regular basis. Uh, That seems to be the specific kind of thing he's talking about. I think that we need to acknowledge that and we need to make our church leadership policies submit to that reality. What we should be getting nearly every Sunday from the pulpit is exactly that kind of thing, that kind of teaching coupled with authority, where they're proclaiming the truths of Christianity. Does that mean you always get that every Sunday or there are no exceptions on Sundays? We'll, we'll, We'll talk about that as well. But this is meant to be the bread and butter of what the church is receiving on a regular basis on Sundays. And that's exactly the thing that Paul says not to have for a woman to do for a man in particular, leaving the door open for doing the same thing for women. The term teacher have authority should not be understand, understood in the following ways. It should not be understood as teach in a domineering fashion. It should not be understood as teach with assumed or presumed authority. It should be understood as teaching that is done with authority, such as what we ought to have in the church all the time. Other kinds of teaching are not a problem. Um, I want to throw out there that um, famously, uh, John Piper has suggested that women, if a man pulls over and asks a woman for directions, she has to give him directions in a special way that honors the role differences and the authority he has. And she doesn't want to, because she's teaching him, right? She said, try to, try to not do it in a way that's teaching him exactly. And I think that this is hogwash and we just need to ignore that and not worry about that. In my opinion, okay, I think what we're doing here, and we'll talk about this next week, is we're drawing out the application of something way too far which is a problem that the Pharisees had. And I want to keep that in mind. Um, So this whole thing is 100% based on gender, by which I mean biological sex. A woman can do all the stuff in verse 12, just not over a man. Catch that? It it is very much a gender-based issue and all attempts to try to take it away from the gender topic that is what a large amount of egalitarian writings are doing, I think is incorrect. Um... It is based on creation in the fall. That's really significant, verses 13 and 14. This isn't because of some Artemis cult creation story, right? It, that, that's not the issue. It's based on just Genesis. It shows that the rule about genders that Paul is giving is supported by both God's created design in, in Genesis 2, as well as it being reaffirmed in the fall, and therefore it applies in all churches today. This doesn't mean that I'm fighting to push the fall and keep the consequences of the fall. That sounds good to say that, that's rhetorically powerful, but it goes against the clear teachings of scripture to make that claim. Eve's deception does not mean that women are more easily deceived than men. I hope people will go back and re-listen to that section of the video if they still are thinking that. And if you think, well, Mike, you're just a weak male. No, you are an arrogant male and you, you need to let scripture correct you on this because you're being abusive and cruel to people and kind of stupid reread the text there is every indication that you are wrong every indication there's just no validity to that interpretation in my in my opinion none um there is sorry i use the i use the s word sorry um i think i'm just i'm trying to i want to shake you up and wake you up and have you go and you have to think it through you can't just look at me and be like beta male bah. no you need to go and examine the text of scripture and let it correct you um and if i'm wrong you show me where i'm wrong don't just call me names 
Show me where I'm wrong, then call me names. But you better show me where I'm wrong. Or else. Bah, bah, bah. Bah, bah, bah. Beta. Okay. All right. What about the theory that this restriction is only on women because women had less education? Um, no, that that's false. That doesn't work for a number of reasons we explained. It is a gender-based restriction regardless of education level. The phrase saved through childbearing is admittedly tough. The conclusions I have on that, while I feel great about it, I can't I can't like assign the same level of competence to my interpret interpretation of saved through childbearing as I do to my interpretation of the rest of the passage. Um, I, I believe we should be able to say it's not about being saved from death or pains while giving birth. It's not about being saved in spite of the fact of going through labor pains. I don't think it's about those things. Personally, I think it refers to Christ. I think I made a very strong case for that. And I hope that that, that becomes the more popular view moving forward. Not that I myself am going to cause all that to happen, but maybe I can contribute to it. But it may be a reference to the importance of a woman's role and a statement that a woman is not is saved not by living out that role, but in association with that role. That is a possibility, and at least that's consistent with Paul's teaching elsewhere, in which case it would affirm that women have the full status of co-heir, you know, sons of God, that status with Christ. A common thing to see whenever gender issues are brought up in the New Testament is that affirmation of the high status of women. 1 Timothy 2.12 means what it looks like it means. This massive video is only really needed because of the massive debate. It's not really needed because of a bunch of confusion that is naturally arising from the passage. It's pretty straightforward. Yet most of you didn't really need this video, the ones that needed it. You needed it because you read some stuff that confused you and you were like, help me understand this. I don't have the tools just now to work through all this with a fine tooth comb. And so hopefully this video has done that for you. Aside from verse 15, aside from verse 15, the whole passage is fairly straightforward in most current translations. Um, I have been so, I can't, I, I've expl I expressed it to you guys clearly, but in case you skipped the conclusion, I have been so disappointed by egalitarian arguments. I had, not only did I have higher expectations, because I know many of these same scholars have done amazing work in other places and done really great stuff that I would recommend. But also because I was hoping for better, right? Um, I have something in my own heart that has skewed me away from the goodness of God's design and gender roles. This is probably related to the way I was raised and very feminist environments that I've been in and that sort of thing, aside from, yeah, in conservative churches. But my, but I was not raised in the church, y'all. So just so you know, one of the growing up, one of the one things you didn't want to be in my house was a typical man. That was, that was the biggest insult you could possibly have. So maybe part of that is bleeding into what I want to see um, or the ease of witnessing. If I could just tell the people in my own sort of very liberal culture and community I live in, if I could just tell them that this is a non-issue and that the Bible's totally egalitarian in every way, well, it is egalitarian in some ways, not in the ways that, are, that, that the movement actually is all about. Um, so I've just been so disappointed in egalitarian arguments. I hope I've given you evidence to support that disappointment and to be honest, to share it with you as well so that you will not think, because <clears throat> here's what I often see, because there's so much argument, I'll just get on the fence and then you're standing for nothing. This is not one of those issues where you should just be utterly confused and stand for nothing. I held off. People would send me messages. Women, um, you know, Mike, I, I'm really confused about this issue. Um, I have people in my church telling me that I should seek pastoral ministry, but I'm not sure. I mean, I read these passages and they give me pause. Can you tell me what they mean? And for like three years or longer, I don't remember how long, for years, I just wouldn't answer the questions because I felt like, what if I'm wrong? There's so many egalitarians out there that are brilliant, that I respect, that are saying this. I haven't heard all their arguments. And I just said, you know, read the Bible, follow your conscience before the Lord. I'm not going to weigh in on this yet. I wasn't afraid to weigh in. I was afraid to be wrong. I hope this video restores your confidence in the goodness of God's design for men and women. I hope that this series helps do that so you don't have to get on the fence unnecessarily just because the sheer number of people arguing about it. What's next? What is next? Um, I'm going to make one last video in this series. One last video. It will not be this long. I would die. <laughs> um, it'll just be a summary, a quick, super short summary of each video in the series. Just main topic. Boom, 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 boom summary. So that people are like, I just need one little resource where it's like quick and easy. That'll be that. 
Um, but then I'm going to talk about application. The brunt of the video is going to be about applying all of these principles. So I'm going to pull out all the biblical principles we found about males and females and gender relationships, and we're going to apply it to every tough question that I am able to apply it to. What about YouTube channels where women talk about theology? What about ones where they talk about apologetics? What about a one-off lecture where a woman does a one-off lecture at a church on a theological topic where she's an expert and she's really good at it? What about that? Is that teaching and authority? Is that just teaching? What is that? What do we do with that? What about a woman doing announcements in the church or leading worship and standing and, and being the worship leader who's maybe exhorting, offering some words in between songs? What about teaching a parenting message from a Sunday pulpit about parenting? What about teaching a message directed towards the women, but the men are present in the church? What about women in apologetics at a conference? Um, speaking about like uh, Natasha Crane, a friend of mine who does a great job with apologetics and she speaks at conferences and events. And what about that? What about that same woman coming as a guest teacher on a Sunday morning and teaching from the pulpit about apologetics? What about a woman being interviewed by the senior pastor where he's, he's there and she's being interviewed, or maybe her husband is present and there's some sort of team thing going on. And is that, what about team teaching? Like what they're doing at, um, uh, at Saddleback Community Church, now that Rick Warren has, has stepped down, they've got the husband there and his wife. And so there's like a sense in which she's like sort of under his leadership in a sense, but she's still teaching. They're kind of co-teaching and stuff. Is that acceptable? Is that is that still complementary in some way? What about leading? A, there's a lot more. We're going to go over all these if, as best I can. What about teaching at a Bible college? Teaching theology at a Bible college. Someone's going to be a pastor and they're sitting under a woman who's teaching. What about that? What about a seminary? What about leading a church ministry, like a food ministry or a hospitality ministry? Very often women are stepping into those roles. What about leading a youth ministry? Junior high? How about high school? Teaching? Are those men? They're 18. They're also 14. Like, what about them? What about being a small group leader? Being just a small group leader, facilitator, small group leader. What about that? What about being a head usher or hosting a podcast where they discuss how weird Andy Stanley has become? What about other things? What about women doing all that stuff? The reason why I want to dig into these issues is because I know women who have, and many of you are watching this, um, at, at least the, the five who made it to the end of the video, um, that you have had people in your comment sections on your videos or when you go up to share in any capacity and any, and there's, there's some guy that comes up, even a woman that comes up and says, you shouldn't be doing this. Where are the clear boundaries? How far do we extend Paul's restrictions on women to be safe, but without becoming Pharisees where we're saying, oh, you can't even rub these, these, this chaff together on the Sabbath to put it in your mouth. You're violating the Sabbath. Jesus didn't think so. Like, so how far is the strict reality of don't do this, don't do that versus the flexibility of people have tons of gifts and we don't want to limit and, and stop those things. Um, I'm going to dig into all that next time, because what we will do is we'll gather all those biblical principles through all those things. That, that we've done, all the other videos I've done, and then say, boom, here's how we apply them into real life. I hope that that video becomes something that's tremendously helpful for you guys. And I cannot believe that I'm done with this one. Um, just, just a personal note, if I can. I mean, it's already this long. Um, I got, I got uh, real sick and was, was messed up for like the past year and the past like month or so i've been getting a lot better a lot more energy and stuff like that that delayed this video massively and then had family things and had to see my mom through the hardest part of her life when she got cancer and had to take a lot of time out I, I i from my the time i started recording this video until now it has been over three weeks it has been almost a month because of stopping to just go and take care of my mom and stuff like that um, and so I'm just, uh, it's been a rough and tough time for me, actually. I hope and pray that this is a really helpful contribution to the, to the way too angry discussion on women in ministry. Any egalitarian watching this, I love you. You are my brother or sister in Christ. I think this issue is important, but e getting this issue right isn't even as important as just our love for each other in Christ. That is number one. That's paramount. But that doesn't mean this doesn't matter. And so I'm going to hold no punch. I'm not going to hold punches. But I will never hold back the hand of fellowship with you. I love you. I care about you. And I pray that we can see more of that love. Um, and those who are right can extend that rightness in a way that hopefully builds bridges and doesn't burn them too much. As for scholars who've put out bad arguments, you're causing problems. And I pray that you would seriously reconsider those things. Yeah. I'm going to go ahead and pray. Lord, we thank you for the fact that you've made male and female. 
you've made us this way. You've made us different in ways that are very contrary to our society, but our society is just demolishing itself. And part of the destruction is that they keep rejecting these biblical truths. They either go the side of hyper patriarchal views where arrogant, <clears throat> arrogant men diminish the value of women and mistreat them, abuse them and try to shrink them down or where um, hyper feminism stands up and pushes against ways in which we could picture Christ as husband and wife ways in which we could step into roles you've called us to and we can function in the ways that would beautifully have us helping each other and serving each other and demonstrating love and leadership and submission and trust and we um we pray that you would help the church to get back to the truth on these things to not worry about appeasing our culture but to set a standard that our culture could look at and see is not oppressive but is also not arrogant that is wise and is pure and is good and is healthy in jesus name amen